Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. This time, a mystery. A puzzle, if you will, which I challenge you to solve. As with all mysteries worthy of the name, each clue will be honestly and plainly presented to you. And yet, unless I miss my guess, the answer to the puzzle will elude you till the very end. We'll play a game of wits, you and I, just for the fun of it, and see who wins. Unhappily, one of the characters you'll meet lost. I, I found the shrunken head on the pillow of my bed, and that clock points to 12. That means I, I die at 12. Question is, Elizabeth, dear, 12 what? 12 what? 12 noon or 12 midnight. Drum clock. Twelve o'clock. Noon. Maybe you'll be dead on the stroke of twelve, Elizabeth. <laughs> and maybe you have to wait till midnight. Our mystery drama, Sting of Death was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars William Prince. My first move is to describe the huge barn-like living room of the country home of Trevor Costain, explorer, adventurer, author. And the living room reflects the trophies of his travels. On the north wall, headdresses of native tribal chiefs from all over the world. The south wall is covered with awards, trophies. The west wall is hung with native spears, shields, primitive weapons. And on the east wall, above the huge fireplace, hangs a clock. A most bizarre clock. The face is made of a Tugari war shield. Headhunters, you know, the Tugari. The hands of the clock are made of, uh, well, human thigh bones. And the hours, from one to twelve, are marked by shrunken human heads. Well, don't look so horrified. I told you the Tugari were headhunters. And when I told you that... I gave you your first important clue. See what you can do with it. Liz, give me another drink. Trevor, the doctor... I know, I know, but if I'm going to die, I'm going to die happy. Dad, the disease, you know what alcohol does to you because of it? I'm in enough pain, Furry. Stop calling me Dad. He is your son-in-law, Father. Don't remind me, Jackie. Liz, that drink, please. Some son-in-law, some husband, an alcoholic who's put you through purgatory since the day you married him. That's ended now. I haven't had a drink since I joined AA five weeks ago. I wish I could believe that. You can. Oh, Fari, here's your drink, Trevor. Thanks. Oh, Father, you're not going to smoke, too. Did I say I was going to smoke? Well, every time you pick up one of your pipes... Oh, don't I'm... worry, Jackie. Whatever disease hit me in Borneo years ago... Just a whiff of tobacco sickens me. Give my right arm to be able to smoke these pipes again, but all I can do is polish them, clean them, puff on them, never light them. It's a terrible way to live. I'll be glad when I'm dead. Oh, don't say that, Trevor. You sound as if you'll be sorry when I'm gone, Liz. I will be. Why lie to me, Liz? Our marriage has been anything but a happy one. We put each other through the ringer the way our long-haired son-in-law put Jackie through one. Different kind of ringer, that's all. Oh, well, that's over now. Everything's over. For me. <clears throat> oh, Father, please don't get up. If you want anything, Got just... Got to get up and ease the pain. Just want to get those pipe cleaners on the mantle and... Oh, blast. You dropped your drink. All over me, I'm afraid. Sorry. Spasm of pain. I'll make you another. Uh, I'll have to change these pants. Father, sit down. I'll get the pipe cleaners. 
Oh, I can't do a thing for myself anymore. Not a thing. <sighs> Jackie, what about the divorce? Well, I've given Fory... Here. Here are the pipe cleaners. Mm. I've given Fory another chance. It's a waste of time. Do you know that? It's probably hopeless, but... In common decency, I can't let him down. He depends on me, Father. A weakling. He's a weakling. Well, some men are. Not Rod Champion. He was a man for you. I told you that. Your drink. Thanks. Rod will be here tomorrow, Jackie. Gonna spend a few days helping me straighten out my affairs. Why don't you and he try to get together? See if you can still hit it off. Father. He's the... What the devil? What? The clock. That headhunter clock over the fireplace. Look at it. That's strange. One of those awful shrunken heads is missing. The one that marked the hour of seven. Oh, Father, what happened to I it? I don't know. I just noticed it was missing this minute. Look around. See if it's on the floor. Oh, if it is, I'd just as soon... Look not... around, I said. I can't. All right, dear. All right. Jackie, you look and see if... Oh! But that was Fari. Something's happened. Good heavens, what could... I don't know, I do... Look at this. Look at this, look. The head off the clock. Oh. What are you doing with it? It was on the pillow of my bed. Your pillow? It was just lying there, smack in the middle of the pillow. Fari, this some kind of gag? Did you take it off the clock? Oh, why would I do a thing like that? I don't know. But then I don't know why you've done a lot of things you've done. Dad, I tell you, I... All right, all right. We'll put it back on the clock. The hour of seven. Yeah. Sure. Somebody's playing games. Somebody with a sick sense of humor. And I... Oh. Oh! Sorry, what? Uh, Father! Catch him, he's uh, fall... Oh, oh, sorry! Get away, Jackie. L let me see. Is the... Is he... Dead? Yes. Drum clock in the hall. It's seven o'clock. The shrunken head. The hour of seven. Fari found it in his room. On his pillow. And now he's dead. What does it mean? What? Yes? Well, this is Trevor Castain. Uh, oh, I see. Oh, uh, yes. Well, I want to be informed the minute you find out. Fine. Goodbye. Who was that? At the coroner's office. I've been bugging them all through the night to tell me what killed that husband of yours. And? We just wanted to let me know they're starting the autopsy now. Oh. Jackie? Yes, Father? We've never pulled any punches with each other, you and me, so don't let's pull any now. You really sorry for he's dead? What a thing to ask! What's the answer? I... I don't know. <laughs> Marriage to Forey was purgatory, as you said last night, but he... He was starting a new life, joining AA, and... Uh, oh, it isn't fair somehow. Not to him, maybe. But it's very fair to you. What do you mean? You can do what you should have done in the first place. You can marry Roger. Oh, Father, you're taking an awful lot for granted. You love him, don't you? Yes, I... I guess I do, but... No buts about it. When Roger gets here... Hey, sounds like he's here. Come on. Let's meet him at the door. Are you strong enough to walk? Sure, sure. Having a good day. Come on. Can't wait to see him. Best safari manager I ever had. <laughs> Never took any guff from me either. Didn't have to. He's a fine man, Jackie. Fine man. <clears throat> hey, Trevor. It's Jackie. Good to see you. Rod, you old son of a gun. I can't tell you how good it is to... Who's this? Trevor? Jackie? Meet Virginia. My wife. Virginia.
<laughs> You've no idea. No idea at all what killed for it? Well, they're doing the autopsy now, Raj. Uh, coroner, uh, Dr. Dodd is a friend of mine. You'll let me know what they come up with as soon as they know. Help yourself to a drink, Raj. Oh, thanks. You? No, no, almost lunchtime. I <laughs> have to limit myself. Can't even smoke. And with three months or less to live. Hell of a way to go out. Oh, hand me those pipe cleaners, will you? Yeah. Here you are. Hmm. At least you get some satisfaction from fooling around with these old pipes of yours. Yes. Kind of makes not smoking a little easier. You know, Raj, you shocked me when you arrived with a wife. How come? I had plans for you and Jackie. I was in love with Jackie, yes, but when she married Forey, well, that was that. Ginny's a, a wonderful girl, and she'll be a wonderful wife. Oh, I'm sure. Speaking of Jackie and Virginia, they ought to be back from their walk soon. It's almost... Now, what in blazes? What is it? The clock. Look at the clock. A head's missing. From 12. Now, what does this mean? Well, probably nothing at all. It probably just fell off. It didn't just fall off. And don't bother looking for it on the floor. Someone took that head off the clock, Raj. And unless I miss my guess, it means someone else is going to die. Oh, I can't believe that there's any significance. Oh, Father... Roger, is something wrong? Jackie, your mother's still asleep in her room, worn out after last night. Better get her down here. Well, why? What, what's happened? A head is missing from the clock again, this time from the hour of twelve. Oh, no. If oh. it means another death... Well, never mind. Wake your mother up and tell her to come down here. What? Liz, stay here. All of you, I'll handle this. Father, when did you discover this head missing? Just now. Seconds before you and Virginia came back from your walk. But, Father, you don't think it means... It, it can't mean another... I'm afraid it could. Uh, easy, easy, Elizabeth. Oh. Trev, oh. she woke up a minute ago to find this beside her on the pillow. The shrunken head. Oh, Mother. Oh, am I going to die? Is that what it means? That I, I, I'm going to die the way Farry did? Oh, of course not. Twelve o'clock. My head is missing from 12 o'clock. I'm going to die at 12. I know I'm going to die at 12. The question is, 12 noon or 12 midnight? Oh. oh. I didn't think of that. Well, you'd better. Oh, how can you be so callous at that head? That shrunken head. You put it on my pillow. What? It would be just like you to do something crazy like this. Because you're... You're sick, Trevor. Mother, sick. Mother, he please. is sick. I don't know how he killed Fari. Before our eyes, yours and mine, killed him. But he did. And he's going to do it again. This time to me. Take it, take it easy, Elizabeth. You, uh... When? When is he going to do it? That's the only question now. The only question that interests me. When, Trevor? Twelve noon? Twelve midnight? <laughs> I don't mind dying. But I can't. Bear not knowing when. Tell me, Trevor. Tell me. A dramatic scene. And an intriguing one, don't you think? If I were you, I wouldn't at this moment be asking, was Forey murdered? And will Elizabeth meet the same fate? But... If Forey was, and she does, how? I'll return in a minute for Act Two. At 
this moment, you have all the clues you need. In fact, all the clues you're going to get, because that's all there are to answer the riddle of how Forey Prescott died. And, oh, let's face it, it is murder, and who killed him? If it comes to that, who will murder Elizabeth, and how? For surely, she too is going to die. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Oh, catch her. She's falling. I've got her. Elizabeth? Oh. Oh, I, 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 I'm all right. Oh, Mother, thank heaven you're alive. So you see, oh. my dear Elizabeth, I didn't murder you after all. Oh. Only because you mean to prolong the agony, Trevor. Now I must wait till midnight. Why? What do you mean, why? You can simply leave. Get out of here now. Yes, Mother, you can do that. I'll drive you to town. You could stay at the motel. Or if you want, I'll take you to New York. You could... No. But, Elizabeth, if you're afraid of being murdered at midnight... Then let it be at midnight. Get it over with. This... This, it's, it's crazy. You know, all this talk about murder. You, all of you. You're assuming Forey was murdered when you don't even know what he died of. For all you know, he could simply have dropped dead. A heart attack. Cerebral hemorrhage. Why have you assumed, the three of you, you, Jackie, you, Trev, you, Elizabeth, why have you assumed from the start that Forey was murdered? But if he wasn't, Raj, what's the meaning behind the shrunken head? We discovered the head was missing from the hour of seven on that... that awful clock above the fireplace. And then Forey found it on the pillow of his bed, and Forey died at exactly seven o'clock. This time a head is missing from twelve, and it's on the pillow of my bed. Where I found it when I woke up from my bed. Hello? Oh, hello, Ed. Dr. Dodd, the coroner. I see... Hmm. Well, how long will that take? Will you let me know? Thanks, Ed. Thanks very much. What What did Dr. Dodd say, Father? Forey was murdered. <gasps> no. The autopsy revealed poison in the body tissues. What kind of poison? Well, they uh, don't know yet. Ed's sending a tissue sample to the New York police lab to find out. No doubt uh, about it now, though. Forey was murdered. As you will murder me. At midnight. Darling, let's sit down a few minutes before we go back. Oh, Raj, I just had to get away from that awful atmosphere in that house. <laughs> Look, sweetheart, I'll be more than happy to take you back to New York. And then come back by yourself? Oh, no. Oh, I'd be safe enough, I think. From whom? What? I'm not thinking of the murderer, sweetheart. I, I'm thinking of the danger you'd be in. And, and I'd be in from the very attractive and decidedly sexy Jacqueline. Oh, I owe it to Trevor to help him all I can with his records, papers, Lord knows what. Help him get them in order before he dies. Raj, what do you make of all this? I, who do you think murdered Trevor's son-in-law? I don't know. Could be Trevor. He hated Fari, but then it... It could be Jackie. She hated him, too. What about Mrs. Costain? Elizabeth? Hmm. I know what you mean. With that shrunken head on her pillow, she could have put it there. Yeah. A red herring, a blind. Hmm. Something to throw the police off the scent when they get here. The police will come again, you think? Well, sure. I'd say all they're waiting for is a toxicology report on whatever poison killed Fari, and that can come any minute, any hour. It's, it's almost five. I guess we, we've been gone at least a couple of hours. I guess we'd better think of getting back. Jenny, you sure now? You don't want me to take you back to New York? Uh-uh. You're a brave little girl who deserves a kiss. I'm a scared little girl. But, but don't let that stop you. Don't tell me what to do, Jackie. If I want to change my will, I'll change it. In fact, my attorneys are changing it right now. Well, damn it, don't look at me as if I'd done some 
terrible thing to you. Or maybe you misunderstood me. No, I didn't misunderstand. You're cutting mother off and leaving your fortune to me. Why? Plain enough. I want to be sure you're financially safe and secure. Oh, no, Father. There's more behind it than that. You know as well as I do, Mother would take good care of me, share what she has with me. <laughs> you don't know her like I know her. Oh, I know her better than you. I've spent my life with her. You've spent yours elsewhere. Well, I'm an explorer, or I was. Oh, you could have spent more time with her. I don't tolerate fools easily. Well, we've got off the subject. What's your real reason? For changing the will. All right. Let me tell you. You're still hoping I'll marry Roger Campion. You're hoping that if I'm an heiress, the money will help induce him to divorce Virginia and marry me. You said it, not me. Well, you think it. You must. I can't think of any other reason for changing your will. Oh, Father, Roger and I are through with each other. If only you hadn't married Fari. Damn. Well, if you'd put a break on your temper, you wouldn't break so many of those pipe stems. One of my best pipes, too. Well, I have to send it for repair. I wish I could repair the mess you've made of your life as easily. All right, I made a mess of my life, but that's over now. Fari's <laughs> dead, and that's over. And I mean to keep you from making another. <laughs> now, you listen to me. Roger's the man for you. He always has been. And why you didn't marry him oh, years ago... you know ago. why? I wanted a husband I could live with, be with. Not a wanderer like you. I saw what happened to Mother because of you. The emptiness, loneliness. And I made up my mind it would never happen to me. <laughs> Fari was no bargain, as it turned out, but he stayed at home. So does Roger now. He runs his safaris from an office in New York. <laughs> that, that disease you picked up in Borneo, it's just making you see things in a warped way, a distorted way. You're not yourself. You think it's crazy of me to change my will? It's crazy of me to hope that you'll persuade Roger to get a divorce and marry you. That what I want so much, the two people I love most in this world, should make it together. But I haven't got a prayer, it'll happen. Well, it won't. I'm sorry, but it won't. It will. I want... You can't always have what you want. You're wrong. I always have, and always will. Till the day I die. Midnight. It's nearly midnight. Jackie, where's your mother? I told you. She's locked herself in her room. And I told you I want her here in this living room at midnight. Go get her. She won't unlock the door. She feels safer locked in her room. If you won't go and get her, I will. Weak as I am, I'll go up there and break the door down. I want her here. Give it another try, Jackie. All right. And tell her I'll come up and break the door down. And you go get that piece of fluff you married. I want her here, too. That little piece of fluff I married is probably fast asleep. And Trev, I'm not waking her. You will do as I She's say. She's had a rough time since we got here this morning. If I'd known what we were heading into, I wouldn't have come, let alone bring Ginny. She went to bed after dinner, and that's where she's going to stay. All right. You know, that's the one thing I always liked about you, Raj. You never failed to stand up to me. You take a lot of standing up, too. Not anymore. Hand me that rack of pipes, will you? The, the one with the church wardens. Church wardens? Oh, the ones with the long stamp. Yes. They're beautiful, Trev. They really are. Any practical reason for the... Extra long stems? Oh, sure, they cool and filter the smoke. The longer the stem, the better... Th oh, you finally decided to join us. You decided, Trevor. Why are you so determined to have me here, in this room at midnight? Elizabeth, why were you so determined to stay in yours? To put it plainly, 
so you couldn't kill me. You've eaten no dinner? You've had nothing to drink all day? To cut day? down the chances of your poisoning me the way you poisoned Fari. I locked myself in my room to cut the chances down even further. But, well, here I am. You wanted me here, in this room, so you could murder me. And I'm sure that when the drum clock strikes at midnight, you will. Oh, I don't know, but you will. It's never occurred to you, I suppose, that I want you here so I can protect you. Protect me? <laughs> Is that so hard to believe? Oh, very hard. In fact, impossible. Well, less than a minute now to midnight. Roger. Yes, Elizabeth? Goodbye. I, I want you to know that, like Trevor, I too have always been very fond of you. Respected you. Hoped you and Jackie would marry. But I also want you to know that you, you couldn't have done better when you married Virginia. She's a fine girl, Roger. Just the kind of wife you need. Goodbye, Roger. Elizabeth, you're sounding as if you were going to your execution. In a way, that's what it would be. Nonsense. You're not going to die. You're standing here in this room, as healthy a woman as I've ever seen. You, we, we've let Fari's death overshadow everything, warp our thinking, make us expect death. But look around you, Elizabeth. Where could you possibly find a more, a more home-like scene? A scene that ought to reflect contentment rather than anything else. Content? I mean, look around. The fire blazing in the fireplace. Trev polishing his pipe. The friendly warmth of an old house where... Midnight. Jackie. Mother. Let me hold you. Mother, you're not going to die. You can I am, I know it. I... Elizabeth, this is nonsense. It's ridiculous. Trevor. I'm waiting. What do you mean? Waiting? For you to kill me. Murder me. If I murder you, Elizabeth, it'll be the neatest trick of the week. I couldn't agree with you more. Oh, mother. Oh, mother. I tried to catch her, but... No, no. Jackie, stand back. Let me... She's dead. One moment she was alive and the next dead. Roger, what killed her? What killed Fari? What? What? How? Do you know? Have you figured it all out? As I told you, you have all the clues I have... And I've figured it out. Well, uh, I think I have. I'll be back shortly for Act Three. Now Elizabeth Costain is dead. Mysteriously struck down. Instantly killed as her son-in-law Forrest Prescott was. Only the day before. Now, the following morning in the guest room, occupied by Roger and Virginia Campion... No, no, Virginia, I've made up my mind. We're leaving. Not if you plan to take me to New York and then return here. I won't be coming back. I never expected anything like this when I agreed to help Trevor straighten out his affairs. Oh, but Roger, you're such old friends. I'm not so sure of that, Jenny. To be Trevor Costain's friend, you have to be friends on his terms. Oh, he likes me, sure. He values my friendship up to a point. But that's because I always did the job he wanted done, and I never crossed him. He must have been a hard man to live with. He hasn't changed any, even with a... Well, even with his death only a few weeks, months away. He's still demanding and getting what he wants. He's still riding roughshod over everyone in his path. I have got a strong suspicion that that's why Fari and Elizabeth were murdered. 
They got in Trevor's way. Then you really think... I'm almost <laughs> sure of it. Now, there are only four of us left in this house now. There's you and me and Jackie and Trevor. Now, you and I certainly aren't murderers, and Jackie wouldn't kill a gnat if she could avoid it. No, no. It's got to be Trevor. What I can't figure out is how he killed them. What's that? Well, I, I thought all the police had left. Oh, it's the last car heading out of the driveway now. Come on, Ginny, let's get these bags packed. I want to be heading out of that driveway, too. And just as soon as possible. Father. Father, will you please stop polishing that damn pipe and listen to me? Well, what do you want, Jackie? The police have just left. I... I wondered if you'd like a cup of coffee. Give me a drink. No, you're not supposed to drink. I know what I'm not supposed to do. All right. Whatever you say. And hand me those pipe cleaners. Here you are. Here's your drink. Thanks. It's good. Good. I'll miss this final scotch when I'm gone. <laughs> One consolation, though. Roger always enjoyed it, too. And it'll all be his when I've kicked the bucket. You... You willed it to him? Your supply of scotch? No, no, of course not. I meant all of this will be his. I don't, I, I don't understand. You said you willed everything to me. Well, I did. Maybe I shouldn't have said this will all be Roger's. I should have said yours and Roger's. Naturally, after you're married... Married? Father, I told... I told you yesterday I'm not marrying Roger. For one thing, I don't love him anymore, and he doesn't love me. And for another, he's happily married to Virginia. For as long as she lives. As long as she lives? As long as... Oh, come in, Raj. Come in. Trev. Jackie. Did you and Ginny get any sleep? Not much. Dozed an hour or so. How about some coffee? It's a good idea. And what would you like for breakfast? Just uh, coffee. You'll be okay. And what about Ginny? Coffee will be enough for her, too. We, uh, we want to get an early start back to New York. Back to New York? We haven't even started on my paper, my record. I know, old Trev, but... Uh, but? but what? Trev... Uh, if I'd known what I was walking into when I came here, and uh, kn known what I was walking Ginny into, I'd never have come. Oh, yes, you would. You never disobeyed me. Stood up to me, yes. But when the chips were down, you did what you were told. I was your second in command then, and that was years ago. Oh, not so many. Uh, Two, three. But busy, busy years, Trev. I've got my own business now, my own life to live, and... To be plain, I don't take orders from anybody anymore. Why, you ungrateful... Now, just a minute, Trev. I was more than willing to come here and spend as much time as it took to straighten out your affairs. I felt I owed you that. The least you owed me, the least. Maybe. But what I don't owe you is putting my life, or Ginny's, on the line for you. You mean, Fari's death. Mother's. Yeah, and who's and next? I've got a feeling that no one is safe in this house. A feeling or a suspicion? Same thing, Trev. Not exactly. Feeling there may be another death is one thing. Suspecting who might be behind the deaths is another. You suspect me, don't you? Yes, Trev, I do. Well... I guess the time has come to tell you that your suspicion is correct. One hundred percent correct. You. You did kill. Oh, me. you suspected me too, but did you? But it's impossible. You hardly have strength enough left to stand on your feet, to walk a few steps. Wrong. How... Oh, I'm weak, all right, but not as weak as I pretended. See? Then you... You were able to take the shrunken heads from that clock. And put one on Forey's pillow. 
And the other on Elizabeth? But even so, I still don't see how you... How you kill them exactly on the hour. Foray at seven, mother at midnight. How did you manage that, Trev? My little secret. Some sort of slow-acting poison? A, a poison that you were able to time to the minute? No, but, oh, a small matter. All that matters to me now is that you and Roger marry. You're out of your head. Father, father, you're sick. Right now, you're overly tired. You're exhausted. You're a, a little mi mixed up. Crazy. When you... Say it. You said it yesterday. Say it again. Crazy. But sane or crazy, the two of you will do as I wish. Obey my final order. No way, Trev. I love Virginia. I'm married to Virginia. I'll stay married to Virginia. You can't very well stay married to a corpse, Raj. Now, what do you mean by that? Why, no more than what is stated in the marriage vows. Uh, Till death do us part. And death is going to do just that in a few short minutes. When I kill Virginia... As I kill Forey and Elizabeth. Trev, you've gone crazy. Ginny and I are getting out of here and fast. Don't move. What? I said don't move. Try. And I'll kill you where you stand. And be warned, Raj. I can do it. Jackie? Yes? Get Virginia. Bring her here. Father, I... Do as I order you. But I... Do you but... want him to die now? Before your eyes? Jackie, no. I'd better do what he wants. Or he will kill you, Raj. Get her in here, Jackie. No need. I'm here. Ginny. I heard every word he said. He will kill you, Raj. Unless you let him kill me. Let me kill you? He can't prevent me. What I mean is it's my death you want. Not his. I don't know how you do it. But go ahead. And do it. Kill me. Ginny, you're out of your mind. I love you, Raj. Too much to see you die. Answer that, Jackie. Hello? Yes, Dr. Dodd. It's for you, Father. You talk to him. I uh, can't at the moment. Oh, if Father can't come to the phone, Dr. Dodd, could you give me... Oh, I see. Yes. Yes, I'll tell him. Well? The poison that killed Forey and Mother, too, I guess. The New York police identified it. Carrari. Carrari? So, that's how you did it. Huh? What is Carrari? It's a poison used by New Guinea headhunters to kill their victims, kill them instantly. How? With darts, thorns, dipped in the stuff, and shot through blowguns. Yes, but how could Father... Oh, good Lord. Oh, Lord. The pipes. The pipes. You've sat there polishing and cleaning. Blowing through the stems to clear them, you said. But blowing a poison dart through them when you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> the stem of a pipe makes an excellent blowgun. Especially the very long stem of a church warden like this one. And the thorn inside this stem, a thorn dipped in curare, kills instantly. Virginia? Yes. Doesn't hurt, Virginia. Uh, All you feel is a little sting uh, when the thorn pricks the skin. Second later, you'll be dead. Roger? I warned you. Drop it, Trev. Drop that pipe stem or blow gun or whatever you call it. I don't see anything funny. You standing there holding that mess I wore spear over your head, ready to throw it. You look a little silly, Raj. You're not exactly the mess I wore your type. I know how to throw one of these things, and you know I do. You've seen me do it. In Africa, yes. Those mess I spears fascinated you. 
But you practiced every day. Got quite good, too. But not good enough to put that spear through me before I blow this dart into your wife. Not you. I'm not going to throw it into you. I'm going to throw it into her. Me? Kill Jackie? You leave me no choice, Trev. You love your daughter. You love her more than anything, anyone on this earth. Kill Jenny, and I'll kill her. You haven't the guts. Yeah, try me. Jackie, take that pipe stem away from him. Give it to me, Father. Take it. Oh. I know when I'm licked. What are you doing? I'm calling the police. All things considered, Trev, the quicker you're taken into custody, the better. If you want to move really fast... Call the morgue. The morgue? I gave Jackie the pipe stem, but I kept the thorn. Father, no! <laughs> Police headquarters, this is Roger Campion. I'm calling from the home of Trevor Costain. You better send someone out here. What? No, it's not another murder. Suicide. You'll admit I did play fair with you. From the very beginning of this mystery, you had all the clues, all of them, including the shrunken heads, the New Guinea headhunters, who you might have known use Curare, and a clue that gave everything away. Trevor Costain's absorbing interest in his pipes. When E.G. Marshall plays fair, he plays fair. I'll be back shortly. Hope you enjoyed our mystery. I certainly enjoyed playing a little game with you because that's what all mysteries are, you know. A game of wits. Oh, sure, I have the advantage. I know the answer before I start. But in fairness to you, whenever I bring you a mystery, I'll make sure you have all the clues from the start. After that, it's up to you. Entirely. Our cast included William Prince, Tony Roberts, Marion Seldes, and Martha Greenhouse. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Do you believe in ghosts? Oh, not necessarily the old-fashioned kind. Dragging, clanking chains behind them. The fetid odor of the grave. Voicing the ghastly groans of souls in torment. Or threatening some terrible supernatural justice that they intend to wield. I'm thinking of gentler ghosts. Who have your interest in mind. Not your destruction. No consciousness yet, Kathy. No. How's the scope, nurse? She waves are almost flat. What happened, Bruce? Potassium imbalance. She must have lost too much. Can we save her? We damn well better. Stephen Champion signed his death warrant for this child. She's got to come through. Stephen had every reason for living. He 
He's got to have a decent one for dying. Our mystery drama, Angel of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Marion Seldes and Michael Wager. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is a story of the present and of the past. And in a couple of ways of the future as well. It is also a story of life and death. Death both violent and accidental. And death that is natural and supernatural. It is a haunting story in the actual and also the figurative sense. It is a story of hope deferred and renewed. And it begins with a wildly emotional threat. I could kill you, Frank. Katie, <laughs> darling, for Pete's sake, get hold of yourself. How could you dare? Everything. Everything I have to remember him by and cherish him by. You throw it out like discarded rubbish. <laughs> do you think it didn't tear my heart out to do it, too? I don't care what it did to you. All I know is what it did to me. You, you deliberately buried every memory I have of my son. Your son? Our son. If after what you've done can make you pretend he meant as much to you. I resent that. Oh, I resent that you constitute yourself God or an amateur psychiatrist, whatever you think you are, to strip his room bare of all my memories. Dorothy. <laughs> Dorothy, we lost our boy. I was involved, too, just as much as you. But to continue to keep Jimmy's room as a sort of shrine, that was sick. To moon over the first sleeping animals we gave him, the bat and glove, I was a sentimental idiot enough to give him too soon. To keep it all intact like little boy Blue's room as if he was coming back. That's what was destroying us and destroying you. He was my only one. He's gone. But the gone. doctors the all doctors, said... The doctors, With your background, you should thank them. All right, once they saved my life, what could they do for our Jimmy? There's a world of difference between being totaled in a crash like Jimmy was and being rescued by medical science. Fifteen years ago, you'd have been just as dead if it wasn't what for... What a terrible thing to say. I'm trying to bring you to your senses. Good Lord, Dorothy, do you think I can stand by and see our marriage fall apart over a tragedy that should have and did shake us both to bedrock, but that we have to overcome? I can't, Frank. Darling, Dorothy, 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 please, listen to me. We've lost Jimmy. He's gone. All I wanted to do was to clear him out of your mind because we can have other kids. No, and... no. There aren't any substitutes. You can't try to make life a simple little exchange like that. A substitute will bring Jimmy back. Right. <laughs> So why do you think I gave everything away of his change that that unhealthy alter to a son we both once had into just another room in the house? I want you to forget him. I'll never forget him. Well, I, I, I didn't mean it quite that way. You don't understand. You're right, Frank. We don't understand each other any longer. I feel my life is over. You don't. So make the most of what you have left. Where are you going? Away. Out of it. A moment ago, I said a silly thing. I wanted to kill you. What I really should have said is I want to kill myself. Oh, I wish I had the courage. Because all I want to be is dead. <laughs> like my son. Dorothy! Dorothy! Where are you going? Dorothy! 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 Doroth
of my child away and give them to... What am I thinking? I'm, I'm mad. But, but face it, anyone who doesn't want to live anymore... Which must... aside from being an insult to me is a silly thing to think at 26 years of age. Who are you? I'm not quite sure anymore. Once I thought I knew... Now I don't. How did you get in the car? Now, that wasn't my problem. When I'm always with you, whether you see me or not. I don't understand. In a way, you... You seem like someone I might have known, but I don't actually recognize you. And still, I'm sure we must have met. Well, we did meet, but very briefly, a long time ago. Yes, and and I feel I owe you something. No, I don't. It was just a fair exchange, your life for mine. And between us, I don't think mine could have been saved. I'm puzzled. I, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> so many things that puzzle you, aren't there? Yeah, I... I must be seeing things, thinking things. I am alone in this car. There's nobody else but me. Well, that could be right. What? If you don't remember me, I guess I don't exist. You mean you're a ghost? Or something that haunts you. Well, why would you haunt me? Because you called. I called? Yes. Something to do with your conscience, I might imagine. My conscience? Well, I think it's troubling you. This is all crazy. Who are you? You still don't remember? I can't... Something... I, I must be mad talking to myself. You can't be here. There was nobody but me in the car when I got in. What are you doing here? Where are you from? From inside your mind, buried deep in the layers of memory. What am I here for? To save you from yourself. Well, what does that mean? You blame your husband for your son's death? Yes. Oh, no. I... Is it the thing that matters? The only thing that matters is when... Jimmy was lost. We lost each other. I'll never find my way back to Frank, to what we had. Jimmy stands in the way. He always will. And so you're running away into the night. To do what? Oh, I don't know how to get away from it. I, I can't stand that empty room. <laughs> and an empty heart. <laughs> you know you can't fill either of them up by running away. I know. Do you have some other idea? Did you want to kill yourself? No. Oh, no, I, I don't believe in that. Huh? Are you sure? Look at your knuckles. Dead white because your hands are clenched so tightly on the wheel. Ah, look at your right foot. Jamming the accelerator to the floor. Look in your heart. Consciously or subconsciously, didn't you have something like this in mind? What happened? 
nothing yet. I wanted to give you a glimpse of the future, and I did. You mean I'm going to crash? I mean, you could if you don't turn back. I can't. I can't. There's nothing for me the way I turn. I've lost it all. I just don't want to live. Well, I don't think that's quite fair to me. To you? What claim do you have on me? Maybe I'd better light up the past for you. Open your memory and tell you why I have... Oh, not a claim, but shall we say a vested interest in you. Sixteen, perhaps seventeen years ago, you were a little girl of ten with a whole life ahead of you. And I was quite an old man of both early in my seventies with most of my life behind me. I never married Dorothy, and I never had a child. The nearest thing was a young man who was one of my medical students and who, in the year that I'm talking about, was a pioneer in a process I helped to develop to save lives. Something taken for granted today, but in the late 50s, so new and so untried that it tied up five doctors who volunteered time for eight to ten hours at a stretch. I'll tell you about that later. That medical student I mentioned had just been made chief of surgical services of the Westfield Community Hospital here. And I was flying up to be at his wedding, to stand in loco parentis, since Bruce's father was dead. When suddenly the old man with the scythe decided to take a swipe at me. Good morning, Dr. Johnson. You're on page. I heard it. Thank you, nurse. I'm on my way to Dr. Harding's now. You're a lucky girl. Don't I know it. Three days till the wedding. I didn't mean that. I meant you're the only one in this hospital can answer that summons without taking a deep breath. <laughs> you think he's all that tough? He runs a tight ship. You, maybe he treats with kid gloves. Don't you ever believe it. When our new chief of surgery puts me on page, he wants the physician, not the fiancé. I'd better straighten up and fly, right? Come. Good morning, Dr. Johnson. Morning, Dr. Harding. <laughs> Bruce... Kathy, darling. Mm, every doctor's day should begin like this. I wish mine had begun as well. What is it? No wedding shopping this afternoon. We're both needed on the artificial kidney. I'm just calling the team together now. Who's the patient? One of our wedding guests. Outside of my mother, the most important one on my side of the aisle. Oh, not your old teacher, not... Stephen Champion top biologist in this country, maybe in the world. He just called me from the airport. He's on the way by ambulance. Thank God we're one of the first hospitals in the country to have the machine. Renal failure? Possibly terminal. Certainly without the support we can offer. Maybe it isn't that serious. Let's not kid ourselves, Kathy. I talked to Steve briefly. Damn the luck. One of the great men of our century, teacher, scientist, Nobel Prize winner, pioneer in every kind of perfusion pump, including the kidney machine he's coming here to use. And the nearest thing to a father I've ever known. Oh, don't sound so hopeless, darling. Face it, Kathy, he's not young. But, well, the way things go today, there's always hope. Stephen's given his whole life to medicine. The least we can do is try to save what's left of it for him. And so we have turned back from a story of the present for one in the not too distant past and have learned who that quiet understanding ghost that haunts and tries to comfort Dorothy Maitland is or was. But how was his fate tied in with hers? When did he die and how? And why his concern? I shall return shortly with Act Two. It is incredible to think that hemodialysis, or the artificial kidney, 
is a standard piece of supportive equipment available in any hospital today. In addition, it is small and portable. Medicine marches with such giant strides. Less than 20 years ago, hemodialysis was a new and only hope to preserve the patient's life. Transplants were still a thing of the future. Atkins, what's this note about little Dee Dee Blake being scheduled for surgery? Dr. Labar's orders, Dr. Johnson. She had a reverse. When? During the night. Why wasn't I notified immediately? Well, the chief resident knows you're going to be married next week, and since Dr. Labar is standby on the The case, resident stuck he... his neck out. I'll be glad to lop it off for him later. My patients get my service. I'll have time to check Dee Dee before I go to the kidney room. I want to examine her myself. Will you see that she's prepped while I change? Oh, and notify Central where I'll be in case Dr. Harding needs me. You can put Mr. Champion over there, orderly. Uh, brought me straight to the monster, huh, Bruce? The stuff along the way, Steve. I examined you in the treatment room, ran off some tests. Oh, did you now? I don't remember that. I must be worse off than I thought. Am I? Just routine. I have to establish the balance of chemicals for the bath. Uh, coming to the point, I think you know that I'm a hard man to con. I do. We owe each other the truth, don't we, Bruce? Yes, Steve. But you know it as well as I do. Yeah. Uh, I would have liked to see you married and drunk some of your champagne. But I have no other complaints. It's been a long road when there has to be an end sometime. Not yet. Not by a long shot. I wonder. The artificial kidney saves lives every day. I helped to build it for that. Steve, ten hours on it, and your own kidneys will be strong and healthy enough to fight the uremic infection. I'm old, son. And I'm very, very tired. Why continue the fight? There's no one to battle for, no one of my own to mourn me. That's simply not true. No wife, no child, no issue. When I cease to function, then I am gone, like a snowflake melted on a river. Not for me. You'll never be gone. Or a whole generation of people whose lifespan has been lengthened by your discoveries. Besides, you yourself have left us the means to prolong yours and the team of doctors I've assembled here to make sure it is prolonged. Is this poor old carcass really worth all that trouble? In my book it is. Not only for this machine alone, but all the others you've worked on. The breakthroughs you've made. Who in the world is more worth it? <laughs> Make me sound like an entry in who's who. Dry words in a dusty book. My epitaph. What I do or achieve in my lifetime will be a drop in the bucket next to what Stephen Champion has contributed. We need you for the next breakthrough. <laughs> You're a better con man than I gave you credit for. All right. Bring on your cannula. Let's make a fight for it. That's the attitude. I'll go scrub to make the cut down. You know what? Excuse me. Kidney room, Dr. Harding speaking. This room is supposed to be zeroed out. Bruce, it's Kathy. Kathy, where the Sam Hill are you? We're all ready to go. You're keeping us waiting. I'm sorry, darling. I may have to hold up things a little longer. What does that mean? I'm up in Dee Blake's room. Who? Oh, your favorite little patient, 513. Something's wrong. I need you up here, Bruce. Are you out of your mind? You know the one place I needed is right here. What is it? What I was afraid of started last night. Dr. Labar scheduled her for ops this morning. So? What do you want me to do about it? Even though it's technically my case, he outranks me. I want you to countermand that order. Why? Because I think she's in no condition to stand surgery. I'm convinced I know what she needs. And that's a decision you're the only one who can make. Well, 
Kathy, for Pete's sake, let's not start our life together with you taking advantage of the fact that I... Dr. Harding, this is Dr. Johnson talking to you, and this is an emergency. All right, it had better be. I'll be right up there to see for myself. Steve, small crisis. Give me five minutes. Well, I have lived for 73 years, Bruce. I guess I can hang on for five more minutes. And I don't like doctors anymore. Even Dr. Johnson? Oh, not her. We're forever friends. We're also perennial pals, solid sidekicks, and bosom buddies. It's a game. You have to be illiterate to play it. That's with an A, not an I. Of course. If you were illiterate, you couldn't play. Illiterate means the first letters of both words are the same. Or any number. Like in Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Or a big black bug bit a big brown bear. That's pretty good for a man, Doctor. And you're pretty smart for a ten-year-old. Well, Dr. Johnson taught me old Dr. Labar never could. Anyway, he has a mustache. (laughs) I'm glad Dr. Johnson doesn't. (laughs) But you know, Dr. LeBarn is a very good doctor. I don't think so. He wants to operate on me again. He told you that? Just last night. He said I had one bad old kidney that was poisoning the other one. So he'd have to cut the naughty one out. He talks down. You know. But you won't let him, will you? Talk down? No, take it out. We'll try not to, Dee Dee. Do you mind if I ask Dr. Johnson some questions? Can I listen? If you want. But I bet you won't understand. What's the blood urea nitrogen in the last five days? Wednesday, 94. Thursday? 115. Friday, 138. Saturday? Same, but today... 225. What's the phosphorus count? 7.5. Renal acidosis. (sighs) Low calcium, hmm? 6.8. 6.8. Creatinine. 5.4. You don't sound like doctors. Oh? What do we sound like? Quarterbacks. Learning plays. I help my brother with his playbook. He's one. A doctor? No, a quarterback. He's only 15. I don't care. I'm so, so tired. Nurse, get her back on Ivy. Come over here, Kathy. What do you think, Bruce? I think Lamar was right. No question one kidney is seriously infected. I can tell that even from palpation. There's obvious bilateral involvement, not only indicated manually, but from the output. So you agree to the operation? Absolutely not. She's in no condition to take it. Then you know what the answer is. Hemodialysis. That's why I called you up here. After... Stephen Champion. It could be too late. She could recover spontaneously. Dee Dee is young. It's her youth that concerns me. She's just a little girl with her whole life ahead of her. But Stephen Champion. Oh, darling, I know how much he means to you. What a terrible thing I have to say. But which is the most deserved? You cannot ask me to put Steve's life on the line. Yes, nurse, what is it? It's Dee Dee. She's gone into coma. I'll handle this, Kathy. Check Mr. Champion downstairs. I'll be with you the first moment I can. You want me to set up the kidney machine for Dee Dee instead? I don't know. How can I ask a man like Stephen Champion to risk giving up his life? Me, of all people. How can you ask a child to give up her right to it? Oh, my darling, why must I be the one to ask you to make such a decision? <laughs> Just a little oxygen, Mr. Champion. Nothing to be afraid of. Uh, I don't need it. Uh, at my age, there's nothing left to be afraid of. Uh, or everything. Uh, uh, who are you? I'm Dr. Johnson. Uh, no, you're not. You're Kathy. Sorry I held things up. It's all right. Now, you're the girl Bruce Harding is going to marry. Guilty as charged. Oh, no, no, no. 
life is for the young. And I wish you all its wonder. Bruce will be right down. It's my fault he's delayed. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not. It gives me a chance to talk to you a moment. Uh, just tell me about this little patient of yours. Why do you want to talk about Dee Dee Blake? Uh, I have my reasons. A female? Most definitely. Attractive? Adorable. Uh-huh. Big, dark, haunting eyes. A complete femme fatale. She's ten years old. Uh, what's the matter with her? Well, it should have been just a simple appendicitis, but it perforated. Peritonitis? Yes. Uh, I begin to see a pattern. Probable sulfur reaction, huh? That's right. The threat of renal failure. Too late for surgical procedure. How could you know all this? Uh, I heard enough from this end when you were talking to Bruce to make an educated guess. I suppose it's quite a problem, doesn't it? I don't follow you. Of course you do. She needs hemodialysis on an emergency basis, as I do. One kidney machine to serve two emergencies. Which do you save first, huh? Huh? Ten-year-old girl with the dark, haunting eyes who might have the reserves of strength in her own young vitals to recover? Or uh, a weak old man with possibly great contributions left to make to society but who stands a good chance of not making it, even with supportive measures. No time to convene the death committee. This one's on Bruce alone. It's one the heck of a hot potato you handed your husband to be. Isn't it, Kathy? I wonder what he'll do. The old man's blue eyes are still piercing under the shaggy brows, in spite of his weakness. Kathy is held immobilized, aware now that her fondness for her own patient has forced an unbearable choice on the man she loves. I'll return shortly with Act Three. As Kathy, her breath still caught in her throat, stares fixedly at the shrewd old man who has stated the dilemma Bruce faces, her brain fumbles to think what she would do in his position. And on a personal and selfish level, while wondering how Bruce will react, she cannot help a twinge of fear at what his decision will do to their personal relationship, whichever way it goes. Tell me about your patient, Kathy. Tell me about this Dee Dee, whatever her name is. Is she intelligent? I think so. Uh Uh-huh. And what contributions do you think she can make to society at large? (laughs) It's a little too early to tell. Huh? Is it? Does she have good pelvic construction? Will she bear healthy children? I'm sure she will someday. So, that's Stevie. Now let's have a look at Stephen Champion. Do you know what I'm working on, or was, before I was hospitalized? No, I don't. In a complex field, the collagens. But I won't explain, except to say that the breakthrough I believe I'm near could mean all the difference to thousands, to countless lives. Well, I'd like to be a part of that. I don't blame you. Well, not so much for myself, but... If it doesn't sound too stuffy for humanity. I knew that's what you meant. There's also the thought that for faithful service, a man should be entitled to ask for a reward. Isn't he? 
Yes. Particularly when the reward is the use of something he pioneered and developed. There's no question. I and can... totally on the personal level. I wanted to be at your wedding more than anything else I can think of. Because Bruce Harding is the closest thing to a child I ever... I, I think you've proved your point, up, Mr. Champion. Have I? Ah, well, there you are at last, Bruce. You ready to start? Stephen, I... Well, come on, spit it out. You know the artificial kidney can be the difference between life and death. You know that as head of the team, I must decide when and on whom to employ it. I... You want to tell me that there's a child who needs it just as much as I am. Let's stop wasting time. Get her in here and get started. I'm not asking you to make the decision. No, of course you're not. I'm telling you. If it came to that point, you'd make the decision. In fact, you'd already made it, hadn't you? Oh, Stephen, I... You know damn well you had. And I hardly concur. Anyway, you can't hook me up to that contraption unless I agree. And I don't... But I thought that you... Oh, Kathy, Kathy, my dear, I only took you over the hoops to make sure you knew the kind of guts it took for your husband to make this decision. And what a good man you're marrying. Now, let's get that little girl down here. And you two, listen to me, both of you. You pull her through... Or I'll never speak to either one of you again. Is the bath ready, Kathy? Yes, Dr. Harding. Had enough time for diffusion, nurse? All set. How's your picture on the cardioscope, Dr. Mason? See for yourself. I don't like those tea waves. We'd better get started. I'll make the cut down. Are they going to put me in that big tub? No, dear. We're just going to attach you to it so it can take all the poison out of your blood. How could you attach me? I'm just going to make a little cut in your arm. Right here. And put the magic tube in. Will it hurt? No. Dr. Johnson is putting something on you so you won't even feel it. I can't even feel my heart now. You won't let it stop. I won't let it stop, Petey. How long have they been down with the little girl, nurse? Only a couple of hours, Mr. Champion. Ah, long time to go. <laughs> Man never grows too old for new experiences. For the first time I know what a father goes through waiting for the birth of his first child. Huh? And no life for Didi. As if she was born again. And I had a part in it. Almost as if she were my little girl. That's right. Close your eyes and rest. No. Not to rest. How's the scope, Doctor? T-waves are almost flat. What happened? Potassium imbalance. She must have lost too much. But can we save her? After all that's happened, we'd better. Let me listen. Arrhythmia. How high do you want the potassium, five? The way the EKG looks, bring it to six. Let's see, what's the atomic weight of potassium? 39 plus. Chlorine, 35, so in a 100 liter bath, that makes it uh, 8 grams, right? Go to the head of the class, you've got it. Oh. Now we wait. Why did diffusion have to be so damnably slow? You sure it was potassium? Damn well, better be. We'll have lost two patients. It's 100 to 1, Stephen signed his death warrant for this child. She has got to come through. Stephen Champion has every reason for living. He's got to have a decent one for dying. 
Morning, Stephen. Morning? Ah, uh, uh, it's you, Bruce. When are you going to hook me up to that infernal machine of yours? You were on it for ten hours last night. I was? Uh, I don't remember. Well, I'm afraid it didn't do much good. The old kidneys are too far gone for that. Someday, soon, we'll make one of those breakthroughs. And you'll be able to fit me for a new set. Or one. One be enough. If a transplant were only possible. Yeah, but it isn't yet. I'm tired of talking about me. How's the little girl? She came through with flying colors. We'll save both her kidneys. Uh, there's a nice thing. And a sad thing. What do you mean? I'm a lifesaver. Well, in actuarial figures, I am a statistician's delight because I've improved percentage figures on life expectancy in a lot of fields. But of all of them, whoever they were, I never got to know one single human being whose life my research ever saved. There's one you can meet if you want. Dee Dee, you saved her life directly. My best promise of whatever immortality I'll have. Yes, with all my heart, I want to meet Dee Dee. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Champion. How do you feel, Dee Real good, thanks. How do you? Oh, terrible, terrible. If you want to feel real good like me, you should have Dr. Johnson and Dr. Harding fix you up. Ah, that's just what I aim to do. They're a team. And a good one. The only thing is, they take an awful long time, and a person gets pretty tired. Mm. Well, maybe it's time for you to go, huh? Well, I don't mean to be, but I am real sleepy. Mm, come to think of it, so am I. Bye-bye, Dee Dee. Bye, Steve. Get a good, long rest. Sleep tight, Steve. That's just what I'll do, Dee Dee. You can take her upstairs now, nurse. And close the door. Bruce. Mr. Champion. I... I know, Kathy. Steve. Sleep tight, Steve. No woman ever said that to me but that little girl. <laughs> when I never had. We've got to get you back on the kidney. Uh, wouldn't help. It doesn't matter. Let the rest of them find the breakthroughs. I'm happy. You may be going to get married, Bruce, but... I beat you to it, boy. Beat me to, to what? Handing out the cigars. I finally became a father. So that's who you are. That means... You are dead. You're a ghost. 
Oh, I can think of pleasanter terms. Let's say your guardian angel. Why don't you pull over and park in that turnaround up ahead? Why? Why, you make up your own mind about that. Just be a good girl and stop there as I tell you. All right. Yeah, that's better. Nice and quiet. Easier to think. I remember everything now. I was so sleepy, I didn't understand why I had to go and meet you. I owe you my life. You don't really owe me anything, Dee Dee. Except that in you I borrowed a little piece of immortality as long as you lived. Of course, if you don't, I lose that. Now I have to go. No way. I... How can I go back? I... I haven't the courage. I... I need help. You don't need help except from within yourself. You see, I really am a ghost, Dee Dee. I don't exist. Except in some dim, buried subconsciousness, perhaps. I never was there. But I've been talking to you. And just talking to you... You've come to a decision. Well, if you have, it's your own. Don't you see? The only one you've been talking to is yourself. 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 I've been out of my skull. I didn't know what to do. I was just about ready to call the police. I... Frank, Frank, just hold me. Don't say anything. Oh, I'll hold you. Don't ever worry. Oh. I'll hold you so you can never run away again. I never will. Let's go inside. Home. And start all over again. Of course, dearest. You must be terribly tired. You're worn out. No, no, darling, no. I have a new lease on life. I'm looking for a new little boy who's going to be called Stevie. I'll even settle for a girl. <laughs> we'll call her Stephanie. Come on, darling. Come, Frank. Where? You and I are going to build another piece of immortality for someone. You and I are going to have a new baby. So Stephen Champion will achieve his piece of immortality after all. For the only sure life after death is the memory of us. The memory that stays in the hearts and minds of our friends and our families and their children and their children's children. I'll be back shortly. Did Dee Dee really see a ghost in the car? Or was it just the evocation of a memory buried and forgotten in childhood, but still haunting the corridors of the mind? Doesn't really matter, does it? For ghosts are real. All of us carry them within us. Nor should the word ghost be feared. The most persistent of them are a heritage of our parents' love. As Steve said, a better name would be Guardian Angels. Our cast included Michael Wager, Marion Seldes, Robert Dryden, Hetty Galen, and Shelley Bruce. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I heard that somebody lifted it. Rest assured that by now, Colonel Poulos has received information from Interpol and is probably looking for you, too. Now, 
You will give me the sacred rope or I will kill you here and now. All right, now, hold it a second, and will you? naturally, when I kill you, the young lady cannot be allowed to exist as a witness. Ah, oh, he's bluffing. You will place the necklace in my hands now. If, I say if, I had the necklace... I wouldn't have it on me, right? I'd have it stashed. So if you knock me off, you'll never get your hands on it. Once again, this is not a motion picture. Such a speech means nothing. And Mr. Turner, killing you would give me much pleasure. <laughs> killing anyone is pleasurable. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and all state insurance companies. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Dark fantasy. charter such a large plane for just the two of us, Michael. Isn't this being just a bit too pretentious? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but the best from now on, Adela. Besides, this was the only plane available. You can unloosen your safety belt now. I might as well confess that the real reason I was late was because I took so much time reading the notices in the paper this morning. Oh, weren't they superb? Excellent. The audience was quite nice to me last night. Extremely appreciative, but... I didn't expect such fine reports from the press. Didn't I tell you before the concert that you'd be a hit? Today, my dear, you're recognized as the outstanding soprano of the nation. You've had a lot of faith in me, haven't you, Michael? Well, offhand, I'd say I have, yes. You spent a lot of money to make me a success. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll collect every cent of it back if we get as good houses as we had last night. Michael. Yes, darling? Do you feel... Well... Rather strange. Strange? No, dear, why? I... I feel like something is going to happen. <laughs> what makes you say that? I don't know. A feeling of impending danger just seemed to come over me all of a sudden. Danger? What possible danger could we be in? I don't know. But I've had this feeling before. It's like... Like someone had spread a shroud down over this airplane. Oh, now that's a peculiar way to talk, Adela. It's the same sort of feeling I had that day Stefan disappeared. Stefan Wilder? Yes. Adela. I was riding in my car that day. I'd been to a matinee with several of my friends. We'd had a glorious time. I was quite happy. So I drove out into the country with the top down on my car. The wind was blowing against the car, just as it's blowing against the plane now. And the sun was glistening on the bright metal of the car, just as it's glistening on the wing out there. Darling, please don't think of that now. Oh, it was a lovely day. Just like today. My heart was very light. I was happy. Thrillingly happy. Stefan and I were to be married within a week. Adela, please. And then, for no reason at all, I had that strange feeling. It just came out of nowhere. And settled down around me like a... a huge cloth might cover the body of someone who had just died. Don't talk that way, darling. It was the strangest feeling I'd ever experienced. Weird. Terrible. It gave me the feeling that... A hundred thousand evil spirits were racing at a maddening pace behind my car. Trying to catch up with me. Clutch me in their bony, fiendish hands. That was so long ago. Five years. So long ago. 
seems like yesterday. Then, when I speeded up the car, something began to pound in my ears. It's pounding there now, Michael. It's pounding there now. Adler, please. The faster I drove, the more that evil shroud hung over me. I gave the car more gas. More and more and more. And then... When they found you in the wreckage, they thought you were dead. I couldn't make the curve. The motor had reached full speed. I could think of but one single danger. The invisible danger that raced there behind me. Striving to catch me in its hold. But there was no one. Nothing. Oh, but there seemed to be. And what was so strange... All of a sudden, that bright day vanished. Just vanished. Clouds came out of nowhere and hid the sun from sight. Darling, I... I better pull down the shade on the window. Oh, Michael, wait a minute. Look. Look outside. Clouds. We're flying below them. And they've completely blotted out the sun. The sun will be out in a minute. Oh, it's just like that day. Clouds hiding the sun. Just like they did that day. Oh, just a coincidence. Dark, dreary clouds. Oh, my loud bursts of thunder, listen. Oh, my God. What does it mean? Nothing, nothing at all. Just a thunderstorm. Pilot will go up and fly above it. Why didn't he go up above the storm when he saw it? Oh, I don't know. Because he didn't see it, that's why. Certainly he did. No. No, it came up. Just like that day five years ago. Out of nowhere. Came up before the pilot was even aware of it. Oh, nonsense. It wasn't nonsense five years ago. First clouds. Then the thunder. Then it began to rain. Well, look for yourself. It's not raining now. It's nothing but an electrical storm. See, we're going above it. Oh, Michael, I'm frightened. There's nothing to be frightened about. There, look. There's the sun again. It was all so strange. That feeling. The clouds hiding behind the sun. The thunder. Sure, but no rain. Mr. Brown? Oh, Michael. Oh, just the pilot talking to us over the talkback system. Uh, push that button right there so I can answer him. Mr. Brown, Miss Rhodes. Yes, pilot, what is it? Uh, don't be alarmed about the storm. We're above it now. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, just an electrical storm, isn't it? No, sir. It's more than that. It's raining cats and dogs down there. Michael. Rain. Oh, Michael. We're up above the storm. Nothing can harm us here. You remember, don't you? I never saw Stephen Wilder again after that experience I had five years ago. Yes. As I remember. No one ever saw him again. He just disappeared. Please, darling, don't think about it anymore today. You're tired. Perhaps a little rest would do you good. Oh, yes, you're right. I am tired. Just lie back and relax, then. Honestly, sweet, there's nothing to be worried about. We just happened to run into a storm when you thought about that old experience of yours. I wonder, Michael. I wonder if we did just happen into the storm. You, darling? Over here, dear. Did you have a good sleep? Oh, I did sleep after all. Why are the lights out? Oh, I turned them out so you'd sleep as long as you could. Now I'll switch them back on. There. What time is it? Uh, 9.30. 9.30? Oh, Michael, I've been asleep more than eight hours. <laughs> I thought you'd never wake up. It's after dark, and you've had the lights off all this time just for me. Well, I guess I'd better admit I got a little sleep, too. Where are we now? Over Mexico. Hey, hungry, dear? Oh, I'm famished. You know, I can't imagine what made me sleep so long. Well, we landed at Centella. We can get food there. Have we landed at all since I retired? Oh, no, we're circling now. Well, that's Centella down there. Oh. They better pretty up a bit. 
This is a secluded part of the country, but you never know who you're going to run into. Centella. How long before we're in Monterey? Oh, about an hour. Did you get good reservations? The best. Did you enjoy your dinner? Oh, immensely. That was a nice place. Certainly a rough landing field, though. Well, it's not actually a landing field. We had to land someplace to refuel before we got to Monterey, so I picked Centella. I enjoyed it. A quaint little place. Hmm. It's a funny thing, Michael. Did you notice the plane? What do you mean, dear? didn't look a bit like it had been in a rainstorm. I thought you'd forgotten all about that. Of course, it didn't look like it. We flew above the rain before it started. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to spend the next hour looking through my fashion magazines before we land at Monterey. Over water? Water? Well, no, of course not. Well, we are. There's water all around us. Well, let's see. Why, heaven, Adela, you're right. The pilot's off his course. Well, surely you must realize it. Oh, you better go up and find out. Yes, I will. I'll be right back. Well, hurry, Michael, for heaven's sake. Right. Oh, door to the pilot's cabin's locked. I say, pilot. Pilot. What's wrong, Michael? Oh, the door to this cabin is locked. Curtain over the windows pulled down inside. Pilot, open up. Look, he's raising the curtain. <gasps> Michael. Good Lord. A thick, hairy arm. Michael. That's not our pilot at the controls. It's a monkey. A gorilla. Oh, Michael. Are we dreaming? No. No, it's true. A live gorilla piloting our plane. But that's impossible. No, it can't find the doors locked. Open this door. Open up. Oh, Michael, be careful. Look at him. Peering back at us. Those little beady eyes. And an expression on his face that... Almost human. This is fantastic. How in the world did we ever come to be in the air with a creature like that? We had our regular pilot when we landed at Centella. I saw him climb down out of the cabin. So did I. But I never did see him again before we took off. Naturally, his back was to me when I gave him the go-ahead signal. Oh, Michael. Michael, now what? Oh, we're over land. He's bringing the plane down. Oh, Michael. We're on the ground. An absolutely perfect landing. Oh, he's unlocking the door now. Michael. What's he going to do? Just take it easy. Don't get excited. Whatever you do, don't run or make a fast movement. Don't let him know you're afraid of him. You're just standing there, looking at us. Whatever you do, don't let him know you're afraid of him. You don't have to be afraid of me. Oh, Michael. That, that creature talked. Of course I talk. <laughs> oh, we're a couple of fools, Adela. Just our pilot playing a trick on us, dressed up in a monkey suit. There is no trickery. I am not your original pilot. What? I joined you at Centella, where I came to meet you for Dr. Luther. Doctor? Dr. Luther? Yes. He's waiting for you. Now come, follow me. Steady, darling. Come on. We'd better follow him. Here's the doctor now. Well, Stephen, I see you brought our visitors. Yes, doctor. Yes. Just as I directed you. Welcome, Adela Rhodes. And welcome to your lovely, lovely voice. I say, look here. And welcome to you, Mr. Brock. I'm so sorry that you will be of no assistance to me. However, you may be interested in what I have planned. Now listen, Dr. Luther. I want to know what this is all about. You will learn what it's all about. And without delay, I assure you. 
Come, Stefan. Don't be so inhospitable. Show our guest into the laboratory. Sit down over there, my dear. Over here, Mr. Brock. Michael. Dr. Luther, I demand an explanation. Where are we? Why have you brought us here? You're too full of questions, Mr. Brock. I've already told you I'm about to show you why I brought you here. Here, high in these mountains, secretly, I've been working for five years, experimenting, testing, trying to accomplish what everyone would have said was utterly impossible had I told them about it. But I didn't tell anyone. Instead, I came here and built this laboratory. You see, it's fully equipped and modern in every detail. Oh, look here, Dr. Luther. During those five years, I trained Stefan here. I believe you will agree my training has been very successful. You now see an almost full-grown gorilla behaving like a human, acting like a human, even talking like a human. I've been very kind to you, haven't I, Stefan? Yes, Dr. Luther. Of course you've been kind. Yes, just so. Scientists back there in your world, my dear Miss Rhodes, will tell you it's impossible to completely train a gorilla. That is the second point in which I've proved them wrong. Step in. Sing for us. Yes, Doctor. Mm-hmm. Si può. Si può. Signore. Signore. Doesn't he have an excellent voice? Michael. Did you hear that? Impossible. Sing again, Stephen. Oh, oh, oh. You see, soon he will be world famous. I shall travel with him, take him to the four corners of the earth, and show people how well my gorilla sings. Oh, Michael. I can't believe it. That's Stephen Wilder's voice. It can't be. Ah, but it is. Yes. Now I remember. Now I know who you are, Dr. Luther. Stephen Wilder had an appointment with you that day he disappeared five years ago. I'd forgotten all about it, but I just now remembered. So that's what happened to Stephen Wilder. You kidnapped him and brought him here and... You. Precisely. (laughs) I brought him here to do what others said could never be done. When I chloroformed him five years ago and brought him here, I thought I was ready. But my gorilla wasn't. So I had to wait. Three months ago... I performed the operation. Operation? I removed the vocal cords from the man and grafted them into the gorilla. This is ridiculous. A thing like that can't be done. Oh, surely you don't deny the proof I've just given you, Mr. Brock. Stephen, sing. You recognize that voice, Miss Rhodes, the moment you heard it. Because you'd sung operas with Mr. Wilder so much. That was the way he sang. To exercise his voice. (laughs) Don't you both realize what I have here? The secret of an untold wealth. Why, besides knowing how to train this ferocious and morose type of animal. Besides knowing how to transfer human vocal cords successfully. I have something I can exhibit to the world. To prove my knowledge. Think. Think of the fortune I can amass. Because people will pay immense sums to see and hear my singing gorilla. (laughs) Stop it. Stop it, I say. Why have you brought me here? Surely you could have spared me this. I will tell you why, Miss Rhodes. If you and Mr. Brock will step over here. The only place we're going to step is out of this place. You will do as I ask. Step in. These people are not to leave. Very well, Dr. Luther. Over here, if you please. Better do what he says, Adela. There. Go to this straight glass. 
Look into the next room. Another gorilla? Yes. Isn't it a fine specimen? Fine specimen? Yes, she. She? Hara. No. You're not planning. I've trained her very carefully. She was so much more responsive than the male. Now that she's able to obey me, I'm quite ready for the rest of my plans for her. Oh, no. No, you can't. I, I won't let you. I'll say you can. Neither of you will be able to prevent it. And soon, soon I'll tour the world with the most amazing exhibition on earth. A male and a female gorilla singing all the world famous operas. Look here, you... Wait a minute. I just happened to think of something, Doctor. Yes? Do you remember the day Stefan Wilder had that appointment with you five years ago? Yes. Certainly I remember. I'd been planning to obtain possession of him so I could bring him here. I was most pleased when he called and asked for an appointment. But did he tell you why he was calling upon you? I know. No, he didn't. He came to you, Dr. Luther, because he was losing his voice. You. you must be wrong. I am not wrong. I am the only one he told about it. It had been worrying him for a long time. You see, the more he sang, the worse his voice became. He was gradually losing it. But that's impossible. Do you think so, Doctor? You're a specialist on that subject. That's why he was coming to you that no. day. No. You must be wrong. After all the work I've done. Your gorilla will lose his voice, Dr. Luther. And I assure you, before you'll do anything to me, I'll see to it that my voice is ruined too. He won't. He can't. He's an excellent voice. Excellent. Yes, yes, of course he is. We've worked together. I've trained him. His voice can't go bad on me now. Not now. Just when it's finally successful. Oh, you'll see, Dr. Luther. No, you're wrong. You're mistaken. He'll sing all right. He won't lose his voice. Will you step in? No, of course not. You're in an excellent voice, step in. Sing. Sing your head, step in. Show him. Signore. quality, beautiful tones. Listen, Doctor. Kevin, what's wrong? Try again. Now you think I'm wrong. So, it's true. Kevin, you, you devil. After all I've done, after all my work, this is what I get as a reward. I've sacrificed everything. My position, my career, all my money. And this is what happens. Well, there's one way, Stephen. Thy heaven has one way. Get back, Adela. He's got a gun. No, no, Dr. Luther. Oh. That bullet hit that beast. But look at him. Stop. No, 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 stop it! Stop it, no, no! Stop it, let go of me! Stop it! Stop You have heard Spawn of the Subhuman, tonight's original tale of Dark Fantasy by Scott Bishop. Ben Morris was heard as Michael Brock, Eleanor Naylor Corrin was Adler Rhodes, 
Garland Moss played Dr. Luther and Muir Height was the gorilla. Next Friday night at this same time, listen to the 16th in this series of dark fantasy dramas created by Scott Bishop. The Man with the Scarlet Satchel. The story of an aged millionaire who receives a child's set of modeling clay as a practical joke, but who turns the gift into an incredible and weird instrument of destruction. Don't miss this unusual story next Friday night, The Man with the Scarlet Satchel. Tom Paxton speaking. Dark Fantasy comes to you from WKY, Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The first chance a man gets sleep in this country, and the dad blame telephone has to wake me up. I should let it ring till doomsday. Yes. Yes, this is Sand Canyon Airport. Oh, this is Don Thurman speaking. Now, yeah, there's a plane here. Where? Mantella. much for that trip across the desert, but if you need the plane, they're willing to pay me for flying it to you. It will make it 600 and it's a deal. All right, I'll make the arrangements. Now you can expect me in about, two oh, about seven hours if everything goes all right. Yeah, fine. And I have that 600 waiting for me. I'll need it at Mantella. East, 13 degrees. And Mantella lies in that direction. I'm going to buck a headwind most of the way, I'm afraid. And those mountains worry me. They're dangerous. Let's see now. Over this way, it's... Santilla. No. Not that way for me. If I ever ended up in Santilla... Wouldn't want to bet anything on my chances of getting to that place and coming out to tell about it. I can't stay up here much longer. That sandstorm over the desert's getting worse every minute. I can't see a thing down there. Thick as pea soup. Oh, confound it, there goes the motor. Choked up with sand. Well, here it goes. I can't see where I'm heading, but maybe I can bring her in on her belly. in my ears for hours. Oh, my eyes blinded by that awful sandstorm. I can't see. I don't know whether it's day or night. All I know is that someone found me out there on that desert and brought me here. Is that someone? Someone there. I have come to take you to the king. You will be placed in the den of the leopards. Leopards? It is our custom here to feed uninvited guests as a sacrifice 
to the lepers of the pit. What is this? It nears the time of the full moon. When the moon is full, its rays affect our leopards, maddens them, makes them vicious beyond control. Only the flesh of man will quiet them. And only the king can perform the ceremony of sacrifice. King? What king? King of Santia. Am I at Santia? You are. Yes, you have come where a white man is forbidden. But my plane was forced down on the desert. I was purposely avoiding Santia. I was trying to reach Mantella. You were 500 miles from Mantella. But I can't be. I was only in that storm for a few hours. The storm has been raging for three days. Three days? Why, I've... I've been only two hours on the desert. The storm came up only a few hours ago. The entire desert has been covered with the storm for three days. But I don't understand. You were discovered only because the Anna has once again displayed her temper towards her father. The Anna? Daughter of King Tinasi. It has been arranged that the Anna is to wed within the changing of the moon. And the Anna has rebelled. She attempted to flee Santia through the desert storm. She was followed. She was discovered there with you. Then she found me. Yes. The two of you were returned here to tear to the village. Now you will come with me. My eyes. I can't see a thing. It is the justice of Santia. What do you mean? Come. You will have to guide me. Then take my arm. Now. All right. Let's go. This way. How far? Wait. Panama Hasse! What's the matter? Panama Hasse! Panama Hasse! What in thunder are you talking Look, about? They're in the sand. Panama Hasse. Big foot. I told you I can't see. Big foot. Panama Hasse. Big leopard foot. Followed by man. Leopard foot? Yes, they're in the sand. Leopard tracks. Followed by man tracks. Come. Hurry. Wait a minute. We must hurry. Evil spirits set loose against my full moon. Panama Hussey, big leopard, come! We hurry! I have brought you the prisoner, wise one. Prisoner? Look here, what is this? You have come, Mr. Thurman, but you are not welcome. I tried to tell you, flunky here, that I didn't come to Santia purposely. I was headed for Mantella. You are not a very wise man, Mr. Thurman, to make such an unwise statement. Mantella is half a thousand miles from here. No, I got off my course. I ran into a sandstorm. My plane was forced down. It's a likely case. But it's true. I was blinded by the sand. I'm still blind. If you have a doctor, I... You say you are blind? I am. I need medical attention right away. Blind. It is the justice of Santia. What are you talking about? It is the law that should a white man look upon the countenance of Princess Yana, his eyes shall be blinded. I don't know what you're talking about, Tanasi. I've never seen your princess. We found you with her on the desert. Well, I was unconscious when you found me. But she was with you. Then she found the same spot where I took refuge. We are not fools here, Mr. Darman. Fools? I don't understand. It is so ridiculously evident. What's so evident? I have made complete arrangements for my daughter to wed. She has refused to marry as I wish her to. And last night, she fled from Santia. And when we found her, she was with you. But what you think isn't true. You had the rendezvous there with her. No. How many times you have met, I do not know. But each meeting has been in complete defiance of the laws of Santia. That no white man may look upon the countenance of the prince. I deny it. I don't know your princess. The evidence speaks for itself. You are blind. From the sandstorm. No. Because the gods are vengeful. I tell you, the cyan blinded me. It's only temporary. It was written ages ago that whatever white man looks upon the countenance of Santia Princess will be doomed forever. To eternal blindness. It's not eternal. It's sand blindness. It happens to lots of men who get caught in sandstorms. All I need is a no doctor. No doctor can cure the blindness sent down by the gods. Give me a chance. I may be blind permanently if you don't let a doctor look at my eyes. King Tinasi, 
Your daughter approaches. Come in, my daughter. My father. My father, have you heard? Heard what, my child? Tanya Mahasi. Tanya Mahasi? Yes. He was in the camp again last night. Leopard footprints are near your house, followed by man feet. Tanya Mahasi. It's the evil spirit again in the full of the moon. I saw them too. Many tracks. Big. We must tell the wise ones they will work a charm to protect us. First, we must dispose of the prisoner. Look here. Silence. My daughter, come here. Yes, father? He's a white man. Look you at his face and tell me, where have you seen him before? Well, my child? I... I do not know him. I have never seen him before. But my king, I saw them together. Silence, Ivan. You are most wise, my daughter. You are most wise to deny your foreign lover. But I'm not her lover. I've never seen her. I can't even see her now. The American is blind, Diana. Blind? Because he has broken the law. Because he is looked upon the face of a princess of Santilla. The gods have blinded him. It's not true. I've never seen her face. Ask her. She'll tell you it's not true. Take him back to the prison hut. And let him wait there until the body of wise ones sit in judgment of his crime. Silence, Naomi. Silence, my two pretty ones. Tonight is a night of the moon. The night is a night we hunt. Pounding. My eyes burning in my head. If I could only find a little cool water. Yeah. I wonder where I am. The king told Ivan to take me to the prison hut, but instead he brought me here. Here? Where? Somewhere out in the open. Bushes, shrubbery all around it. Wait a minute. What's that? A light. Up there through the trees. A light. Why, it's a star. I can see. I can see again. One lonely single little star in a sky of heavy clouds. And there. Coming over the ridge. The full moon. What's that? Someone. Something there in those bushes. Is someone there? Be quiet, Americano. Who is it? Iana. Princess Iana? Do not speak so loudly. Why are you here? I came to see you. I went first to the prison, but it was empty. Then I knew there had been trickery. Ivan did not do what my father ordered. No. He brought me here instead. Where are we? On the edge of Decano. Decano? The precipice? Yes. It's hundreds of feet over the side of the canal. Listen. This rock. I will show you. Ivan knew you were blind. He left you here alone, knowing you would eventually wander over the edge and be crushed on the jagged rocks down there. He could not wait for the sacrifice. Sacrifice? Yes. With each fullness of the moon, the leopards in the pit of Santilla become madly enraged. The wise men say the moon rays affect them. They must be appeased by the flesh of a human. And the moon will soon be full again. Yes, Donaldo. A pleasant thought. Oh, but Ivan could not wait. He fears all Americanos. So he brought you here to be a victim of Decano. Oh, a nice fellow. Ah, 
I despise him. And my father says I must marry him. You mean... You don't mean you're supposed to marry him. Do you blame me for running away? I certainly don't. Even death on the desert would have been better than, than him. Princess, why have you come here? Because I would not have you die as Ivan wishes. How did you find me? I have ways. Tell me, Ivan said the storm on the desert had been blowing for three days. Is that true? Yes, it is true. But I was only an hour and a half journey from San Filidor. I ran into the storm suddenly. I cannot say about that. Donato, your eyes. You look upon me as though... as though you see me. I do see you. My sight has come back. Oh, no. You're not glad I can see again? No. I mean... Oh, yes, I... But Donato, to look upon my face... Oh, nonsense. That's all a lot of tripe. Oh, what's that? Tell him a hussy. What? Tell him a hussy, evil leopard spirit. Oh, look here. What is this evil spirit business? Tell him a hussy. Leopard. Wherever he goes, tracks always followed by those of man. They kill at the full of moon. A leopard man? Oh, do not say so. Why? Because he is a leopard man. Have you ever seen him? Oh, listen. Come on. Let's ride over here someplace. Oh, Donaldo, have care. It is an evil spirit, a spirit that kills. Do you have any kind of a weapon? Only a small dagger. Oh, give it to me. Oh, no weapon will harm Panama Hossi. Oh, we'll see. Oh, wait. The clouds are... Oh, there he is. Over there. It's Ivan. Oh. Oh, look at him. Uh, he's been... He will die. We must take him back to the village. He's unconscious. Jungle. No. <gasps> Do not touch him. Who's that? Father. Iana. Go at once to your hut and remain there. I fear the gods even now hide their faces from you. Oh, but, Father, Ivan is badly hurt. Go, at once. Now, Mr. Darman. This man needs attention. Put him down. What? I said put him down. But he's badly wounded. By the claws of an animal. Yes. We heard the animal screaming. The princess tells me it's a leopard man. It is true. Tanimahase. The evil spirit... A spirit which takes possession of a man and changes him into a leopard. Yes, but what man? Who? We have not known up to now. Up to now? Look at your hands. Hmm? Blood. Deep beneath your nails. But I... It is an evil disease, Mr. Thurman. To bring it here among us is still more evil. But I... I say, look here. Do you think I did this? I repeat. Look at your hands. Oh, no, you're wrong. It's Ivan's blood. So it is. But I got it on my hands when I tried to help him. Put him down. Mr. Thurman, I do not try to escape. Ivan will be returned to the camp. Our medicine men will heal him. You will go with me now. Where? Your spirit must be destroyed. You have had the wisdom of our elders, Mr. Thurman. You are guilty of a most foul sin against us. You must pay the penalty. And you, unfortunate daughter, are equally guilty with him. I cannot plead for you. The law is so written. You have seen too, Iara. Tomorrow night, the two of you shall perish. stairway leads to the leopard pit. The two of you go first. Come, Donaldo. Be brave. I'm thinking of you, Iana. It is 
is a hundred feet into the earth. We are halfway down now. Look up above us. Good Lord. This pit is immense, huge and round. Yes. And look up there. All the tribespeople of Santia perched around its ridge, peering down. Yeah, to watch the sacrifice. Yeah. But how can they see down here? It's pitch dark. We can hardly make our way in the blackness. Soon, the full moon will be directly above the pit. It is only when the moon is full that its rays reach here into the depth. And its beams madden the leopards. Iana, I see the beast now. Two of them. There's a man down there with them, petting them. Look, your father. No. He's a white man. I too am white. But I am not his daughter. He has been king of Santia for many years. He stole me when I was an infant at Mantela because he wanted a white princess. Iana, the moon. It's coming over the edge of the pit. The people up there can see us now. You see, the moon rays affect the beasts quickly. Move on. Down to the pit's bottom. Come, Donaldo. Iana, there must be some escape for you. I am not afraid, Donaldo. No, oh, isn't there any way to escape? <laughs> Only one. An impossible one. What does he mean? It has always been the belief that if the prisoners are not truly guilty, the leopards will not harm them. There. The full moon is directly over the pit. I remain here. You too, through this iron gate. Come, Donaldo. There is only one more gate now. The one that separates us from the animals. Come. Look how that man controls those animals. It is the power of the full moon. Then there is another way out. If we can keep away from the animals until the moon has crossed the pit. Oh, no, that would be ours. The leopard will be released upon us any moment. This is as far as we go. If I could only save you. There is no way. Courage, Donaldo. No, I'm not afraid for myself. Now, you die. Now I offer you to the gods. Open the gate. No. Wait, Ian. Look, the moon. Donaldo. It is gone. It's dark. Did the moon across the pit? Oh, no, no, it did not turn. It's behind the cloud. Oh, Donaldo. The leopards. My father. They will kill him. No. No, she No. 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 Get back. Get away from me. No. 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 The Thing from the Darkness. Tonight's original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop, originating in the studios of WKY. Ben Morris was heard tonight as Donald Thurman. Eleanor Naylor Corrin was Princess Iana. Fred Wayne played King Tanasi. And Muir Height was Yvonne. Next Friday night at the same time, listen to the 21st tale in this series of weird and unusual dark fantasy adventures. Created for you by Scott Bishop. Next week's story is called The Edge of the Shadow, which tells of a dairy farmer in Vermont, of a strange dream that is all too real, and of what this dream finally means in the scheme of his destiny. 
Tom Paxton speaking. Dark fantasy comes to you from Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, the Granite Furniture Company, with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo, presents... The Hull of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of Death in the Bayous. The Granite Furniture Company brings you the Hall of Fantasy. Listen now to original tales of the imagination and some of the classics of the supernatural as we take you down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to the mysterious realms of the unknown. These are stories of eerie and fantastic thrills brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Stores. You know, spring is practically here and the centennial summer is not far away. So now's the time to cheer up your home with something new from the Granite Furniture Company. You'll be amazed at how easily you can improve the beauty and comfort of your home with small items here and there, such as a new floor lamp, a new lounge chair, a table or so, or some other seemingly unimportant item. The Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo are daily receiving new stocks for spring home redecoration. And now you may choose from these delightful new things at prices well within your budget. Go in tomorrow and see for yourself. And be sure to listen a little later in tonight's program for an important announcement from the Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. And now for tonight's story. An original radio drama by Robert Olson entitled Death in the Bayous. Death strikes quickly along the bayou. Who's to say the deed was murder? According to this map, we should be nearing that plantation. Oh, I'll be glad to get there and a chance to freshen up a bit. It's a long drive from New York. Ah, very true, Mrs. Crane. A long ride and a dull one. That is, as far as the scenery is concerned. I think it's been lovely. No, oh, if you say so, said the henpecked groom. <laughs> but the Adirondacks have this beat a million ways. Look at this swampland. Well, whatever made you want to spend a honeymoon down here anyway? Oh, Tom would have been hurt if we'd refused his invitation. He'd have been hurt? Well, whose honeymoon is this anyway? Oh, now, Reggie, it's really charming. And you'll like Tommy. You've been down here quite a lot? I spent two summers with the Bonds, and they're really wonderful friends. And Tom the is... Thomas Bonds, the fifth? <laughs> yes, he's a dear. He wanted me to marry him once. Oh, fine. We spend our honeymoon with one of your old suitors. <laughs> we'll probably sit around the family hearth and glower at each other. Oh, no, that's over now. He's nothing more than a friend. A very dear, very rich, and I'm afraid a very lonely one. Now, he must be a fool to be able to forget you, Mad. I know I never could. Don't you dare ever try. Ah, uh, no danger, beautiful. Ah, but methinks I see a sign of life in this uh, forsaken waste. Where? Oh, you see those lights ahead? Reggie, this is it. This is Tyne Oaks. Ah, the welcoming committee. Say, that mastiff looks as if he'd like a pound or two of leg. Now, take it easy, hound. We've been invited. Hello there. Would you let us in, please? Who's there? Oh, it's Amos. Amos, this is Miss Madeline. Why, Miss Madeline, hello, child. Of course, Master Tom's expecting you all. He's pacing the floor right now, he is. Amos, this is my husband, Master Reginald Crane. Yes, Master Reginald. Welcome to Tyne Oaks. You'll just drive up to the house. Master Tom is powerful anxious to see you all. Well, Mad, this is wonderful, really wonderful. I thought you'd never get here. And this is, I presume, the lucky gentleman? Yes, Tommy. This is Reggie. Of course, Reggie. Well, take your things off and join me in the drawing room for a little drink. Lena, take Mrs. Crane's thing. Yes, Master Tom. Thank you, Lena. I'd very much like to clean up. Ah, let me see now. That's one and another. Ah, there's your drinks. Amos, take our guest things to their rooms. The rooms? Why, this is a honeymoon, old man. I, I believe it's legal oh, to... Of course, but... it seems strange to think of Nad as being married. Forgive me, please. Oh, sure thing. <laughs> I'm a little dazed about it myself. Fabulous luck, you know. Did you ever see anybody so lovely in your life? No, Reggie, please. No. Never have I seen a more lovely creature. Never. Too lovely for you, old fella. Much too lovely for anybody. Well, excuse me. I'm getting a little self-conscious in here. 
Tom, how are things at dear old Tyne Oak? Well, it's not what it used to be, Matt. Echoes of the old days. Since the Colonel and my dear mother died, well, it's a lonely old place. Now it's yours, Matt. Oh, thank you, Tom. It was nice of you to ask us down here. Well, I'll be going now. Where are you going? I moved to the guest house this morning. You mean this entire house is... is a bridal suite. Pardon me, Master Reggie, but do all these things come in? I'll be right with you, Amos. Uh, excuse me for a minute, will you, Mad? Uh, don't forget my black overnight case. Okay, I won't. So you did it anyway. Did what, Tom? Married that... Tom. Ma- I told you I'd never let anyone else have you. Tom, what are you saying? Your pardon, Mad. I forgot myself. I thought you'd forgotten that and it's all over. Forgotten? No, not forgotten. Good night. Forgotten. Open oh, forgotten, is it? Oh, man, you should never have let me love you so much. Well, my pretty, here's your precious black case. Thank you, Reginald. Oh, why so formal? Well, during our courtship, you called me Reggie. Now we're married, it's Reginald. I'm going home to father. Oh, please, Reggie, don't joke. Maybe we should have gone to the Adirondacks. Oh, nonsense. All I had to offer you there was a rustic little three-room cabin... But th- this plantation, all to ourselves, <laughs> it's like something out of Gone with the Wind. That cabin sounds heavenly to me, Reggie. Now, wait a minute, beautiful. A honeymoon is no time to start second-guessing. This is it. This is what we dreamed about. Yes, sir, by golly, I'm going to make our honeymoon at Tyne Oaks the best either of us ever had. You expect more, then? Oh, I certainly do. Well, mighty square of you to tell me about it. Uh, we shall have as many honeymoons as there are days in the year. Oh, Reggie, you're a nitwit, but a charming one. What is it? Now, I'll see you a minute, Miss Madeline. Yes, Lena, come in. Excuse me, I didn't know the master was here. Oh, don't be shy, Lena. This is Master Reggie, my husband. How are you, Lena? Nobody the same at Tyne Oaks. You shouldn't have come down here, Miss Madeline. Lena, what do you say that for? Tyne Oaks has always been my second home. That when Tyne Oaks was the home for everybody. It changed since the Colonel and Master's bond died. Master Tom changed. He get crazy drunk and beat us. Beat you? Why? There ain't no why, Miss Madeline. He just mean. I get so scared of him. And tonight, well, Miss Madeline, he's acting awful. Lena, I won't have you saying such things. Now, you run along or, or I'll tell Master Tom. Oh, no, please don't tell Master Tom. Please, he'd... He'd, he'd, he'd what? Please don't tell him. Then don't let me hear you talking like that again. I'm ashamed of you. Yes, and Lena medicine fool. Lena should be dead. Well, Tommy. You know, Tommy sounds to me like a problem child. He, he was. Oh, but he settled down now to, to, to this quiet life of the plantation owner. Uh, who knows this is all really hated with the lines of the souls of men? Why, Reggie, what do you mean? Only that he still loves you and hates me. Now, I could see that right away. He wanted to put us in separate rooms. Can you imagine it? Yes, Reggie, I think you're right. Well, that's what I was going to tell you. While you were out there, he said something very strange. It frightened me. Well, what did he say? He talked as if he'd forbidden me to marry you. Oh, he did, huh? Had he ever said anything to you about our marriage? Nothing, whatever. That's what startled me. Well, it strikes me, my pretty, that we're... Yeah, yeah, but... What, 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 Red Edgy? No, 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 nothing. Nothing at all. Say, come on out here in the balcony, Mad. Oh, there's that moon again. And the jasmine... Oh, Reggie, isn't it lovely? Oh, I don't know. You don't? No. <laughs> Anything lovely outside of you is just too dull to attract my attention right now. Then you retract your threat to go home to Father. Oh, home was never like this. What do you say we stop reading weird meanings into Tom's words and give him credit for this beautiful honeymoon mansion? This is really something, Mad. It's got that cabin beat a mile. I'll bet that little cabin is wonderful. Well, I built it. What was that? That sounds like the dog that greeted us at the front gate. Now, what's he doing out in the swamps this time of night? Well, if Prince is in the swamp, Tom's there, too. Well, then I'll revise the question. What's Tom doing out in the swamp this time of night? <laughs> hey, what's that? There's something wrong out there, Mad. I'm going to see what it is. No, Reggie, don't go out no, there. No, I've got to see. Reggie, come back! No! Oh, Reggie, you fool. You don't even have a gun. Go on back. Go back to your bride, you nitwit. Go back. Uh oh. The sentry. Nice doggy. Nice. Come here. Down, Prince. Tom. What was that scream? I, th- I thought maybe I might help. It's Lena. She's dead. Dead? But 
We were... Why, only a few minutes ago we were... It strikes quickly in the bayous, Reggie. Now, will you help me get her out of here? Oh, sure, but I want you to tell me what happened to her. Later, Reggie. Stay on the way. Now, come on out here. Just like that? Well, it looks pretty muddy to me. Is there some way around? No, Reggie, there's no way around. Are you afraid of getting your feet wet? No. Well, okay. Here he goes. Hey! Hey, I went down to my waist. I seem to be stuck. You'll have to give me a hand, Tom. A hand? I don't dare give you a hand, Reggie. You're in a pit of quicksand. Quicksand? So why didn't you warn me? I forgot, Reggie. Tom, I can't get loose. Help me. I felt sorry for you when Madeline got word that you were a German prisoner. And then when word came through that you'd been killed trying to escape, Madeline was brokenhearted. Tom, get me out of this. It was I who dried her tears, Reggie. Madeline finally promised to marry me. They set the date, even sent out the invitations. And then you came back from your grave. That, Reggie, was very inconsiderate of you. I'm sinking, Tom. Do something. Do something? When you were dead, I headed the list with Madeline. When you're really dead, I headed again. Tom! Tom, get me out of here. Madeline's bound to know she'll hate you for the rest of your life. Hate me? Perhaps, but she'll be mine, Reggie. She'll be mine. No. Reggie, you're in pretty deep. You're in pretty deep, Reggie. Almost to your chin. Tom! Tom, you won't get away with... Oh, man, with I... Here, Madeline. Reggie? No, Madeline, it's Tom. Oh, Tom, where's Reggie? Reggie? I thought he was with you. That's where I'd be if you were my brother. He came out here to... Oh, help me find him, Tom. I'm afraid to have him out in the swamps alone. Sure, Mad. I'll help you hunt for him. But don't come out here. Why not? I'll come to you. There. You almost stepped in a quicksand pit. Quicksand? Yes. Yeah. Very treacherous, you know. You are listening to Death in the Bayou in tonight's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy, presented by the Granite Furniture Company, with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. Well, here's the special announcement we mentioned a few minutes ago from the Granite Furniture stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. Just received another new shipment of 9 by 12 rugs. Yes, you heard correctly. Another new shipment of 9 by 12 rugs at the Granite Furniture Company. You may choose from a wide variety of colors and patterns. And in addition to these new 9 by 12 rugs, you may now choose from an excellent selection of Wilton and Axminster wall-to-wall carpeting. Choose from more than 20 rolls. And you know that rugs and carpeting have been very difficult to get. And because of better buying connections, the Granite Furniture stores have scooped the market. So buy early tomorrow. Rugs and carpeting just received at the Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. Now back to tonight's story, an original radio drama by Robert Olson entitled Death in the Bayou. Who is it? It's Tom Madeline. May I come in? Oh, yes, Tom. Please do. Madeline. Is there anything I can do? Oh, Tom, help me find Reggie. Where could he have gone? The bayous have many hiding places. If he's lost, we do our best to find him. What happened out there tonight? Happened? What do you mean? There was a scream. That's why Reggie went out. He thought someone was in trouble. Now both Reggie and Lena are missing. What happened? These are treacherous swamps, Madeline. Maybe Lena was caught in the quicksand pit. It wouldn't be the first time it happened, even at Tarn Oaks. It's no place for anyone who isn't acquainted with every foot of it. And you think Reggie I don't know, Madeline. Quicksand leaves no traces. Where were you when Lena cried out? I must have been in my shower. The first thing I heard was Prince's barking. What did you see when you reached the quick pit? Just Prince raising up an awful clamor about something. Is there anything we could do? Well, make sure about... About the pit? Hmm. We've never been able to find out how deep that pit really is. I'm afraid it would be a heartbreaking task and fruitless, Madeline. Well, then what can we do? You have some hounds, don't you? Bloodhounds? No, they went out with slavery. I have some hunting hounds, but, well, we could try it, I guess. Well, then let's do it, Tom. First thing in the morning. Get a good night's sleep. Bright and early we'll start. No, I want to start right now. Oh, I couldn't sleep knowing I was doing nothing. You really loved him, didn't you? Love? Oh, I do love him, Tom. I don't want to live without him. You know... All I have asked of life is to be loved that much. Get your rest, Mad. I'll take the dogs and see what I can dig up. Tom! I'm sorry, Mad. I didn't think. We both need a drink. Here, I'll pour one. Drink this, Mad. 
You'll feel better and sleep better. Well, thank you, Tommy. You're sweet. It's beginning to get light in the east. I'll soon be able to see where I'm going. Let me go with you. No, Mad. There's nothing you could do, and I don't want something to happen to you, too. You stay here. Oh, I guess you're right. I'm getting a bit drowsy already. I know. I'll put a little sleeping pot in your drink. It'll calm your nerves. Right you are. Oh, my arms feel like window weight. I'm so sleepy. So very sleepy. That's right, Mad. Sleep. Sleep, Mad. Sleep. The Adirondacks, Reggie. Oh, it would have been a lovely honeymoon. Madeline. Madeline, what have I done to you? If you've only loved me. I couldn't expect you to know what a difference it always made to this old place to have you here. And how desolate it became the moment you left. Even now, as you sleep, Tyne Oaks has an enchantment. The charm it never had at any other time. Is it my fault if I love you too much? What are the rules, Madeline? Is it all right for me to go mad with longing in these tinkin' swamps while you and some other man live life like a musical comedy? I couldn't do it, Mad. Not because you love me too little, but because I love you far too much. Oh, forgive me, Matt. The loneliness is too bitter. As long as Reggie lived, I could never hope to be anything better than half dead. Poor old Lena. That was never meant to be. But she tried to warn you and drive you away forever. That I could never allow to happen. Yes, Madeline, I killed for you. But I'll do it again and again until I know you're mine. The fog is forming over the bayous. Another day will soon be here. What will it bring for you and me, Madeline? How can I steal the heartbreak that weeps inside you, the longing for the lost one? Reggie's gone, it's true. Reggie will never come back. I destroyed him. But how can I destroy the memory of him? How unless I destroy the mind in which that memory is embedded? Open your eyes, Matt. Oh, where am I? In your room. You thought you were asleep. You weren't. I, I put nothing in your drink. I only suggested that. But I have been asleep. Asleep I suggested to you only that. You act on my suggestion now, don't you? Yes. You believe in me, don't you? Yes. Then listen carefully to what I have to say. This is what is known as post-hypnotic suggestion. You will obey me. You know that, don't you? Yes, I know that. Then listen and don't forget. But that light, it, it hurts my eyes. You see a light. I am that light, Madeline. I am the light. If that light ever bothers you, all you have to do is come closer to it. Does it bother you now? Yes. Then come closer. That's it. Closer yet. Now, does it bother you? Yes, it hurts my eyes. It, it's too bright. Then come closer. Now what do you see? You. I see you. You're very close. Then the light is what? The light is you. And if the light bothers you, what do you do? Come to the light. Come to you. That's it. You come closer to me. Now remember this. That light is all the pain you know. There is no other, no other. Now what is that light? Pain. It's all the pain. And what do you do if you feel pain? I come closer to you. Right. You won't forget that. No, I won't forget. All right, Madeline. Now listen carefully. Reggie is pain. Every time you think of Reggie, you'll come to me. Do you hear that? Come to me. I am Reggie. I am pain. I am the light. You remember that? Yes. Good. Now, Madeline, wake up. Oh, hello, Tom. How long have I been asleep? Not long. How do you feel? Oh, I feel a little... Strange, Tom. Well, how do you mean, strange? I feel as if I'd forgotten something, but I don't know what it could be. Hmm. Well, I'll be downstairs, Matt. Join me as soon as possible. Tom, wait. Well, what is it? I couldn't see you for a moment. What do you mean? Just then, when I looked at you, I... Yes? I saw nothing but a blinding glare of light. I must be going mad. I, I can't seem to think. I have the feeling that now, more than any time in my life, I must think... I must think. What is it I've forgotten? Oh, think, Madeline, think. I've never felt like this before in my life, but then how have I felt in my life? I can't remember that. What happened to me? I want to do something. There's something I must know. What is it? What is it? Who is it? It's Amos, Miss Madeline. Amos. Could I talk to you a minute? Amos? Who is Amos? Maybe he can help me. Come in. 
Miss Madeline. I can't find Lena. Lena disappeared last night. Do you know where she is? Lena? Who's Lena? Who is she? Why, she Lena, Miss Madeline. Amos, what am I doing here? What's that? What am I doing here? I, I'm sick. I can't seem to remember. Amos, where's that light coming from? What light, Miss Madeline? That light behind you. It's blinding. Amos, what are you doing here? I look for Lena, Master Tom. She gone. She didn't come to the house last night. Do you know where she is? Of course not. But if Lena is lost, we'll find her. Now, don't bother Miss Madeline about it. She isn't feeling well. Oh, I don't mind, Tom. Stay here, Amos, and talk to me. I told you not to bother Miss Madeline. Now, get out of here. Yes, Master Tom. Amos, go. But Amos, find Lena. Amos, find Lena. Get out, you tramp. Get out of here before I hit yes, you. Yes, sir. Amos, go. But Amos, find Lena. Tom, will you help me? I can't seem to remember anything. You need a lot of rest. Look at me, Madeline. Yes? Yeah. What do you see? Why, your face is... It's what? It's the face I've been trying to remember. Who are you? Come closer. Yes? Yeah. Now what do you see? Why, you're Tom. Good. Now sleep, Madden, sleep. But that face I saw a moment ago. Oh, would you let me see it again? I said sleep. Yes, I'm asleep. But I must remember, too. I must remember. Good. I must act quickly. And I will sleep a word from here. We're going a long trip. She'll never have need to remember. I'll give her a completely new life. Tonight we'll drive out of here. We'll go to Cuba. That's it. We'll go to Cuba and keep her on going. Reggie. Reggie, where are you? She's talking in her sleep. She remembers everything I told her to forget. But she doesn't know it. Reggie. Reggie, I can't hear you very well. What is it? What are you trying to tell me? She's talking to someone. She's hitting up. Her eyes. Her eyes are wide open. Louder, Reggie. Where are you? I I can't hear you. I didn't hear you, Reggie. In the pit. The pit? (laughs) Madeline. Wake up, Madeline. Take that light out of my eyes. Look, Madeline, look. Oh, Tom. Oh, Tom, I was dreaming. You were? That's strange. You haven't been asleep. I haven't. No, Madeline, you've been right here talking to me all the time. But, Tom, oh, what's the matter with me? I'd sooner be dead than this way. Why can't I remember anything? You have no memory, Madeline. It's been taken away from you. Who took it away? Why? Oh, just when I need to remember. I took it away, Madeline. You? Why? Because you're about to learn something that would have killed us both. What was it? You'll know soon enough. Until then, don't try to remember. Miss Madeline, Miss Madeline. Who is it? It's Amos, Miss Madeline. I must see you right away. Come in, Amos. Miss Madeline, you've got to get out of here. Get out? Why? Master Tom's in a killing mood. He just tried to kill me. Oh, Amos, what are you saying? Tom wouldn't kill yes, you. Yes, he would, Miss Madeline. I followed him out in the bayou. I saw him with Lena. Who's Lena? You remember Lena, Miss Madeline. She's Lena. She's my Lena. I seem to remember, yet I don't. Oh, tell me, Lena. Tell me more about her. Why should I remember her? You should remember Lena because, well, Lena's your friend. Lena tried to help you. Now she dead by Lena Dade, Miss Mellon. Master Tom Killer. I see him with her down on the bayou. Amos, I can't see you. It's got light again. Amos, be careful. The light is behind you. Amos. I told you to stay away from Miss Madeline. Why are you here? I saw you, Master Tom. I saw you bury Lena in the bayou. You killed my Lena. I warned you. Now you're going to... Come back here, you babbling fool. Come back here. Amos, Amos, be back. But Amos, come back for Lena. Miss Madeline, run away. Run away, Miss Madeline. Run. Get that meddling fool. Amos. Amos, I'm coming to get you. Oh, the light. It, it's going away. I must follow it. I must follow the light. Madeline, stay back. Don't come out here. The light? Going away? I I must follow the light. Madden. Madden, turn back. Without the light, there's nothing. I I can't lose the light. Madden, I command you to go back to the house. It's gone. Where did the light go? Hey, Miss Madden. Duck behind this tree. It's Amos. Master Tom, don't see us here. He must take you back to the house. Master Tom, awful crazy. You've got to get out of here. Where are you, Madeline? Answer me. Down low, Miss Madeline. He's coming. Madeline. Madeline, don't move. Cottonmouth, don't move an inch. The light. There's the light. Forget the light, Madeline. Please, don't move a muscle. That 
snake isn't two feet from your face. Tom, bring the light closer. I, I want... I want pain. That's what I want, Tom. I want pain and, and Reggie. Madeline. I must find Reggie. Reggie. Quiet, you little fool. That snake will strike at anything moves. Madeline, look out. Reggie. I lost Reggie. She remembers after all. Please, Miss Madeline, listen to Master Tom. Madeline. The snake. It's Madeline. Snake. Right in the mouth. Hey, Miss Grabber. This man. This man. Give it to me. Madeline, speak. Tom, you did this. Don't talk, Madeline. I'll get you back to the house. You killed Reggie. No. Reggie died in the quicksand pit. You killed him. Oh, Reggie, it would have been lovely and... <gasps> Madeline. Madeline, speak to me. Good heavens, she's dead. Madeline's dead. Uh, Master Tom. Go away, Amos. Go away. Madeline, what have I done? Master Tom, you killed Master Red. I didn't mean to, Amos. I didn't mean to. And you killed my Lena, too. I must have been mad. Now Amos kill you, Master Tom. Go away, Amos. What? Now old Amos kill you, Master Tom. It's right. Amos must kill you now. Stand back, you fool. Get away from me. Amos gonna kill you, Master Tom. May the good Lord help me do it. Amos, give me that gun. I'll have you whip. No, Master Tom. You won't whip Amos. You won't whip anybody anymore. Amos! Amos, don't! Master Tom, come on. This man has gone. Nothing but the bubbles in the bayou. Ain't nobody left the Dinos anymore. The bayou got us all. Now Amos, go. Lena. Lena. Amos, hear the voices. So runs the tale of Beth in the Bayou. Well, friends, heave a big sigh and uh, then listen to this. Another new shipment of 9 by 12 rugs and wall-to-wall carpeting has just arrived at the Granite Furniture Company. You may choose from a wide variety of 9 by 12 rugs in choice colors and patterns. In carpeting, the Granite Furniture Company is now able to offer you a choice from more than 20 rolls in Wilton or Axminster grades. This is hard to get merchandise, and the Granite Furniture Company, through its bigger buying power and better wholesale connections, has scooped the market. Buy early tomorrow on easy terms, rugs and carpeting at the Granite Furniture Company. There is a store near you in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. Remember to join us next week at the same time for another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear the tale of The Doctor of Terror. Tonight's story was written by Robert Olson. Heard in tonight's program were Michael Bruce as Reginald Crane, Beth Calder as Madeline, Dick Thorne as Tom, Carol Moser as Lena, and Ken Jensen as Amos. Musical background was provided by Earl Donaldson. The technical supervisor was Nephi Sorensen. Your announcer is Mal Wyman. These programs are produced and directed by Richard Thorne. Remember, be with us again next Sunday night on call at 8.30 p.m. when the Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo will take you on another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear the tale of the Doctor of Terror. And now... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Return from Death. You mean that you can bring him back to life? I know I can. There, everything's ready. Will you step back, David? Of course. Now to turn on the machine. You will see for yourself what I mean. Now to induce the charge. How much voltage are you using? 25,000. 
That's enough. Now, look at him, David. Wait. He's alive. He was dead, but now... Now he's alive. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Return from Death. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Return from Death. Dr. Jason Sinclair was a brilliant man. He was one of my instructors at medical school. He gave of his knowledge freely, creating in the students a desire to learn, imparting some of his own enthusiasm for his subject into the minds of his students. I always looked forward to his classes. After I received my degree, I lost track of him for several years. But one evening when I was ready to leave the research center... Hello? May I speak to David Cummings? Speaking. David, this is Jason Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair, it's good to hear from you. I was wondering if you'd remember me. Of course I would. All of us who studied under you owe you more than we can ever repay. What are you doing this evening? Well, actually nothing. I'd like to see you, David. Why don't you come over to the house tonight? It'll be a pleasure. You still live at the same place? Yes, the world may change, David, but Jason Sinclair and his habits don't. I'll be expecting you about eight soon. See you, David. Come in, come in. Good to see you, Dr. Sinclair. You can forget the doctor part of it, David. Call me Jason. You're not in school now. How long has it been? I've I've lost all track of time. You received your degree in 1943. It's been ten years. <laughs> I didn't realize it was so long. You haven't changed, you know, Jason. Only ten years older, that's all. Oh, do you remember my daughter, David? I believe she was that's in... That's right. She was in my class. How are you, Elaine? Fine, David. It's good to see you again. Are you working with your father? Yes. Sit down, David. Sit down. Now, can I pour you a drink? Not right now, thanks. Are you still with the college, Jason? No, I left there some time ago. Oh, really? How come? I wanted to devote more time to research. I see. David, are you happy with your present position? Well, I hadn't stopped to think about it. I guess I am. That's a shame. Why do you say that? I was wondering if you'd like to work with me. I don't know. I hope you'll forgive me for hesitating, Jason, but I've... I've been with Associated Chemical for several years. I understand, David. It's only natural that you'd hesitate. Why, of course. Dad doesn't want to push you into this, David. You're perfectly free not to accept. Of course, I would like to have you with me. I can guarantee you more than you're getting now. Well, that's a pretty good inducement. I'd like to work with you, David. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. What are you working on, Jason? Come, I'll take you downstairs. Then you can see for yourself. Do you remember some of our discussions years ago about death and the possibility of bringing back to life a man that medical science had pronounced dead? Yes, I do. Well, that's what I've been working on. Oh? Have you had any success? Quite a lot. More than I'd expected this early. I'll show you. The rabbit you see on the table is dead. I'd like to have you examine it, if you will. Yes, he's dead, I'd say, for... Uh... For at least two hours. Very close, David. A few minutes longer, that's all. What do you intend doing? You see. I've already given him the preliminary injection, David, to save time. You know, of course, that all life has a connection with electricity. We think we send out small charges of electricity along the nerve network, which in turn activates our muscles. You mean that you can bring him back to life? I know I can. There, everything's ready. Will you step back, David? Of course. Now to turn on the machine. You'll see for yourself what I mean. Now to induce the charge. How much voltage are you using? 25,000. That's enough. Now look at him, David. What? He's alive. This animal's alive. Yes, David. But there's something strange about him. How do you mean? I don't know. I, I can't explain it. You're imagining it, David. You saw him dead, now you see him alive. The sight is foreign to your mind. Perhaps. I've learned the secret, David. Now we can restore to the living those who have passed into the realm of death. Oh. 
Although Jason Sinclair passed over my objection, I still couldn't get the thought from my mind. There was something strange about the animal. Something seemed to be missing. We went back upstairs. Jason left the room to get the papers he'd written explaining the various steps he'd taken in his experiments. I was left alone with Elaine. Did you see it? Yes. It's amazing. Are you going to work with him? I think so. David, I wish you wouldn't. Why not? Did you notice the rabbit after he returned it back to life? Yes. David, didn't it look foreign to you as if something were missing? I noticed something, but I, I couldn't put my finger on it. That's what I mean. David, I don't think you should do it. I don't see why, Elaine. Think what a boon this will be to the world. Will it, David? Well, of course. I'm not too sure about that. Elaine, you of all people should have faith in your father. I don't, though, David. Why not? Because I don't believe that once an animal is dead, it should be returned to life. It should remain dead. Because when it dies, its spirit dies with it. And when Dad brings these creatures back, the animal lives, true enough. But, David, it's like an automaton. The body may live, but the thing which gave it personality is dead. I'm still going to work with him, Elaine. Do you know what you're getting into? Dad is a precisionist. He'll experiment and experiment until finally he'll want to try it on a man. And where is that man going to come from, David? Where is he going to come from? Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Return from Death. I was in the house of Jason Sinclair. A few minutes before, I'd been witness to a scene which had amazed me. As I saw it, I made up my mind to work with Jason. We went back upstairs, and when Jason left the room, his daughter tried to dissuade me from my decision. I'm serious, David. Where is he going to come from? I don't know. Then you're going to go through with it? Yes. I warned you, David. Remember that. Here are the papers, David. Oh, thank you. Look them over. They contain all the notes I've made on the experiment. I will, Jason. Are you going to work with me? Yes. Good. You'll have to give the organization for which you're working now at least two weeks' notice. Of course. If you like, you can live here with us. Do you have any relatives, David? No. Glad to hear that. I'll see you in two weeks. Two weeks later, I moved in with Jason Sinclair and we began working. We conducted experiments, making a few changes, altering the content of the preparatory injection, resetting the amount of voltage required, progressing from the lower stages of animal life ever higher. And then one night, he told me what he intended doing next. David, have you heard of Terry Whalen? Whalen? He... Oh, yes. He's going to die next week for the murder of that old man. That's right. We're going down to the prison tomorrow to see him. Why, Dad? Whalen has no relatives, no one to bury him after his death except for the state. What do you mean? I believe we can have access to his body after he's executed. You mean you intend using him as a subject? That's correct. But if we're successful, Jason, won't it, won't it be dangerous to return a killer back to life? Not if we watch him. Not if we can destroy his urge to kill. Dad, I don't think you should do it. He's a dangerous man. Nonsense, Elaine. We'll increase the amount of voltage, David. Enough to destroy that part of his brain which motivates his desire to kill. Perhaps he'll completely change. You someone else, Dad, not Terry Whalen. Where would I get someone else, Elaine? We rose early the following day and drove out to the prison. Jason was well known and thought highly of in official circles. We were allowed to talk to the warden and Jason convinced him that Whalen's body would be used for medical research, but... He neglected to tell him how it would be used. Then we were allowed to talk to Whalen. Just a few minutes, Dr. Sinclair. I understand. Uh, who are you? My name is Jason Sinclair, Mr. Whalen. Uh, what do you want? To talk to you. So talk? You are to be executed next week, Mr. Whalen. Look, if you come here just to tell me that, I've got a surprise for you. 
I already know it. I'm a doctor, Terry. We'd like to use you as the subject of an experiment. Sure, sure. Go right ahead. Not now, Terry. After you've been executed. Huh? What do you mean? Where are you from? You from one of those medical colleges? Listen, don't go for that stuff. No, sir. If that's what don't you're here Terry. for, I... I propose to bring you back to life. You mean... You mean after I'm dead? That's right. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like you've been in stir too long. <laughs> I'm serious. We can do it. You mean... <laughs> you mean you can actually bring me back to life? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> ah, and they can't punish me a second time, can they? They can't kill me twice. <laughs> you agree to it then? Yeah, sure. Sure, Sawbones. Sure, I agree to it. Anything... Anything to get another chance. <laughs> Jason made arrangements for an ambulance to pick up Whalen's body a short time after the execution. That night, the night Whalen settled his death with the state, a storm broke. We stayed at the house and waited. The ambulance was already at the prison, waiting for its passenger. What time is it? Almost 12. I wish you hadn't arranged all this then. Nonsense, Elaine. Well, that is, 12 o'clock. The time is to die. It's only taken three hours, even in this storm, to get back here, Jason. That's right. When they do, David, they'll have Whalen with them. We waited there at the house. The storm was the perfect background for the strange mood which had seized hold of each of us. A short time after three, the ambulance pulled into the driveway and we went down and opened the basement door. They brought him in and sat him on a table. Yes, that's right. Thank you. You ready, David? I guess so. I'll prepare the hypodermic then. We'll give him 20 cc's of this. No more than that? Of course not. There. That does it. Now, help me attach the wires. Dealing with the death has always frightened me. It's foolish, my boy. As a scientist, you should never allow yourself to be subjective about things. You must be completely objective. There. I believe that'll do it. Dr. Sinclair. Anything wrong, David? Maybe... Maybe we'll not go through with this. We can't turn back now? No, I suppose not. Shall we begin? Switch it on. It has a pleasant sound, hasn't it, David? What's the reading? 10,000. Increase the charge. The reading? 15,000. 20,000. 23,000. 24,000. 25,000. Shall we stop? No. We must destroy his desire to kill. 26,000. 27,000. That's enough. Turn it off. Now, to take a look at him. Place the contact microphone in his chest, David. Yes, Jason. Listen, David. You're listening to the sound of his heart, David. The beating heart of a dead man. We've succeeded. We've brought him back from death. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Return from Death. It was a wet and storming night. Jason Sinclair hovered over the body on the table in the center of his basement laboratory. I stood just behind him, watching a dead man return to life. Listen, David. You're listening to the sound of his heart. We've brought him back from death. Remove the contact, Mike. Jason. Look at his eyes. 
They're open. Yes, I see. Whalen? Can you hear me? Answer me, Whalen. Uh, Think what uh, this means, David. Uh, he can tell us what it was like to be dead. The first man ever to know the secret. Whalen, answer me. Uh, 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 the, uh, the strap's uh, taken off. Uh, All right, let's loosen them. Uh, how do you feel, Whalen? Look out, Jason. He's getting off the table. Nothing to be afraid of, David. He didn't limp before, did he? No. Some of the motor section of the brain must have been damaged. He's coming toward us. Don't move. You might frighten him. Look at his eyes, Jason. They're not human. Quiet, David. He's trying to say something. I can't understand you, Whalen. What are you trying to say? He's patting you on the back. You're trying to thank me, no doubt. All right, that's enough, Whalen. I understand you appreciate... Take his hand away from my throat, David. That's enough, Whalen. Ah! Look out, David. I see him. You knocked him out. Yes. You shouldn't have done that. Are you serious, Jason? I was protecting myself and you, for that matter. He wouldn't have hurt me. You didn't seem to think that when he had his fingers around your throat. Well, I admit that I was frightened. All right. What are we going to do with him? Well, keep him down here. Teach him to talk again. Seems to have lost the power of coherent speech. Look at him, Jason. Why? Is there anything wrong? I don't know. But looking at his face now... I have the strangest feeling that he's not really a human being anymore. That something's missing. That he's a mad, vicious creation of the devil. You're talking like a fool, David. Perhaps you're tired. I know I am. He can't get out of here. He'll lock the doors and the windows are barred. Let's go upstairs. All right, Jason. But remember what I said. placed him back on the table, taking the precaution of strapping him down in case he should awaken. Then Jason locked the doors and took the keys with him. We went upstairs. I've been waiting for you. Elaine, I thought you were asleep. No, no, I couldn't sleep. You should have come downstairs and joined us then, Elaine. You brought him back? Yes. How did he react? Not as well as he might have, Elaine. Anything wrong? No, nothing. He tried to kill your father. What? He was merely trying to thank me, David. He's probably suffering from a sort of amnesia. He doesn't realize his own strength. He's like a baby. You know that's not true, sir. He's an inhuman, vicious killer. Oh, you should never have done this, Dad. Will you both be quiet? I'm tired of listening to you. What? I don't like to admit it. But I know I've been wrong. I'm sorry, my dear. I lost my temper. I shouldn't have. I know it's because I think you're both partially right. How do you mean, Jason? There is something inhuman about that thing that was a man downstairs. I noticed it tonight when his hands were around my throat. In his eyes, that intangible something that makes an animal a man is missing. But in its place, I see the eyes of a madman with no soul. Oh, what are we going to do? I don't know. Maybe we haven't failed, sir. Maybe because we're tired, we think we have. It may look completely different to us after a few hours of sleep. I just... What was that? came from downstairs. Whelan. We had him strapped to the table. He must have gotten moved. That was the door. He's trying to knock the door down. We have to stop him. But how? Elaine, get my gun. All right, Dad. I'll be right back. I tried not to admit it, David, but that was only lying to myself. You and Elaine brought me to my senses. You were right. Right all along. About the rabbit, about the other animals, and especially about Whelan. He must be destroyed. He's a monster without feeling. Here, Dad. Here's the gun. Thanks. I'm going down there and... You oh. don't have to go down there. That was the door. Listen. Listen, he's coming up the stairs. Turn the lights out, David. Yes, sir. I'm going out in the hall to meet him. No, Dad. No, let him come in here. I'm going to stay right over here on this side of the room. All right, David. Be quiet. He's coming. I don't want to shoot him. I'm going to take him alive. You'll have to shoot him. Oh, yes, Dad. He's just outside the door. David, I'm afraid. Be quiet. 
Now, David. Yes. I see it. It's composed. It looks human again. Perhaps we're not meant to tamper with the natural laws of life and death, David. I see that now. But it took Wayland's return from death to prove it to me. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. to life? I know I can. There, everything's ready. Will you step back, David? Of course. How to turn on the machine? You'll see for yourself what I mean. How to induce the charge? How much voltage are you using? 25,000. That's enough. Now, look at him, David. Why, he's alive. He was dead, but now... Now he's alive. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Return from Death. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Return from Death. Dr. Jason Sinclair was a brilliant man. He was one of my instructors at medical school. He gave of his knowledge freely, creating in the students a desire to learn, imparting some of his own enthusiasm for his subject into the minds of his students. I always looked forward to his classes. After I received my degree, I lost track of him for several years. But one evening when I was ready to leave the research center... Hello? May I speak to David Cummings? Speaking. David, this is Jason Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair, it's good to hear from you. I was wondering if you'd remember me. Of course I would. All of us who studied under you owe you more than we can ever repay. What are you doing this evening? Well, actually nothing. I'd like to see you, David. Why don't you come over to the house tonight? It'll be a pleasure. You still live at the same place? Yes, the world may change, David, but Jason Sinclair and his habits don't. I'll be expecting you about eight thirty. See you, David. Come in, come in. Good to see you, Dr. Sinclair. 
You can forget the doctor part of it, David. Call me Jason. You're not in school now. How long has it been? I've I've lost all track of time. You received your degree in 1943. It's been ten years. <laughs> I didn't realize it was so long. You haven't changed, you know, Jason. I'm only ten years older, that's all. Oh, do you remember my daughter, David? I believe she was That's in... right. She was in my class. How are you, Elaine? Fine, David. It's good to see you again. Are you working with your father? Yes. Sit down, David. Sit down. Can I pour you a drink? Not right now, thanks. Are you still with the college, Jason? No, I left there some time ago. Oh, really? How come? I wanted to devote more time to research. I see. David, are you happy with your present position? Well, I hadn't stopped to think about it. I guess I am. That's a shame. Why do you say that? I was wondering if you'd like to work with me. I don't know. I hope you'll forgive me for hesitating, Jason, but I've... I've been with Associated Chemical for several years. I understand, David. It's only natural that you'd hesitate. Why, of course. Dad doesn't want to push you into this, David. You're perfectly free not to accept. Of course, I would like to have you with me. I can guarantee you more than you're getting now. Well, that's a pretty good inducement. I'd like to work with you, David. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. What are you working on, Jason? Come, I'll take you downstairs. Then you can see for yourself. Do you remember some of our discussions years ago about death and the possibility of bringing back to life a man that medical science had pronounced dead? Yes, I do. Well, that's what I've been working on. Oh? Have you had any success? Quite a lot. More than I'd expected this early. I'll show you. The rabbit you see on the table is dead. I'd like to have you examine it, if you will. Yes, he's dead, I'd say, for... For at least two hours. Very close, David. A few minutes longer, that's all. What do you intend doing? You see. I've already given him the preliminary injection, David, to save time. You know, of course, that all life has a connection with electricity. And we think we send out small charges of electricity along the nerve network, which in turn activates our muscles. You mean that you can bring him back to life? I know I can. There, everything's ready. Will you step back, David? Of course. Now to turn on the machine. You'll see for yourself what I mean. Now to induce the charge. How much voltage are you using? 25,000. That's enough. Now look at him, David. What? He's alive. This animal's alive. Yes, David. But there's something strange about him. How do you mean? I don't know. I, I can't explain it. You're imagining it, David. You saw him dead, now you see him alive. The sight is foreign to your mind. Perhaps. I've learned the secret, David. Now we can restore to the living those who have passed into the realm of death. <laughs> Although Jason Sinclair passed over my objection, I still couldn't get the thought from my mind. There was something strange about the animal. Something seemed to be missing. We went back upstairs. Jason left the room to get the papers he'd written explaining the various steps he'd taken in his experiments. I was left alone with Elaine. Did you see it? Yes. It's amazing. Are you going to work with him? I think so. David, I wish you wouldn't. Why not? Did you notice the rabbit after he returned it back to life? Yes. David, didn't it look foreign to you as if something were missing? I noticed something, but I, I couldn't put my finger on it. That's what I mean. David, I don't think you should do it. I don't see why, Elaine. Think what a boon this would be to the world. Will it, David? Well, of course. I'm not too sure about that. Elaine, you of all people should have faith in your father. I don't, though, David. Why not? Because I don't believe that once an animal is dead, it should be returned to life. It should remain dead. Because when it dies, its spirit dies with it. And when Dad brings these creatures back, the animal lives, true enough. But, David, it's like an automaton. The body may live, but the thing which gave it personality is dead. I'm still going to work with him, Elaine. Do you know what you're getting into? Dad is a precisionist. He'll experiment and experiment until finally he'll want to try it on a man. 
And where is that man going to come from, David? Where is he going to come from? Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Return from Death. I was in the house of Jason Sinclair. A few minutes before, I'd been witness to a scene which had amazed me. As I saw it, I made up my mind to work with Jason. We went back upstairs, and when Jason left the room, his daughter tried to dissuade me from my decision. I'm serious, David. Where is he going to come from? I don't know. Then you're going to go through with it? Yes. I warned you, David. Remember that. Here are the papers, David. Oh, thank you. Look them over. They contain all the notes I've made on the experiment. I will, Jason. Are you going to work with me? Yes. Good. You'll have to give the organization for which you're working now at least two weeks' notice. Of course. If you like, you can live here with us. Do you have any relatives, David? No. Glad to hear that. I'll see you in two weeks. Two weeks later, I moved in with Jason Sinclair and we began working. We conducted experiments making a few changes, altering the content of the preparatory injection, resetting the amount of voltage required, progressing from the lower stages of animal life ever higher. And then one night, he told me what he intended doing next. David, have you heard of Terry Whalen? Whalen? He... Oh, yes. He's going to die next week for the murder of that old man. That's right. We're going down to the prison tomorrow to see him. Why, Dad? Whelan has no relatives, no one to bury him after his death except for the state. What do you mean? I believe we can have access to his body after he's executed. You mean you intend using him as a subject? That's correct. But if we're successful, Jason, won't it, won't it be dangerous to return a killer back to life? Not if we watch him. Not if we can destroy his urge to kill. Dad, I don't think you should do it. He's a dangerous man. Nonsense, Elaine. We'll increase the amount of voltage, David. Enough to destroy that part of his brain which motivates his desire to kill. Perhaps he'll completely change. Use someone else, Dad, not Terry Whalen. Where would I get someone else, Elaine? We arose early the following day and drove out to the prison. Jason was well known and thought highly of in official circles. We were allowed to talk to the warden and Jason convinced him that Whalen's body would be used for medical research, but... He neglected to tell him how it would be used. Then we were allowed to talk to Whalen. Just a few minutes, Dr. Sinclair. I understand. Uh, who are you? My name is Jason Sinclair, Mr. Whalen. Uh, what do you want? To talk to you. So talk? You are to be executed next week, Mr. Whalen. Look, if you come here just to tell me that, I've got a surprise for you. I already know it. I'm a doctor, Terry. We'd like to use you as the subject of an experiment. Sure, sure. Go right ahead. Not now, Terry. After you've been executed. Huh? What do you mean? Where are you from? You from one of those medical colleges? Listen, I don't go for that stuff. No, sir. If that's what no, you're here Terry. for, I... I propose to bring you back to life. You mean... You mean after I'm dead? That's right. You're crazy. <laughs> you sound like you've been in stir too long. <laughs> I'm serious. We can do it. You mean... <laughs> you mean you can actually bring me back to life? That's right. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> ah, and they can't punish me a second time, can they? They can't kill me twice. <laughs> you agree to it, then? Yeah, sure. Sure, Sawbones. Sure, I agree to it. Anything. Anything to get another chance. <laughs> <laughs> Jason made arrangements for an ambulance to pick up Whalen's body a short time after the execution. That night, the night Whalen settled his death with the state, a storm broke. We stayed at the house and waited. The ambulance was already at the prison, waiting for its passenger. What time is it? Almost 12. I wish you hadn't arranged all this, Dad. Nonsense, Elaine. Well, that is 12 o'clock. Time is to die. It's only taken three hours, even in this storm, to get back here, Jason. That's right. When they do, David, they'll have Whalen with them. We 
waited there at the house. The storm was the perfect background for the strange mood which had seized hold of each of us. A short time after three, the ambulance pulled into the driveway and we went down and opened the basement door. They brought him in and sat him on a table. Yes, that's right. Thank you. You ready, David? I guess so. I'll prepare the hypodermic then. We'll give him 20 cc's of this. No more than that? Of course not. There. That does it. Now, help me attach the wires. Dealing with the death has always frightened me. It's foolish, my boy. My scientist, you should never allow yourself to be subjective about things. You must be completely objective. There. I believe that'll do it. Dr. Sinclair. Anything wrong, David? Maybe... Maybe we ought not go through with this. We can't turn back now? No, I suppose not. Shall we begin? Switch it on. That's a pleasant sound, hasn't it, David? What's the reading? 10,000. Increase the charge. The reading? 15,000. 20,000. 23,000. 24,000. 25,000. Shall we start? No. We must destroy his desire to kill. 26,000. 27,000. That's it up. Turn it off. Now, to take a look at him. Place the contact microphone in his chest, Ed. Yes, Jason. Listen, David. You're listening to the sound of his heart, David. The beating heart of a dead man. We've succeeded. We've brought him back from death. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Return from Death. It was a wet and storming night. Jason Sinclair hovered over the body on the table in the center of his basement laboratory. I stood just behind him, watching a dead man return to life. Listen, David. You're listening to the sound of his heart. They've brought him back from death. Remove the contact, Mike. Jason, look at his eyes. They're open. Yes, I see. Waylon, can you hear me? Answer me, Waylon. Uh, Think what uh, this means, David. Uh, he can tell us what it was like to be dead. The first man ever to know the secret. Waylon, answer me. Uh, uh, the, the strap's taken off. All right, let's loosen them. Now, how do you feel, Waylon? Look out, Jason. He's getting off the table. Nothing to be afraid of, David. He didn't limp before, did he? No. Some of the motor section of the brain must have been damaged. He's coming toward us. Don't move. You might frighten him. Look at his eyes, Jason. They're not human. Go ahead, David. He's trying to say something. I can't understand you, Waylon. What are you trying to say? He's patting you on the back. You're trying to thank me, no doubt. All right, that's enough, Waylon. I understand you appreciate... Take his hand away from my throat, David. That's enough, Waylon. Ah! Look out, David. I see him. You knocked him out. Yes. You shouldn't have done that. Are you serious, Jason? I was protecting myself and you for that matter. He wouldn't have hurt me. You didn't seem to think that when he had his fingers around your throat. Well, I admit that I was frightened. All right. What are we going to do with him? Well, keep him down here. Teach him to talk again. He seems to have lost the power of coherent speech. Look at him, Jason. Why? Is there anything wrong? I 
don't know. But looking at his face now, I have the strangest feeling that he's not really a human being anymore. That something's missing. That he's a mad, vicious creation of the devil. You're talking like a fool, David. Perhaps you're tired. I know I am. He can't get out of here. He'll lock the doors and the windows are barred. Let's go upstairs. All right, Jason. But remember what I said. We placed him back on the table, taking the precaution of strapping him down in case he should awaken. Then Jason locked the doors and took the keys with him. We went upstairs. I've been waiting for you. Lane, I thought you were asleep. No, no, I couldn't sleep. You should have come downstairs and joined us then, Elaine. You brought him back? Yes. How did he react? Not as well as he might have, Elaine. Anything wrong? No, nothing. He tried to kill your father. What? He was merely trying to thank me, David. He's probably suffering from a sort of amnesia. He doesn't realize his own strength. He's like a baby. You know that's not true, sir. He's an inhuman, vicious killer. Oh, you should never have done this, Dad. Would you both be quiet? I'm tired of listening to you. What? I don't like to admit it. But I know I've been wrong. I'm sorry, my dear. I lost my temper. I shouldn't have. I know it's because I think you're both partially right. How do you mean, Jason? There is something inhuman about that thing that was a man downstairs. I noticed it tonight when his hands were around my throat. In his eyes, that intangible something that makes an animal a man is missing. But in its place, I see... The eyes of a madman with no soul. Oh, what are we going to do? I don't know. Maybe we haven't failed, sir. Maybe because we're tired, we think we have. It may look completely different to us after a few hours of sleep. I said, oh, what was that? Came from downstairs. Whelan. We had him strapped to the table. He must have gotten loose. That was the door. He's trying to knock the door down. We have to stop him. But how? Elaine, oh. get my gun. All right, Dad. I'll be right back. I tried not to admit it, David, but that was only lying to myself. You and Elaine brought me to my senses. You were right, right all along, about the rabbit, about the other animals, and especially about Wayland. He must be destroyed. He's a monster without feeling. Here, Dad, here's the gun. Thanks. I'm going down there and... You oh. won't have to go down there. That was the door. Listen. Listen, he's coming up the stairs. Turn the lights out, David. Yes, sir. I'm going out in the hall to meet him. No, Dad. No, let him come in here. Stay right over here on this side of the room. All right, David. Be quiet. He's coming. I don't want to shoot him. I don't want to take him alive. You'll have to shoot him. Oh, yes, Dad. He's just outside the door. David, I'm afraid. Be quiet. Ah, there he is. Where you today? He's searching for me. Shh, be quiet. He's looking this way. Stop it! It's me! Use the gun, Jason. Oh, Pull the trigger! face now, David. Yes. I see it. It's composed. It looks human again. Perhaps we're not meant to tamper with the natural laws of life and death, David. I see that now. But it took Wayland's return from death to prove it to me. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental.
Boston Soup presents Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host, Raymond, the gay ghoul. Friends, would you like to uh, fly through the air with the greatest speed? Do you think you'd enjoy being invisible, huh? <laughs> oh, it's easy. All you have to do is become a ghost. And to become a ghost, all you have to do is accentuate the ectoplasm and eliminate the protoplasm. Man! If that doesn't work, we'll introduce you to one of the characters on our show. He'll take care of you. And that's the truth. What awful people on this show. Wherever do you find them, Mr. Raymond? Well, it's simple. All you have to do is turn over a rock and out they come crawling. Hmm. And just suppose you were looking for decent people. How would you find them? Oh, well, now, Mary, you were the one who showed me how I'd just go snooping around houses and peering into windows... And I'd find all the nice people drinking Lipton tea. Oh, dear. There you go, making fun again. You know, maybe if you drank Lipton tea, you wouldn't be such a bitter, unhappy person. Yes, there's something so warming and cheerful about Lipton. I guess that's why lots of folks drink it not only at mealtimes, but between meals. Or whenever they get a chance to sit down and enjoy Lipton's famous brisk flavor. Mm Mm-hmm. That word, brisk. B-R-I-S-K Explains a lot when it comes to tea flavor Brisk means that Lipton tea always tastes tangy and and bracing It's never flat or wishy-washy That's right You just don't know how good tea can be Till you know how good Lipton's is All right, Mary Um, As long as you're in the kitchen You'd better sharpen up a couple of knives As our main character tonight is going to use them The story is called Song of the Slasher. It's an original radio play by Milton Lewis and stars Arnold Moss in the role of Detective Dan Miller. Are you uh, ready? Then uh, gather close and listen. If you find you're getting too many chills and just sit in a fire. uh. (laughs) A thick murky fog hangs like a damp veil over the waterfront. Streets are deserted. The buildings loom like tombstones in a cemetery. No living soul can be seen because people who sense stay behind locked doors. The slasher has murdered and mutilated his fifth victim in eight days. In a drab, lonely little room, a young woman suddenly looks up and she hears a door close. Wow. Well, what's the matter? Can't you speak? Hey, you, get away from me. Get back up. That knife. What are you doing with that knife? You're a flasher. Help! Help me, someone! It's a flasher! Help! Hello, police headquarters. Hello? It, it, it's the slasher. What are you talking about? He's here. Twelve doctors. He's upstairs. Mr. Nell's apartment. I can hear it screaming now. He's with her. I go up, but I, I am, I'm an old man. It's the slasher. He's killing her. Hello? Sergeant Miller? Speaking. This is Captain Quinn, headquarters. Here's the chance you've been waiting for. The slasher's at 12 Dock Street, right around the corner from you. On my way, Captain. Bye. And that's how it started. The detective was asked to do some queer things in the line of duty. I didn't mind moving down to the dump at the waterfront with my wife if it would help catch the slasher. So when I got the call, I rushed out of my joint and beat it down to 12 Dock Street. Oh. oh. Where is he? Where'd he go? Hey. Hey. Listen, I... I... Uh, don't do that. I'll get your doctor. I... Uh... And listen to me, sister. I don't know her name is. Are they going to send an ambulance? Yeah, yeah, but it won't do her no good. You were too late. Did you see the guy who did it? I saw nobody. He can't be far. He was here a minute ago. I heard someone go out the back way. When? A minute ago. Listen. 
coming from that alley down there. Oh, it's so thick you can't see two feet ahead of you. The back way goes into the alley. Well, then... Then it's him. It's a slasher. We got down to the alley, the radio cars and the men from the precinct were coming. We went through that neighborhood with a sieve. But we couldn't find the guy who whistled that queer tune. Is that you, Danny? Yeah. Oh. What happened? Well, you shouldn't have got out of bed, baby. I was worried. He got away. Did he kill another? Yeah, yeah, another dame. It wasn't so foggy I could have seen him. That's how close it was. Any clues? No, nothing to speak of. Hey, look, look, baby, don't you worry about this. You go back and get some sleep. I'm frightened, Danny. That man is somewhere in this neighborhood and us living here. I shouldn't have brought you down here. You're going back to our old place tomorrow. No, I'm not. I don't want you here alone, and I want to stay with you. Shut up. Danny! Listen. You hear that, don't you? That ain't something I'm hearing in my head, is it? Danny, what are you... Answer me, answer me. I want to make sure I ain't hearing things. Well, of course I hear it. It's someone whistling, but why are you acting like this? He, the... The slasher whistles that tune. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, I heard him tonight. Then the killer... The slasher must be somewhere around here. I'm going out, baby. Lock the door. The whistling was somewhere in the building. I listened. Where was it coming from? It was gone. I looked at my watch. 4.30 in the morning. I walked down the stairs listening for the whistle. I, I walked on my toes. Listened at the other flats. I didn't hear a thing. I went down into the cellar. There was someone there, all right. Oh? Who's there? It was Sykes, a janitor. I came closer. Oh. Oh, it's you, Mr. Miller. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Sykes. Hey, what's the matter? You're, you're shaking like you got a fever. You... You frightened me. Why? I thought you were the slasher. Yeah? He's around here, you know. He might be hiding in these shadows. He might be anywhere. Everybody's afraid of him. Everybody. Yeah, yeah, so I hear. Uh, time did you come down here? 4.30. Like I do every morning. Why? See any stranger in the building? No. I didn't see anyone. Who lives in the flat below us? Mr. Trevelyan. Reginald Trevelyan. Funny name. He's a funny fella. Never sleeps at night. Wanders around the building whistling to himself. Whistling to himself? Yeah. He writes music or something. He got a piano in his place today. He talks crazy sometimes. Think he's up there now? Yeah, he never sleeps. Here. Twenty dollars? Yeah, yeah, it's for you. Why are you giving this to me? I want you to tell me when Mr. Trevelyan leaves his apartment. Do you get it? Yeah, but... But why? I ain't paying you 20 bucks to ask questions. Who's there? Miller. Mr. Miller. Yes? What is it, Mr. Miller? My wife and I live upstairs. I know it's kind of late, but, uh, can I come in here for a minute? Of course. Hope I'm not disturbing you. No, it's quite all right. You the people who moved in a few days ago? That's right. Glad to know you. My name is Reginald Trevelyan. Dan Miller's mine. You been up all night? Yes. Why do you ask? Uh, because maybe you can help me. Someone tried to break into our place at about 4.30 this morning. Really? Mr. Miller, you think your wife would be very annoyed if I play the piano now? No. No, I don't think so. She, uh, she likes music. Does she? 
Seemed like a charming girl. I noticed her when you first moved in. You're very lucky to have such an attractive wife. You, uh, you whistle yourself like that very often? Yes. Especially when I'm working on a new composition. Wait a moment. I think I have it. I've been trying to work out that passage all night. Miss Miller, please get out of here. I want to be alone. You're a query, you are. I'm not in your opinion. Well, what are you waiting for? Get out of here. Get out of here. Try it. I've lost it. What? What? That passage. You see what you've done? I had it a minute ago, and now it's gone, gone. It's so been lately. I keep forgetting things. I'm sorry. I was rude to you. I didn't mean to be. Just a minute. Good night. Mr. Miller, is it really true what it says in the papers about the slasher? That he has the whole neighborhood trembling in terror? Yes. Lovely. Trembling for their miserable little lives. Worried about their dirty little souls. Shivering in fear in their ugly little rat holes. I knew who the slasher was. I'd embrace him and give him every penny I had. Why? Because I hate them. Because they laugh at me. Because. I phoned headquarters, told them to check on Trevelyan. Oh, he was a queer one, all right. So queer, I didn't tell Laura about him. I didn't want to scare her. Couldn't arrest him. I didn't have anything on him yet. I lay down to rest. Maybe I heard it in my dream. Maybe not. But I heard that whistling again. That same tune. I think that's what woke me. I looked around. Laura. She was gone. And the door was open. I rushed out. The hall was filled with thick fog. In the yellow light, I saw a crumpled heap on the floor. I recognized Laura's bathrobe. Ah, the slasher, that's my boy. He's not the type of low character who goes around murdering his friends and relatives. No, he's so big-hearted he murders anyone. Even people he was never introduced to. He's no snob. Snob? He's much worse than a snob. He's a lunatic. Oh, Mary, you're so unsympathetic. He's just lonely. He wants to get close to people with a knife. Well, if he's so lonely, then why does he go around cutting people? <laughs> you see, Mr. Raymond, I can say the same kind of things you do. Don't you dare just be your sweet, practical self, or else... <laughs> you can't frighten me, Mr. Raymond. But as a matter of fact, I do have something practical to say. I'm going to suggest that all the folks who drink Lipton tea should buy the larger, more economical size packages. Not only because they're thriftier, but for another reason. You see, if you have a large package of Liptons at home, then you're not likely to run out just when you need it. For instance, when folks happen to drop in unexpectedly some evening. And of course, Lipton's is a grand drink to serve your guests. It goes so well with cake or sandwiches. It, it, it just seems to make everything taste better. So, folks, be sure to have a good supply of that brisk Lipton tea on hand. Yeah, I'll do that. And uh, while you're at it, be sure to have an extra hand on hand because the slasher may want to collect one for a souvenir. <laughs> well, we've kept the blood from flowing long enough. On with the murders. Listen as we hear Arnold Moss as Dan Miller finish that story. Laura was alive in a dead faint. 
I scooped her up in my arms and rushed her back to our flat. She opened her eyes a few minutes later. Danny. You're okay, baby. He was going to kill me. Yeah, yeah. Drink some of this. Uh, thanks. Oh, Danny, it was awful. What happened? Well, you were asleep. I, I went out to get the milk. And I heard someone whistling. Do you remember what? That same queer melody we heard before, the one the slasher whistled. So I thought I'd help you. Help me? I thought I'd see him. I walked quietly down the hall, and there was no one there. And I turned the corner. Yeah? I saw the knife gleam. Someone was hiding in the shadows. He grabbed my neck, and I screamed. I screamed, Danny. I, I screamed so I thought I'd burst my throat, and then it all went flat. Did you see him? No, but I felt his hands on my throat. They were strong hands, fingers like steel, and I... Danny, I'm sorry. I can't even talk about it. Now, now, lie down, lie down. You'll be all right. But when you think that he's right here, maybe living in this building... Well, he won't be here long. I'm calling headquarters. You know who he is. I got a good idea. Now, just let me get on that phone and... Danny, maybe that's him. Take it easy, take it easy, kid. Who's there? Right. It's just a janitor, baby. Oh. What do you want? He went out. Providing? Yeah. Okay. Laura, get dressed. I want to get you out of here before the trouble starts. I'll be gone for a few minutes. Where are you going? With Mr. Sykes. You got a key, Sykes? Yeah, but I'll have to go along with you. You you can't take anything. You know what this badge means? You a detective? Yeah, yeah. Now, let's go. What are you doing here? Looking for the slasher? I'll write your book about it, pal. Right, here's his choice. Open the door. All right. But you'll have to hurry. He may come back any minute. All I want is enough evidence. I'll take care of him when we get it. The door's open. Come on in. It was eight in the morning. But it could have been eight at night. The fog was so thick. I knew this was it. I couldn't take any chances. I had to get all the evidence on him before I nabbed him. And I had to get it without him being wise. What are you looking for? Knives. We know he's got at least three. I don't see none. Neither do I. Maybe it's a bum steer. I could be wrong. Hey, hey, what's this? Music. He's always writing it. I used to be a choir boy once. They taught me how to read them notes. I wonder if I still can. Why? Uh, because I think this may be a tune I'm looking for. Now, let me see. Song. Did you ever hear it before? Yeah. Bet you did. He's always whistling it. I heard it myself when he killed the last one. You've got to find those knives. You better hurry. I think he just went out to get some breakfast. I looked everywhere. Couldn't find the knives. I couldn't bring a guy in just because I heard a song. I found a bunch of keys. They were trunk keys. But there was no trunk. I think I hear him coming. Never mind what you think. Where does he keep his trunk? In the storeroom in the cellar. He's always going down there for things. Hold it, hold it. That's him. Yeah. Come here. There's room behind this upright piano for both of us. What, the piece to shut, shut up? Shut up. Get behind here and hurry. <laughs> he sat down at the piano and played a queer arrangement of the same tune that led me to him. I reached for my gun just in case. Suddenly, I felt the sweat ooze out of me. It was sweat that, that felt like ice. I didn't have my gun. I remembered I took it off when I laid down to rest. It's all wrong, all wrong. Why can't I get it right? going out again. Come on, Sykes. I told you to hurry before. I hear him going down those stairs. It's, it's safe to go now. All right, Sykes. We're going to open that trunk in the store. Here's his trunk, Mr. Miller. This key should open it. Are they the knives? Yeah. The knives. Look at them. Look at them. Covered with blood. Hmm. Sykes, go to the police precinct. Tell them Miller sent you. Tell them to come over here with as many men as they can spare. All right. All right. 
I took the knives and put them under my coat. Went up to my room. I'm leaving. I'll be home soon. I could hear Laura talking on the phone to someone. I opened the door. Oh, of course. I... Oh, I better hang up now. Danny just came in. Goodbye, darling. Who are you talking to? Mother, I'm... I'm ready to go. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's no rush. Mr. Danny. That man at the piano. Sounds like the trash or something. Yeah. What have you got there? My gun. Come on, baby. We're going. That man playing the piano... Are you sure he's a slasher? Yeah. Positive. Oh, Danny, you're hurting my arm. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm nervous. Oh. That's his place. Come on in with me. Come in with you? Yeah. yeah. I figured out a way to trap him. But Danny, I... Don't be scared, baby. You'll be okay. Oh. You? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Trevelyan. I... I'd like you to meet my wife. I'm delighted. How do you do? Would you like to hear something? It's a composition I've just completed. I've had a great deal of trouble with it. But I think I've got it right now. Oh, are you? Oh, that gun. Yeah, you got it coming to your slasher. Oh, you stupid swine. You idiot. Why did you come here, Sam? My music. Not even written down. <laughs> Danny. You murdered him. Yeah. Why? You'll find out. What are you going to do with that knife? It's one of his knives. Stand still, Laura. Danny, do with me. In a minute. Danny, what's the matter with you? It's coming to you, too. Why? I know who you were talking to on that phone. It wasn't your old lady. What? It was Jerry Boyd, that guy who lives next door, wasn't it? Answer me, wasn't it? No, no. Lie to me. So this is why you made me come down here with you. You planned this all along. That's right, baby. And that's why I had you insured for 40 grand. Oh. You made one bad mistake. You married a smart cookie. You're going to kill me and blame it on the slasher. Yeah. No! Help me, someone! Help me! Daddy! Don't! Oh. When it was over, I wiped the knife clean of fingerprints. And then I, I smeared Trevelyan's hand over the handle. I knew what to do. Made it look good, made it look perfect. There's a way to get away with murder. And I found it. I thought. Go on with the report, Noah. Well, Captain Quinney, after I sent Sykes to the precinct, I went upstairs for my gun... My wife wasn't there, and I got the gun, and I heard a scream. I rushed to his place. I opened the door. I, I saw Laura. The second I thought I'd pass out. Yeah? He, he grabbed a knife and come at me, and I shot him and killed him. <gasps> oh, Laura. She was insured for $40,000, wasn't she? Yeah. 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 Well, what difference does that make now? A lot of difference, fella. I want you to meet someone. Come in, Sykes. Yes, Captain. Did you hear Detective Miller's report clearly? Yes, sir. Was he telling the truth? No. He lied. What are you talking about? I didn't go to the police when you told me. I hid in the cellar. I saw you go upstairs. I saw you get your wife and go to Trevelyan's place. I listened at the door. I heard you shoot Trevelyan and then murder your wife. Captain, the man's insane. Yes, Miller. A homicidal maniac. I'll take away his coat. You see? He's handcuffed. I don't get it. He's the slasher. He? It's impossible. I told you about that melody. Why, it's still on Trevelyan's piano. Trevelyan copying down that melody after he heard Sykes whistle it. Yeah. I whistled the whole thing for him. But the knives I found in Trevelyan's trunk. I put them there. I know who you were. Sykes was trying to frame Trevelyan. He's made a complete confession, Miller. But how did you find out Will that... When you he... asked us to check on Trevelyan, 
we discovered that he's quite a famous, if eccentric, composer. I checked up on the other people in the building at the same time. I found out that Sykes escaped from the State Institute for the Insane two years ago. He's confessed. Yeah. I'm the slasher. Why should Trevelyan become famous for what I'd done? You had a perfect crime all figured out, Miller. But you made one little mistake. You decided the wrong person was the slasher. Even a copper can't pull a perfect one, Miller. So, I'm telling you all this because... In ten minutes, I won't be able to tell nobody anything. Ever since I made my report, I've been... been hearing that song in my head. Like, like somebody whistling it. Soon I... I... I won't hear that either. <laughs> it's a nice tune. Kind of sad. The uh, moral for tonight's story is never quarrel with your wife. Avoid strife. If that doesn't work, get a carving knife. <laughs> now, there's the perfect formula for domestic bliss. Don't you think so, Mary? I do not. Oh, well, then I'll give you another one. You'll love this one. Beat her till she's black and blue. Break her arms and legs in two. Then tell her to brew a cup of Lipton tea for you. <laughs> oh, I give up. <laughs> All I can hope is that folks don't pay any attention to all these peculiar things you say about Lipton. And I guess they don't. The proof is that more people drink Lipton tea than any other brand. But if any of you folks haven't tried Lipton, then why don't you do so now before Mr. Raymond says a word more about it? Why not let that famous brisk flavor speak for itself? Well, now, if you weren't too caught up by tonight's story, let me tell you about next week's gory little tale. It's, uh, about a beautiful woman who holds your hand tells you about the future. Of course, she's kind of pessimistic. She sees a man with a knife stuck in his throat, the girl waving gaily from the gallows. And listen to this. Our star will be the glamorous motion picture actress, Wendy Berry. Let's make it a day now. Huh? Oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is The uh, Lucky Sip by Craig Wright. And now I guess it's really time to close that squeaking door until next week at the same time when Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup bring you another Inner Sanctum Mystery directed by Hyman Brown. So until then... <sighs> Good night. Is in time. <laughs> Folks, if you'd like to try a modern food with a real old-fashioned flavor, then try Lipton's noodle soup. You see, Lipton's comes in an envelope, and all you have to do is empty the contents into boiling water, and in no time at all, soup's on. And what a delicious, chickeny-tasting soup it is. It really tastes homemade, and it's brimming with golden, tender egg noodles. Lipton's is economical, too. It costs less and makes more than canned soups. So, folks, don't forget to try Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Lipton Soup presents Inner Sanctum Mystery, starring Simone Simone. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is, of course, Raymond, your host. Uh, please come in, won't you? Make yourself comfortable in any gloomy corner. We 
had intended to have a real surprise for you tonight. Instead of myself, we were going to have a guest ghost to act as host. But, uh... Unfortunately, this real ghost caught pneumonia and he's in a very grave condition. The doctors have given up all hope. He's uh, going to become alive. <laughs> well, Mr. Raymond, I must admit I'm glad that that ghost couldn't come. Hmm? It's difficult enough to talk to you. But heavens, I wouldn't know what to say to a ghost. Oh, well, that's simple, Mary. All you have to do is find out whether it's uh, a he ghost or a she ghost. And if it's a she? Oh, well, then you compliment her on her appearance. You say, darling, what a divine sheet you're wearing. <laughs> that's right, Mr. Raymond. Hmm. The ladies are always interested in something new to wear. Hmm. And right now, I'm going to tell them about something they'll all want. It's a lovely piece of jewelry, a real sterling silver medallion about an inch in diameter. It's the kind of jewelry you find at those smart shops on Fifth Avenue in New York. But the only way you can get it is from Lipton's. The medallion is decorated with a Chinese inscription, and it's hung on a narrow black rayon satin ribbon. That's the height of fashion this year, you know. And here's how you get the medallion. Just send 25 cents and the box top from a package of Lipton's. The tea with the brisk flavor. To the Lipton Tea People, Box 92, New York City. Yes, that's Box 92 in New York City. And uh, now it's time to begin. Our story is called The Black Art. It's an original tale by Milton Lewis. And our star tonight is that glamorous motion picture star, Simone Simone, who played the role of Claudine. So, uh... Gather close and get ready to hear a sweet little tale that'll make you wake up screaming for at least the next two weeks. You all set? Now remember, if you don't want your hair to stand on end, get someone to sit on your head. Okay? <laughs> all right, now, let's, uh, let's hear Larry Gifford tell you his story in his own words. <laughs> I wish I never heard that scream. I wish I never saw a body lying there. Blood all over the room. A knife on the floor near her throat. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget how I picked up the knife. I'll never forget the sweat that came creeping out all over me when I heard the door slam. Stand where you are. You make a move, I'll blow your head off. Don't you, copper. Drop that knife. Okay. What's your name? Larry. Larry Gifford. Look, I'm from Chicago. Stranger, huh? Yeah, what of it? What's her name? Her? I, uh, I don't know. I never saw her before. Look, you don't have to frisk me. I haven't got a gun. Shut up. Listen, I, I know it looks bad, but you see, my room's downstairs. I heard a scream and I... Give me back that wallet. Yeah. Ugh. Your hand's up. <laughs> Roll papers. What of it? So I'm an ex-con, so what? You don't know her, huh? No, I don't. I... What? What have you got there? Just a picture I found in your wallet, mister. Picture of her. To Larry. With all my love, Nancy. Reckon you forgot about this, huh? Yeah, but look, I didn't kill her. I, I Shut I... up. I think I heard that screaming came up here. Put out your hands. Sure. You can have them. Here. Come back here. Come back. crowd of streets and Adley. They got him when I heard the shots and the scream. I was dumped in jail. Well, this was a little bird in the bio country, not far from New Orleans. I was the biggest thing that hit the town since Ripley's Believe It or Not. For them jerks, my trial was a bigger show than Carmen Miranda and Gypsy Rose Lee doing a trapeze act. In no time at all, they sentenced me to be hung. <laughs> It was the night before they were going to take me to the state pen for the necktie party. I was sleeping. Dreaming I was in Africa. They were beating them drums. Tom-toms. Suddenly I woke up. Moonlight was shining through the bars of my cell. I listened. Someone was beating like a tom-tom on the wall of my jail. <whistles> Who is it? Who's doing that? Larry Gifford. Yeah, that's me. Were you beating on the wall? Yes. I'm under your cell window. What do you want? Drop one end of your ties over the bars. Okay. There. I've got it. What are you doing? Pull up your tie. Okay. Got it? A gun. 
gun. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Good luck. Goodbye. Thanks, baby. Whoever you are. What's going on there, Gifford? Huh? Oh, nothing. Why? I heard talking. Oh, I, I was talking in my sleep. You never done that before. I never was going to be hung before. What's you holding there? Come here, I'll show you. What's that? A gun? Yeah, and it's got enough bullets to fill your head with lead. Go over here. Open that door. Open that door. Give it to you between the eyes. Go on. Don't shoot. Okay. Okay. Now I'll take your gun. Give me those keys. See how you like it in there for a while. So long. Stop him. He's near the stretch. Let's go. He's near the stretch. bar. Someone told me it was a good joint where they don't ask any questions. It was. I had a few drinks. I was leaning on the bar, looking at a paper. How are you drinking? Scotch. Buy me one. I gave her the once over. I know something about Dave since she was dynamite with class. She was something. Well? Set up another, Charlie. Cigarette? Thank you. It's a nice cigarette holder. Must cost at least a C. You know a lot, don't you? Enough. I know you. Do you? Sure. There's something about... Wait a second. Here. Here in this evening's paper, your picture. Oh, it's not a very good picture, is it? After seeing you, no. Claudine Lucerne. Recently returned from France. Elected head of art committee. Miss Lucerne, member of one of New Orleans' oldest and wealthiest families. I've read it. Turn the page. Why? I want to show you something. Okay. There. Larry Gifford of Chicago, wanted for murder, is sought by police after sensational Jane Blair. I don't read anymore. Why? Feel something against your side? Yes. It's a gun. I'm holding it in my pocket. Don't be afraid. I won't give you away. Got a light? Yeah. What do you want? Listen to that music. That tapping. What about it? The way you're tapping your cigarette holder against your glass. I'm just keeping time to the music. I heard that tapping before. Yeah, sure, in the cell. And I heard your voice before. Did you? You gave me the gun. Shh. Now let me hear you. Uh, uh, what, what's, what's this all about? You'll find out. Relax. I, I can't. I, I, I guess I had a few too many. My head, I feel like I'm sp spinning around. Getting dizzy. <laughs> Two green eyes Pink with blood around the edges Looked at me out of a queer furry head It was the head of a bat It smiled It had sharp little bat teeth That had pink on them There was an ache in my throat I looked again It wasn't a bat's face it was hers. Claudine's. I was dreaming. Larry? Hmm? Oh, well, where am I? My suite at the hotel. Ah, how'd I get here? You passed out at the blue bottle. I brought you here. When? Two hours ago. Oh, I must have been sleeping. I had the queerest dream. I thought... I... <clears throat> oh, oh. What's the matter? My, my throat. That pain. Like a knife. Those, those green eyes of yours. That red mouth. Those white teeth. Look, we're, we're going to have a showdown right now. I'm, I'm... Where's my gun? I took it. Look, what do you want with me? 
Oh, nothing you don't want to do yourself. Just don't talk in riddles. Have you have you ever been in love? Sure, dames are always falling for me. Why? I, I guess that's what happened to me. Are you kidding? No. Do you think I'd get you out of jail if I were? But I, I never saw you before. I saw you at the trial. That's that's where it happened. Oh, how, how can a dame like you go for a guy like me? I don't know. But it happened. I, I don't believe it. I'm sorry. Come here. Yes? I'm going to kiss you, baby. Larry. Oh, Larry. Yeah, it's a funny thing to do. Kiss a guy on the neck. Better wipe that lipstick off. I can... Hey. What's the matter? My handkerchief, that ain't lip rouge on my neck, it's blood. No, you're making a mistake. My neck's bleeding. What, what kind of a dame are you, anyway? I'm getting off. No, don't. If you go, I'll tell them who you are. Oh, you will. Yes, uh, I'll... You... Oh! You won't tell them for a while, baby. <laughs> Grady's joint in the old city of New Orleans was just a place. She'd never find me in that dump. Nobody'd ever find you there. I got a room. I went to sleep. I was safe. Then I heard it again. That same rhythm. It woke me up. I heard it, but I couldn't believe it. How, how could she know I was here? Or was it her? There's nobody in the room. I opened the door. Nobody outside. I slammed it. The beating stopped. I turned around. It's looking into the muzzle of a gun. Sit down, Larry. <laughs> How'd you get here? My Grady ran to the room next to you. There's an connecting door. What? What's the idea of the gun? Can't you guess? Are you you going to kill me? Maybe. Well, you're, you're going to a lot of trouble to bump off a guy who's going to be hung anyway. Do you want to die? No. There is a way you can live. How? By coming with me. Yeah. What else have I got to do? Marry me. You're right out of your head. You hate me? No. No, I, I, I don't. I don't hate you. I'm, I'm scared of you. Yeah, I, I've never been scared of anybody the way I'm scared of you. Scared enough to do as I say? Maybe. I had hoped you would love me. Maybe I do. You're lying. No. No, baby. <laughs> it's no use. Look, what are you going to do? Kill you? No, put the gun down. Give me a break. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that Claudine's a kid of her words. When she tells someone she's gonna kill him, she does it. She'd make a wonderful wife for some Frankenstein monster. She's attractive, a good killer, and she has a well-developed taste for blood. Then why should I hand her over to some other guy? She's just a gal for me. Nonsense, Mr. Raymond. Why, Mary Bennett, I believe you're jealous. I am not. Yes, you are. You're thinking what a handsome couple you and I would make strolling down the avenue, me dressed in a shroud, and you wearing your new sterling silver medallion. Now, mm. don't you go making fun of my lovely medallion, because I want all the ladies to send in for one. I know they're going to enjoy wearing it, because it's made of solid sterling silver, and it's really a fine piece of jewelry. Besides, there's a true story behind this medallion, an inspiring story. It seems that the original was given to an American flyer by Chinese guerrillas who rescued him after he'd bailed out over enemy territory. The flyer was told that the Chinese characters on the medallion would identify him and bring him safely through the lines. Well, he did get through. And only then did he learn that the medallion said, Good luck, in Chinese. Now, there's a story to tell your friends. And to get this good luck charm, just like the one the flyer carried, all you have to do is send 25 cents and the box top from a package of Lipton's, the tea with the brisk flavor, to the Lipton Tea People, Box 92. That's Box 92, New York City. 
Now, uh, let's get back to our star, Simone Simone, who seems to be making life hard for a guy named Larry. And the last time we looked in, she had just shot him. But I've got a tip that that's only the beginning of his troubles. Uh, how about it, Larry? What happened then? I went down in a heap when she fired. The bullets caught me in the thigh. I lay there. I made out like I was dead. Larry. Larry. She fell for it. She bent over me. A gun in her hand. Larry, are you... Oh! Take it easy, kid. Let go of my hand. Not like I get that gun. Let go. Let go. Now get that gun if I have to break your arm. No, to... Oh. Okay. I've got it now. You shot me in the leg, but I'm still strong enough to get rid of you. Larry. I'm no angel, baby, but you're worse. Here's something I heard about, but I never believed. How'd you know I'd be here? How'd you know I'd be in the blue bottle? Go on, answer me. I've got nothing to tell you. Oh, you don't have to. It was magic. Black magic. Somebody nobody'd believe if I ever told him. It's only one thing to do with you. Yes? Kill you. But I ain't taking any chances like you did with me. When I kill you, you're going to stay dead. Those tom-toms are going to stop forever. You think so, Larry? I know it. Come here. Larry, Shut I... up. No! Oh! I knocked her out cold. She lay on the floor. Put the muzzle of the gun to her temple. She was so beautiful, it made you shiver. I pulled the trigger. I looked. What I saw nearly made me pass out. A little blue vein on her temple was beating. There wasn't a scratch on her. A little curl of red hair was twisted around her ear. Was I seeing things? I aimed the gun at her heart. Nothing. Not a speck of blood. I stuck the muzzle between her eyes. Shot till the gun clicked empty. I looked. The white skin on her face looked more beautiful than ever. I had to get away. Out of the same city where she was. Out of the same state. The same world. I let out for the open country. To the bayous on the river back in New Orleans. My wounds festered as I dragged myself through the swamps. And I got a fever. It was like a nightmare. In my head, I kept hearing those town traps. I couldn't take a train or a bus or go to a doctor. I'd be caught. One night, I saw a big house shining in the moonlight. I decided to take a chance. I knocked at the door. What is it? Sorry, miss. I was hunting. I had an accident in my leg. Oh, if you let me come in and call a doctor, I'd be very grateful. You don't want to come into this house. Oh, can't you see I need help? You'll never be helped here. There's nothing good here, only evil and fear. So go away, please. I'm warning you. Go away before my sister comes out. What's the matter with you? Don't you see I can hardly move? Go away while you still have the strength to crawl away. Now, believe me. Tell Mr. Gifford to come in and close the door, Cassie. Uh, that voice. That's my sister. Yes, your sister. Claudine Lassan. Good evening, Larry. I was wondering when you'd get here. You know him? Yes. Mr. Gifford and I are old friends. Friends? How can you have a friend? Now, Cassie. He's someone like you. You mustn't mind her, Larry. Cassie isn't quite well. I don't know who you are, Mr. Gifford. But I do know that she's brought you here to kill me. Cassie? I knew it would happen on a night like this when the moon was full. She's been preparing for it for months. I've told everyone about it, but no one will believe me. I've told them again and again, and they say I'm insane. They think I've lost my mind. But she is going to murder me tonight while the moon is full. She's going to murder me. She's going to murder me. Go to your room, Cassie, immediately. Yes. Yes, I'll go. I'll go. How did you get here? I live here. Come, Larry. You must know by this time that you can't fight me. Yes, I... I thought I'd never see you again. I'm not, I'm not well. I've got a fever. Hey, that tom tom being in my brain. I can't stop it. It's getting louder and louder. I blacked out. When I opened my eyes again, I was in a soft bed with clean sheets. Someone had dressed my wounds. The moonlight came into my room like a living yellow ghost. Then I heard it. Screamed. Just like the one Nancy made when she was killed. I limped out of bed, went to the room next door. 
It was Kathy on the floor. Murdered. The knife was still in her neck. And I heard it again. The tom-tom. Queer sounding this time. I felt myself beginning to sway to the rhythm like a dancer. Then I did something I couldn't stop myself from doing. I put my hands down, drew out the knife. I wiped my bloody hand on my shirt. Suddenly I looked up. She was there. Claudine. Drop the knife, Larry. What? What have you got in your hands? These? These came from the skeleton of someone who was once alive. You're not a woman. You're a devil. I'm going to... Don't come any closer, Larry. I don't want to kill you just yet. Just, just yet? So we're close to the payoff. Yes. You're trembling, Larry. Who are you? There's no reason why I cannot tell you now. You don't believe, do you, that there are unseen powers that can be controlled by someone who knows how? I can believe anything about you. Thank you, Larry. Your heart is pounding like a throbbing drum, isn't it, Larry? You can feel death close, can't you? What have you got to say to me? I'm going to tell you a story, Larry. The story of a child who was brought up on this estate by a strange old woman, a conjure woman. In her head were all the black arts of the world. She taught me. Why are you telling me this? It amuses me to watch you, a murderer, helpless and terrified. So terrified you can hardly breathe. I find it very exciting. Then it, it was blood I found on my handkerchief. Yes. It is one of the ways to gain complete power over a person. In a tanta. Another spell to make you do what I want. In the murder of your sister? You want me to be the patsy for that? You're beginning to understand. You see, Cassie and I inherited the estate. There's really not enough for both of us. You tell him I did it. Yes. And then I killed you in self-defense. What are, you, what are you looking at me that way for? I was remembering something. Remembering? Oh, that kiss baby, wasn't it? You're a devil, but still a woman, ain't you? You didn't forget that kiss, did you? No. Well, what are you going to do? Come here. Closer. Well? Don't move. There. You, you're going to let me live? Live? When it's my life against yours, you fool. I'll put that gun down. When I'm finished. Please, give me a break. I'm begging you. Begging you? I'll do anything you say. Just give me a chance, please. Here it comes, Larry. Between your eyes. How do you feel today, Gifford? Much better, officer. Legs healing fine. We checked that crazy story you told us. It's all true. Tell me something. How'd you know to come to the Lucerne place when you're dead? You arrived just in time. A second later and she would have killed me. Kathy, her sister phoned us, told us to come out. When I came in the room and saw her threatening you with a gun, I shot at her. I had to. Got her in the shoulder. You should have killed her. The state will take care of that. Did you believe the story she told you at first? That I killed her sister and she was killing me in self-defense? No. You see, Gifford, we'd found out that you weren't a murderer. You didn't kill Nancy Warren. The man who did that confessed. That made her whole story false. How, how did she do it, Captain? How did she find out where I always went? Police psychiatrist said she did, did it by post-hypnotic suggestion. She told you where to go while you were asleep, and you never realized that you were always doing just what you wanted. But the bullets, when I shot at her and tried to kill her, how would she do that? It was all carefully planned. The first shot she fired at you were real bullets. The others in the gun were blanks. She wanted to get you so thoroughly under her power that you think she couldn't be killed. You see, all this so-called black magic has an explanation. Has it? I wonder. <laughs> Oh, that black magic. <laughs> I tell you what I'm going to do. Step 
Right this way, friends, and get yourself a post-hypnotic suggestion. Spell it backwards and you get murder. Uh, what's that? You can't spell. Ain't you lucky? Talking of luck, Mr. Raymond, I think Larry Gifford was mighty lucky to escape that awful woman. Oh, well, you see, Mary, it's very simple. He probably wore one of your good luck medallions. Oh, now that's plain uh, silly. A man wouldn't wear a medallion on a black rayon satin ribbon. It's the ladies who like jewelry. Yes, that's why I know that they'll appreciate this solid sterling silver medallion that the Lipton people want to send them. And, ladies, here's how you get it. Send just 25 cents, which includes tax and postage, with a box top from a package of Lipton's, the tea with the brisk flavor, to the Lipton Tea People, Box 92 in New York City. The uh, moral for tonight's assault on your nerves is never marry a dame who sucks blood out of your throat. Such dames give you a uh, pain in the neck. <laughs> By the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is The Red Right Hand by Joel Townsley Rogers. Yes, and don't you dare miss next week's story directed by Hyman Brown and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about a pair of murderers who get scared to death. They're more frightened than the guy they're murdering. So if you hear some static on your radio next Tuesday, it'll just be their knees knocking together. <laughs> Well, now I guess it's really time to close that there squeaking door. So, uh, <clears throat> good night for real. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, the next time you send a box of food to your boy overseas, be sure to include a package or two of Lipton's noodle soup mix. You see, Lipton's is just like a taste of home. Mm -hmm. It has the same homemade chickeny taste as the soup you make yourself. The soup your boy's always been so fond of. That's why it's such a thoughtful, welcome little gift to send Lipton's. And as you know yourself, Lipton's noodle soup makes a grand snack. So remember, send a package or two to your boy. And remember to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Last time, Walt. Please let me go. Nuts. Then it has to be this way. Hap, no. Drop that gun. Uh. I'm sorry, Walt. Very sorry. I've known all along you had to die tonight. But I didn't know. I killed you. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Man Who Died Yesterday. <laughs> of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story by William Morwood is The Man Who Died Yesterday. Afternoon on a little traveled highway. 
A strange-looking man in threadbare clothes stands hopefully by the roadside. A car comes around the curve. Slows up. Stops. Looking for a lift? Are you headed for New York? That's me. Hop in. Thank you. It's very good of you. I... I'm in a hurry to reach New York. I haven't much time, you see. Yeah, sure. I picked you right off for a big executive on his way to a board meeting. Nothing like that. (laughs) It's just that, oh, there's something terribly important I've got to do. A mission. Oh, Salvation Army, huh? No, United Nations. I have to see the Secretary General before midnight tonight. That leaves me only eight hours. The United... Are you feeling all right, pal? Yes. I was sick, but... I'm feeling fine now. You don't look so good to me. What is it, Ghost? Of course, you could do with a haircut, too. I suppose so. I'm afraid I've been out of touch with civilization a long while. By the way, my name is... Rather was... David Hepgood. I am. I'm Walt Griggs. Can't you drive any faster, Walt? We've still got a long way to go, and... Well, I'm worried about this part of the road. There's going to be a rock slide and... Rock slide? Oh, you mean those signs? Ah, that's nothing to worry about. They put them up on... What the... It's all right. Keep going, Walt. We got through safely. Yeah, but... There was a rock slide, just like you said. Of course. But... How did you know? I can see ahead, Walt. See into the future. For 24 hours. <laughs> was nuts, of course, but still, what are the odds against calling a long shot like that? A million to one? A billion? I gave up trying to figure it. We drove along for about an hour and then stopped for gas. There was this hamburger joint right by. Where are we going, Walt? Grab a bite. Oh, but there isn't time. I've less than seven hours now, and by midnight I... got to gas up anyway, and I'm hungry. Come on, Hap. Hello, sugar. Sit down, Hap. What'll it be, boys? Hamburger for me, sweetheart, with onions. What's yours, Hap? I... I'm not hungry. Oh, busy with your speech for the United Nations, huh? Well, I'll just read this racing form while you're thinking. Racing form? Sure, I play the G's all the time. Got some important dough on today's meet. Fifty bucks on Alistair to win in the sixth. Alistair? Yep. I'm afraid you'll lose your money, Walt. What? Don't kid me. Alistair's the hot favorite. It's going to be a walk away. Marble the third won that race. Marble? What are you nuts? He's a rank outsider. A hundred... What do you mean won the race? It hasn't been run yet. Hasn't it? I didn't know. Look, I... Wait a minute. Sweetheart. Yeah? You think you can get the races on the radio? Oh, sure. It's all tuned in. A lot of our customers like to listen Walt, we can't waste time like this. Who can think about a horse race? I can. Remember my 50 bucks. What? He's losing the great race. The crowd is going wild with excitement. They're around the bend now, coming into the straight. Alistair is out in front by two lanes. Uh The rest of the horses bunched. Alistair is going strong. And a boy, where's your marble, Hap? Wait. Entering the last stretch now. It's a walk away for Alistair. Four lanes ahead and no challengers. Wait a minute. Alistair stumbles. Can't regain stride. He's down. What? The chockey's thrown clear, but Alistair... The other horses have gone past. Number eight is out in front. Number eight. Marble the third. Marble the third. Marble the third. And Marble wins. We go. Ah, turn that thing and off. And run for the books, folks. The most extraordinary... I'll be... You knew it all the time, Abby. You knew Marble had to win. Of course. Thought we've got to go. Sure. Sure, Happ. Anything you say. You're the guy I've been waiting for all my life. I didn't need no more figuring to tell me Hat was a gold mine. And I had him first before anybody else could get their hooks into him. The only thing that worried me was the way he talked. All this about midnight, not having much time. I had to use him while I had him, even if it meant taking chances. So while we drove, I worked on a plan. Walt, we've left the New York road. The signs are pointing the other way. I know. I'm taking a shortcut through a town called Hassock. Hassock? Yeah. That name mean anything to you, Hap? Hassock? Think hard. 
Let me see. There's going to be a hold-up there tonight at the factory. Two men involved. There's still the week's payroll, ten thousand dollars. Ten grand, huh? They get away with it? There's a chase, but they shake off the police. Great. Couldn't be better. Why? Where do two men have? You and me. What? No, Walt, no, I'm not a criminal. And I've something else to do with what little time I have left. You're coming with me, Hap. Maybe this will convince you. Her gun doesn't frighten me. Stop the car and let me out. I've got to get to New York. All right, look, I'll make a deal with you. You come with me on the stick-up and I'll drive you straight through to New York without stopping. Are you on? But, but I can't, Walt. My message concerns the whole world. It's the only way you'll get to deliver it. Well, if, if it is the only way. All right. Now, there's something more I've got to tell you, Walt. What's that? We leave a dead man behind. It was getting dark when we hit town. I drove down the main street and onto the factory building beyond. It was all dark except for a light in the cashier's office. Hap and I went in. There was a guy sitting at a desk. Who? Who are you? What do you want? The ten grand in that safe. This is a stick-up, brother. You, you're crazy. There's no ten... Open up. I'll do the talking. I, I warn you, men. You'll be caught for... Shut the... up and start turning that dial. All right. Well, I guess you win. Come on, come on. Snap into it. I'm doing the best I can. That's it. Now hand out those greenbacks. Come on, get a move on. Watch out, Walt. He's turning in an alarm. Oh, you double cross and rat. Oh. Hey. Harry, you. Is the guy that had to be killed, Hap? Yes. Okay, then step on it. The cops will be swarming around like flies. Gaining on us, Walt. I can't go any faster. I'm down to the floorboards already. He'll start shooting soon. You sure we get away? There's no slip up? No. We get away all right. Good. Where did they get you, Walt? My arm. What do we do, Hap? Keep driving till we hit that bend in the road. Yeah? There's a clump of willows around the corner. Pull in there. Okay. Here goes. That's the lights. Off. Like you said. No hurry. Get back to the New York road. I've less than three hours left. Okay, but i got to stop and see a doctor. A doctor? Sure, my arm. Oh, what's the matter, Hap? I, I'm afraid of that doctor. Something happens there that I don't understand. What is it? I don't know. It's something I should have explained before. I can see into the future for you, Walt, and for everyone else. But not for myself. You the doctor? What can I do for you? Oh, my arm. I had a little accident. I was cleaning my gun and went off. Come into my office. Okay. And this man? He's just a friend of mine. Nothing the matter with him. I don't agree. Looks much sicker than you do. No, doctor, really. Your face, it's the color of... No, no I'm all right. Believe me, please hurry with my friend. It'll only take a second. Just get my status Look, open. Let's quit kidding around, doc. I'm the one Quiet. that... Hmm. Good Lord. What's the matter, Doc? Why are you looking at him like that? But it's it's impossible, of course, but there's no heartbeat. No. But but that's impossible. If if your heart wasn't beating, you'd be dead. Yes. I've been dead since yesterday. At midnight. Staring at him. The living corpse of the man who died yesterday, Walt, and the doctor draw back in horror. Just who is David Hapgood? Perhaps we'll know when the clock strikes 12 for murder at midnight.
back to Murder at Midnight and The Man Who Died Yesterday. The goose pimples were standing out on me. Here I'd found the guy, I'd been with him for hours, through a hole up in a killing. And now I was hearing from his own lips that he was dead. He gave me the creeps. I wanted to take it in the land, but instead I was froze to the floor. I heard the doc saying, You've been dead since yesterday? Yes, doctor. But that's, that's impossible. There must be some explanation, some obscure heart condition. There is an explanation, but not that kind. You see... I was cheated out of 24 hours at the time of my birth. Eh? And I'm just making up for it now. How do you mean? This will sound fantastic to you, but nevertheless, it's true. I was born on a ship crossing the international date line. I started coming into the world during the last moments of a Friday and finished up early on Sunday. So I skipped a whole day of my life. I've always been living 24 hours ahead of myself. But... But that's sheer... That's gospel, Doc. He can call the turn on anything like he was reading tomorrow's paper. Eh? I told you it would sound fantastic, Doctor. But it is true. When I realized it, I... Well, I tried not to use it for selfish ends. I wanted to help people. But I never could. People would never listen to me, believe me. Finally, I realized that there was no place for me in the world. That man wasn't meant to know the future. So I went away. Up into the woods... Uh, how long ago? About ten years ago. Away from civilization, it was easier. I still knew what was going to happen, of course, but with no way to communicate my knowledge, my conscience was at rest. That is, until last night. Last night? I had caught a cold. It developed into pneumonia. I was deathly sick. I couldn't breathe. And uh, lost consciousness. And then suddenly... At midnight, I was well. Quite well. Not a trace of my illness. I knew what had happened, of course. I was dead. Duh. But I still had my missing day to live. I knew I must use it for the benefit of mankind. How? Oh. There's something I know. Something that involves the fate of millions of people. Unless some action is taken within the next few hours. What action? What is it? I'm sorry, but I can't tell you, Doctor. I can't tell anyone except the Secretary General of the United Nations. And I must reach him before midnight, before I'm really dead. It's getting on to ten o'clock. Now do you understand why I'm in such a hurry? I'll say, let's get going, Hap. Never mind about my arm, that can wait. No, listen to me, Hap. You can't leave. What? As far as your being able to read the future is concerned, well, it doesn't matter whether I believe that or not. But that heart condition of yours, that's something unique in medical history. Now, you've got to let me take you to a hospital where it can be studied properly. Lay off that stuff, now, I'll phone for an ambulance. Stay away from that phone. He's mine. Yours. But do you realize what this can mean to science? Do don't you... give me that talk. You just want to grab him off for yourself. Uh, nonsense. Stop it. Stop it, both of you. I don't belong to anyone. I'm not a specimen to be examined. I've got a mission to perform for all of civilization. I've got to get to the United Nations. Now, before. now, no matter how you've been deluding yourself, young man, you're terribly sick. I'm going to phone the hospital. Okay, and... you asked for it. Do you? I must get away from here. Have, have come back here. Come back here. Okay, you did that. It won't hurt you if you're not. Oh... Holy smoke. That bullet went right through you and only knocked you down. Let go of me, Walt. Try to run away, huh? I've got to get to New York. Nothing can stop You're me. You're coming with me, Hap. i got plans for us as long as you last. You've got your 10000 What more do you want? A chance to run it up to 100000 and we can do it. I know the police and you can call the cars. But there's no time. I'm figuring on only a couple of hours. That's plenty. Listen, Walt. I'm asking you for the last time. Let go. Do a decent thing for once in your life. Nuts. What I'm trying to do, it's for you as much for millions of others. I never gave a cuss about the others and I'm not starting now. All right, Walt. And has to be this way. Hap, drop that gun. Oh! I'm sorry, Walt. Very sorry. I'd known all along that you had to die tonight. But I didn't know that I'd kill you. Type, ain't you? Sorry? Oh, that's all right. I don't like fellows a gad too much. You know, it, it was nice of you to pick me up back there on the road. No, I was lonely. Besides, I, uh... Well, I needed reassurance. How's that? 
you see, I've been out of touch with civilization for some time, and the people I've met today weren't inspiring. <laughs> You're a strange guy, do you know it? Am I? Yeah, I mean, the way you talk and look. You don't look quite real. Oh, now, now, now don't get me wrong. I, I like you a lot. Oh, I'm glad. Well, for instance, we've been driving for nearly an hour now, and you haven't even made a pass at me once. I'm afraid that wouldn't do either of us much good. Yeah, but just the same, a girl appreciates a little thing like that. Incidental, what's your name? You can call me Hap. Hi, Hap. I'm Hazel. How do you do? Well, I guess I ought to tell you something about myself. Well, I know a little already. Huh? You're going to New York to find your fiancé, aren't you? Yeah, a guy called... Say, how'd you know that? You're going to look him up in the phone book and call. And then you're going to uh, find out that he's married. What? Oh, you're kidding me. Jim wouldn't do a thing like that. He'd wait for me forever. He said he would. And Hey, why are we stopping? Almost out of gas. Howdy, folks. Uh, fill her up as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, how far to New York from here? Well, you ought to be at George Washington Bridge in about ten minutes. Fine. You folks hear about all the excitement on the highway? No, what happened? Well, the cops are looking for a crazy killer. Murdered three people. One was a stick-up, the other two was a doctor and his own sidekick. Oh, what's he look like? Well, according to the radio, he's got, got a chalk white face, a mop of hair that looks like it hasn't been cut in weeks, no hat, and, uh, and... What's the matter, bud? What are you staring at? You're... Your friend, I, I... I gotta get something out of the office. I'll be back in a minute. He's going to phone the police. This is your chance to get out, Hazel. Oh, no. I'm staying with you, Hap. Now, you better get moving and keep moving. We're being followed. We may make it yet. Are you frightened, Hazel? Being with me? I guess I should be, but I'm not. Thank you. Somehow I, I can't believe you're crazy. If you killed anyone, you knew what you were doing and you had a good reason. Thank you again. You don't know what that means to me. Have people always been scared of you, Hat? Most people. Till I met you. Why couldn't I have met you sooner, Hazel? Well, what's wrong with now? It's a little late. Not for me. You honestly mean that? Sure. Well, then perhaps it's going to be all right after all. Perhaps we'll meet again. What do you mean? I didn't mean to tell you this. Perhaps I shouldn't now. It may cause you pain. Go ahead. I can stand it. After you call Jim, your fiancé, and find that he's married, you... Start across the street in a daze. A taxi is driving too fast and. Uh... It's got my number on it, huh? Yes, I'm sorry. And yet, in a way. Uh, what did that sign say, Hazel? Uh, uh, George Washington Bridge, two miles. Oh, I'm going to make it. There's still time. The Secretary General is in his home. They'll let me in when they hear my message. I'll have most of an hour with him. It's not quite 11 yet. 11? Hey, your watch must have stopped. What? Look, look, there's a clock in the building. Where? Up to the right, there. Three minutes of 12. Oh. Well, what's the matter, Hap? Oh, I can't make it. Oh, I've lost. Unless... A telephone. There's still time for that. Well, why are you talking here? There's no phone. In that house, the family's all in bed upstairs. There's a telephone in the parlor. But the door is sure to be locked. They've forgotten to latch the parlor window. Hey, how do you know all these things? Never mind now. Goodbye, Hazel. But I'll be waiting here. No, you better start down the road. The police mustn't find you. But when you come back, I'll be here. I won't be back, Hazel. This is goodbye. For keeps. But you've got to come back. You've got to. Operator, get me the Secretary General of the United Nations at his home. Hurry, please, it's urgent. Hello? The Secretary General, please, it's terribly important. No, I've got to speak to him personally. I. Uh... Midnight. Hello? 
Will you get him for me? There's no time left and... Uh, never mind. I'll tell you. It's... It's about... Uh, I'll swear to that. You must have climbed in this window. You better go in and have a look. There was a girl with him when he left my gas station. She ought to be around. Where's the light? Here. There he is. On the floor. And he looks... He's dead, all right. No wonder. Look at that hole in his chest. Wait a minute. There's something funny here. That wound never bled. Huh? And the only way that could happen is if he was dead before the bullet hit him. Two men staring at a corpse that is finally still. Still forever. The corpse of the man who died yesterday. While outside, somewhere in the night, a restless spirit keeps a rendezvous that none can avoid. And the distant clocks chime the last notes in epilogue for... Murder! At midnight. again when death brings time to a full stop and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of David Hapgood was played by Stuart Brody. Vandell Kramer was Walt. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Thompson? The, uh, the King of Hearts. Colonel Moore? The Five of Clubs, Mr. President. Count Rizzini? Come, Count, we are waiting. What is your card? Lasso di Spada. I beg your pardon? The Ace of Death. Witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Ace of Death. <laughs>
And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story, based on Robert Louis Stevenson's immortal suicide club, is by Max Ehrlich. Its title, The Ace of Death. I stood there on the bridge and stared down into the swirling fog. It hid the river like a white shroud. I shivered. It'd be cold down there, freezing cold. I would go down, down, deep into the black, watery depths, my ears bursting and my lungs fighting for breath. And then, finally, there would be silence. Silence. And eternal peace. Somewhere, a clock began to chime eleven. The last hour. The last hour of a man's life. My life. I, John Evans, ill and broke without family or friends. Sick and weary of the constant struggle among earthbound mortals. Looked forward to my new future. Death. I put one foot over the bridge rail... My heart pounded. My head throbbed. And then someone came out of the mist and seized me from behind. No, 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 you fool. Don't do it. Not this way. Let me go. Let me go while I still got the courage. Did you hear what I've got to say? Why did you stop me? Why? I wanted to die. I wanted to. I sympathize with you, young man. You see, I too am tired of life and, and seek death. You? You want to die? Yes, but not by drowning. No, my boy. I've made other arrangements. The river is not only a dull way to die, it's positively sordid. The very idea makes me shudder with distaste. Wait, I I don't understand. It's very simple, young man. Most of us are too commonplace about the the hereafter. We enter it with with morbid fear and without imagination. Actually, death can be glorious. Glorious? Yes, a great new change from our ordinary lifetime routine. A journey into an uncharted world. A man should meet death on the wings of adventure. It should be an exciting and delightful experience. Death? Exciting and delightful? Why not? I've already arranged my decease along these lines. And since you and I have an interest in common, why not join me? Huh? We'll seek death's private door together. Come, young man. Come along with me. Where? To my club. I'll be glad to recommend you for membership. Your club? Yes. It caters to a clientele of gentlemen like ourselves. We call it the Hereafter Club. The whole thing was mad, insane. And yet, yet it was intriguing, too. I looked hard at the elderly gentleman who'd come out of the fog to pull me from the brink of death, only to offer me a pleasanter and more delightful variety later. He repeated his invitation to join him, and I could see that he was perfectly sincere. I decided to go with him, even though I secretly considered him some kind of a madman. After all, what could I lose now? We took a cab and stopped at a grim-looking building in the silk stocking district on the east side. My elderly friend, whom I now knew as Frederick Whitney, took me into a luxurious reception room and asked me to wait there until he saw the president of the club. Finally, the president himself came out to greet me. He was a man of about 50 with a bald spot on his head, piercing gray eyes and a thin mouth. He smiled and extended his hand to me. Welcome to the Hereafter Club, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Whitney has recommended you very highly, and I'm delighted to count you among our members. I am pretty vague as to... What all this is about, but Mr. Whitney mentioned something about a $400 initiation fee, and, well, I'm tut, afraid tut, I... Tut, my boy, Mr. Whitney knew you were in delicate financial straits and took your initiation fee upon himself. Oh. You were fortunate indeed, Mr. Evans, that he happened along and rescued you from the river. Such a morbid way of entering the hereafter would have been tragic indeed. <laughs> Isn't death in any form... Uh, tragic? By no means, Mr. Evans. Death can be a triumph, a fine, heady wine, when so designed by a connoisseur. Come, Mr. Evans, follow me. 
you are about to embark on an exciting and unforgettable experience. Like a man in a dream, I followed the president into a large room. There was a green baize table in the center of it, and several men in evening dress lounged around the room drinking champagne. They seemed uh, nervous and distraught. And when they laughed, it was high-pitched and too loud. They seemed to be waiting for something to happen, some event to begin. As the president and I stood at the door, he turned to me and smiled. These men, Mr. Evans, are charter members of the Hereafter Club. They come from all walks of life, but they have one common desire, death. I see. And uh, what happens now? Our procedure is very simple. We all play a game of cards. A game of cards? A simple but fascinating game of cards. That is, these gentlemen play. As president of the Hereafter Club, I am the dealer. And uh, what is the game? Each man draws a card and turns it face up. The man who is fortunate enough to draw the ace of spades dies. For this is the card of death. And uh, how does he die? By the hand of the man who draws the ace of clubs. Oh, I see. The ace of clubs eliminates the ace of spades. <laughs> Precisely. I, uh, how many of these games do you play a night? Just one. But as you can see, Mr. Evans, during its course, a man can live a lifetime of adventure. For this makes of death an exciting game of chance. A game to whip the blood and make the pulses race. You see, one never knows whether he will draw the fatal ace of spades tonight or whether he will survive for weeks or even months. A question, Mr. President. Yes? How much of this can a man stand? I can only answer in this way, Mr. Evans. Our members always come back to the Hereafter Club night after night until they draw the ace of spades. Once a devotee of the game, it's impossible to resist. <sighs> now, but come. We're ready to begin. <laughs> In a kind of hypnotic trance, I followed the president into the room. But when the members saw him, their conversation stopped suddenly. They put down their champagne glasses, straightened. Their faces grew pale and tense, their eyes brilliant with a mixture of fear and anticipation. The president took a fresh pack of cards from his pocket, and like... A magnet attracting iron filings, the men drew close to the baize covered table. I found myself standing next to Frederick Whitney as the president spoke. Gentlemen of the Hereafter Club, the game is about to begin. Someone here tonight will draw the Ace of Spades. Whoever he is, let me assure him that we will arrange his death so that it will appear to be an accident with no breath of scandal and with no unnecessary anguish to his family. We all know that life is only a stage to play the fool upon, as long as the part amuses us. Now we are wearied of our daily performance and have chosen a civilized and exciting way to quit that stage. Gentlemen, the deal. <laughs> It was a fantastic, weird, monstrous experience. The green baize table, the president puffing on his cigar and dealing a card to each man face down. Each man his face like a graven image turning his card up. I, I could feel the sweat pouring down my forehead. My heart pounded like a hammer. And next to me, Frederick Whitney stood rigid, his eyes shining as the president's voice droned on. Mr. Thompson, your card. They here. The three of diamonds. Colonel Moore? The six of hearts. Mr. Denison? It's... It's the jack of spades. Count Rizzini? The eight of clubs. Mr. Evans? Our new member? The... The, <coughs> the queen of hearts. <laughs> Mr. Whitney? Uh, Mr. Whitney, what is your card? The... The ace of clubs. Well, Mr. Whitney, congratulations. You shall be the official agent for tonight. Now let us see whom you will guide into the hereafter. 
Frederick Whitney left the game and went directly into the president's private office. There was only one card to be drawn now, the ace of death. The tension was almost unbearable. I felt like running away from that table, screaming at the top of my voice, but I didn't. I only stood there, riveted, staring at those cards, listening to the president's hypnotic voice. Mr. Benedict. The tray of spades. Mr. Wallace. Nine of diamonds. Mr. Thompson. The uh, king of hearts. Colonel Moore. Your card. The five of clubs. Count Rizzini. Count Rizzini, we are waiting. What is your card? Das of Sparta. I beg your pardon. The Ace of Death. <laughs> I stumbled from that horrible place into the cold night air. I went directly to my room, shaken to the core at what I had seen. In the cold, gray light of the morning, it took on the aspect of a bad dream. A macabre nightmare. I resolved to shrug it off, forget the whole thing. But when I bought a newspaper... The headline struck me like the blow of a hammer. Quickly, my heart beating wildly, I read the lead paragraph. Count Pietro Rizzini, prominent Italian nobleman, was hit and instantly killed at midnight when he stepped off the curb into the path of a speeding taxicab. The Count, who had recently lost his fortune, was with a friend, Mr. Frederick Whitney, when the unfortunate accident occurred. <coughs> And so, in the darkness of the night, a man who has played a grim game and lost goes to his death as the clock strikes twelve for... Murder at Midnight. Here is John Evans again to continue his story. Yes, the Hereafter Club was really a murder club. A racket conceived and created by the polished gentleman who called himself the president. He made a game of death and grew rich on it. For each night, although he lost a member, he made $400, the member's initiation fee. And as the members dropped out, according to Hoyle... There were always plenty of disillusioned neophytes like myself ready to replace them. My first impulse after reading that grisly newspaper announcement was to run to the police. But I had pledged my word to secrecy. And besides, besides, I wanted to go back. I had to go back. The thrill of the game was in my blood. I fought to resist it, but it was like a hypnotic drug. Time after time, I went back to the Green Bay's table, and then, one night... Your card, Mr. Whitney? Come, sir, what is your card? The Ace of Spades. Now, my friend, Frederick Whitney, the man who'd introduced me into the Hereafter Club, had drawn the Ace of Death. His string had run out, he was through. I stared at him. He was calm. And there was a half-smile on his face. He seemed almost glad that for him the game was over. The president kept on dealing. Mr. Thompson, your card? The uh, Jack of Hearts. Colonel Moore? The Four of Spades. Mr. Denison? The, the Ace of Diamonds. Mr. Benedict? Ten of Club. Mr. Evans? They were waiting for me. Come, come, Mr. Evans. Your card? I... <laughs> The ace of clubs. Oh, Congratulations, you know. Mr. Evans. Only your sixth evening at our club, and you draw a winning card. Now, if you'll join Mr. Whitney and myself in my private office, we'll arrange the details. The instructions were simple. I was to drive Mr. Whitney into the garage of his home... Leave him in the car with the motor running. That was all. And so without a word, I got behind the wheel and drove my elderly benefactor to the appointed place. We looked at each other there in the garage, and then he said... John, 
If anyone had to draw the ace of clubs, I'm glad it was you. No, Mr. Whitney, look here. I, I don't want to kill you. I, you know I don't. Let's end this farce. Let's go to the police and end this monstrous thing. No, John. You forget I, I'm a murderer. I have already killed. And I'd rather die by carbon monoxide gas in this comparatively painless way than in the electric chair. But the police will never know that you were responsible for Rizzini's death. If we expose the Hereafter Club, the president would be sure to tell them. There death. must be a way no. somehow. No, my boy. I have chosen death. My time has come. In a way, I'm glad. <coughs> Everything is resolved. There is no more waiting. Waiting for the fatal card. No, it's over now. <coughs> go. Go, my boy. Leave the garage. Slam the door. No, no, Mr. Whitney. <laughs> For God's sake, turn off the motor before... Go, go down before it's too late. Hurry. Don't worry about me. I have sought death for weeks. Now I welcome it. Meet it gladly. I staggered to the garage door, went out and slammed it shut. I heard the motor still going. Five minutes. Ten minutes. I knew... That it was the end now for Frederick Whitney. I looked at my luminescent watch. It was just midnight. I walked the streets for hours after that. Now I was a murderer. True, I had killed with my victim's consent, but I had killed... Now, as the dawn came, I began to shake with a cold rage against the connoisseur of death who called himself the president. Men killed. Men died, and he profited without risk. He always dealt the game and never participated. He was a prince of ruin, and unfortunate men like myself could not resist what he had to offer. And so, like a smiling Satan in formal clothes, exerting a demoniac spell upon the fools who played his game, he watched them destroy each other. That night, I went to the Hereafter Club, and just before the game confronted him... Ah, good evening, Mr. Evans. I see you are back again tonight. Yes, Mr. President, I am back again. And I want to congratulate you... Indeed? On what? On your financial vision in starting this club... By simple mathematics, it nets you a handsome profit. We play five evenings a week, and each evening you make $400. That, Mr. President, adds up to $2,000 a week. Yes, it's a tidy sum, Mr. Evans, to be sure. But to tell you the truth, tonight we play our last game. Our last game? Yes, to be frank with you, Mr. Evans, the sport of the game is beginning to pall on me. I've decided to retire to the country and pursue the delights of horticulture. Flowers are my hobby, you know. Oh, I see. Even you can tire of sending men to their deaths. And just what do you mean by that, Mr. Evans? I mean that you are a coward, Mr. President. You have created a monstrous game, and yet you haven't the courage to play it yourself. You question my courage, then, Mr. Evans? I do, and I question your honor, too. It seems to me that if you profit by your clients, you should take the same risk they do. Hmm. You are a very impertinent young man, but I cannot let your accusations go without rebuttal. <laughs> Indeed, it might be an interesting experience to play this last game myself. A kind of fitting climax to a successful career. Of course, Mr. Evans, I'll demand a handsome apology when it's over. You don't mean that you are actually going to take a chance. Yes, why not? I've often been intrigued by the excitement of my clients. Now, I might as well savor that excitement myself. Before I close the Hereafter Club... <laughs> that the president was going to play created a sensation among the members. He dealt around, and then another, and the third time around, for the second night in a row, I drew the murder card, the ace of clubs. The president smiled his congratulations of what he called my phenomenal luck and continued. Mr. Thompson, your card? The uh, two spades. Colonel Moore? The king of hearts. Mr. Dennison? The... Seven of clubs. Mr. Benedict? Queen of diamonds. And now, gentlemen, I'll turn over my own card. Oh. Congratulations, Mr. President. 
You have drawn the ace of spades. The president's face was immobile. Not an eyelash flickered. We went into his private office and his words were calm as he explained the evening's arrangements. I had drawn the murder card and he had drawn the death card. Yet, judging by his unworried attitude and serene bearing, it might have been the other way around. I couldn't help a flicker of admiration for him. As for me, I was eager to do my part. To kill this man who had been caught at the last moment in his own net. He had sent many a man to his death. And now he had to meet it himself. There is a railroad bridge on the outskirts of town, Mr. Evans. It has a low railing, and below it an express train passes, exactly at midnight. You will push me over that rail into the path of the locomotive. And now, if you're ready, let us go. We didn't speak on the trip out to the bridge. It was a cold night. We stood there... Shivering and waiting. Finally, in the distance, that was it. The midnight train. I could see its bright headlight flickering as it approached. Then the president spoke. Mr. Evans, of course we are not going through with this. Of course we are, Mr. President. Look here, my dear boy. As you know, the Hereafter Club is disbanded. Unlike my clients, I have no desire to die. There's no point in doing so. Well, you are going to die, Mr. President, just as you have sent others. I'll see to it myself. Be reasonable, Mr. Evans. I have everything to live for, and so can you have. Now then, I'm a very wealthy man, and I'm quite sure you could use, say, $10,000. Get close to that rail, Mr. President. I suggest you listen to reason, Mr. Evans. The others died without a whimper. You sent them into the hereafter, and now you're going yourself as you deserve. You're a very stubborn young man, Mr. Evans. Uh, no, drop that gun. Don't. Try to kill me, will you? Oh, well, you got me in the arm, that's all. And now you're going over that trail. Don't, don't. I'll give you anything. Anything over you. No, no. no. Ah. Ah. When the train had passed, I saw what was left of his body on the tracks. Slowly, with dragging footsteps, I walked down the street toward the twin green lights of the police station. Now, like the others, I'm ready for the end. The doors of the police station open and close on the man who trumped the ace of death. The man who now seeks his own dark destiny as the clocks strike twelve for... Murder! At midnight! Remember to be with us again when death deals his final hand and the clocks strike twelve for... Murder at midnight. The part of John Evans was played by Carl Swenson. The president of the Hereafter Club was John Griggs. With music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader.
Mystery is my hobby. Ladies and gentlemen, Barton Drake speaking. For tonight's drama, I select a case history number 116 from my book, Mystery is My Hobby. I call it Death is a Twin. This is the place, Riley. You wait out here. I'm going in. Okay, Chief. I better try again. Come in. Come in. The door's unlocked. I'll call you if I need you, Riley. In here, in the living room. Be right there. You the police? I phoned for the police. Inspector Noah Danton. You're Susan Waterstone? Yes. Yes, okay. Inspector. I'll... Okay, Miss Susan. What's this all about? It's my sister, Claire. Something's happened to her. I know it. Oh? What? She went into the library about 10 o'clock this morning with George Dale, our attorney. Told me if I needed anything to call out. I'm I'm a cripple, you see. Yes, I see the wheelchair. A spine injury. I'm unable to walk a step. Claire does everything for me. If anything's happened to her, what would become of me? No, no, no. Just calm yourself. Maybe nothing's happened to her. But it has. I've been calling for her for the past half hour. She won't answer. Why didn't you wheel yourself into the library and see what was the matter? But I did wheel myself to the door. The door is locked. From the inside? I'm afraid so. I, I can't see through the keyhole. Well, guess I better take a look. Oh, we'll be along, will you, please? I want to see which Yeah, one. yeah, sure. Which one? This door right here. Hmm, locked, all right. Yep, keys in the lock on the inside. Is Wonderstone? Is Wonderstone? Anything the matter? Oh, something's happened. I know it. Yeah, I guess I'll have to break in the door. Oh, no, please don't. That's such a beautiful old door. If you had to break anything, why not a window? Okay, it doesn't make much difference. I'll get Riley to do it. Hey, Riley, try and get in one of the library windows. They're all locked. Break one. Okay, Chief. Riley, you'll be in the jimmy. Oh, I do. What do I do? Oh, maybe she just had a fainting spell. Guess the windows must have been locked. Holy cow. Chief Boss, she's dead. Claire dead? Oh, no. No! Oh, no! Mike Fat, Barton Drake's Chinese houseboy, carefully twirled a bottle of rare old vintage in the ice bucket and carefully adjusted a spotless napkin around the top. Carefully, he set just the right glass on each stand beside the two easy chairs, and then, just as carefully, placed a carpet tack point upwards in the chair where the good Inspector Danton would soon be planting his very ample frame. Mike Fat loved the good Inspector, but he also loved his little joke better. <laughs> Mike, do you up for something? Oh, no. Just putting out very cooling refreshment. All right, if you sound rather suspicious. Okay, I have dinner ready. Inspector's always hungry, you know. Oh, yes, Mr. Drake. Dinner ready? Good. Sure. Oh, Inspector here now, I think. I go. I'll be up in a minute. Well, evening, Mike. Thousand welcome, Mr. Inspector, to the abode of Mr. Drake. Also of humble Mike Flat. Please wait up. Yeah, oh, thanks. Where's Bart? Dinner ready? Mr. Drake enjoying pleasure of admiring new hand-painted necktie in the mirror. Uh-huh. <laughs> please sit down. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, no, no, no. This the chair, please. Huh? What's the matter with this one? Oh, that Mr. Drake's chair, please. Oh, I think I'll stand for a while. I'm tired of sitting. Oh, no, no. Better sit. Old Chinese proverbs say, quote, Man who sits in friend's house is friend of long standing, unquote. <laughs> All right, I... Oh, oh, something the matter? Victor, was that you yelling? I sat on something. Oh, yes, in one moment. Oh, huh. only carpet tax. Mike, did what you... What are you saying? Uh, uh-huh. Carpet tax should be in carpet. Excuse me, please. I get emergency blinding. That conniving, scheming, celestial heathen. I had to take him and... Uh, Inspector, wasn't accused without proper evidence, you know. Evidence? 
Oh, the carpet check. I don't bet you Mike doesn't leave a single clue. Well, I'm... Sit down, Inspector. I'll have Mike for your drink. I'll take mine standing up, thank you. <laughs> I have it your own way. Oh, here, lead cross your bondage. Yeah, well, you can take it right back where you got it. Pour the Inspector a drink, will you, Mike? Not on your life. I'll pour my own. <laughs> All the Chinese proverbs say, he who drinks from white bottle... Get red nose. Well, you get that. <laughs> get out of here. Oh, yeah. Oh, like you. Well, that you can sit down safely now, Inspector, I'm sure. Well, okay. Pour yourself some wine. Okay. Pour mine, too. I'll trust you. Well, Inspector, have a hard day? No, nothing interesting. A few robberies, hit and run driver, wife beat up her husband, and uh, a suicide. So, oh, well, suicides are always interesting. Always some very tragic reason that makes a man take the matter of his life into his own hands. Mm, nothing odd about this one. Just plain open and shut case. Yeah? Who was it? Gal by the name of Claire Waterstone. How did you do it? Poison. Glass of milk. Uh, look, Bart, how about dinner? Fingerprint? Sure. Dead girls on the glass. What did it happen? In the library. Sat there reading a book. Drank a poison milk. Just as calm as you please. Then dropped over dead. Reading a book, huh? Now look, Bart. Don't start getting any ideas. This was suicide. Plain and simple. Why, even all the doors and windows were locked on the inside. We had to bust a window in order to get in. And the only other person in the house was a crippled sister who couldn't walk two steps if the house was on fire. Now, come on, let's eat. Reading a book. Hmm. What uh, book was it, Inspector? Mm-hmm. If there's any satisfaction to you, it was one of yours. Huh? The first edition of Mystery is My Hobby. <laughs> now, will you tell that Chinese boy to start serving the food? Uh, uh, the food will have to wait, Inspector. Huh? If that girl was reading my book when she died, I feel duty-bound to look into this case. But it was suicide. I solved the case myself. Yeah, so it would seem. But anyway, get your hat and coat. We're calling on the remaining Miss Waterstone. Come along, Inspector. Oh, but I'm hungry. <laughs> And now, back to Glenn Langan for the second act of... Mystery is my hobby. Waterstone. Waterstone. You know that name strikes a familiar note, Sir Inspector? Sure, you remember old man Waterstone who made a killing during the First World War? All kinds of publicity. War, profiteer, and all that stuff. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. the newspapers made it so unpleasant for him that he retired. He's been living on his millions ever since. Then he's still alive? No, he kicked off about five years ago. What about his money? Left in trust equally to his two daughters, Susan, the crippled girl, and Miss Claire, the one who committed suicide. Hmm. The mother died when the twins were born. Twins? Sure, Susan and Claire. They were twins. Oh, I see. Uh, we'll pull in here. This is the place. It seems there's another visitor. Huh? That chap's just going in the door. Do you know who he is, Inspector? Mm, no, can't say I do. Well, we'll soon be finding out. Uh, Miss Waterstone isn't at home, gentlemen. Just she... a minute, you. We're the police. Police? Oh, uh, well, that's different. Come right in. Thanks. I uh, thought this matter had all been settled. It has. Well, then what? This is uh, just a final checkup, Mr. Uh, Mr. I'm George Gale, Miss Waterstone's attorney. How do you do? I'm Barton Drake. This is Inspector Norden. How do you do? How do you do? George? George, is that you? Uh, yes, Susan. Is that someone with you? Yes, Susan, the uh, police. And a Mr. Barton Drake. Well, bring him on in. Uh, follow me, gentlemen, please. Sir. Miss Susan is confined to a wheelchair, you know, Mr. Drake. Yes, I've been told. I didn't expect you back, Inspector. I thought this matter was all settled when I took my poor sister's body away. It is settled. It's just that Bart... Uh, Miss uh, Waterstone, I'm Barton Drake. I uh, knew of your father. Oh? Barton Drake, the, the writer? Yes. Susan is very fond of your books, Mr. Drake, so... Oh, yes, indeed. Being confined as I am, I find reading a great relaxation. and I'm particularly fond of mystery stories. I'm very glad of Miss Waterstone. Would you gentlemen care to join me in a cup of tea? I have some here, all nice and hot. I would. I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> Miss Waterstone, I'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. I know this must be a very painful subject to you, but... Well, it's uh... all right, Mr. Drake. I'm only too glad to have someone to talk to. Thank you. Now, Miss Waterstone, do you know of any possible reason why your sister Claire should commit suicide? Why, I... I, I... can give you a very good reason, yes, Mr. Gale. Claire lost all her money. Oh? All that money her father left her? Yes. 
and I was a spendthrift. She ran with a fast crowd, Mr. Drake. Why, I've seen her lose 10000 over a gambling table in one night. Hmm. And if you handled a trust fund, why did you let her? The terms of the will allowed me to make a cash settlement when she was 25. I advised her against, of course, but... Mm -hmm. And she lost it all, eh? Yes, she did. She couldn't take it, I guess, so she took the easy way out. But you still have your share of the money, Miss Waterstone? Oh, yes. I'm able to live very well on the interest of my investment. You see, Mr. Drake, I've... I've taken the precaution never to be a burden to anyone. A very wise move, I'm sure. Uh, Claire didn't think so. She was mad as hops because Susan wouldn't give her half of what she had. Poor Claire. I did take care of her, Mr. Drake. I, I gave her an allowance of $100 a week. I see. Inspector, uh, mm-hmm. I want you to show me around the library. Oh, well, come on. You'll excuse us for a bit, won't you, folks? What's yes, on? indeed. Thank What's you? the matter with you, Bart? I've never seen you act this way before. Uh-huh. Not just over a plain old suicide. Mr. Bella? Yeah. Now, well, come on in if you come. Oh, just a minute, wait a minute. Did you uh, oil this lock when you were trying to get the door open, Inspector? Well, of course not. Riley opened that door with a key from the inside. Yeah. That's strange. Well, now, where was the body? Plunk over in this chair. In the book, my book? Laying in her lap. Hmm. That's the book for fingerprints? Sure, sure. Who's hers? Oh, uh-huh. What was the glass of milk? Laying on the floor. That spot there was the milk. I see. How do you know the milk contains the poison? We analyzed the spot. Now, are you satisfied? What's that broken window? Where Riley came in. Barn, I told you all about this before. Now, what do you find? <laughs> a... <laughs> Look at him. Oh. They both must have liked mysteries. <laughs> you know, here's a book of mine I'd forgotten I'd ever written. Well, I wish you'd go home and write another. I'm hungry. I want to eat. Hmm. Very well, Inspector. Let's go. You mean... Back to your house and good old Mike Fat's dinner? No, Inspector. Down to the morgue. Good evening, Charlie. Oh, good evening, Mr. Drake. You come down to take a look at my customers. We came down to look at a step. Yes, yes, of course. Come right in, gentlemen. How are you this evening, Inspector? I'm starving to death. Good, good. I had a cadaver that came in this morning to starve to death rather thin. Now, what can I show you? I've got all types. Look, we aren't down here to pick out Miss Corpse of 1947. Oh, we'd like to look at Miss Claire Waterstone. Sorry. Claire Waterstone. Yes. Oh, yes. (laughs) I'll see if she's in. Thank you. Yes, yes, here she is. Someone to see you, my dear. Beautiful girl, beautiful girl. Of course, Charlie, of course. You're sure this is the right one? Yes, yes, indeed. I have her case history right here. Got it tied to her big toe. Claire Waterstone poison suicide. Yes, she's the right one, all right. Well, what are you waiting for, Charlie? Just looking at her face. Awful sad. Awful sad. Well, there you are. That judge, Inspector, what a remarkable resemblance. Why not? They were identical twins. Yes, that's not the time for us. Well, that's enough. I've seen all I care to. My pleasure. Come on, Inspector, let's go. You mean that last we're going to eat? Hmm, well, maybe. If Miss Susan will make you a cup of tea. And now, back to Glenn Langan for the third act of... Mystery is my hobby. Well, I hope at last you're satisfied, Bart. Yes, Inspector. I'm satisfied. (laughs) I told you it was suicide all the time. I'm satisfied that it's murder. Uh, Murder? Oh, now, by the Lord. Stop at the drugstore, Inspector. I want to make a phone call. Phone call? Go home. My stockbroker. Stockbroker? Are you nuts? I don't think so. Well, while you're phoning, I'm going to have a double banana split. Hello, Al? 
Bobby Drake. Listen, Al. You know a chap by the name of George Gale? Yes, that's the one, a lawyer. Yeah. Down at the stock exchange, that's right. Okay. Quite a heavy loser, huh? Thanks, Al. That's just what I wanted to know. Yeah, sure. Meet me for lunch tomorrow. All right, bye. And vanilla. And plenty of nuts, Barty. You two already. Yes, Inspector. Come along. We've got work to do. But I just ordered it. No, what's the use? I'm coming. Suicide. Morgue. Murder. Stock broke. <laughs> I give up. You want to solve this case, don't you, Inspector? I've already solved it. All I want to do is eat. Back to the Waterstones, Inspector. Oh, now, look, Bart, I don't mind going along with a gang, but this time you're going just a little bit too far. You think so, Inspector? You're darn right. This is nothing but an ordinary police job, just plain suicide. That's the way it's marked up in the book town of headquarters, and that's the way it's going to stay. Oh, Inspector, I'm afraid you're in for a big surprise. But it couldn't be anything else. Yeah? It couldn't be murder. Look, be reasonable, will you? Why couldn't it be murder? Because nobody could walk into that library, give Miss Claire a glass of poison milk, and then walk out and leave all the windows and doors locked on the inside. That's why. Claire just had to lock that door herself. Well, it's been done before. If you've read my book on the case of... And the... besides that, there weren't anybody else's fingerprints on that flask but Claire. Of course there weren't, Inspector. You wouldn't expect there would be, would you? Oh, no. Oh. And now, Miss Susan, just one more little thing, and then we'll go, maybe in peace. Of course, Mr. Drake, what is it? Susan, it seems to me they've been poking around quite enough. Oh, never mind, George. I'm sure Mr. Drake knows what he's doing. Thank you very much. I'd like to look at your sister's room, if you don't mind. Oh, certainly. Right down the hall. The last door on the left. Thanks. Coming in, Inspector? Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, I won't go with you. My please, sir. Of course. I think this is it. Dark and gloomy. Yeah, isn't it? Now, let's see. What are you looking for? Hmm? Well, just things. Hmm. Not much in here. She wasn't very fancy. No. A little bottle of perfume. Let's look in the closet. Huh? Not much of a wardrobe. Well, you got to remember, Claire lost all her money. Probably sold all her fur coats and stuff. Kind of heavy for dressing gowns and robes. Some pretty nice slippers. Probably stuff she had left over from the good old days. Seen enough? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, in here. While we're at it, we might as well take a look at Susan's room. Okay, anything to get you out of here so I can eat. Must have shared the bathroom. Yeah. Well, this girl Susan has the best room. Yeah, very nice. Want to look in the closet, Bob? No, you look. What I'm trying to find will more likely be in a dresser drawer. Yeah, she's got plenty of clothes. Evening gowns, four dresses, three fur coats, and about six, uh, six, about 50 pairs of shoes. Yeah, so I suppose. She has all the money, remember? Isn't that what you said, Inspector? Yeah, I sure did. Uh-uh. Inspector, here it is. Here what is? The key to the whole crime. Huh. It's nothing but a knitting needle. Yes, that's right, Inspector. What do you suppose that string is doing tied to the end of it? Is that the way you knit? Is that... Uh, I don't know. I suppose she... What is it doing tied there? Just another fatal mistake our murderer made, Inspector. This knitting needle throws up the whole case. Now I'm able to tell you who our murderer is. And who was murdered. But we know who was murdered. Committed suicide. It was Claire Waterstone. You're sure of it, are you, Inspector? Of course I'm sure. I'm as sure... Dad, you had to figure it out, Mr. Drake. Hey, Bart, look. Susan Waterstone, she's wanted. You're mistaken, Inspector. Not Susan, but Claire. Then where's Miss Susan? We just left... We just left Miss Susan Waterstone with Charlie down at the morgue. I would like to know just how you figured this all out. Well, stop me if I'm wrong, but here's the way I think it happened. If you lost your money, Miss Claire, you were forced to depend upon your sister, Susan, for your very existence. In order to get the weekly allowance she gave you, you had to wait on her hand and foot. You're right so far. That had to be pretty tiring after a while. You couldn't see why a crippled girl who was unable to go anywhere should have all that money while you, who were young and healthy, didn't have a dime. So you decided it would be wonderful to change places with your sister and have all that money for yourself. Yeah, but one of them was crippled, why? Susan, why did you get out of the chair? Oh, it's no use, George. Mr. Drake knows everything. Oh, that's too bad. You don't think I'm going to let him tell, do you? Marty's got a gun. Yes, indeed. 
I wouldn't use it, though, Mr. Gale. No, I don't think I will. After all, Claire is the murderer. <laughs> no, George. You are the murderer. What? Why, I... This morning, when Susan was in the library, you brought her a glass of poisoned milk. You've been careful to hold the glass with a napkin in order not to leave any fingerprints. Susan drank the milk, or at least part of it. And the poison worked immediately. But I thought that... Then, George, you took her out of the wheelchair and dumped her body in an easy chair and placed an open book in her lap, a book that she'd been reading at the time. That was another mistake. People who commit suicide never do it while they're reading books. You're very clever, aren't you? Not so clever, George. This case was very simple. Then you wheeled out the wheelchair and carefully oiled the lock in the library door. You took this knitting needle in which you had attached this string. You put the needle through the handle of the key, stretched the string to the floor and under the door so that the end was on the other side, the outside. Then you carefully closed the door, pulled on the string, the needle turned the key and locked the door and then fell to the floor. It was a simple matter to give the string a yank and pull the needle under the door. And you hid it in Miss Clare's dresser drawer. And you had done the supposedly impossible. Locked the door on the inside. How did you guess? I didn't have to guess. I'd written up a case just like this one. It was in the book Susan Waterstone was reading, and which, by the way, you also must have read. Well, that's about all. Except that you then forced Miss Clare to assume her sister's identity, didn't you? I hate to do this. It's either you or me. Ready, Inspector? Don't try it. I'm going to shoot you first, Mr. Drake, and then I... No, 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 no. I got it. Uh, Inspector, I felt the wind of that one. I'd save those tears, my dear. You'll need them for your sister's funeral. And now, back to Glenn Langan for the conclusion of... Mystery is my hobby. Oh, Mr. Inspector, you would uh, like a maybe so have a little wine? Uh, okay, Mike, but no more tricks. Oh, no tricks, no, sir. Dinner uh, ready pretty soon, Mike? I'm starving. Yes, sir. Few minutes, sir. Good, good, good. You know, Bart... I can't get over the way that Claire grabbed that gun. I suppose that she was in with George Gale all the time. Yes, she was, Inspector. However, embezzlement and murder are two different things. Clara wouldn't go for murder. Yeah, but how about Susan's murder? Claire really thought that it was suicide, the same as you did. Yep, George sure had me fooled. I don't know how you ever figured out that Claire wasn't Susan. Oh, no, Inspector, I'm surprised at you. That girl at the morgue, didn't you notice her legs? Sure. She had two, just like everybody else. Uh-uh. No, not like everybody else, Inspector. Hers were thin, very thin. Not at all the legs of the girl who used them to walk on. And then, of course, the clues in the bedrooms were unmistakable. Did you honestly believe that Susan, being confined to her wheelchair, would use evening gowns, sport clothes, fur coats, and 50 pair of shoes? Well, I... I don't know. Uh, how did you know that George killed her instead of Claire? Well, primarily because of my call to my broker... He said that George Gale had been gambling on the stock exchange with much more money than he could possibly possess. Only, Inspector, it was Susan's money instead of Claire's. Hers was already gone, remember? Gentlemen, dinner is soft. Ah, at last we eat. Just a minute, Inspector. Martin Drake speaking. Yes? Yes. Well, yes, indeed. What? What? We'll be right over. You... Come on, Inspector, get your hat. But, boy, dinner's ready. You I can haven't eaten. eat later, Inspector. You uh, can eat later. Right now, we're going to investigate a very mysterious murder. But, Bart, with me, eating is a very serious business. I know, Inspector, but with me, mystery is my hobby. Sealed book. (laughs) 
Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept the great sealed book, in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of two scoundrels who would stop at nothing for money. A tale called The Ghost Makers. the tale, The Ghost Makers, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. It is an autumn afternoon in the ancient New England village of Wilton. In an old stone house a mile from the town, Agatha Wainwright is serving tea to her nephew Ned, and a little man Ned is introduced as Professor Piedmont, a friend who has come to spend a few weeks with them while he works on a book to be called old graveyards of New England. Uh, so this is your graveyard, friend Ned. Uh, he looks like a man who'd be happy staring at tombstones. They make a fascinating study, Miss Wainwright. Well, I'll take your word for it, Professor Piedmont. For myself, I'd rather read about them in a book. The professor not only writes books, Auntie, but he's also an expert on psychic phenomena. Psychic phenomena, eh? Oh, you mean ghosts. Hmm. Foolish fiddle-faddle, dreamed up by silly people without the brains to know better. Ah, but Miss Wainwright, I assure you, you are wrong. Oh, nonsense. When a person's dead, he's dead. And I see anything I'm willing to call a ghost, I'll know I'm crazy and I'll admit it. Why, Auntie, this very house is supposed to be haunted. You know that. Oh, rubbish. This is a perfectly normal house. I've lived here a month, and I haven't heard so much as a board squeak. Ah, but Miss Wainwright, that may be only because you're new to the house and not yet sensitized. It takes time to become aware of occult influences. Oh, stop and nonsense. Who started all this talk about ghosts, anyway? Uh, Here, now let's have some tea and no more talk about ghosts. Well, Ned, now that we're alone, suppose you tell me a little more than you put in your letter. I'm still not sure why you sent for me. All right, Professor. This is the gist of it. Three months ago, Aunt Agatha's brother died, leaving her an estate of $400,000. And I'm Auntie's only living relative. I see. Yes, light begins to dawn. No, wait. My uncle arranged his will so that Aunt Agatha gets only the interest, about $20,000 a year, and this house to live in. On her death, the entire estate goes to charity. I'm cut off without a penny. I see your uncle didn't like you, Ned. <laughs> a shrewd man. Very shrewd. Yes, he was making sure I couldn't get my hands on any of it. But that's where you come in. Hmm? If Aunt Agatha were to become, uh, oh, shall we say, ill, mentally ill... <laughs> so that she was incompetent to administer the estate, you mean? Exactly. If Aunt Agatha were to lose her mind through shock or fright... Who but me, her only relative, would be the logical one to administer the estate for her. You would, then. 
Then you'd have the whole income for as long as she lived. Yes, and part of the principal, too. I know ways to manage it. But I've got to get my hands on some of it before the end of the year. I'm sunk. I owe a little money, about 25000 If I don't get it quickly, well, the people I owe it to are rather short-tempered. I understand. Yes, Ned, I remember when I knew you in Chicago. You liked to gamble, didn't you? But that's your affair. Personally, I prefer to stick to my own profession, creating ghosts. Yes, I've heard of some of your jobs, Professor, and some of the ghosts you've created to order. Yes, I pride myself on having a unique occupation, Ned. I believe I'm the only ghost maker there is. And the ghosts I've created have been effective, too. (laughs) So I understand. (laughs) Now, what I want you to do is this. I want Auntie frightened to the point where she... Yes, yes, I understand. Well, Ned, it's going to be difficult. She's a tough-minded woman. Hard to scare. Hard to uh, drive insane. It's got to be done. Got to get my hands on the estate. If you succeed, Professor, there's $5,000 in it for you. Hmm? All right, Ned. I'll try. It won't be easy. But she may crack suddenly when the time comes... That type does, you know. Good. That's settled, then. You brought everything you're apt to need? All my apparatus and gadgets are in my trunk. They'll be here tomorrow. I'm not altogether sure I like this job, Ned. I hope you're not going to turn moral on me, Professor. No, 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 no. There's something about this place that disturbs me, though. You know, I am psychic at times. Not altogether a faker. (laughs) Next you'll be scaring yourself with your own stories. As we were driving past that old cemetery this afternoon, I suddenly felt a premonition and a chill. The kind of chill you're supposed to feel when you go near the place you'll someday be buried. Oh, it was just the wind. Ah, We'll have to get you some red flannels. Here. Here's something that'll give you your courage back. Drink it down. Ah. Yeah, that does me good. (laughs) Of all the different kinds of spirits, I prefer those in bottles. <laughs> I thought you'd like it. Now, let's go downstairs again. We won't talk about ghosts anymore tonight. But tomorrow night, who knows what may come knocking at Aunt Agatha's door. <laughs> <laughs> to continue the story as it is written in the sealed book. The following evening, Ned and the professor joined Aunt Agatha by the fireplace where she sat knitting. Outside, a cold winter wind blew. Listen to that wind. We may be in for a storm. Uh, We're in for an early winter, that's what. The first snow will fall any day now. It's good to have a fireplace to sit by when the wind blows like that. Here's the cider and donuts, ma'am. Very well, Emmy. Bring it right in. Ah, cider and donuts. Just what we need on a night like this. Will you have a glass, Mr. Ned? Oh, yes. Thank you, Emmy. 
Will you have some cider, Professor Piedmont? Professor, Emmy's trying to give you some cider. Uh, oh, excuse me, I was listening. Thought I heard someone knocking on the front door. Someone knocking? Well, there is someone there. Well, they can't be very anxious to get in if that's all the noise they can make. Shall I go see who it is, Miss Agatha? Yes, yes, girl, go see. Though I can't imagine who'd be calling at this hour of the night. Sounded like someone who didn't expect to get in anyway. A timid child, or maybe a ghost. Yes? Yes, who is it? Why? Why? Miss Agatha! Well? There wasn't anyone there. No one there? Of course there was. Someone knocked, didn't they? But I opened the door and there wasn't anyone there. Then who was knocking? Answer me that. I don't know. But it wasn't anyone... Anyone you can see. Emmy, I'll stand for no foolishness now. No, ma'am. But just the same, there's nobody at the door. Someone's playing tricks on us, and I'm going to see who it is. I'll come with you. You won't find anybody there. Well, we'll see. Well, what is it? What do you... There isn't anyone here. No, but there was... They slipped away into the bushes. That's what they did. Yes, yes, of course. Some small boys playing tricks, I suppose. If I catch them, I'll tan their hides. Who was it, Miss Wainwright? Just some boys playing tricks, Professor. That's all it could have been. Come on, Professor. Drink your cider. Uh, what? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, professor, you look like a man who was listening to something then. What was it? Oh, no, no, I assure uh, you. I... I'm too old not to know when a man is lying, Professor Piedmont. What were you listening to? To tell the truth, I thought I heard voices. What kind of voices? Far away voices, crying something I couldn't make out. I bet it was just the flames in the fireplace. I'm sure it was. <laughs> of course, that's all it was. <laughs> well, what do you say we all turn in? <clears throat> this New England air makes me sleepy. Hmm. Knocks at the door when there's nobody there. And voices. Yes, it's high time we were all in bed instead of sitting around here imagining such nonsensical things. Highly pleased with their first effort in creating ghosts that didn't exist, Ned and Professor Piedmont went to bed. But before they retired, they held a brief, low-voiced conference in Ned's room. Well, Professor, that door-knocking act was all right. You did it very nicely. Yes, Ned. An ordinary length of black thread run through a crack in the window sash and attach the door-knocker can create a very satisfactory ghost indeed. Now tell me, <laughs> what comes next on the program? Well, we can't work too fast. Tomorrow, the hired girl, Emmy, will spread the story of tonight's happenings. The whole town will start talking about it. Good. And then? And tomorrow night, nothing happens. Your Aunt Emmy is reassured. But tomorrow, I'll be busy. I noticed today there's an old hollow tree in the woods about a hundred feet from the house. Mm, what about it? I'll run wires to it, hiding them under the leaves, and install a small loudspeaker in it. I'll conceal the microphone and batteries behind the drapes in the living room. <laughs> I see. So two nights from now, we'll hear ghostly voices, eh? <laughs> exactly. They'll accompany the ghostly knocks on the door. And But that won't be all. <laughs> There'll be other surprises on the program. <laughs> Professor, remind me to tell you sometime that you're about as unpleasant an old rascal as I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> The next evening, Agatha Wainwright listened nervously for a repetition of the ghostly knocks. But nothing happened, and she regained her composure. The evening following that, however, as she and Ned and the professor sat in the living room around the fire... Uh, nine o'clock. The evening may just be starting in New York, but here in Wilton, it's bedtime. Hmm, seems to be someone at the door. So there is. Shall I go? No, Emmy can answer the door. She does little enough to earn her money. Emmy? Emmy? Yes, Miss Agatha? There's someone at the door. See who it is, please. Why, must I, Miss Agatha? Must you, indeed. Answer the door, Emmy. I'd... I'd rather not, ma'am. Emmy, see who is at the door. Yes, Miss Agatha. I'm going. Who is it? There's no one there. There's no one there again. Emmy, get control of yourself. But I tell you, there's no one there. Then it's someone playing tricks. That's all you hear, Emmy. Yes. Yes, Miss Agatha, I hear. 
But I don't believe it. Go to your room. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, Miss Agatha, but there wasn't anyone there. I hope I'm not going to have to discharge that girl. Shall I go this time, Auntie? No, Ned. If the rascals play their tricks, whoever they are, they'll soon stop when they see we pay no attention. I wonder if I could see them from the window. Maybe we could trap them if we were to go quietly out the back door and slip around to the front. What was that? Someone calling. Really? I don't hear anyone. It's someone calling to us to let him in. Strange. I can't hear it. You must have heard it, Ned. It was perfectly plain. There are some voices certain people can hear and others can't. If there's someone calling, we better take a look. Come on, Eddie. We'll see what goes on. Who's there? Show yourself, whoever you are. The yard's perfectly empty. No. There isn't a soul in sight. Both the knocking and the voices seem to have stopped. Perhaps we ought to search the yard and... <gasps> And Agatha, look. Eh? Down at the edge of the trees. Lights. Three balls of light moving around just above the ground. Really? Three spheres of light? And dear me, luminous spheres are common manifestations of spiritual presences. Oh, nonsense. And... They're just uh, will-o'-the-wisps, that's all. Well, whatever they are, we're going to see. Come on, Professor. If it's a trick, we'll soon know. Yes, Ned. Uh, wait for me. Don't scare them away. I want to see what they look like. Ned! Ned, they're rising. They're floating away above the trees. And Agatha... Annie, are you all right? Shall I get a doctor for you? What do you... I want with a doctor? I'm all right. I'm an old fool carrying on like that. Just because of some will-o'-the-wisps or whatever it was. I... I shan't do it again, I promise you. You need not be ashamed, Miss Wainwright. Unless I'm much mistaken, we've witnessed a psychic visitation of a kind unsurpassed in my suspense. Oh, stop the nonsense, Professor. You may believe in spirits, but I don't. I never have believed in ghosts, and I'm not going to stop now. It was just that it was, well, unexpected. In the days that followed, Ned Wainwright and Professor Piedmont found it impossible to shake Agatha Wainwright's iron nerves. Emmy, the hired girl, resigned in terror... But Agatha remained seemingly unmoved. Resolutely, she ignored the ghostly knocks, voices, and footsteps that Professor Piedmont's ingenuity devised. The whole town buzzed with tales of her haunted house, but she refused to pay any attention to them. After a month had gone by, Ned was ready to admit defeat. Well, Professor, you're a washout. And Agatha hasn't turned a hair at your ghost. No, Ned, I told you it might take a long time. She's a very strong-minded woman. Believe me, anyone else would have cracked by now. Well, she hasn't, and she's not going to. I still say it may happen all at once. She's nervous and distraught. She doesn't sleep well. Every evening she sits listening for ghostly voices, and she won't admit it. But she's made up her mind not to believe in ghosts. And I'm afraid she never will. Well, what do you suggest? It's the middle of December. I've got to get my hands on her money by the end of the year, and I'm sunk. We must play our last card. You. Me? What do you mean? She's fond of you. You're her only relative. What are you getting at? How would she feel if you, her only relative, were to die and come back here as a ghost? I don't follow you. My plan is simple. We'll say goodbye to your aunt and drive off as if we were going away. Then, secretly in the night, we'll return to the house. Yes? And then what? We'll see to it that she receives a phone call from a friend of mine in Boston. He'll announce to your aunt that you and I have been in an automobile accident, and that we've been killed. Oh, I see. Yes, I begin to understand. Uh, immediately after the phone call, we'll knock. She'll come to the door and see us standing there. And having just heard that we're both dead... Exactly. And if that doesn't work, Ned, we are defeated. But it'll be a strong mind indeed that can withstand such a shock... A strong mind indeed.
And now to continue the story, as it is written in the sealed book. Two days later, Ned and Professor Piedmont said goodbye to Agatha and drove away. It was starting to snow as they left, so they made their way by a roundabout route to an isolated roadhouse, and there they spent the day waiting. After darkness had fallen, they started back towards Aunt Agatha's house. By now, there was snow feet deep on the road, and the cold blast of the north wind made even the heated interior of the car uncomfortable. Oh, I'll be dead when this is over, Ned. At the moment, it must be down to zero. Yes, at least. Well, we're almost there. We'll drive up to within 100 yards of the house and wait in the car with the heater on. What time did you arrange to have that phone call made from Boston? At 9 o'clock, exactly. We want to knock the instant after she gets it. Right. Isn't that our turn there? I think so. This snow makes it so hard to see that... Professor, look out. We're going up the road. Ned. Ned. Are you hurt? Uh, My ankle. I'll be out of here. Uh, Come on. Uh, uh, Hurry, Ned. I smell gasoline. The car may catch on fire. All right. Help me onto the road. Yes, yes. What happened? We skidded down a ten-foot bank and turned completely over. Well, if you'd watched where you were going, it wouldn't have happened. I couldn't tell there was ice under the snow. No, but never mind that. We've got to get to shelter. And I think my ankle's broken. Yes, I can't step on it. Yes. You can lean on me. But where are we? A quarter of a mile from Aunt Agatha's. There isn't another house within a mile. Then come on, we've got to get there quick. Lean on me. Help all you can. If we don't get there soon, we'll freeze to death. Half an hour later, numb with cold and scarcely able to struggle on, Ned and Professor Piedmont staggered up to Agatha Wainwright's house. The windows all had heavy wooden shutters over them. Shutters they themselves had helped Agatha put in place to keep out anything that might come knocking at the door in the night. But through the small pane of glass in the front door, light showed as they stumbled thankfully up the steps. Uh, uh, Kevin, we're here. Couldn't have gone another hundred yards. Oh, no, I, I'm almost frozen. We've got to get inside. Yes, here, help me. Uh, all right. Uh, one more step. Uh, there. Uh, Ned, the phone call from Boston. What time is it now? Time? I, it's nine. Nine o'clock exactly. Then knock quickly. We've got to get inside before that phone call comes. <laughs> Inside, Agatha Wainwright heard the knocking, but before she could go to the door, the telephone rang and she answered it first. Hello? Yes, this is Wilton, 317. Boston, calling long distance? Yes, I'll hold on. Just a minute. Hello? Yes, this is Miss Wainwright speaking. The Boston General Hospital. My nephew Ned. What is it? What's happened to him? Dead. An automobile accident. Both of them killed? No. Oh, no. Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Thank you for letting me know. I'll come in the morning. Dead. Killed. Oh, no. No, no, he can't be. It's Ned. Let me in. Let me in. Ned. Ned's dead. He's been killed. Let me in, please, Hannah. It's Ned. Let me in. No. Ned's dead. Ned's dead. No, you can't be Ned. Ned was killed. He's dead. Stand Agatha, please. It must be Ned's ghost. The professor was right. There are ghosts. It's Ned's ghost out there. Stand Agatha, we're freezing to death out here. Please let us in. No, no, you can't come in. You're a ghost. You're Ned's ghost. You can't come in. I won't let a ghost in here. I won't. The next morning, 
Ned and Professor Piedmont were found frozen to death beside the house. For they made a vain effort to pry open the heavy wooden shutters that covered the window. You see, Agatha never did let them in. She knew better than to open the door to ghosts. the great book. Show us the tale we tell next time. This one? Ah, yes. Why, this is amazing. It's a tale of murder. Queer, unexpected, fiendish murder. Murder of a very different and unusual kind. A tale such as you've never heard before. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Seal Book. The Seal Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you the story of a man who talked to death all those who stood in the way of what he wanted. A story we call Death Pitch, starring Mr. Jack Carson. Hey, there's Sam, my friendly Autolite spark plug man. Hiya, Sam. Hello, Mr. Wilcox. What are you doing? Hunting. Hunting? For what? For cars that have lost their pep and power. Cars that are slow and jerky in traffic. Cars that are not up to par on the hill. Oh, you can't kid me, Sam. I know you're looking for worn-out spark plugs because they're usually the cause of all those troubles. You bet I am, Harlow. And when I'm through, you ought to see those cars zoom out of here with the smoothness of a trout going after a meal. Well, Sam, that's because all Autolite spark plug dealers have the exclusive Autolite plug check indicator to help recommend the best type of spark plug for every car and every style of driving. Plus all the tools and equipment to offer the best spark plug service money can buy. And when replacements are needed, Autolite spark plug dealers are the only ones that can offer you Autolite standard or resistor type spark plugs. The spark plugs that are ignition engineered to work as a dealer this week. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now with Death Pitch and the performance of Mr. Jack Carson, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. That morning I decided to talk to death. All those between me and what I wanted. I would talk and they would listen and die. Words. Words are what makes the world go round. People dangle on words like marionettes and a string. Step a little closer, folks, and they step a little closer. Test your skill, three chances for a dime, and they pay their dimes. Hurry, 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 and they do hurry to obey. Words. <laughs> 
That morning, I was standing as I often stood, just inside the entrance to the big top, my head back, watching Annette's rehearse. I love to watch trapeze artists. What ease. What confidence. But so far above me, out of my reach, in more ways than one. But if I owned the show, yes, I, Nick Arnold, if I owned the show... Nick, Nick, snap out of it. Always dreaming, all the time in the fog. Meet Peter Belington, Peter the Great. He's with it now. Pete, my brother Nick. Hello there. Peter the... Oh, yes, yes, I think I caught your act in Dallas last season. Escape artist? Rig a lot of chains and handcuffs? That's a good act. Pete's wagon ready for him, Nick? Well, don't go blank on me. Didn't I tell you to get a wagon ready for him? Where's huh? he going to bunk if he has no wagon? You didn't tell me, Duke. It's all Lee to take care of. Well, if I don't do everything myself, not son. As if I didn't have my hands full already, now I have to drop everything and find an empty wagon. Uh-huh. Pete, you wait here. We'll see about your wagon. Come on, come on. See you around, Pete. Yes. Come on, Hello. come on, walk. Walk a little faster. I don't have all day. Lee. Yeah. A fine partner that loopy rum hound is. Gets half the profits and leaves me all the grief. Yeah, he'd, he'd be lost without you, do. I gotta do this. I gotta do that. Hire fire, square the, the, the badges, everything. And does he cooperate? Yeah. Hear that? He's barreled again. Lee. What's the washing matter, Duke? You right. mad about something? You lush, you rum dumb. The star act joins the outfit, and there's no wagon ready for him. Oh, man, I'm sorry about that, Duke. Yeah. It slipped my mind. Really? You're sorry, huh? It's just dandy. Look, I'm finished. One of us has to get out. I want you to sell the half to me. Sell? Yeah. Oh, you know, I can do that, Duke. This show has always belonged to oh. my family. My grandfather started it. It belonged to my father. Oh. I broke into show business with this circus as a lion tamer. Oh, I what? couldn't sell it. It don't impress me. A fine lion tamer you must have been. You get clawed once, your nerve breaks, you don't go near a cat for 15 Not years. true. I uh, was a good lion tamer. Why'd you give it up then? Because, well, yeah? because of, of my other responsibility. Oh. Dad, running this show and looking after my uh, wife and, and raising my son, Robbie. Throw it to the sparrows. You don't run this show. I do. You don't look after Nora. She looks after you. Yeah. And she's a better tamer than you ever was. Because she's got the monster. No! Oh, Please leave me something. Oh, incredible. A few words, mere wind, and a grown man cowers like a whipped dog. Oh, words. Okay. You want to sell out to me? Buy me out. No, Duke, please. Take your sloppy hands off me. Oh, please. You're the only one who can run the show. What's shop. going on here? Oh, Nora, Nora. I said what's going on. I'm talking to you, Duke. I don't talk business with Dane. Oh, Nora, he, I well, still got a performer out there waiting for a wife. Well, uh, I'll see uh, uh, about that right now. Uh, Nora? Go ahead, Lee. I'll take care uh, of it. Oh, I take care of it myself, but I I have to get a wife. Uh, no dice, Nora. He won't buy and he won't sell. I told you he wouldn't. Uh. Duke. Duke, don't bear down too hard on him. He really used to be something... Mm. Once. I'm sorry. Working with him is like trying to crack a whip underwater. I lose my temper. <laughs> you look tired, baby. Well, I've been trying to work Jezebel all morning. It's no use. She's turned killer cat. We'll have to shoot her. Come here and give me a kiss. Uh, Duke. Ah, it's only Nick. You're going to fade into the background once too often, brother. Beat it. Lee. I decided then to start with Lee. With Lee gone, Duke would have Nora and the show for himself. It would fatten him like a Christmas turkey. And then, <laughs> the axe. Hi, Nick. Oh, hello, hello, Annette. Where are you going? To the cookhouse. Walk me over. Was that you down there watching me rehearse this morning? Yeah. What'd you think? Ah, uh, you're getting big time. Now, if I owned the show, I'd, I'd give you a star billing. Not only that... Here comes Robbie. Pretend we don't see him. All right. But if I owned the show... I'd make Hello, it. Oh, a... dreamy eyes. You got a smile for Robbie? And you grab my arm again and I'll. I'll... When are you going to give me the green light, dreamy eyes? Come on. I hate that. That. Just because Lee's his father, he thinks. Always trying to play footsie under the table in the cookhouse. Want me to take care of you? You. I can take care of myself. Look, they're rolling a new wagon next to mine. Yeah, we have a new star act Peter the Great. Escape artist. Oh. 
Well, see you later, Nick. Well, that night, sitting in the, in the dark at the steps of my wagon, I saw Nora and Duke pass arm in arm. A little later, Robbie on his way to town. I finished my cigarette and stretched. It was time. Bring back those wonderful days. Bring back those wonderful days. Hello, Lee. Oh, you. You have a drink? Thanks, thanks. Hey, what's that, a photograph album? Yeah, I'm looking through some old pictures. Here's me, the, the, the day I first did my lion painting act. Mm. Good looking costume. It wasn't a big success. Stop show cold. I bet you did. Did you, Jamie? Mm. Good. Yeah, you see this picture? Me and my cat. This big one's name was Rondo. Mean cat. But I tend them. How how many did you work? Yeah. Thirty at one time. And then, and then five tigers. Greatest thing you ever saw. I think Nora's good. Should have seen me. I'm as good as I ever was. Matter of fact. Want to know something? I'm thinking of going back to her. Really? Let's have a drink on that. You're gracious. Never would have left it, you know, if I didn't have more important responsibilities. <sighs> well, it's true. It's true, you'll see. I didn't lose my nerve. Sure, sure, of course. Why, I bet you could even handle a killer cat like Jezebel. Jezebel? <laughs> <laughs> I could have Jezebel purring inside of five minutes. Used to work 30 at one time, I tell you. And five tigers. Oh, God, give me that well. I'd build them in a pyramid. Come, you three. Come, I don't bear. Hold it. No, you. You five. And you. And you. And you. And you. And there they'd be. With the audience screaming themselves crazy. I'd like to see an action. Any time, any time at all. Uh-huh. Well, uh, how about now? With just Jezebel. Yeah, that's it, sure. Come on. Yeah. I'll show you. Yeah. You know something? When I'm done with Jezebel, I'm going to have a little talk with Nora. Getting out of hand lately. Some women have to be tamed. Well, I'm the bully boy who can tame them. I can tame anything. Anything, anything at all. Look at her. Back and forth. Back and forth. <laughs> you Jezebel, you. Mean looking, ain't you? They don't come too mean for you. Yeah, you watch me work her over. I remember the way it used to be. The ringmaster used to say, Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest of them all, Lee Duncan. And I'd be standing there in the spotlight, all shiny and proud. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest of them all, Lee Duncan. Yeah. Ah, uh, you Jezebel, you... Go ahead, Lee. <laughs> Almost... No, 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 it's not your fault. It's a loose board. Uh, you wash me, Nick. Wash a man. Uh, uh, take a good look, Jezebel. Take a good look. I'm... I'm going to... <laughs> Back, Jezebel. Back! Back! What am I doing? No! 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 We buried Lee the next day. And a month later, Duke married Nora and became the sole owner of the circus. The money made exhibiting Jezebel the Man Killer. Almost paid for the banners and posters advertising the Duke Arnold Show. <laughs> the Duke Arnold Show. I'd see my brother staring at those four little words for minutes at a time. His eyes filled with their wonder and their glory. Yeah, Duke was a happy man. Except for one or two little things. I could tell you, you little punk. Mom, stop it, Duke! 
What's Robbie done? I'll tell you what your little Robbie has done. He's made three of the cooch kids hand in their notices. They're leaving. Walking out on the show in the middle of the season because he's been throwing his weight around. Um, um, I was only having a little fun. Fun? Is that what you call it? Putting me to the trouble and expense of bringing three more girls down if I can find them? You stay away from my performance, you hear me, pantywaist? Leave them alone! And if I catch you annoying the net again, I'll... Will you calm down? They can hear you all over the lot. Let them. I'm the boss. Yeah. And how'd you get to be boss? I do a little... Duke! Duke! Brother of the owner of the show. I was coming up in the world. And that began to look at me as though say me for the first time. But it, it needed more. And it wasn't enough. And then a name popped into my head. Robbie. Yes, Robbie. Robbie and Duke's murderous temper. The next afternoon, I, I, was, I was in the office working. Seen Mom? Ah, come in, Robbie, come in. Seen Mom? You know, no, but I, I've seen someone else. Come on in. What's up? I have a message for you from <laughs> Annette. No kidding. What? Ah, you're a lucky guy. She wants to see you in her wagon after tonight's show. No fool. Uh -huh. What do you know about that? Well, it's about time. That's all I have to say. It's about time. She sure... Hey, wait a minute. Are you sure she said Robbie? Last time I spoke That's to her... That's the way some women are. Take their own sweet time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Nick. See you around. Don't mention it. So long. In her wagon after tonight's show. <laughs> Words. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Jack Carson in Death Pitch. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. I stood in the shadows that night and watched Robbie get ready for his date with Annette. <laughs> he spent at least 15 minutes in front of his mirror, tying the knot in his tie just so and plastering his hair down with goo. And there was no doubt about it. He was going to make an elegant corpse. He even winked at himself in the mirror. He put on his gaudiest jacket, took a large box of candy from the table and put out the light. He came down the steps whistling and swaggering down the line to Annette's wagon. I followed Come in. Hello, dreamy eyes. Here's your Robbie. Oh, beat it, or I'll tell your mother on you. <laughs> Look, candy. For you. Five bucks worth. That's the way I am. How about a little kiss for Robbie? <laughs> Go away, little boy. Sure. Sure, you don't have to pretend with Robbie. See how I mean? Pretend. You know, the don't come near me act. For the others, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> but not for little Robbie. How about that kiss? <laughs> you could only see how funny you look, trying to act like a grown-up man of the world. Go away, Robbie. Go away. Come on. Give me a kiss. <laughs> you little... Come here. Let me go. Let me go! Let me go! Stop it! Let me go! Duke! Duke, over here! What's going on? Anna! 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 Who's you? What? Anna in her wagon! Robbie! Robbie! I'll kill that little punk! Duke! I Duke! Don't! Please! Don't! Let go! Come back here! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! I ran after them. In the lights of the wagons all down the line, I could see Robbie running, dodging, stumbling over tent ropes, heading straight for Nora, and Duke pounding after him. When I got to her wagon, Robbie was inside, hiding behind her while she tried to keep Duke back with her whip. Duke, get back! Get back! Get back! Don't let him get me! Don't let him get me! I'll kill him! I'll kill him! 
Get out of my way. I'll kill him. Get out of my way. Do it. I told you. I told you. I told you. I told you. Nick, please help me. Duke. Duke. Mara. Where are you going? My gun. You wouldn't listen. You wouldn't listen. You wouldn't listen. No. <laughs> I couldn't help thinking. In the beginning was the word. Robbie strangled to death, Duke shot to death, Nora in the jail for manslaughter. Bingo. All good things come in threes. <laughs> that was good to be boss of the Duke Arnold Circus. You see, I I kept the name in memory of my dear brother. <laughs> but uh, Annette wasn't turning to me as I'd planned. She was growing more and more attracted to Peter Valenka, Peter the Great. He had a sureness about him and a conqueror's strut that some women find attractive. If it were possible to describe Peter in one word, that word would be, uh, egotist. He was top star of our show and aware of it. It, it wasn't hard to think of the words to use. You, uh, wanted to see me, Nick? Yeah, yeah, sit down, Pete. Huh. Pete, I, I was wondering how you'd feel if I gave Annette star billing along with you. You know, she's getting to be a big drawing card. Sure, give it to her. She deserves it. I don't mind. In fact, I'm glad for her. Uh, is she a bigger draw than me, do you think? Well, she's right up there with you. You know how it is. The Mark's always like something new and different, and she keeps adding new routines. Yeah, and... I know. She's good, all right. You, um... Think I ought to change my routine a little? No, no, no. You have a good routine, but well, if I may suggest, well, sure, go you, ahead. Your act isn't sensational enough. After all, even though you are the best of them, escape artists haven't been too much of a novelty since Houdini. You, you need some kind of a flash stunt, something that'll make the yaps ears flap back and forth with excitement. Houdini, what does he do? I can't do underwater escapes. <laughs> I can do underwater escapes. You can? Oh, sure. Don't give me Houdini. Well, say, uh, how about something like this? Now, let's say you're handcuffed, and then after a thorough search for hidden keys, you get into a, a crate of some sort. The crate is sealed and lowered beneath the surface of the water. A couple of minutes later, your head appears above the surface. You're out of the cuffs, and you're free of the crate. Something like that. Could you do it? Oh, sure. It's just a question of shucking the cuffs. The rest is only swimming. Okay. Let's do it that way. Now, you're sure you can handle it? I, I don't want you to try it if it's too dangerous. I mean, maybe you're not good enough to escape from... I can escape from anything. All right, then. By the way, how do you get out of the cuffs? Or is that a strict secret? Master key. I use a master key. Yeah, but you'll be wearing only bathing trunks. It'll be a search from head to foot. What, what do you do? Hide it in your mouth? <laughs> they can look at my mouth all they want. No, there's one place they never think of looking. The soles of the feet. I fastened the key to my art with flesh-colored tape. Oh, I always wanted. Well, I'll, I'll start working it right away. Some kind of advanced build-up. Our next date is Scudderville. Now, there's a bridge across a pretty large stream right across the street from the fairgrounds. And I was... Thinking... Outstanding feats ever performed. You will see Peter, Peter the Great, while handcuffed, do the impossible right before your very eyes. Now, folks, you have just seen your chief of police search Peter thoroughly. Chief, come up here, tell the folks, did you discover any keys, pick locks, or other concealed devices? I did not. Thank you. There you are, folks. And now, Peter, step into the casket. All set, Pete? Yeah. Nick, you double check the winch and the rope. I don't want any slip-ups there. Mm -hmm. That current's like a runaway horse. Unless this casket is anchored to the bridge, I am a gun pigeon. Oh, I attended to it personally. Okay. And remember, if I'm not ab above water in three minutes, pull me up fast. Oh. Hold it, brother, hold it. As you see, the casket containing Peter the Great is being lowered into the raging rapids below. Will he be able to perform this stupendous feat? Will he be able to wake himself free? If he does not, the joke is on us. 
And there you are, folks. He is now below water. The casket will soon be resting on the bed of the stream, 54 feet below water. Notice the strong pull of the current. Let me draw your attention to the manner in which the rope from the casket to the winch is being strained. And also notice that... The... Do something, somebody. Do something. The rope starts. Do something. Of course the rope snapped. I attended to it personally. I turned my back on the crowd and left the bridge a happy man. <laughs> There's no greater satisfaction than that afforded by the knowledge of a good job well done. I had the show, and it was only a question of time before I had Annette as well. She would come to me for guidance, lean on me more and more, and... <laughs> pleasant prospects. But, <clears throat> meanwhile, there was work to be done. A letter to Billboard informing that Bible of the Carney world of the unfortunate occurrence of the Scudderville Bridge, then an ad for a new escape artist for the Duke Arnold Circus. Ha, ah, ah, ha, words, words. I draw them to me by words, move them like marionettes and strings of words. By words, I send them away. It's words that make the world go round. I sat back in my chair and looked into the future. The possibilities were infinite, stretching far beyond the canvas walls of a small carny show. Why, I could conquer the world. Times seem always to be ripe for a man like me, a man who can manipulate people. The earth is filled with fools who are open to uh, suggestions. If one knows the proper words, they listen. Nick. Peter? Surprise, Tom. There's your rope. The one you attended to personally? Now, no, Peter, listen to me. Let me explain. I, you're naturally upset and excited, and I understand what you must be thinking, but but, please give me a chance to explain, will you? Yeah, uh, I just did it to make it look good. I mean, more exciting, you know? You understand, don't you? You see, I knew the cask would hold a lot of, a lot of air, and enough, enough to give you plenty of time to escape even without the rope. You see? You see, see what I mean? Peter. Peter, tell me you understand. Well, and that you you understand, don't you? That tell him to listen to me. He can't listen to you, Nick. He can't listen to anyone. He can't hear at all. The water pressure down there broke his ears. You, you 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 can't hear me. You mean my words? I'm going to kill you. No, no, please stay where you are. I'll give you half the show. You can have it all. Don't come any closer. Can't you hear me, Sir Peter? The show will belong to you. The show I kill Lee for and Robbie and Duke. Peter, can't you hear me? Listen to me. Can't you hear me? Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Jack Carson. Friends, this is Harlow Wilcox again to remind you that Autolite makes over 400 fine products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. These include complete ignition systems used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars. Generators, coils, distributors, electric windshield wipers, voltage regulators, wire and cable, starting motors, and many more. They're all engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly because they're all part of the Autolite team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts, at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, you will hear in his first appearance on this program, and only dramatic appearance of the season, America's favorite comedian, Mr. Jack Benny. And in weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, James Stewart and Ann Baxter. All on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Death Pitch was written for Suspense by Walter Newman. In tonight's cast, Ed Max was heard as Duke, Francis Cheney as Nora, Georgia Ellis as Annette, Dick Prenna as Robbie, Herb Butterfield as Lee, and Joseph Kearns as Peter. Others in the cast were Eddie Marr and Byron Kane. Jack Carson may soon be seen in the universal international picture, The Groom War Spurs. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Jack Benny, as a man who found $25,000 
Sudden Death in Murder in G Flat. You can buy world famous Autolite resistor type or standard type spark plugs, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. Strengthen your future as America strengthens hers. Join the National Guard. You'll be well trained with and by men from your own hometown. And you'll be well paid. If you're over 17, get the story from your nearest National Guard headquarters. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Ronald Coleman in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you the story of a mind reader who discovers his nightclub act is not a fake, a vision of death. Our star, Mr. Ronald Coleman. What's the trouble, Oscar Otto? It's my battery, Harlow. Water, please. Why, sure. But why not avoid that battery distress, Oscar? Get an Autolite Stay Full, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Is that a fact, Harlow? A fact that millions of cars and owners have proved for themselves, Oscar. And the Autolite Stay Full gives longer life, too. Fiberglass retaining mats protect every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking. And give the Autolite Stay Full longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Where do I get this no worry battery, Harlow? From your nearest Autolite battery dealer. To quickly locate him, phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. I'll tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, where you can get an Autolite Stay Full, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents A Vision of Death, starring Mr. Ronald Coleman, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. I speak too rapidly for your stenographer, you'll tell me, won't you, Lieutenant? No offense, but um, he impresses me as someone who has to sit on the floor to put on his shoes. And stop me if I seem to wander away from the point, won't you? I mean to say, this is my first and, I hope, final appearance in a police precinct, and I should hate to give a sloppy performance. We were always known, Aurora and I, for the smoothness and gem-like precision of our act. As far as this murder... Uh, rap, I suppose it's called, is concerned. An acquaintance with our act is the essential rabbit. Awfully good act. Smart, informal, occasionally humorous, and always mystifying. Well, the act always began with music, never with the cliché fanfare of trumpets or roll of drums. I would saunter out to the center of the floor and say something like, uh, Good evening. You are about to witness an exhibition of mental telepathy. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce Aurora, my wife? Ah, they never fail to give her a hand. What would they applaud? Why, the vision she presented as she came toward me. There has never been anyone as lovely as Aurora, the most beautiful flesh in the profession. Now, Aurora, would you care to tell the audience or shall I? You tell them, Judd, while I tie the blindfold across my eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, all mind readers employ a gimmick. A gimmick is a trick, a device. For example, when the mind reader threading his way through the audience says to the mind reader sitting blindfolded on the stage, a lady has given me a small object which I now hold in my hand, what is it? And the mind reader, sitting blindfolded, replies, a silver coin. The answer has not come through mind reading, no. It has come through the gimmick. A cue or signal communicated through the very question itself. But we don't do that. We do not. 
You will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that I never speak to Aurora at all. Now, are you ready, Rory? Ready, Jeff. Here we go, then. Now, uh, you, sir, you have something? Good. Concentrate upon it like a good chap. And the you gentleman have... holds the coin in his hand. It's a Mexican peso bearing the date 1892. <laughs> oh, oh, that's very clever of you, madam. I'll be surprised if she gets this one. <laughs> the now, lady how about holds in her hand her other hand. <laughs> Yeah, a sucker once born remains a sucker till death. The audience never realized, never in all the years we worked, that although I was not speaking to Aurora directly, my chatter nevertheless was loaded with signals and cues for her guidance. By revealing the gimmick, we concealed the gimmick, and that, Lieutenant, is the knee plus ultra of gimmicks. <laughs> yes, it was as crude as that, but it enabled us to work 50 weeks a year here and abroad at an average of over a 1,000 a week. Of course, I always gave some credit for our success to, to our agent, Harry Arnold. Although Rory was inclined to give him no credit at all. Good news, Judd. I've managed to book the act into the college inn in Chicago with a four-week guarantee. That's not bad, huh? Get him. He managed to book the act. I suppose they never heard of us in Chicago. I suppose we weren't held over there six weeks when we played the Sanssouci in 1948. Well, you think it's easy to get a four-week guarantee these days? Money is short, money is tight. I have never yet heard you say money is long, money is loose. You have to sweat for your 10%, don't you? Yes, you do. In a pig's ear, you do. Agents, they're all alike. There's gratitude for you. There's the milk of human memory. <laughs> what were you when I first saw you? Nothing, not this much playing ten a day on the canvas of Menashe, Wisconsin, and paid off in bottle tops. I worked, I schemed, I sweated. Agents, all of them. All they know is how to live off a dead whale, scum of the earth. I'm not going to take that from you, you hear me? You'll take it, baby, along with the 10%. You'll take it, you'll chew it, you'll swallow it, and you'll keep it down. How do you like that? I'm warning you, kid, don't push me too far. Don't uh, push uh, me uh, too... Children, children, now on your way, Harry, and don't let it get you down. I think a four-week guarantee is pretty good. Thanks, Judd. If it wasn't for you, I'd... No, uh, I go into it. I'm going for a walk. But aside from these altercations between Rory and Harry, it was smooth sailing. We wore the best, ate the best, drank the best, stayed at the finest hotels. And every Saturday night after the performance, Harry would bring us our salary. He'd bring it in cash. Thousand, twelve fifty, fifteen hundred. <laughs> I've the old performer's distrust of checks. Been given too many with a high latex content. <laughs> anyway, life couldn't have been more placid. And then, one evening, about five weeks ago, soon after we opened at the Grove here in town, a frightening thing occurred. We just begun the act, and I was out in the audience. You will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that I never speak to Aurora at all. Now, are you ready, Rory? Ready, Judge. Here we go, then. Now, uh, you, madam. The lady you have holds in her hand a compact. It is platinum. It bears her initials R.C. Uh, 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 you, sir. The gentleman you... is holding an engagement ring. In it are three small diamonds. I, I, uh, uh, miss, well, what would lady, you... The young lady... The young lady is holding... It's a small cameo brooch. <laughs> Rory! Rory! Uh, Maurice! Music! I... I picked Rory up from the floor and hurried with her to our dressing room, almost beside myself with anxiety. I placed her on the couch, dampened the towel, and put it on her forehead and began to chafe her wrists. Rory. Rory, honey, Rory. Judd, Judd. I'm here, Rory. Are you all right? I, I guess so. I don't know what happened. Well, you fainted away. Try to remember what happened. I, I felt funny. I don't remember. No, no, try, Rory, Try. Try to remember. It's important. I can't. Why is it important? You don't know. 
Rory, you don't know. You were calling out the answers before I even had a chance to give you the cues. Do you believe in telepathy, Lieutenant? I don't mean the sort of thing Rory and I usually did. I mean real telepathy. Uh, I never did either until that night. I don't mind telling you I was badly shaken. I mean, after all, I, I knew we'd been using a gimmick, and suddenly it began to happen without the gimmick. Scared us to death. We didn't know what we were getting into, but we went on with the act. And in my mind, I began to search about for the answer. <laughs> I found it, of course. You'll find a gimmick in almost everything, if you look hard enough. I've got it, Rory. We worked together so long that you know what I'm about to say before I say it. From my inflection, my pauses, even my movements. You see? Oh, Judd, that has to be it. Oh, this is marvelous. When Harry gets back, I'll tell him about it. And if I last till tomorrow, he can ask the management for more dough. As soon as he gets back. Next Thursday. Tonight. How much more should we ask for? Tonight? What made you say tonight? Well, I don't know. Well, you were there when he told me he'd be in Palm Springs till Thursday. What made you say tonight? I don't know. What difference does it make? Stop picking on me. So I made a mistake, so what? <laughs> I, I don't see how you can make such a mistake, that's oh, all. Oh, Judd, leave me alone. I've been worried half crazy about really being able to read your mind. I've been under a strain. So Harry's coming back Thursday and not tonight. All right, are you satisfied? He'll be here Thursday, not tonight. You just the stone, mister? This dressing room, eh? Yeah, what is it? Telegram, sign here. Uh, sign for it, will you, Rory? There you are, kid. Judd, I... I'm sorry I blew up in your face. Uh... Judd, what's the matter? It's... It's from Harry. He's coming in tonight. <laughs> And he did, too, Lieutenant. Rory was so upset by it, she couldn't go on at all that evening. She had no explanation for how she knew, none whatsoever. I don't know, Judd. I, I just don't know. My mind seemed to go blank. I seemed to hear a voice whisper in my ear, Harry Arnold will be with you tonight. That's all. When we got back to our suite at the hotel, Harry was there, waiting for us. Well, what happened? Well, what happened? You both look like ghosts. Look, Harry, I'll tell you some other time. Leave us alone, will you? All right, I'm going. I just came to wish you a happy birthday and to give you this. Birthday? Oh, oh, oh thanks, Harry. Yeah, thanks. What is it? Well, open it, why don't you? It's a bathrobe. A red silk bathrobe. With your initials. That's right, it's a red... How does she know? How do you know? Get out of here! I won't be talked to like that. I don't care who she is. I won't be talked now, to Harry, like that. Harry, shut up. For heaven's sake, shut up and go away. Leave us alone. Go. Get out. Get out. You too, Judd? She's got you talking against me too? All right, I'm going. I'm going, but from here on in, it's strictly business between us. I wash my hands. He kept his word, Lieutenant. From that time on, he kept himself to himself. And I was prepared to let it go at that, much as I liked Harry. Until the night I was awakened by Rory, moaning in her sleep. No. No, please, no. No. Rory. Rory, no. wake up. You're having a bad dream, no. Rory. No. Uh, huh? Judd. Judd. Shh, shh. It's all right. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, Judd. What, Rory? The voice. Whispering again? Yes. Oh, Judd. What? He's going to kill me. Harry Arnold is going to kill me. And that, Lieutenant, was the beginning of the end of that. Autolite, 
Wright is bringing you Mr. Ronald Coleman in A Vision of Death. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, hello. Here's a riddle. Shoot, Oscar Otto. I got it, and I have it. You've got an Autolite Stay Full battery, and now you have a power-packed Paragon that gives quick, dependable starts and needs water only three times a year in normal car use. You said a stay full, Harlow. Just what every driver should say when he needs a battery, Oscar. An Autolite stay full with the fiberglass retaining mats protecting every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give that brawny battery longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. So, friends, choose the battery that states right on the case... Needs water only three times a year in normal car use. To learn quickly where to get an Autolite Stay Full battery, just phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. I'll tell you the location of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, the expert on all makes of batteries. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Ronald Coleman in Elliot Lewis's production of... A vision of death. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Rory. Rory, get a grip on yourself. He's going to kill me. Harry's going to kill me. Don't be ridiculous. Stop it now. It's just a bad dream. He's going to kill me. Will you stop that? Will you stop saying that? Judd, hold me. I'm frightened. Harry's going to kill me. You've had a bad dream, I tell you. He hates me. He hates me. Oh, Judd, he's going to kill me. I'm a rational man, Lieutenant. I've always felt, for example, that when Hamlet says... There are stranger things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. Horatio ought to reply, tell that to Sweeney. I knew there was no such thing as mental telepathy. I knew it as well as I know I'm sitting here talking to you. Up here in my head, I knew it. And yet, the next afternoon, I found myself entering a gun shop and purchasing a revolver and a box of bullets. Determined that before Harry Arnold could so much as injure one hair of Rory's head, I would kill him. I should have gone directly to the police first. (laughs) You're using hindsight, Lieutenant. I had all that out with Rory. Please, Judd, please, go to the police. Tell them about this. Let them handle it. Tell them what? That by reading his mind, we've learned Harry intends to murder you? They'll believe us. They've got to believe us. You're reasoning like a child. They'll decide that it's either a publicity stunt or else that we're both lunatics. But if I tell them about the telegram and the birthday present... Rory, we have no proof. We have to do something. What? Tell me what? You know he intends to kill you. I know he intends to kill you. But what can we do? Do you know when he's going to do it or how he's going to do it? No. He hasn't decided yet. Oh, Judd, isn't there anything we can do? Nothing. Except wait. I reacted to the waiting as you might expect, Lieutenant. Sleeplessness, loss of appetite, growing irritability. I flared up at everyone. Waiters, chambermaids, elevator boys, the manager of the club. The manager of the club. (laughs) He finally said to me... Stone, what the devil's gotten into you? I'd really like to know. None of your business. Well, look, I'm only trying to be nice. Oh, shut up and leave me alone. Sure, I'll let you alone. I'd let you alone right now if your contract didn't have another week to run... But after that, I'll let you strictly alone. You'll never work this club again. You maniac. I began to drink quite heavily, quite noticeably. I was going crazy just from the waiting. And then the waiting came to an end. It was around three in the morning. I was sitting up in bed, in the dark, smoking, when Rory opened her eyes and said, Judd. Yes? The voice. Yes. 
He... He's going to kill me here. Right here in this room. Rory. Saturday. This Saturday. At midnight. Oh, John. Rory. Rory, sweetheart. He's going to shoot me. He has a gun. He's going to shoot me. He's going to... He's going to get you downstairs in the manager's office at the club. And while you're there, he's going to come up here. No, 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 Rory, Rory, listen to me. I want you to listen to me. You're mistaken, do you understand? You've been having another bad dream, and that's all there is to it. No, Judd, I swear it. He just thought of it. Just this minute. He's standing at a bar. Standing there all by himself, drinking. And he's just this minute decided. You're... You're making it up. Judd, no. It's... It's the bar over the Tuscany Hotel. I see it so clear. Oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. I'll prove you're wrong. Desk. Uh, get me the bar at the Tuscany, will you? Over on Sunset? One moment, please. You'll see, Rory. He's not there at all. You'll see it's just a dream. Just a bad dream. Tuscany Cocktail Lounge. Hello. Is uh, Harry Arnold there at the bar? Harry Arnold? No, I'm sorry. He's not. He's not? You sure of that? Sure, I'm sure. He was here all evening and left about a minute ago. I said goodnight to him myself. Want me to have... Uh, Look. Look, Lieutenant, my hands... Just the memory of how I felt at that moment of my hands begin to tremble again. Amazing, isn't it? Now, that was last Thursday night, or rather Friday morning. Towards daybreak, Rory sobbed herself to sleep, but I was restless. I got dressed and went downstairs and, and got into my car. The long drive has always relaxed me. But when I got behind the wheel, oh, I don't know what it was, possibly the fresh air, but... But all at once, I felt as though I couldn't keep my eyes open for another moment. Simply had to have some sleep. So I... I crawled into the back seat. Curled myself up in one corner. Pulled the rug over me and went out like a light. I was awakened around noon... ...by the sound of voices. Don't smile at me, you idiot. They may see us. Look business-like. Where is he? I don't know. Since he hasn't got the car, he must be out walking. Did he fall for it last night? Just like he fell for all the rest of it. The red bathrobe, stooges you planted in the audience. He even phoned the bar just after you left. Oh, I timed it beautifully. Satin skin, satin skin. I can hardly keep away from you. After tomorrow night, we'll have all the time in the world for each other, Harry. You want the whole story that it's going to happen at midnight? Tomorrow, your place? Every word. Just do what you have to do now. Remember to come to the dressing room before the 8 o'clock show... Tell him you've set up a meeting with Stamper, the manager, in Stamper's office at 12. Yeah, I want them to shake hands and be friends again, I'll tell him. Yes, and don't forget, when you come to our door at midnight, keep talking to the elevator boy. Don't let him go, whatever you do. You want him to testify with self-defense. Uh, don't worry, I won't forget a thing. You'll handle all the rest of it? Just leave it to me. I mean about his gun. That's pretty important, you know. Don't worry. It'll miss fire. <laughs> It'd be difficult for me to tell you what I felt as they walked away, Lieutenant. One part of me felt the way a man ought to feel, I suppose, when he when he learns that the woman he loves is not only unfaithful, but plotting his death as well. But another part of me felt only relief. Relief at learning there was a gimmick in this too. Ah, they'd been fairly clever for amateurs. Harry had a good excuse for carrying a gun to protect the cash he brought me each Saturday. My own behavior in recent weeks would lend weight to what he would probably offer in his defense. That I must have been crazy. That for no reason at all I'd opened the door, pointed a revolver at him, and threatened his life. That he had to shoot in self-defense. The presence of the elevator boy, that could mean only that Harry would shoot just as soon as I opened the door. I'd be found dead with a revolver in my hand and a heartbroken agent at my side. Tableau. I found myself hoping, as I never hoped before, that they'd come to their senses before Saturday. 
that they'd realize what a vicious, inhuman thing it was they were planning. But just before the eight o'clock show that night, there was a knock at the door of our dressing room. Come in. Uh, Judd, I've been talking to Stamper, the manager. He's sorry there's bad blood between you and wants to square it. I told him you'd be in his office at 12 to talk things over. All right with you? Yeah. We don't want it so that we'll never work here again, do we? I mean, there's no reason we should. No reason at all. Button my dress, Judd. Uh, see you later, Judd. Yeah, later. Well, we did the show and then went up to our suite. I convinced Rory that I should meet Harry alone, and then I helped her pack a small overnight bag. I loaded the revolver, and then there was nothing to do but wait. The minutes passed. Nine o'clock, ten, ten thirty, and I waited. Judd? Yes? It doesn't seem right to leave you here alone. Harry might... No, no, you go. Things might not turn out as I planned. I might not be able to stop him. If I fail to stop him... No, no, it's best that you go. Just wait at the motel until you hear from me. Uh, what time is it? Almost eleven. Two minutes of eleven. I... I'm out of cigarettes. Dad? Uh, this is Mr. Stone in 1101. Please send up a carton of players, will you? Right away, Mr. Stone. I want you to go now, Rory. Judd, let me call the police, please. Oh, it would be useless. We've gone into it and it would be useless. Well, then come with me. He won't find anybody here. And then he'd choose another place, another time. Now, here's your valise. You have your gun? In my pocket. You, you won't take any chances. I don't know what I'd do if you were hurt. Or... I won't take any chances. Now, let me help you on with your coat. Oh, Judd, I love you so. Yeah, I know. And I love you, Rory. I really do, you know. You ready? Yes. Eleven o'clock. You'll be here in an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go now, Rory. Kiss me goodbye. Judd. Yeah. Oh, the cigarettes. Uh, get them, will you, darling? Will I find change? I shall always remember the look on Harry's face, Lieutenant, as she sank to the floor. They'd concocted a bad dream between them and it had come true. I'll bet he still doesn't know how it happened. If you pass his cell, you might tell him. Just whisper the word gimmick into his ear. Yeah, that's what I said, gimmick. I gimmicked the clock while Rory was dressing. Set it back a full hour. It was eleven to her, but twelve to him. <laughs> I adore gimmicks, don't you? Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Ronald Coleman. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite and bringing back our distinguished star, Mr. Coleman. Thank you, Harlow. You know, it's been over two years since I last played in Autolite's theater of thrills. But I've listened to suspense attain new dramatic heights this season. With such exciting fare as Edwin Drood and, of course, Othello. Harlow, my congratulations to our producer-director, Elliot Lewis... And to Waterlight for magnificent radio entertainment. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. And friends, you can always expect the finest from Autolite, the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. No wonder Autolite serves the greatest names in the industry. Yes, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Autolite. 
Next week, we recreate one of the great mysteries of the sea. A ship found drifting in perfect condition, but with no human aboard. The mystery of the Marie Celeste. Our star, Mr. Van Heflin. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Bluskin. A Vision of Death was adapted for Suspense by Walter Brown Newman from the original story by Jerry Hausner. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Aurora. Featured in the cast were High Aberback, Benny Rubin, Julie Bennett, and Charles Calvert. You can buy Autolite Stapol batteries, Autolite resistor or standard type spark plugs, and Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Witness for Death. Written for Suspense by Ronald Dawson. Based on a story by Ann Howard Bailey. Life was good to me. I had a wonderful wife, a lovely baby... And two of the best friends a man could ever want, Randy and Kay Stoneman. One day after work, I thought I'd drop in at Riley's Grill, where Randy often stopped on his way home. I was approaching the rear entrance when I noticed the time on a window clock and stopped to check my watch. It was exactly 5.45. Suddenly, I saw Randy hurrying out of the rear entrance of Riley's Grill. Randy! Hey, Randy! Randy, it's me, Bert! Randy drove away without seeing me. Little did I think that this simple incident was going to lead to one of the greatest crises in my life. An hour or so later, I was at home when... Uh... Bert, would you come into the living room for a moment? What is it, hon? Move the baby stroller somewhere, will you? Where to? Oh, anywhere, just so it's out of sight before Randy and Kay get here. Going to a lot of fuss, aren't you? Oh, I'm tired of their always seeing the apartment in a mess. Kay has lovely things. Randy has lovely bills, that poor guy. Oh, stop defending him. He spends as much as Kay does. But at least they have things. Oh, salesmen have to look good, Linda. And accountants don't, I suppose? I'll take a steady salary any time. I know Randy's commissions look big, but they... Oh, there they are. Would you let him in, Bert? I want to run across the hall and borrow Mrs. Lacey's steak knife. Keep your shirts on. I'm coming. Oh. Well, I... I You're Bert was... Claxton? Yes, I'd like but to I... talk to you for a couple of minutes. I'm Lieutenant Conover, Police Department. Well, yes, Lieutenant, but my wife and I are expecting company. It won't take long. Just a few questions. Well, okay. Come in. Oh... Uh, What's the trouble, Lieutenant? I haven't done anything. Oh, I'm just checking some facts for the DA. Oh. Okay, shoot. According to my information, you're an accountant. Yes. For the Columbia Mutual Insurance Company for 18 months. That's right. There's another tenant in this same building. Works at Columbia, too. Randolph Stoneman. Yeah. Friend of mine. Randy and I were in Korea together. Mustered out at the same time. Great guy. You see? According to this record, he's worked for me a little over two years. Yep, salesman. When I finished my accountant's course, he pulled me in. <laughs> Randy's that kind of a guy. Um, take a look at this picture. Is him with you? Well, yeah, that's him. Uh, say, what is this? What's this all about? Just routine check, flexing every now and then. Something happens. We got to check it. That's all. Uh, trouble at the company? Not exactly. Well, I'm, I'm glad to cooperate, but like I said, my wife and I are expecting company, and as a matter of fact, it's Randy and his wife. Why, maybe he could help you. Maybe. You see a lot of the Stormans? Well, sure. You guys share rides to work and home, huh? Randy drives me in mornings. I don't own a car. He's out during the day making calls, and sometimes after work, I look for him at Riley's Grill and hitch a ride home. Tom Riley's. I was there this afternoon. I didn't see you there. I was across the street. I didn't go inside. 
You missed him, huh? No. I saw him coming out of the back door. I I yelled, but he didn't hear me over the traffic. What time was it? About? 5.45 on the nose. You're sure? Sure, I'm sure. I happened to check my watch just then. Why? It was Randy Stoneman who came out that back door at 5.45. You're positive? Look, Randy and I have been buddies for years. I'd know him anywhere. Why? But, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Claxton. It's been very helpful. How? I'm sorry I took so long, Bert. Have Randy... Hi, anybody home? Are we too early? Your name Randolph Stoneman? Yeah, Randolph. Long for Randy. Where were you this evening at approximately 5.45, Mr. Stoneman? What's it to you? Here's my badge. Lieutenant Conover, Police Department. So? Did you answer my question, Mr. Stoneman? Well, now, uh, just let me think now. Uh, 5.45, I must have been at home. Yeah, right upstairs at home, wasn't I, Kate? I was washing my hair when you came in. Uh, I'm not sure of the time, but Mr. if you Stoneman, say you were... you're quite sure you weren't leaving Riley's Grill by the back door at 5.45? Well, didn't I just tell you that... I'll have to ask you to come downtown with me, Mr. Stoneman. You can repeat your story there. Hey, let go of my arm. Now, what is this? It's an arrest. An arrest? What for? The man who shot Riley didn't finish the job. Riley's in a coma at City Hospital. For the moment, the charge is assault with intent to kill. If he dies, it'll be murder. What's this got to do with me? Riley was shot at 545. You were seen running out the back door of Riley's grill at 545 p.m. Oh, yeah? Who saw me? Your friend here, Mr. Claxton. <laughs> next morning, I went to see Randy at police headquarters, where he was being held. They ushered me into a bleak and barren room. Presently, Randy entered, still wearing his sports outfit from the night before. It was a rumpled Randy, who looked like a man who had not slept the night before, who sat opposite me at the long table in the center of the room. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad you came. What can I do, Randy? Now, tell me something I can do. <laughs> What can I tell you? I didn't know what he wanted, Randy, last night. I I, I didn't know what he was after. Now look, look, you don't have to prove to me that you're on my team. You didn't shoot Riley. They can't pin this on you. Just because you were there. But I wasn't there. Now get that through your head. I wasn't there, Bert. You didn't see me, understand? But Randy, now I... you know Riley made book in that back room. I got in pretty deep. They got enough to pin this rap on me if Riley died. Well, not if you didn't shoot him. Not if you're innocent. If, if, if. Tell me straight, Randy. I'll believe you. I don't care if you were there. I don't care if you put your fingerprints on the gun. If you tell me you didn't do it... I I'll... am telling you. I wasn't near the place. You didn't see me. You were mistaken. But if you want to put a noose around my neck, Bert, if you want to do that, you just stick to that story of you. Randy! What are you trying to do to me, Bert? But, Randy, I did see you. It's up to you. Now, you just remember that. Buddy... the story as it now stands. You know, my lawyer, Bill, I've come to you for advice. Yes, yes, of course. How is Riley? Well, just before I got here, I called the hospital. He was still in a coma. Your friend is in trouble as it is. But if Riley dies... Yeah. If Riley dies, and Randy's up for murder, I'm going to be a sort of key witness, wouldn't you say? Your testimony will be vital. The prosecution has a strong motive for the shooting in Randy's gambling. But your statement places him at the scene of the shooting at the exact time it happened. Oh, it's all my fault. I got Randy into this mess. You didn't get anybody into anything. You were asked a question. You answered it truthfully. As any law-abiding citizen should. Your statement can't become testimony unless you repeat it under oath at a trial. Testimony? You think I'm going to be a witness against Randy? Oh, not on your life. Well, that's up to you. You came to me for advice, and I'm giving it to you. I suppose you could find a way to evade the subpoena. Lots of people run away from unpleasant things, Bert. But can you run away from yourself? What am I going to do? I'll tell you what you have to do. You'll have to decide. I know you're afraid that Randy Stoneman shot Tom Riley. And if Riley dies, you'll have to choose between your friendship for Randy and justice. <laughs> Hello. Yes? 
Yes, this is he. Oh, well, uh, d- did he regain consciousness before he... No. All right. I'll be there. Thanks for calling. Well, what's the matter, honey? You look... Riley just died. <gasps> oh, no. It's murder. The DA wants to see me tomorrow morning. But that means... Bert, you can't testify. How can you? Do you think I want to? I'd give my right arm if I hadn't seen him. Are you sure you saw him? How can you be sure? I'm sure, I tell you. I saw him. You could have been mistaken. I wasn't mistaken. But I can't send Randy to... I just can't. Bert, what will you do? I don't know. I don't know. The dreaded moment when I would have to make a decision... The side between Randy and Justice was drawing close. It was like a nightmare that never ended, that kept getting worse. A nightmare from which I could not escape by waking up. The next morning I was in the DA's office. I can understand your feelings, Mr. Claxton. Randy Stoneman saved your life in Korea. You two men have been through the mill together. Strong reasons for loyalty. But none of them alters this fact. Randy Stoneman committed murder. That's your opinion. We'll prove it. Randy was living high, way beyond his income. He mishandled his insurance collection. The company's books prove that. He was deeply in debt, not only to stores, but also to Riley. Riley was calling him. Ah, A man doesn't kill just because he owes money. Uh, Suppose he owed $15,000 to a bookmaker who wasn't afraid to play rough. Randy couldn't pay, and he didn't want to be worked over... So he shot Riley. You can't make it stick unless I testify for you. Well, I'm not doing your dirty work. Get yourself another boy. We have your statement, Mr. Clegg. So what? I haven't signed anything. You say evidence doesn't count. Uh, don't give me that smart talk, Claxton. It isn't a question of defying me, you know. You're defying the law. The law was designed to protect, not to punish. We're not persecutors. We're trying to be guardians. So a man can live out his life in peace and safety. Instead of dodging bullets. I'm sorry. You don't understand. I do understand. Don't use friendship as an excuse for protecting a murderer. You're doing him a favor. But you're betraying the rest of us. Now that's a copy of your statement in front of Conover and his assistant. Sign it. I can't. Sign it so we can go into court with a clean case. Sign it. Are you crazy? Let me out of here. You listen. No, you listen. I didn't see anything. I don't know anything. And that's the end of it. Do you hear me? That's the end of it. Not quite. We don't need a signed deposition, you know. You'll be subpoenaed to the witness stand. So what? You'll be asked certain questions. You can answer them truthfully or lie and perjure yourself. What was I to do? I would be asked certain questions. And if I lied, I'd be committing perjury. And if I told the truth, Randy would be hanged. How could I do this to Randy? He saved my life and career. He was my best and closest friend. On my way to Bill Tyler's office, the newspaper headlines fairly screamed at me. Stoneman trial opens tomorrow. D.A. promises quick conviction of Stoneman. Will Burst? Have you come to a decision yet? No. There's not much time left. Why haven't you come back to see me before this? What for? We could have talked things over. Maybe I could have helped you. Nothing helps. I... I keep seeing him. I keep seeing the way he looked at me at the jail the day I visited him. When he said, if you want to put a noose around my neck, stick to your story. But your story is true, Bert. You know it's true. Truth? What's that? I owe Randy my life. That's the truth, too. And you think this will even things? If you lie for him on the witness stand tomorrow and perjure yourself, a life saved equals a life saved? Is that how you figure? Now, what if I have? Well, your figures don't balance. You forgot Tom Riley's life. Isn't Randy Stoneman worth more than Tom Riley? Randy's a good guy, Bill. He worked hard. He had plans for his wife, for himself. And Riley was a crook and a gambler. He deserved killing. I don't know. Now, look, let me alone, will you? And you, Bert. You're a better guy than Randy, is that it? After all, he risked his life pulling you out of the line of fire. Oh, no. You don't stop to think about that. I get... 
A guy's out there, you you go get him. You save him if you can, whether you like him or hate him. Why? What do you mean, why? Because that's the way it is. You don't ask questions about a guy in battle. You just... Well, you just drag him in if you can. A guy's got a right to live. He... A guy has a right to live. Any guy. Any guy at all. Right, Bert? Right. Whether you like him or hate him. A man still has a right to live. Not to be shot down, Bert, and left on the floor to die. I guess I better be going. You have no right to sacrifice the laws which protect all men's lives, Bert. To save one man's life, even if he is your best friend. Please, oh, don't say any more. I... I've got to think. I... Look, will you be in court tomorrow? There's nothing I can do, please. I've got to have somebody on my side. All right. I'll make it a point to be there. Oh, Bert, you're so late. I've been worried. I'm sorry, dear. I went by to talk to Bill Tyler. I phoned you earlier, but you didn't answer. I went up to sit with Kay for a while. She shouldn't be alone. I asked her to come down for coffee. Oh. I wish I hadn't. Was there anything wrong with that? Why shouldn't she sit with her friends on a night like this? Yeah. Guess you're right, dear. Well, what did Bill Tyler say to you? We just talked. What did you talk about? The same thing you're thinking about. The same thing everybody's thinking about every time they look at me. What's he going to say when he gets on the witness stand? Will he tell the truth? Or will he lie? Bert. Take a guess, Linda. It's the $64,000 question. The truth or a lie? Bert, stop it. Stop it. Oh, no. Oh, control yourself. It's probably Kay. I'll let her in. Oh, come in, Kay. I told myself I wouldn't come. But I couldn't help it. I, I just couldn't stay up there alone. No, of course not. We want you here with us. Now sit down. I'll heat the coffee. Hello, Kay. Well, Bert, tomorrow, huh? Yep. A big day. He's got a good lawyer. Things ought to go all right. But will they? Will they go all right, Bert? Who knows? I think you do. You and nobody else. It's your decision whether he goes free or not. Okay, for the love of God. It's your testimony they're depending on. If you say you saw him at Riley's at 5.45, why then... Kay. But if you lie, Bert... Now, look, Kay, I've been through this. You didn't mean that. Yes, I did. Because I know Randy did it. You what? I've known since that first day when he said he came home early. It was almost... Almost 6.30 when he got home. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Of course it matters. All this time I've thought I... I've kidded myself into believing I don't care what he did. Can't you understand? I just want him back. And you can save him, Bert. It's not that simple. Oh, don't give me a lot of words. It's yes or no. That's all I want from you, Bert. All right. I don't know. Why not? What are you doing? Weighing the evidence? It's so easy, Bert. Lie for him. Tell a lie and save a life. You owe him that, Bert. Don't you? Don't you? I don't know. I'm joining petty in you. I'm joining human feelings. What kind of a man are you? What kind of a man are you? Oh, Bert, Bert. Now, don't you start on me, Linda. Bert, you don't be so, so touchy. And what is it? What were you going to say? Oh, I, I, I can't believe it. Even when I heard Kay say it all this time, we've been thinking, all this time, he's guilty. So what? So what? Does that make it any easier? Does that change how I feel about him? Oh, of course, you can't change your feelings so easily. Oh, Poor Kay. Linda. Linda, you've always been the smart one in our little family. Linda, tell me what to do. Oh, darling, I... I wish I were clever enough to tell you. That night I was unable to sleep. Voices kept running through my mind. I, I, I kept hearing things that had been said to me since Randy got into this horrible mess. You will have to decide. I know you're afraid that Randy Stallman shot Tom Riley. And if Riley dies, you'll have to choose between your friendship for Randy and justice. Don't use your 
use your friendship as an excuse for protecting a murderer. You're doing him a favor, but you're betraying the rest of us. What are you doing? Weighing the evidence? So easy, Bert. Lie for him. Tell a lie and save a life. You owe him that, Bert, don't you? Don't you? Stop it. Stop it. I can't stand it anymore. Bert. Bert, darling. Hmm? Oh. I'm... Now try to get some sleep, dear. I know just how you feel, but but try to get some sleep. Everything will work out all right. Will it? Will it? I believe it will. <laughs> State your name and occupation. Bert. Bert Claxton. Speak up uh, so that the jury can hear you. Bert Claxton. I'm an accountant for the Columbia Mutual Insurance Company. Now, Mr. Claxton, I want you to look at the defendant and tell me if you know him. Of course I do. Sandy Stoneman. How long have you known him? A number of years. How many would you say? Five or ten years or more? More than ten years. Then if you saw the defendant on the street, you'd never mistake him for somebody else, or vice versa. Of course not. When I know him as well as I do. You're right. It would be impossible for you to mistake someone else for Randy Stoneman. I'd say so. Thank you. Now, Mr. Claxton, on Friday, October 14th last, where were you at 5.45 p.m.? I was on Platt Street. Were you near the rear exit of Riley's Grill? Yes, sir. Right opposite, on the other side of the street. Now, Mr. Claxton, will you please tell the court exactly what happened as you stood on the other side of the street facing the rear exit of Riley's Grill? The moment I dreaded had come. What was I to do? Should I tell the truth or not? I caught a glimpse of Kay. She was, she was looking at me with desperate pleading in her eyes. I... I could hear her words again. I don't care what he did. Can't you understand? I just want him back. And you can save him, Bert. I turned away from Kay and saw Bill Tyler on the other side of the courtroom. He was watching me, as everyone else was. His eyes fairly burned through me, and I recalled his words. Mr. Claxton, I repeat, will you tell the court exactly what happened as you stood on the other side of the street facing Riley's grill? Well, I looked at my watch. What time was it? Exactly 5.45. All right, go on. What did you do next? I started across the street. And at that moment, I saw Randy Stoneman come out of the back door of Riley's grill. <laughs> Listening to Witness for Death, written for suspense by Ronald Dawson. Heard in tonight's story were Frank Thomas Jr. as Bert Claxton and William Redfield as Randy Stoneman. Others in the cast were Ruth Tobin, Mary Jane Higby, Roger DeCoven, Maurice Tartland, and Guy Rett. Listen again next week when we return with Inferno by Peter Fernandez. Another tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Suspense has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
now, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. In a moment, Act One of Black Death, written especially for suspense by Mercer McLeod, and starring Christopher Carey, currently featured in Camelot. <laughs> Well, it's not getting any. I can't understand why the light should be so dim. Oh, dear. What? That might be my fault. Why do you say that? When I took the car for petrol last Thursday, remember? You said be sure and have the battery checked. Oh, say no more. Yes, I'm afraid I forgot. Then that's it. If I stall, I don't think we'll get started again. I'm sorry, darling. What? what was that? I don't know. I hit something. I can hardly tell whether we're on the road or not. Don't you think we should... We are. Well, here goes. Uh, well, that's it. Oh, Charles. And it's all my fault. Now, don't feel bad about it. I don't think we should have made it anyhow. If we were on a main highway, we might be all right. But these small by roads, miles from anywhere... But what can we do? Well, well, we can sit in the car and hope another car comes along. But the chances of that happening here are remote. We might be better off to walk to help. I'd hate not to make our appointment in Dwolding. In this rain? It's a cold night, Nora. If we keep walking, we can at least keep warm. We're almost certain to find a farmhouse or something. Are you game? Well, I... I think I am. Well, then bundle up and let's get on with it, old girl. Right. Well, come on. I'm afraid we won't make Dwolding tonight. beginning to look a little ominous. Yes. We'd better try calling out, Charles. All right. Hello! Hello there! I... I think I'm a little frightened, Charles. Well, come on, let's both call out. Hello! Hello! Charles, it looks as if we... Quiet, Nora. <laughs> Now, where that dog is, there must be shelter. Yes, there's a light blinking over there. That's for us. Come on. Oh, thank goodness. Are we glad to see you? Why, why? Why? Because we're lost, that's why. How far are we from Dolding? No, about 20 miles. Where do you live? Just over the hill there. But it's no use. He won't let you in, not him. Who are you talking about? The master. And who is the master? Now, now, wait a minute. You can't leave us. Here, wait. Yes. Now listen, you. Whether you like it or not, we're coming with you. And whether the master likes it or not, he's going to give us shelter. You go on ahead. We're following you. Come along. Oh, look, Charles. Look at this huge forbidding house. <laughs> It'll do good, it'll do you. Here, take this for your trouble. Yes. Go this light when I find the key. All right. We'll be inside soon, Nora. Yes. And don't say that I let you in. Now, go straight to that second door past the staircase. Thanks. Yes. Well, here goes. What is the meaning of this? Who let you in? We lost our way on the moors. My home is not an inn. Oh, yes, but surely Just you... Just a minute, Charles. If we were drowning and your boat happened by, we'd try to save ourselves by clinging to it. And look at us. We're practically drowning. That's scarcely my concern. And furthermore, my husband is a doctor. And he was scheduled a lecture in... Oh. A doctor, eh? Well, a scientific man, huh? Well, yes. You'll need dry things. Uh, there's food on the buffet here, and I'll get hot coffee. Do sit down. 
Make yourselves comfortable. Do you mind if we hang our coats in front of the fire? A capital idea. Give me your coat, Charles. I'll spread it out. Thanks, Nora. I'm going to take my shoes off, too. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, more coffee, Jacob. Very good, sir. What are you finding so interesting, Doctor? These strange diagrams drawn on the walls and floor. Oh, oh yes, yes. Those are the nuclei of my science. Hmm. White mice in the cage. And what's this contraption? What does it look like to you? It bears a rough resemblance to a huge camera. <laughs> but the side, all this multicolored glass. I don't know. I'm, I'm quite baffled. In there, my friend, is the element black. Black? Black. One of the greatest destructive forces in the universe. But how about you two eating something, eh? Just help yourselves. Coffee it won't be long. Oh, thank oh, you very nice. much. Right, thank you. It may uh, interest you to know that yours are the first strange faces I've seen here in four years. Really? I spend most of my time hard at work. Very, very hard at work. The results of this work may well benefit humanity. Oh, I'm glad to hear. Oh, don't misunderstand me. I don't give a rap about humanity. However, I'm more productive to your humanity than I should be if I were full of gush as the sentimentalist, speechifying to get murderers out of prison. Do you follow me? Well, yes. You noticed my man, Jacob? Of course. He's a perfect servant. Makes me comfortable. I have no feeling for him. I treat him civilly, pay him, but I never concern myself with him as a human being. I know nothing of his character except what I read of it in his last employer's letter. There are, you see, no truly human relations between us. Would you imagine his work would be better done if I'd made him like me personally? Oh, I would, decidedly. I'm certain it would not be so. He'd trade on any relationship to my disadvantage. Ah, but if a crisis a Crisis? Yes, if you needed his help. Not only as a servant, but... Well, supposing you were sick in need. You'd never get from your relationship what can be prompted only by affection. Affection? Ah, affection! How disgusting that sounds. Disgusting! Uh, ah, the coffee. Just put it down. Yes, sir. Will that be all, sir? For now, yes. Very good, sir. Splendid inhuman efficiency. I think I'd go mad in such an atmosphere. Shh. Never mind, Nora. Now, how do you take your coffee? Black, please. Me too. Black, eh? Black. Very good. Who gazes on black stares at death. I beg your pardon. <laughs> you scientists are quite naive, I find. Well, I fail to see you. Let me explain. I find that black is not, as it is commonly defined, an absence of color or light. It is a prime essence, a vital being. And light, on the contrary, is mere activity. <laughs> well, this black coffee tastes good, and I'm glad we're not out in that black light. There you go again. I don't understand. <laughs> you think night comprehends black? Night is never so dark that you cannot distinguish grades of darkness. There is no black in the darkness of night. Black is absolute. You mean to say that blackness... Who said anything about blackness? I've been talking about black, not blackness. The one is a positive term, the other a weak, indefinite. Call blackness darkness, and the phraseology will be much nearer. But when you come to black, black, I say, you're a grips with the positive element of the universe, a force apparent whose work is death. Then one ought to be afraid to go home after dark. If you had the faintest realization of the infinite significance of the words you use, you turn as pale, as pale as this damask cloth. Here. You see this white mouse? I take it out of its cage, hold it by its tail, and set the black to work. I place it in front of the fatal black ray, 
am. Well, well, where did it go? It vanished. <laughs> exactly, it vanished. And you, Doctor, what do you have to say? I believe I saw something like that years ago at the Palace Theater in New York. You stupid, stupid man of science! I'll show you. Jacob! Jacob! Palace Theater in New York. Yes, sir. Jacob, bring in Damon immediately. The, uh, the dog, sir? That's what I said. The old hound dog, Damon. That is the old one, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. Then quickly, quickly, bring it here. Yes, sir. Right away. Doctor, you look at me with the eye of a diagnostician. You would condemn me as a hysteric or a madman, wouldn't you, Doctor? How would you put it? Uh, suffering from delusion. That would be your diagnosis, wouldn't it? Why, I... Exactly. And having placed a tag on me, you'd wash your hands of the whole business. Oh, I know you men of science. <laughs> ah, Jacob. Bring that hound over here. Master, you're not leave us, Jacob. But, but, sir, not Dave. I said leave us. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I know, Damon. You dislike me, don't you? You all do. It's sense of the animal. Now, as before, Doctor, we set the black to work. became disgusted with you men who call yourselves scientists. Yes, you condemn everything that resists experiments. You reject as false any theory which cannot be proved in the laboratory or the dissecting room. You refuse even to consider my findings in regard to apparitions. Apparitions? Ghosts, if you like. For thousands of years, mankind has persisted in believing that apparitions are fact. But mention them to you, scientists. But there's never been conclusive... Conclusive proof! If I were to tell you that for 23 years I have been investigating the supernatural, and that I know, past all doubt, that ghosts, apparitions, and supernatural beings exist, what would you think? Huh? That I have lost my mind? Well, unless, of course, you could show me an apparition or some supernatural... Show event. me! Show me! The, uh, brandy, sir. All right, all right, put it down. The, uh, storm is over, sir. Has it now? Has it? Yes, sir. Nora, did you hear that? The storm, it's over. Yes, I heard. I think we should get out of here as quickly as we can. Oh, so do I. Take a good swig of brandy, it'll help. I, I did. I don't know how you feel, but I'm ready for that 20-mile walk to Dwolding. Those two demonstrations have convinced me. Darling, I'm ready. Dwolding, did you say? Uh, uh, yes. Why walk? Uh, I don't follow you. Why not uh, take the local? The local? Yes. Do you mean local train? Of course. I didn't know there was one. 
just one a day. It carries mostly freight. Just one passenger coach. About a mile from here. 1110. I'll show you the way. Oh, this is splendid, Charles. You'll be able to give your lecture after all. Scientific lecture? <laughs> well, sort of, yes. With uh, proof, Doctor? Of course. <laughs> you know, 17 years ago, I ran away from you scientific fellows and your proof. <laughs> it seems funny that one should walk in on me tonight. Oh, you and your proof. You think I'm a little mad, don't you, Doctor? Well, I shouldn't say that, sir. I, uh, I'll get our coat. Here's where you catch it, down by the stone fence. Thank you, sir. You say... Leave everything to Jacob. Good night. Thank you for your trouble. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to be out of the whole mad mess. Oh, me too. How do you feel? Fine. The brandy helps. Good. Charles. Come on. It's right on time. <laughs> Well, things turned out a bit better, eh? Ah. Here. Here we are. Ah, come up. That's it. Now we can relax. Oh, I'm so happy to be out of there. Do you think he's a mental case? Oh, I certainly do. Utterly and completely mad. All that business about black. Absolute nonsense. But, darling... What about that dog? And the mouse? They've really disappeared, you know. <laughs> An old magic trick. You know, disappearing rabbit and all that. Just hocus pocus. Oh. Have you noticed that the lights are so dim? Nora, what are you staring at? Uh, everybody, everybody seems to be asleep in this coach. Look at them. Yes. Well, they do seem to... Oh. Nora, what is it? Oh, Charles. They're not asleep. They're... They're all dead. Charles. They're dead. Oh, Charles, I never name what's happening. Wait. Wait, Nora. Easy oh. now. Oh, Charles. <laughs> this branch line. What? Remember? Years ago, an accident. The train jumped the bridge into the valley. Shook up, but both in one piece. Oh, think we can get them to the house? I think so. Can you help the woman? Uh, I think so. Oh. All right. Oh. Up we go now. There, there, there. Now, can, can you walk? Yes. 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 That's the way. Now, off we go. There. It feels better, doesn't it? Here. Have another sip. You too, sir. You all right, Nora? Yes. Where are we? We are in the sunroom of the master's house. Back here again? Yes. You're both very lucky. Bruised and shook up a bit. Could have been lots worse. Am I... Am I dreaming all this? And what about that train? That's what you were ranting about when I brought you in. There was no train. There's no line there. Hasn't been one for years. There was a bad accident there years ago. Train jumped the bridge into the valley. Hasn't been used since. But you and your wife were in that accident. I brought it back to demonstrate another power of black. Doctor, listen carefully. I made it happen again. Remember what I said about my findings regarding apparitions? Well... What do you think now? And now, if you'll excuse me. Now what's going on? Couldn't tell you, sir. I've long since given up trying to understand the master. 
Well, you're both looking much better. Let me pour you some more brandy. We'll both feel much better when we can be on our way. Here you are. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm dreadfully tired, Charles. What's he doing with that contraption now? Don't know, sir. He said something about his most noble achievement. What? Charles, he means humans. Uh, listen, Jacob, we've got to get out of here, and quickly, you understand? I, uh, I cannot go against the master's order. Jacob, I want to stop with a dog. Bring me one of the older hounds. Jacob! Jacob! Uh, yes, sir. A dog. You heard what I said, Jacob. We've got to get out of here. I think we'd all better get out. Follow me. Come along, Nora. Where are we going? Any place as long as it's away from here. He wants a dog. How dare him a dog? Follow me down this corridor. He shall have a dog, all right. Charles, what's happening to us? I don't know yet. Now stand beside of the door. Open this cage. They won't harm you. They won't even scream. Now, down there. to Black Death, written especially for suspense by Mercer McLeod, and starring Christopher Carey, currently featured in Camelot. Come on in here, Mr. Thorne. This is the best of my collection. It's amazing, McCrane. <laughs> I see that you haven't specialized, have you? Lion, leopard, water buffalo. Panther, cheetah, cougar. Oh, she's touched all the bases. That's the largest polar bear head I've ever seen. Lester thinks my trophies make the house look like a museum. <laughs> um, one thought comes to mind. What's left? I don't intend to try for the abominable snowman, if that's what you mean. <laughs> but something will catch my interest. Oh, confess, Liz, it has. The fish. Did you say fish? Japanese fighting fish. The tanks are over here against the wall. I'll turn on some more lights. Oh. Well, oh, they're beautiful. Mmm. Hate and fury compressed into tiny bodies. Liz tends them as if they were children. Well, they are. Children of death. A lion is a fraud compared to them. If he isn't hungry, you can walk right up to him. The other big cats will attack or not, according to the whim of the moment. But these views have a single purpose. They'll fight any time and there's no truth. Put two in a single tank and only one stays alive. They're the most perfect killers in the world. <laughs> Theater 5 presents Miss Wendy Berry in Children of Death. Look, Ron, you're really getting the $50 tour. I appreciate it. Ah, these fish are certainly a novel hobby, Mrs. Crane. Wouldn't macabre be a better word? Lester, where are Tom and Alan? On the terrace. Alan seemed very concerned about the proposed mental hospital. My attorney has a conditioned reflex against charitable donations. Well, sweet, a million dollars ain't hay, as the jet set would say. Speaking of money, I talked to Carter about your last bill for his bookstore. He won't charge anything from now on without my approval. Liz, you didn't. 
My new book. If you must research your latest plaything, get a card to the public library. You'll be amazed at all the books they have. All free. No, you don't want to understand my work. Um, uh, Mrs. Crane, I... I... Oh, don't be embarrassed. He'll sulk a little, and then come as if nothing had happened. Nothing ever does with Lester. Uh, well, Besides, I... this gives us a moment to be alone. Oh, uh, yes. After our phone conversation, I kept wondering if this wasn't a job for a doctor instead of a retired criminologist. I already have a doctor. These incidents I told you about, petty things individually, but rather damaging collectively. The feeling is growing in our community that Elizabeth Porter Crane may be a little un unbalanced. Here's a written list of the what's and when's. ordered. Servants dismissed. Mm, even a car which I presumably told Lester to buy. You have no recollection of any of this? None whatsoever. You could be suffering from recurring amnesia. I'm not paying you for guesses. Your meeting with Lester was fortunate. It makes contact easy for us. Do whatever you think necessary and let me know when you get an answer. But... No but. Besides, we're about to be interrupted. Well, uh, Elizabeth, I, uh, I'm low here from that excellent dinner, but we really should go over the plans for the hospital. Well, of course, Tom. Come into the library with me. Elizabeth, uh, before you finalize anything, I'd like to make some suggestions regarding the liquid position of the estate. I'll be in your office at nine tomorrow morning, Alan. Satisfactory? It'll have to be. You're the boss. Thanks for the dinner, and good night, all. Good night. Oh, leaving, Alan? Yes. Good night, Lester. It is getting late. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, let's have a night, Cap. Oh, do stay. Lester can do the honors. But Tom and I won't be long. Oh. Quite a woman. An American legend. Elizabeth Porter Crane, business tycoon and big game hunter. Colorful. Like the stories about Martin Thorne, man hunter. Oh, <laughs> well, that was just newspaper exuberance at the time I retired. I'm an avid reader. Frankly, our uh, chance meeting at the golf club wasn't quite by chance. Oh? Someone pointed you out to me and mentioned that you were down here for a long weekend. Oh. And now, uh, well, I'm going to try and take advantage of a short acquaintanceship. A direct approach, eh? Yes. Uh, in your career, <clears throat> you had experience with the introverted, the manic, the various types that can, under certain conditions, uh, become a menace to society or to themselves. Uh, what are you getting at? My wife. I... I've been terribly worried about Elizabeth lately. In what way? <laughs> Isn't it obvious? African safaris, expeditions down the Amazon, those fighting fish. She watches them, you know, watches them kill each other. But, I don't know, perhaps I'm oversensitive. No, it's not a common spectator sport. Liz has a morbid preoccupation with death, which leads me to these family heirlooms on the mantelpiece. As I notice them, matched derringers in excellent condition, pre-Civil War, aren't they? Yes, yes. They're commonly known as gambler's guns because they were used by Mississippi River card sharps. A collector's item. Hmm. One of them is a death gun. What? Hmm. These pistols belong to Caswell Porter, Elizabeth's grandfather. He used one to blow a hole in his head. Oh. Well, perhaps now you understand my concern. <laughs> Dispose of these securities immediately. That will provide the necessary cash. Oh, I wish you would reconsider this donation to the hospital fund. My mind's made up, Alan. It's not a mistake. Sometime, couldn't you make one? It's hard to work for a boss who is always right. Mm, when I do make a mistake, it's king-sized. Now, I've got a hypothetical question for your legal mind. The, uh, quote, good friend, end quote? Oh, never mind the comments. And never mind the hypothetical, come to think of it. What 
would happen to my estate if I were committed to an institution? Institution? A mental institution. Lester is my heir. Would he take over the estate if I was declared insane? No. No what? No Porter Enterprises for Lester. In the event you were ever declared mentally unbalanced, a board of trustees would be set up to administer the estate until such time as you recover or die. But why the question? My husband may be showing signs of initiative. I'm wondering if he's hatching a plot. Well, if it's relative to your sanity, what's the motive? Hmm. This could be another choice bit of gossip. I suggest you forget if you want the annual retainer I pay you. Shouldn't we discuss this? If there is some scheme... Alan, please. Anything left to dreams up, I can handle. Well, Alan, sit down. The distinguished counselor looks jumpy. Distinguished counselor? Hmm. Don't you mean Elizabeth Slagman? <laughs> Sorry, I guess her candor is contagious. Tom, I'm risking my annual retainer from Porter Enterprises, but I have to talk to you. Uh-huh. You're Elizabeth's oldest friend, if she has a friend. She has one. Elizabeth just left my office. She wanted to find out what would happen if she were declared insane. Insane? Isn't it our duty to put the estate in trust? Elizabeth recovered. From what? Mental instability. Oh. Obviously, she's worried about it. It was her grandfather's suicide, remember? And her actions have certainly been strange lately. Now, you're her doctor, and I'm her lawyer. I think that perhaps together, we could swing it. Alan, let's get something straight. The Porters have always been brilliant, and the line between genius and insanity is sometimes a thin one. But as far as I'm concerned, Elizabeth is as sane as you are. So, I was right. Not about Elizabeth. About you. The Porter Memorial Hospital means a lot to you, doesn't it? And to the community. Your fund drive can't get off the ground without Elizabeth's million-dollar donation. What's your point? As long as Elizabeth is in charge of the estate, you get your hospital. You're willing to overlook anything. Before you start a rumor that could be damaging to my practice, answer me a question about your business, Counselor. Yours on rebuttal, Doctor. Elizabeth has handled her business like all the porters, meaning she's been making money hand over fist. Now, why does this charitable gesture bother you? Is it because there might be an audit of the books? You haven't been tampering with funds, have you, Counselor? No, no. What a damaging little whisper that could be. (laughs) Rumor is a double-edged weapon. So, it's a Mexican standoff. Let's call it an armed truce. At least we both know where we stand. Before I leave, have you given Elizabeth a checkup recently? Last week, why? It occurred to me that there's another pawn on the board. Lester? Elizabeth feels he's up to something. She has a nasty habit of being right. Uh, Lester isn't poisoning her, if that's what you had in mind. I don't know what I have in mind. Now, you know, Elizabeth's marriage... Which was not made in heaven. No, no. Lester isn't the driving, empire-building porter type at all. Agreed. Now, you don't suppose Elizabeth is thinking of disposing of her one big mistake... Lester. (laughs) Well, you certainly run the gamut. First, Elizabeth's crazy. Second, Lester's trying to get rid of her. Now she's planning to do away with him. By the way, am I trying to kill anyone? No, Mordhiv. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Counselor.
come in, Mr. Thorne. Lester's out and the servants are in the kitchen preparing for tonight's party. By the way, you're invited. I plan to return to New York. Your work is finished? I think so. Come into the study. Have you got an answer? I've come to a conclusion. You gave me a list of incidents. Situations where you apparently suffered a loss of memory. I checked out every one. And? They all had one thing in common. A middleman. Lester? Yes. Let's take one instance, since it applies to them all. On the fourth of this month, you supposedly told your husband to order two dozen roses from the florist and then completely forgot about it. But no one heard you tell him. There were no witnesses. And my guess is that you never told him to buy the flowers. He just said you did. However... Well, what's wrong with that line of reasoning? I had a chat with your husband the night I was here for dinner. It's a point, but... He never mentioned that your memory was playing tricks. Instead, he seemed concerned about your preoccupation with death. Anything else? He made reference to your grandfather. You mean his suicide? Oh. I'm making out your check, Mr. Thorne. You've given me my answer. How? Oh, I'll give you a clue. When you're hunting the big cats, as I have, the first problem is to find them. And if you want to be sure they're in front of you and in the open, not behind you, in the bush. It's a question of establishing who's hunting who. I don't follow that. Well, I mean that now I know where the lion is. And I hope you'll change your mind about this evening. It'll be a small affair, and I'm going to announce my donation of a million dollars to the Caswell Porter Memorial Hospital. And you'll solicit other donations? Yes, but that's not the part that would interest you. Some other things might. There's the dominant wife. The ineffectual husband, the family doctor with ambitions to head up a new mental clinic, and a lawyer with a frustrated power complex. Do come in, Mr. Thorne. Death may dance at our party tonight. No, I didn't forget my little beauties. Dinner's on time as usual. Oh, uh, Liz. I, uh, couldn't find you, so I... I figured you'd come up here to feed those little monsters. That's not all you figured, is it, Lester? What? Isn't this the zero hour for you? What's that mean? Lester, pretense is tiresome and you're so obvious. Inching your way to the mantle. It was a clever scheme. What? What scheme? The rumors, dear. Whispers about my faulty memory, my morbid moods and preoccupation with death. But you weren't trying to prove I was mentally unstable. You were laying the foundation for my death. You told somebody. What? And spoil the hunt? Of course not. Well, then it will work. Elizabeth hasn't been quite right lately. Seems definitely unbalanced. She just went into the study and, like her grandfather, shot herself with the same gun. A good speech. But to make it effective, I have to be dead. Well, go ahead, Lester. From where you're standing, you can almost reach the mantelpiece. The gun is loaded there, waiting, but... The other gun is right here in the drawer of the desk. And it's loaded, too. What? Oh, don't lose your nerve now, Lester, because I know. And I can't let you off the hook to try again. We're like my children of death, aren't we? This room is our tank, and only one of us can remain alive. You... You don't know! Oh! oh. <sighs> Let's put your gun back in the mantelpiece. And place the weapon in your hand. There. The stage is set. And it's set for your suicide, Lester. Not mine. Elizabeth, I know this is a terrible shock, but you're bearing up beautifully. Oh, I have no choice. If I thought hysterics would bring Lester back, I'd dissolve into a flood of tears. You're an amazing woman. Oh, a fortunate woman, Alan. And having you and Tom and Mr. Thorne to help me. Mr. Thorne, you're familiar with what has to be done. Mm. 
Uh, perhaps you could call the police and with your influence, maybe we can keep this from the other guests. I'm sure the three of us can take care of everything. Of course. Uh, why don't you go upstairs and lie down, Elizabeth? I'll get you a sedative. I wouldn't advise that right now. Oh, pardon? I have had a lot of experience in matters of this kind. And there's a procedure that the police automatically follow. What's that? You're uh, a lawyer. You should know that they will take a paraffinist of Mr. Crane's hands to prove that he fired a gun tonight. And if the test is negative, they'll run the same check on Mrs. Crane. I think her test will prove positive. What do you suggest? Oh, shut up, Tom. You mean the police will know that I fired the derringer? Definitely. Death did dance at your party tonight. And it was murder. All right. Call the police, Thorn. I killed him. My dear, you are hysterical. Don't admit anything. Quiet, both of you. There's a lot to be done. Alan, I want all the money allocated for the Caswell Porter Memorial Mental Hospital to be transferred to the fund immediately. Tom, I want your promise that you will push through the fund drive and start construction on the hospital as quickly as possible. But Elizabeth... Oh, think, will you? Think. Obviously, I'm going on trial for murder. It's equally obvious that we'll have only one possible defense. If that defense is successful, who knows? I may be the first patient in the Porter Memorial Mental Hospital... I'll certainly want a comfortable suite. Presented Children of Death, starring Miss Wendy Berry. Written by Frank Thomas, directed by Ted Bell. Featured in the cast, George Petrie, David Kerman, Paul McGrath, and Jack Manning. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Ralph Herman. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. Again, the immortal tale, The Ghost's Touch. Is it true that when you are very close to death, the dead are really able to reach out to protect you? I don't know, but Ralph Sand and I had been married only a few months when he died. We had been so completely and deeply in love that the memory of the happiness we had found is a thing which will always dominate my life. Well, John Stevens, one of Ralph's best friends, had invited me to spend some time with him on the coast where he had a large house. It was in the town where I had first met Ralph. Mrs. Stewart, my housekeeper and companion, went with me, and Paul Weston, another of Ralph's closest friends, was also there. But he lived in his own house nearby. I had been enjoying my stay there immensely. John had not been with us much, but Mrs. Stewart and I enjoyed the park and the beach. John had been particularly careful about my food, a fact which greatly pleased me. One morning, Mrs. Stewart and I had just returned from the beach. We were standing in the great front hall of the house when she brought up something I know had been on both our minds ever since we'd arrived. My... It's quiet in this big old house. Hasn't it been quiet, Mrs. Stewart? You know, I can remember when this was one of the liveliest houses in St. Anne's. And John was one of the jolliest men alive. Mm, sort of gives me the willies, Mrs. Zant. Something kind of brooding here. No one ever around this part of the house. The servants are all way off in the back there. Does that seem strange to you? You know, I thought that maybe I was just disappointed. Comparing it with the way I remembered it when Ralph and I were here together. Oh, no, ma'am. There's something funny here. You mark my words. 
I didn't want to say nothing, hoping not to worry you. But Mr. John has acted so strange, too. He's a lot more thoughtful than he ever was before. And then, there's that funny smell. Yes. I've smelled that, too. But I thought it was just my imagination. And the strange way Mr. John looks at you after breakfast, when he gets up so solemn-like and goes up into that room at the head of the stairs. He never comes out again till dinner. So what's in that room anyway, Mrs. Zan? Oh, I don't know. It's a study of some sort, I guess, where John's doing some work. You know, yesterday I got hunting for that smell, and I traced it right to that door. I snipped all around there and tried to decide what it was. I heard something in there, too. What? Mr. John was in there. I could hear him muttering to himself. No words, mind you, just muttering. And every once in a while, it sounded as though he was stirring something in the glass. Finally, guess what he said? Oh, Mrs. Stewart, I think you've been imagining things. We're letting ourselves get nervous over something that's probably nothing at all. Well, he said, ah, at last, now I'm certain this will work. Just then, he came toward the door, so I ran back to my room and shut the door. Well, I don't think he'd mind if we went and paid him a visit. Then you can see what he's doing. I wonder if he's up there now. <gasps> oh, my goodness, that startled me. He's at the front door. Why, it's Mr. Paul. I can see him through the glass in the door. I'll just let him in. It takes these servants here so long to get from way back where they are. Oh, hello, Mr. Stewart. Is Mrs. Zant here? Hello, Paul. Come on in. Oh. Why, Dorothy, what are you standing there like that for? You look worried, and as though you're just about to do something about it. Well, Paul, as a matter of fact, we were just going up to pay John a visit in his study. There at the head of the stairs. Study? Why, Dorothy, didn't he tell you what that is? No. That's a laboratory, and he's forbidden everyone to come in there, practically on pain of death. Well, he hasn't forbidden me, and I'm going to find out what goes on in there. I think that was a little mean of him. Oh, Mrs. Sand, do you think you'd better? Certainly I do. And I'm going up now. Well, I might as well get hung for a sheep as a lamb. I'll come along, too. Uh, come on, Mrs. Stewart. Well, you aren't frightened, are you, Mrs. Stewart? There's no telling what we may find. Well, <laughs> it can't be too awful. John's no demon, anyway. No answer. Maybe he's gone out. I'm going to look and see. Be careful, Mrs. Zand. Get out. I told you... Oh. Oh, Dorothy, come in. I didn't realize it was you. Well, we're all here, John. We came up to pay you a little visit. Fine, fine. Come on in, but uh, shut the door. Hello, Paul. When did you arrive? Mm -hmm. Just came in. Dorothy said she wanted to come up here. I told her we'd all been forbidden, but she insisted, so my curiosity got the better of me, too. Well, that's fine. I'm really glad you did. This is a good day for me. This is really magnificent. Yes, Dorothy. What do you think of my private domain? Well, if it's big enough, I'll say that for it. It's, it's a little frightening. Yeah, no smells so good to me either. <laughs> Mrs. Stewart doesn't understand experiments the way we do, does she, Dorothy? Oh, I don't, Mr. John. And after seeing Mrs. Zant foon with them dangerous chemicals, I don't know as I want to either. Oh. What's that, Dorothy? You? Why, yes, Paul, I've been doing some experiments. Just for fun, mostly, but it does take up my time since I'm alone so much. That's why I think it was so unfair of John not to tell me he had such a wonderful laboratory here. Well, Dorothy, I've been saving that for later, until this experiment is well underway. I've been hoping we might work together very soon. John, what are those tables over there? They look like... The dissecting tables? Yes, that's what they are. Well, of course, if you're going in for anatomy on the side, I... I'm afraid you'll leave me way behind. Why, no, my dear, quite the contrary. I had hoped you'd follow right along. I'm sure you will with this new experiment. Well, you, you've got to tell us now what this experiment is. You've certainly got our curiosity aroused. Now, I'll tell you, of course. I have finally developed a new formula. This is the chemical part, which will eventually make a subject absolutely impervious to pain. That is, I will be able to operate without the use of anesthetics. Perform any sort of operation I wish. How does it work? I feed small doses of a certain formula, a very dangerous one, by the way, to the patient's in his food. Dangerous because while he's taking them, the patient occasionally falls into semi-conscious states in which he is very close to death. Then, when a certain stage is reached, there is one more dose which the patient must drink straight without any other food. Then the subject becomes unconscious of any pain whatever. 
But what's the purpose of that? Surely the development of anesthetics. But this, you see, leaves the scientists free to operate on conscious living animals without the stopping of some functions brought on by anesthetics. And this never wears off. Have you ever tried it? Several times, my dear, and with success. I am just waiting now to try my greatest experiment of the lot. To use my formula on the most complicated of living organisms, the human. But, John, you're, you're not going to go on with this, are you? Well, certainly. Why should I stop now? Especially when I'm so near the final experiment. Do you mind, John, if Mrs. Stewart and I go down to the beach? I'm afraid the air in here has made me a little dizzy. That's a good idea, Dorothy. We'll come right along to walk with you. By all means, go ahead. Do get plenty of fresh air, my dear. I hope you'll see more of the laboratory later. Much more. I wondered then what it was in John's look that startled me. Or was it something in his voice? A chill of apprehension made me turn and hurry ahead of Mrs. Stewart out into the cool seashore air. I was sure that John was telling me something. Saying something to me alone. And I was afraid even then to let myself believe what I thought it was. Mrs. Stewart and I walked through a little park that lay between the house and the beach. It was a place of many wonderful memories to me. The place where Ralph had first kissed me. We passed the tree where Ralph and I had stood that day, and Mrs. Stewart, bless her, knew what I felt as we came to the spot. She looked at me. These memories aren't going to spoil your visit now, are they, Mrs. Zant? You know, there's a lot of things a person has to live with all her life. Oh, no, Mrs. Stewart. My memories of him wouldn't spoil anything. They're too beautiful. Well, I just thought from the way you were looking over at that tree, the one... You know, I'm going over and touch that tree. Just for luck. I feel as though I need some luck right now. I feel... But... Mrs. Ant. Mrs. Oh. Ant. Mrs. Ant. What? Well, what's wrong? What are you looking like that for? As though you'd seen a ghost. Oh, Mrs. Stewart, I... I... Where are you? Mrs. Ant, can't you see me here? But you're looking at me as though you've gone blind. Mrs. Ant. Mrs. Ant. Mrs. Ant. No, I'm not blind. I can see everything. The tree, the grass, the whole park. But you've gone. I can't hear you anymore. I can't see you. Mrs. Stewart. Mrs. Stewart. You remember, didn't you, Dorothy? You're not afraid. Oh, Ralph. You're here. But I can't see you. It seems as though I can feel your hand on mine. But I can't see you. I'm right here beside you, darling. Always beside you. You've been gone so long, Ralph. I'm always beside you. But I haven't seen you. I haven't been with you before. Dorothy. Dorothy, darling. It can't be for long this time either. They're coming soon. They're on their way now. Who, my dearest? All of them. Don't forget the others. They'll be here. Don't forget the others. Why can't I see you, Ralph? When I want to so much. I can still feel you. It seems as though you have your arm around me. Oh, Ralph. Oh, Ralph. I'm here, though. Right here with you, my darling. Why didn't you let me know before that we were so near to each other? Because you had to come a long way to me first. And now it's time for you to know it certainly. You already know why. Are you here to protect me? You are. You are, I know it. But from what, Ralph? From what? Dorothy! Dorothy! Mrs. Stant! Oh, thank heavens, Mrs. Stant! You are, aren't you, Ralph? You will protect me. I'll come back to see you here, Ralph. I'll come back. Ralph! Where are you? Why don't you answer? Oh, Ralph, where are you? Dorothy, it's all right. Dorothy, can't you hear me? Can't you see me? Yes, Dorothy. Do you feel all right? 
for? Mrs. Stewart. Oh, Mrs. Hunt. I ran and found Mr. Paul as fast as I could. You oh. stood there looking straight at me and you wouldn't answer me. You didn't even see me when I put my hand up in front of your face. Oh, oh you gave me an awful fright. Mrs. Stewart came running for us. She said you seemed to have gone into a trance. I came as soon as I could. Uh, she's all right now, isn't she? Yes, now she is. But it certainly is strange. Not strange at all. In fact, rather to be expected. Why, Mr. John, Mrs. Zant hasn't ever had anything like that before. You didn't even see how she was. Mr. Paul here can tell you. Why expected, John? Oh, perhaps the air in the laboratory upset her. Perhaps uh, something she ate. Who knows? The shock of Ralph's passing away hasn't really left her yet, has it, my dear? I... I think we're imagining things. I'm afraid that perhaps the food my cook has been serving has been a bit rich these past few days. I spoke to her about it this morning. You all right now, Mrs. Ant? Oh, quite all right, thank you. I, um, I think we'd better go down to the beach. I'll come along with you, Dorothy. If you'll excuse me, I must get back to the laboratory. My, my dog has been acting rather strangely in the last few minutes. Something very interesting may develop. Will you excuse me? Certainly, John. We'll be back shortly. Uh, don't hurry. Dinner won't be ready for a while, and that's all you need to be back for. I'll see you later. Dorothy, I don't like this at all. Are you afraid of something, Paul? Mr. Paul means this funny spell you just had, and I agree with him. It was very strange, but it was very wonderful. Tell me, Dorothy, you know something about chemistry. Would it be possible for John actually to do what he says he has done? Well, there are a great many strange things that can be done with chemistry, Paul. And I believe, yes, that a mind bent on such an insane purpose could probably develop such a combination. But wouldn't it be very dangerous? You're thinking of that spell I just had in connection with it, aren't you? Well, he did say some strange things there in the laboratory. And you may be very right, too, Paul, in suspecting him. I may already have been... Dorothy! Oh, Mrs. Sand, no. Please, let's go home today. But, Dorothy, if you think... No, Paul. Something happened when I was standing under that tree. I talked to Ralph. But Dorothy... And I promised to go back to talk to him again tomorrow. You see, I have to stay here now. Because I must talk to him again. It isn't possible. I may be in great danger, Paul. Even this minute, here with you on this sunny beach, I may be very near to death. But I want to see whether what I believe is true. Because perhaps I am so close to death that the spirit of the man who loves me can reach across the narrow space that divides us and protect me. If that is so, I will have discovered more than a thousand insane experiments can prove. You see, I have to stay now. But Dorothy, hasn't he protected you already? Hasn't he warned you? No, Paul. He's waiting for something. Something else. I think I know what. Didn't he say? No, but there will be more. He told me to come back. He wouldn't have done that if there weren't more. Would he? Shall I have the main dish brought in? Are you both ready? I think you'll find the dinner very good tonight. Since I spoke to the cook this morning, she... Oh, here it is now. Are you sure you feel well enough to eat, Dorothy? Yes, thank you, Paul. I feel very well now. The afternoon must... Oh, Rogers, I believe you've mixed the plates. That one is for Mrs. Ant. Uh, that's all right, John. I don't believe I'll have much dinner anyway. I'm not very hungry. Give Dorothy mine. But I insist. Dorothy's is really quite... Special. I... I... Listen. Oh, listen. Is... Is something wrong, my dear? Oh, I... No, no, it, it was nothing. But, John, does it really matter that much? Perhaps John has had something special prepared for me, Paul. That's very nice of him. And it will be quite all right. Thank you, Dorothy. We scientists seem to understand each other, don't we? Dorothy, Dorothy. It's all right, Paul. At this dinner and going to bed early tonight, we'll fix Dorothy up splendidly, Paul. Wait and see. 
Suddenly I had felt Ralph close to me again. It gave me a new confidence. A knowledge that whatever happened now, I was protected. I tasted nothing strange about the food. But I hadn't noticed anything in the meals before either. Ralph was waiting, I was sure now, until John became bold enough to spell his own destruction. The next afternoon, nothing could have kept me in the house. John had been in the laboratory all morning. And when I looked in, I noticed with a shudder that one of the operating tables was covered with clean white sheets. I went quickly out to the tree where I had been with Ralph the day before. It seemed a long time before I again felt that strange, numb feeling. As though my life had almost left my body. But... Dorothy, my darling, you are here, under our tree. How could I help coming, Ralph, when you promised that we'd be together again today? I didn't promise, my dear. I couldn't promise that much. But remember, my darling, I am always near you. Ralph! Ralph, where are you? You aren't here anymore. What was that? Look at me, Ralph! The grass is all beginning to burn and turn round. Our tree is withering. Ralph! What was that? That great black man coming toward me. John. John, where did you come from? I can only see your face staring at me out of that awful darkness. It's all right, isn't it, Dorothy? You're going to be all right. You said so last night. And you know it's true, don't you? What's true? I don't know anything now. Where's Ralph? Oh, John, why are you fighting me this way? Ralph! Ralph! You're going to be all right now. Aren't you, Dorothy? All right now. one of those spells again, Mrs. Zant. I'm frightened. Mrs. Oh, Stewart and I came out to walk with you, Dorothy. Uh, we found you here again, just standing here, not seeing anything. I'm going to call Mr. Paul. I don't like this. It frightens me. Mr. Paul will know what to do. Shall we go back to the house, Dorothy? You'll feel better in a minute. No, John. Let's just wait here a minute. Mrs. Stewart will be back with Paul. But everything is ready at the house. I have some work waiting. But, John, I... I... That darkness all around you. I can't see anything but your face again. You will follow me back to the house, won't you, Dorothy? That's it, of course you will. Yes, John. Of course. I'll come with you. Everything here is brown and burnt. Park has grown so with it. It's horrible here now. Come on, Dorothy. We'll go slowly. Come along with me. One step. One step. That's it. Come along with me. Look at those birds over there. They're such big black birds. And they're falling, dropping right into the sea. What's the matter with them, John? Why don't they come up again? Don't be afraid of them, Dorothy. Just come with me. One step. One step. And look. Those awful things. Snakes. Snakes. Huge ones. And they're not moving. John, they're dead. Nothing here ever stays alive anymore. Oh. Oh, it's hard. It's hard. Burning hot. It doesn't matter now, Dorothy. Oh. Nothing will hurt anymore. One step. Mm. One step. Here's the door. The door to the house. Wait. Wait while I open it. But John, it's open. It's open and it's all dark in there. So dark I can't even see your face anymore. John, where are you? Right here, Dorothy. Come up the stairs. One step. One step. But everything is so confused. 
I can't find the stairs. I can't find anything. It isn't real. Everything is mixed up. I've lost something. I've lost something I can't remember. We're almost there, Dorothy. One step. One step. I can't remember. It was... Ralph. Ralph. Ralph, where are you? I'm afraid. I'm alone here in the darkness. There's no one here. Even John has gone away now. There isn't any light. Ralph! Oh, Ralph. Oh, Ralph, you are near me. I can feel you here now. I'm not alone. It's near now. It's almost time, my darling. Here, let me hold your hand. I can feel your hand on mine, Ralph. But I still can't see you. It's so dark in here. Come on, Dorothy. The stairs are there. One step. One step. Oh, Ralph, your hand is helping me along. Hold me tight. In here, Dorothy. Right in here. This is where we'll work, isn't it? It's the laboratory, Ralph. This horrible, evil-smelling laboratory. Ralph, I'm afraid. Why don't you speak to me? Now we're all right, Dorothy. Now we'll work together, won't we? I'm thirsty. I'm so terribly thirsty. That heat. The pot is so hot. It's all burned up. I'm thirsty. Here. Here, drink this, Dorothy. This will cure your thirst. You'll be all right. Nothing will hurt anymore. I'm not afraid now, Ralph. I- I'm thirsty. Why can't I have a drink? It'll be all right. That's right, Dorothy. Drink this. Let me hold it up to your lips. I'm so thirsty. I'm going to come and do me, Ralph! him. John. John. He's dead. Oh. He was just holding that glass to your lips, Dorothy, when we came in, and suddenly it shook out of his hand as though someone had grabbed hold of his wrist. A powerful hand. It was like as if a ghost had reached out and knocked that glass out of his hand. Someone did, Paul. Ralph. But no one was here. It couldn't have been. Oh, Mrs. Sam, I was protected. I knew I would be. Ralph was able to reach across and save me, Paul. I know it. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you The Ghost's Touch. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. of a world gone by speak again the immortal tale The Wooden Ghost We head out Look yonder on the road Wait. What is it, Fondriel? A man hailing us to stop What shall I do? Where? I don't see a thing but darkness He may be a highwayman do you have your pistol? Oh, yes, I see him now. Uh, stop the carriage, Ventrill. Uh, the man may need help. Now, where did he go? Ventrill, can you see him from your box up there? No, Mainherr. He, he disappeared. Oh, look, Mainherr, now. There in the shadows beside the road. A tall man in a cape and wide-brimmed hat. Ventrill, drive on. Coachman, hold the reins. Mean hair now. What shall I do? He's coming toward the carriage, Fondriel. Wait. A 
Are you Mainherr Gerard Dow? I am. What do you want? I have been waiting until your return from Rotterdam. You are the uncle and guardian of Rose Falderkaust, I believe. Yes. Yes, I am. Tonight, by the clock of the Stathurst, I will call at your studio in Leiden to see you on an urgent matter. Yes, but uh, what urgent matter is it, mein Herr? I will tell you of it then. Here is my card. Expect me at seven. Good evening to you. Good... Good evening. Mein Herr Dow, what kind of a man is he? I could not see his face. Nor could I, Van Veel. It, it was as if he had no face... Oh, the saints protect us. Drive away from here as fast as you can. Get up there. Get up. <laughs> and I'll admit your good uncle's the best teacher in Holland, that without a shadow of doubt I'm his most promising student. But I can't understand how you, Rose Felderkaust, can expect anybody to paint a portrait of a man without a face. But, Godfrey, I told you I've never seen his face. Well, then when did you first meet him? Oh, long ago, when I was a little girl. And Uncle Gerard and I lived in Rotterdam. One day we went for a long walk outside the city and ate our lunch on the steps of an ancient house that's fallen to ruin. The statue was there, life-size, in a niche in one of the walls. It was carved of wood. Since that time, I've dreamed him here every birthday. You mean all this is a dream? Oh, of course. You didn't think he was real, did you? Oh, the saints preserve us. He's a dream. Of course I thought he was real from the way you spoke of him. Well, perhaps he is after all. How else do the gold coins appear so mysteriously on my dresser every birthday? Why, Rose, my darling, I, I really think you believe in this dream ghost or whatever you call him. He wishes me well. He looks over me, brings good luck. Why shouldn't I believe in him? Of course you should if you want to. Uh, Rose, where are you? Here, Uncle Gerard, with Godfrey in the studio. Oh, I thought he wasn't returning till late tonight. Something must have happened. Oh, dear, what a trip. Two hours of being bounced and jostled in one of Van Driel's infernal carriages. I'll never rent another one from him, never. Was it so bad, Uncle Gerard? You do look tired. I do, do I? Well, I am. Oh, now, where's your new frock? Go, put on your new frock, Rose. Look pretty for Godfrey and for me this evening. But I was planning to wear it tomorrow on my birthday. Mm, a girl should always look pretty, birthday or not. You run along, Rose. Put it on. <laughs> All right, if you say so. Dinner will be ready before long. Oh, there. She's gone. Godfrey, the most extraordinary thing happened to me on the road to Rotterdam just a little while ago. I, oh, what time is it now? Oh, uh, a little before seven. Oh, we've made it. Had to drive like fury, but... We've made it. Godfrey, listen and I'll tell you what happened. Then he walked away quickly into the darkness. I tell you, my boy, the hair's on my head. Oh, there's the Studhurst clock. Godfrey, don't leave me. You stay here. Face him with me. Of course I will, sir. Oh, oh but the card. What does the card say? Here, read for yourself. You, you'd better turn up the lamp a little. Yes, sir. Well, how strange. Rieswald van der Heusen. Rotterdam, manor house of the Boom Key. Gentlemen. Godfrey! How do you do? Did I startle you? I'm sorry. My appointment was for seven, I believe. Yes, of course, it, it was for seven. Come in, sir. Welcome to my house. Thank you. But I can stay only a few minutes. This young man... Oh, forgive me. He is Godfrey Schalken, a student of mine. Is he to be trusted? Trusted? Oh, indeed. He's a friend as well as a pupil. Then perhaps he will do an errand for us. A matter of fetching a box from my carriage. If Menherr Dow wishes me to. Indeed I do, Godfrey. Our visitor's wish is mine. It's a small box, resting on the carriage floor. Will you bring it to us? Why, I'll be happy to do so, sir. Now, what can I do for you, sir? You are the guardian of Rose Felderkost, I believe. She is your ward. Yes, that's right. I am prepared to offer her five times the future she has a right to expect from her husband. Well, you, you are asking for the hand of my niece. I don't believe she's acquainted with you. 
But it is a tempting offer from so fine a gentleman as you. Then it is only necessary to sign the engagement. I have the paper with me. But under the circumstances... Well, I, I think it best to consult with my niece about such unexpected business. As you wish. After the engagement is signed. Here. There's ink and quill on the table. But let me call my niece. You I are think... not content. Another day, sir. When I know my ward's inclination... Time is too precious. Not another hour. But I do not know if... Write I... your name to the engagement. Yes. As you say... There. It is done. Speak of this to your ward when I am gone. Tell her the time has come. Tell her she need have no fear that with me she will be safe from harm forever. Say I will return during the first hour of her 18th year. Tell her Rosal van der Huizen will watch over her as he has done from the moment she was born. Yes, I will tell her what you say. Here's the box. It, it's as heavy as a block of lead. Now it is in your hands, mein Herr Dow. Assurance of my promise. Good night. B but must you go? Really, my niece... Tell her I will return. Good night. Mein Herr Dow, you, you've gone white with fear. What did that man say to oh, you? Oh, the saints forgive me, Godfrey, for what I've done. What do you mean, sir? What happened? He took the paper with him. God, recall Rose to us quickly. Here I am, Uncle Gerard. All got up in my newest frock. I even pinched my cheeks to make them rosy. Now do I please you oh, both? Rose, my child, I've done a terrible thing. What is it? What happened, Godfrey? Your uncle had a visitor named Rosal van der Heusen. What? Rosal? Such a man was here. And demanded that I sign the paper. An engagement in marriage for you, Rose. And this... This man who says you are acquainted with him... That you'd welcome his proposal. An engagement paper. Rose, did you know anything about this? No, of course I didn't. Rusel isn't a real person. He... he was quite real to your uncle and me. Look what he left. A box full of gold. Ancient gold coins. Gold? For oh, me? My... Then it's true. He is real. It's my birthday gold, Godfrey. Don't you see? Men here now. Let me have that card. Yes, of course, my boy. Here, here it is. I'm going to find out what this is all about before it's too late. Godfrey, where are you going? To Rotterdam. That's where I'm going. To look up this Rizl van der Heusen at the manor house of the Boom Key, wherever that is, and bring back the engagement paper. Godfrey, wait. Oh, what is he doing? Uncle Gerard, stop him. There's no need. No, 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 my child. Let him go. I, for one, will welcome information about this stranger. But didn't this man say who he was? Didn't he ask to see me? No, my dear. And he was gone almost before we knew it. He did say one thing, though. He said to tell you that you need have no fear that he'd return during the first hour of your 18th year. The first hour? Then that's tonight. Five hours from now. Uncle Gerard, tonight... Rose felt a coast. Oh, oh, who is that in the garden? It is I. Come to you as I said I would. You, you are Russell. Of course. Don't you recognize me? Yes, the wide hat, the long cape. Just as I used to dream of you on nights before my birthdays. But I don't understand, I... I thought you were a recurring dream. And so I have been, till now. My my Uncle Gerard waits for you in his study, and I was waiting here in the garden until he called me in. You didn't see him. We have nothing to say to one another. You and I will set the marriage time. I... Come. We have much to say. I'm afraid, mein Herr. The fear will go. Take my hand. I cannot leave the garden. But there is much I would show you. And at last the time is now. It has been too long. My carriage waits on the street. Will you take me away? Only to show you wonders. To have you say you love me. With an understanding heart. Come. Here is the garden gate. Me 
in here now. Where are you? Oh, Godfrey. Oh, it's you. Oh, thank heaven you've come. The saints preserve us, my boy. We are dealing with a demon, my boy. Rose, where is she? Gone. Gone into the night with that demon stranger. But where? Why didn't you stop her? Oh, I'm an old man. I cannot stand this harrowing business. He returned a short while ago, just after midnight, and then I thought I took precaution. Rose was in the garden, and I waited here for his knock on the door. But he didn't come, and when I chanced to look out, he was helping Rose into a carriage. And in a moment, they were gone. Which road did they take? To Rotterdam. Oh, you must have passed them, surely. Yes, it was one of Andriel's rented carriages speeding along the road. What will we do? Where has he taken them? To Rotterdam, no doubt. To one of his luxurious houses. Midhead Owl, <laughs> this man has no houses. In Rotterdam, there is no such place as the Boom Key. What do you... Why, well, there must it be... It doesn't exist, I tell you. But what I did find out is enough to make your heart stand still. What, my boy? What did you find out? The manorial records do list the Van der Heusens, giving their residence as the manor house of the Boom Key. But Rieswell van der Heusen has been dead for three centuries. And the line ended when he died. Men heard now. Rose is engaged in marriage to a dead man. my boy. What did you find out? The manorial records do list the Van der Heusens, giving their residence as the manor house of the Boom Key. But Rizal Van der Heusen has been dead for three centuries, and the line ended when he died. Men head out. Rose is engaged in marriage to a dead man. A dead man? But, Godfrey, he was real. He was no ghost. How can you know that, Men head out? To us, he appeared to be nothing more than a large hat and a flowing black cape. What is underneath them? A man or an invisible being? Well, and the gold, Godfrey. The coins are ancient ones, antiques. Even the dates, you see. More than three centuries back. His apparel, too. He wore a costume out of the past. But what shall we do? How do you look for a ghost? I don't know. But we must find them. And Rose, what can this dreadful sympathy be? There's bound to be more to this than we could possibly know. Men head out. The carriage. It was one of Van Driedel's. I know it was. And this stranger must have rented it. Put on your coat. We're going to find Rose. But how, my boy? What do you intend to do? Andrea will tell us where he was directed to go. If somewhere there exists a ghost world belonging to this dead man, we'll find it even if it's beyond the common strength of man to do so. Andrea, drive as fast as the darkness will allow you. Are you sure you can find the place? I think I can. It was some miles this side of Rotterdam, by a little road that ran next to a canal. And, Patril, did they just disembark in this deserted place on the road? That's right. He said, drive, until I saw two men standing to one side of the highway. But, Patril, when did this stranger hire your carriage? Well, a little before midnight. I heard a loud knock on my door, and when I opened it, there he stood. What did he say? He said he wanted to hire a carriage. He offered me a whole sack of gold. Naturally, I couldn't refuse that, even if it were a funny time of night. He said he'd meet me in front of your house, man, head out. And you waited there? Until he came out of your garden gate with your niece. So he told you then to drive toward Rotterdam until you saw these men waiting on the side of the road. What were they like? I really couldn't say, sir. I mean, it was very dark. I could only catch a glimpse now and then of their clothes. It looked very old-fashioned, they did, though. I, I think one was a footman and the other a coachman. Yeah, yeah. I saw a very ancient and dilapidated-looking buggy standing on the narrow road that branched off from the highway. But they took this second carriage to where? Oh, don't you see, it is hopeless, my boy. How can we ever trace them? Did he mention where he was going, Van Driel? No. He didn't say a word. But this road, what road is it? Do you know where it goes? Well, if I remember rightly, it runs a few miles over the moors to an old, old house that's fallen to ruin. It's far off the beaten track and nobody ever goes there. Then that uh, must there's be... There's a name for it. Uh, an ancient manor house it is. 
Call the boom key, I think. The boom key. Godfrey, it's the very same. Yeah. The boom key. Yeah. So that's where it is. Yeah. Right here now, the lady of good luck rides with us this night. Van Driel, take the road to the ruin. To the boom key. Yeah. There is nothing to be afraid of, my Rose. We are at home. But let us come another time, mein Herr. It's so dark here, and there's lightning in the western sky. I will protect you, even from the lightning. Look, is the manor house of Boom Key to your liking? Boom Key? Is that where you brought me, mein Herr? It is our home, and you will be a lady here, with beautiful gowns and servants, anything you desire. I was here before, long ago. I know. I remember it well. You were a little girl then. But who are you? I don't ever remember seeing you before except in my dreams. Van Herr, I don't understand. Who are you? I am one who has waited beyond the generations for this night. When you would come to me. But I'm afraid. I don't like it here, Van Herr. Take me away back home. Please take me away. I cannot now, my Rose. The risk is too great. Come. There is nothing to fear. Take my hand. No, no. But we have much to say. We must set the wedding day. And I would show you treasures and shower you with precious gifts. The statue. There in the niche. That's where the statue was. You remember it then? It was a statue of myself. Where is it now? Come with me. I will show you. But where would you take me? To the tower. There you can see the splendor of the boom key. All that I offer you. For a bit of affection in return. A bit of love in exchange for the outrageous riches of a king. Oh, take me away. Take me back. This is but a ruin. There's nothing here except decay and, and the feel of death. But that's not true. There is beauty here. I have tended it all these years just for you. Then why do you hide from me now behind that cape and hat? Show me your face so that I won't be afraid. Come then, and I will show you. Come with me to the tower. Here are the stairs. The tower stands alone in the ruins. And the stairway is open to the sky. But then, will you take me back, mein Herr? My uncle, he will grow alarmed. He's an old man. He loves you, too. How can you love me, whom you have never known, mein Herr? How? It began very long ago. She was as beautiful as you. Limpid brown eyes and dazzling cheeks. And her hair was like the shining ripples of a canal water. But what was her heart like, my rose? It was like a stone on which the frost sits. And she betrayed me. Who? Who was this woman? Look. Here from the tower. The fields of tulips. Stagnant marshes they are. The abbey and the windmills. Piles of musty stones. She would have had it all. But she betrayed me. Who betrayed you so, mein Herr? Oh, my rose. Now you can save me. A man who has never loved who can never die till he feels the warmth of a woman's heart. Say you love me now. Say you do. No, no, mein Herr, take me away. Please take me away. But she was your grandmother, four times removed. And I loved her more than I loved my own life. And even as you, her name was Rose. My namesake? She's been dead three centuries, mein Herr. Even as I. (laughs) And when she betrayed me, I stood here in the night time... And climbed here to the tower's ledge. Oh, and oh. my body dropped from this height to the ground below. One hair. But I could not die. My ghost lived on. Hungry and cold for the want of a woman's love. And none will set me free save yours. Mine. My love. Because you are the first girl child of your line. Since she betrayed me. And I have waited and tended the boom key and longed for the time when three words from your lips would unbind me from the earth. You are a ghost. You are a dead man. Don't turn away from me. Look. Look at my face. No. No. Ah! The statue. 
statue. The wooden statue. It is the only physical being I know. Stand back from me. Is it such a frightful thing? Rose. Rose, say the words that'll send me on my way. Is your heart so empty of a gift of kindness even as hers? Below in the cellars of Boom Key are coffers of precious gold, and I offer it all to you for three small help me, words. Help me, help me, Rose! Look! There she is in the tower! They have come to take you away! Country! The stairway to the tower! You see? It's open to the sky! I have waited three centuries for this night and for you. They shall not take you back! What will you do? struck him and he fell to the ground. The figure burns like kindling. Oh, what a terrible thing to see. Look how straight it lies, like a statue of wood. Rose, Rose, oh my darling, are you all right? God, I was so frightened, so afraid. But now it's all right, you're safe, and the ghost is destroyed. Look where it burns. He was a ghost in a wooden statue, a phantom caught between two worlds and belonging to neither. Come, my child. Let us leave this dreadful place. It's like a tomb here. Now he is dead, Uncle Gerard. When I said the words, did you see? The lightning set him free. Yes, my darling. We saw. And above all, he wanted me to say I loved him. He gave me the riches of a king, Godfrey, just to say I loved him. The carriage is waiting, Minher Dow. We are coming, Fondrieu. And he meant no harm, Godfrey, for his heart was full of kindness. He was lost. He had no place to go. And the sword, the sword was only a wooden one, after all. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you the story... The Wooden Ghost. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. bring you The Witch's Tale, written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole. Now let us join old Nancy and Satan, her wise black cat. <laughs> On 
Hannah and 17-year-old I be today. Yes, sir. Hannah and 17-year-old. Well, Satan, if these folks are just douse out their lights, we'll spin another of our little bedtime stories <laughs> to ruin their night's rest. That's right. Nice and dark and careful now. Draw up to the fire and gaze into embers. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll see an island in the center of a lake in Michigan. Not so long ago, the Red Indians owned that land out there and worshipped the spirits of its waters and its skies. And they're what we're going to hear about tonight. The spirits of the lake. <laughs> the spirits of the lake. <laughs> Those filthy Indians intend to keep that racket going all night? Surely their chanting doesn't annoy you, dear. I was just thinking how weirdly beautiful it sounded coming across the water. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry you don't like it. You'll hear it every evening, as long as the new moon casts its reflection on the lake. That's a pleasant prospect. You're terribly bored here, aren't you? Oh, naturally I'm bored. I'm not accustomed to living in a wilderness where I see no one but stupid savages all day. Now you say I'll have to listen to them all night. But the reason I purchased this island so close to the Indian reservation was because I thought you'd find their customs interesting and picturesque. Uh. Roger, why don't you take a trip east? Then come back to me when you're... When you're over your restlessness. Fine idea, that would be. My friends would crucify me for leaving you alone. Is that the only reason you stay here with me? You do love me, don't you? I'm married to you. Husbands are supposed to love their wives. I'm in no mood for romance this evening. I don't suppose an invalid can expect her husband to be in a mood for romance, ever. But but I won't be an invalid much longer, dear. I, I'm getting better every day. I... <coughs> <coughs> It's really very seldom that I cough any more like that, but in a little while I'll, I'll be completely well and, and we can return to New York together or, or travel in Europe, anything you want to do. Oh, I mean to give you such a good time to make up for the dreary months you've spent out here because of me. Thanks for reminding me that to have a good time, I'm dependent on your money. I didn't mean that. You know I didn't. Oh, all right. Let's not talk anymore about you and me. No. We don't seem able to talk of you and me. God, I have to listen to that savage, savage caterwauling much longer. I'll go stark raving mad. Perhaps, perhaps if you know the reason for the chanting, it, it might interest you a little. Uh, two horses told me all about it this afternoon. You know, he's the old Indian who comes to see our housekeeper. She's his cousin, I think. And, Roger, it's the funniest thing, but they call me White Goose. <laughs> well, what about the chanting? <coughs> oh, yes. Well... It's a ceremony the tribes hold each year at this time to appease the spirits of the lake. The Neba Norbegs, they call them. This is a holy lake to the Indians, you know. And they say that if anyone affronts it or harms its friend, the Neba Norbegs take terrible vengeance. <laughs> Two horses spoke so convincingly of its terrors, I made a peace offering. Peace offering? What do you mean? I cast a bouquet of flowers on its water and said a prayer two horses taught me. God. No wonder he calls you White Goose. Another month in this wilderness, and you'll be going about clothed in a blanket. Roger. Oh, I'm going out. I'll prowl around in the canoe and try to work my nerves off. Nama can sit with you. You'll enjoy her Indian grunting more than you would my conversation anyway. Now, Nama. Nama. Huh? Come in here with Mrs. Benton. I'm going out. Huh? Me come. Roger, why not take me with you in the canoe? Oh. We haven't been together on the lake in a week. Some other time, not now. Uh... Don't wait up for me. I may be late. Good night. Roger, wait. Well? You, you're not going to the Johansson's farm again. What do you mean, again? Why, oh, I, I know it's quite all right, dear, but, well, there's been a little talk about you and that girl there. That... Oh, there has, eh? I'm having an affair with Hilda Johansson, I suppose. Oh, no, dear, no. Oh, so that's what you have in your mind. It isn't bad enough that I have to be cooped up with you among these dirty Indians, but... Now I mustn't even look at a decent-looking white woman. Roger. Oh, how I hate it all. This beastly island, these stupid savages, this slimy lake. How I hate... George! Oh, I... 
I didn't say I hated you. I'll see you later. Good night. Oh, no. Oh, why, good. My... My husband doesn't mean anything when he speaks angrily to me, Nama. He... He's really a very good man, isn't he? Mm, he better be good if he go out on lake. What do you mean? You give flower to lake today. You say Indian prayer. Neva no begs now your friend. If your man not good to you, Neva no begs punish. Neva no begs punish. Ah. Hilda. Hilda, I'm mad, insane about you. Why do you hold me off like this? Because you haven't any right to be insane about me. You're a married man. Oh, we're not children. You know I don't care a hang about my wife. Besides, it's only a question of time before she... Well... Before she'll die, you mean. Yes. She thinks she's getting better. The doctors don't tell her, but they tell me. And the moment I'm free, I'll marry you, Hilda. I swear I will. I can't wait for you till then. I've got to have you, Hilda. I've Let me go. You'll only have me as your wife. I told you that before. Well, if, if you really mean it, why don't you stop making a fool of me? Why don't you stop meeting him here by this late me each night? Playing with me as a cat does with a mouse. Because I hope you'll not always be a mouse, but a man. And take what he wants. What do you mean? Simply that if you're so mad about me as you say, you'll not let a woman that you hate stand between us any longer. Well, what can I do? Divorce is out of the question. Of course. And our money would be taken from you. Oh, I'm not thinking only of money. I'm not thinking only of divorce. What are you thinking of? Of how mistaken doctors are sometimes. Your wife may live for years. Unless an accident should happen. An accident? On this lake, for instance. It's very deep. And there are sharp rocks near the surface that can rip a canoe to pieces. You might be paddling with her in the moonlight, not knowing those rocks were near. You told me your wife don't swim. She might drown before you could save her. You're suggesting... I'm only talking. But if such an accident should happen, you'd inherit all her money. Have me for your wife. No. No, no. I won't. I couldn't. <laughs> You are a mouse, not a man. I'm going. No, Hilda, wait. Hilda, don't leave I'm me. leaving you for oh, good. Oh, no, Hilda. Oh, listen, you fool. I'm not satisfied to be just the daughter of a Swedish farmer. I want money. I want to live in a fine house like your wife has built in the center of this lake. I want to be a lady and swell it over people who despise me now because I'm poor. All my life I've dreamed of that, and I'm going to have it, for I have youth and looks and brains. If you don't give me what I want, somebody else will. You say I played with you? Well, I play no longer. You won't see me anymore. Goodbye. No, 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 no. Don't say that. Come back. Hilda, Hilda. You know, I can't lose you. I'm mad about you. Hilda. Wait. Well? As, as you say, uh, an accident might happen. Accidents are common. You will marry me if my wife should die. I'll marry you when your wife is dead. Oh, Roger, it's wonderful to be on the lake with you again. It's been so long since we've been in the canoe together. I feel as though we were on a second honeymoon. <coughs> aunt, aren't you enjoying it too, dear? Yes. Yes. Oh, the world has never seemed so lovely as it does tonight. Isn't that distant chanting restful? You haven't complained about it this evening, so it, it must make you feel as I do. It sounds the prayer it really is, a prayer for the dying. Yes. Is that what they're singing? Uh, a death song? Yes, this is Indian summer. 
The moon of falling leaves of dying things. The moon of falling leaves of dying things. Dear, why you... You're frightfully nervous tonight. Uh, your, your hands are shaking as, as they work the paddle. No, 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 I'm... I'm, <laughs> I'm all right. You're not. You're so unhappy here. But, but soon we'll go back east. We'll only come to the island for a day each year so that I can renew my offering to the spirits of the lake. I, I've taken the neighborhood very seriously, you see. For I'm under their protection now, according to Nama and two orders. Oh, dear. Oh, be careful where you guide us. We're close to the sharp rocks the Indians call the spirits' talons. They say the road to the villages of the happy dead lead over such rocks as that. Rocks with a knife-like edge on which only the good can keep their footing. The bad fall off into an abyss of eternal torment. Stop talking, that savage rot. Stop, I tell you, it can't frighten me. Dear. I'm not afraid of spirits. They can't hurt me. And men will say it was an accident. Roger, you're mad. An accident. That's what they'll say. An accident. You're making for those rocks purposely. An accident. You mean to turn me. <laughs> Roger, don't. Turn back. Turn back. We're going to strike. Oh. Oh. Roger. Save me. Don't swim away from me. I'm sick. Roger, come back. Oh, God, I pray to you. Oh, spirits of the lake. Punish. 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 <laughs> of the lake is gonna punish that fellow. All right. And when next you folks come see me and Satan, we'll tell you exactly how. <laughs> About a very pretty finish to this little bedtime story. <laughs> Witch's Tale, written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole. Let us join old Nancy and Satan, her wise black cat. <laughs> Hana and five year old I be today. Yes, sir. Hana and five year old. Real Satan. Suppose we get right down to business. 
and finish that cheerful little story we begun when last these folks was here. Down south them lights. Old Nancy's yarn sound best when heard in gloom and shadow. Let's see, Satan. What we leave off? Oh, yes. We told about that married couple who was living on an island in a spirit haunted lake, a tribe of Injuns worshipped. The wife, who was an invalid, was pretty friendly with the Injuns, and they taught her to make friends with the Neva Norbabes, which is their name for their water spirit. Well, sir, her husband went a northwards and fell in love with a girl named Hilda, and this Hilda gave him the idea of drowning his wife so he'd inherit her money and be free to marry again. And as we left off our story, that's just what this no good fella went and done, making it look as if her death was accidental. Now draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Two years has passed since that fella killed his wife, and now he's married to the other woman. Gaze into the embers deep. Soon you'll see him sitting in a stateroom on a railroad train. Soon you'll hear more about the spirits of the lake. <laughs> the spirits of the lake. <laughs> it's the next station. Only a few miles now. Anyone would think something was going to happen to you on the island, the way you're whining about going back there. Oh, I don't want to go back there, Hilda. If you were anything but a human cake of ice, you'd understand my feelings about the place. What a durable conscience you have. After two long years, the accidental death of your former wife bothers you as much as ever. Hilda, for God's sake, don't talk like oh, that. Oh, don't worry. I hardly think anyone is listening at our stateroom door. You fooled the law for so long, it's not apt to get wise to you now. Oh, won't you ever let me forget. It was all your fault anyway. You planned it. You drove me I had it. nothing to do with it. I wasn't even there. In fact, I know nothing about it. Oh, God. Snap out of this and get our bags together for the porter. If my folks are at the station to meet us, I don't want them to see you looking like a frightened cur. Hilda, couldn't we stay with your family while we're here instead of on the island? Live in a dinky farmhouse when I can swell it over the neighbors in that big house on the island? I guess not. But, Hilda, I, I, I told you I'd buy you a nicer place somewhere else. Hilda, I'll buy you anything you want, but... Don't make me go back there. You could there. buy me the most expensive mansion on Park Avenue and wouldn't give me the kick of living on that island, owning that big house there, swelling it over the people who knew me when I was poor. You kept it from me for two years, but now at last I'm going to have it. You don't understand. Oh, yes, I do. It isn't just conscience that troubles you. You're afraid of the place, afraid of an Indian superstition. No, I... Lord! Your other wife made you believe there were spirits in that lake. Some sort of Indian goblins who'd make you pay for what you did to her. You said she called upon them as she sank beneath the water. Yes. With her last breath, she called on them to... to punish. <coughs> I'll go with you, Hilda. Just let's not talk anymore about it. All right. We're coming in. If my family are waiting here, they can drive us to Two Horses' place and he can row us to the island. Get those bags together. Going back in Indian summer. Well, what about it? Um, two years. Oh, quiet. Who's there? Hold him, ma'am. We've come to your station. We're ready. Open the door and help him get the bags. Yes. The house looks simply great, Norma. I never knew it had been vacant for two years the way you've kept it. I've been over every inch, Roger, and it's spotless. This, this squaw's worth a raise in wages. You like me for a boss, old woman? Oh. Norma, 
Your people are singing their prayer to the spirits of the lake. Mm. It's from the moon of falling leaves. Yes, I know. Out of dying. Me go now. Oh, run along. Two horses is waiting for you in his rowboat. Mind you, bring back everything I'm sending you for, too. Oh, oh now, Nama, wait a minute. Is the... Is the canoe in good shape if, if we wanted to leave the island? What do you mean, if we want to leave the island? Hilda, I... The canoe oh, all right. Go on, get out. Me go. Have not any sense at all? The way you've acted since we landed here, even those stupid Indians know you're scared to death of the place... You want them to suspect the reason why? Oh, I think they've always suspected. Now we're alone here, you and me. Now what of it? Let's get out of this kitchen. You better lay down a while. See if you can pull yourself together. I'll try. Where till I put down this window? I, I can't stand that noise of those drums, that chanting. Well, I'm not crazy about it myself. Hmm. Looks like a storm is blowing up. Come into the living room. No, My no, no, no. living room. No, Hilda. I can't go in Oh, I forgot that's where they brought her when they found her in the lake. Yes, they laid her on the divan in there. I had to go in and look at her. Hilda, you think I'm mad to believe there may be spirits in these waters, as the Indians say. Spirits who love Bernice, who would punish those who hurt her. There was something queer about the way they brought her from that lake. What do you mean? It was as though the lake had taken care of her. Taken, taken care of her? Yes. You know the slime that coats its surface in this month of falling leaves? Green, filthy slime that rises from the bottom and covers all it touches. Benice's clothes were sodden. Weeds were entangled in her matted hair. The ugly slime had never touched her. The lake had not defiled the one who loved it. What a booby you are. Your mind is so filled with crazy notions about the place you're only a step above a lunatic. Now that you're here and can see for yourself there's nothing to be afraid of, you may come to your senses. Come on. We're going in that living room. Uh, oh, you must be right. There can't be anything to be afraid well, of. Of course there isn't. Come on. Hilda, <coughs> wait. What's the matter? But I heard a cough. Cough? Yes. There it is again. There's someone in that room. Well, now... Who... Wait, wait, wait. Don't open that door. What's the matter with you? You're white as a she. Hilda. That's the way she used to call. You're crazy. It's probably Nama. She's come back in the house no, with no. the other door. Look out the window. Nana's with two horses in the middle of the lake. Oh, that's funny. I don't see how anyone else could be in the house. I inspected every room. <laughs> Off again. I'll soon find out who's doing it. Hilda, don't open that door. Get out of my way, you coward. Oh, I thought so. The room is empty. Yeah. Empty. <coughs> Here's the cough again. It's from the next room. Don't leave me, Hilda. Oh, this room is empty, too. Oh, thank God. Funny that we both should have heard that cough. Oh, you've talked so much, you've got me imagining things. Yeah, maybe we imagined it. It's going to rain. You know how damp it's grown suddenly? Very damp. Suddenly. Where did that come from? What? A moment ago, this room was clean as a pin. What do you see? Look there on my rug. A patch of... Eh, it's slime. Green slime. In the bottom of the lake. That squaw didn't clean it. No, no, it. it wasn't there a moment ago. You just said yourself. Oh, I must have overlooked Hilda. it. Hilda. Look, there's more. That spot wasn't there before. And there's another patch on the divan. Slime. Green slime from the bottom of the lake. Hilda. The spot on the divan is growing larger. It is spreading. What's causing it? That divan is where they laid her when... Stop that. There's a natural explanation for this. We've got to find it. Ah! Patch of slime fell on my hand. From where? I don't know. It's falling all around us. Hilda. The spot on the divan. It's still growing. The water soaked all over it's on the day she lay there. Well, she's dead and buried. It's from something else. <coughs> that cough again. She's here, though. We can't see her. Oh, no, I won't believe that. Water's oozing from the walls. And slime. Slime. Green slime. It's coming from the plumbing. Rain from something next. Oh, no, it's from the lake. The lake is going to punish us. I knew it would if we came back. Well, I had nothing to do with it. It was you who killed it her. It was you who made me. Ah! On the couch. A woman's body. Hers. As I saw it when they brought her in. Let me out of here. Let me out. Yes. Run. 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 
get me off this island. This way. Oh, God, but if we leave the land, the lake will get us. Sure, there's nothing against me. I didn't do anything. More sign fell on me. It's dripping from the trees. Yes. It's falling all against it. It's falling on both of us. On you as well as me. Slime, ugly slime from the bottom of the, the lake. The canoe. The canoe at last. Shove off. No, not on that lake. That's what it wants. To get me on the water. Wait, don't stand on yes. the streets. The water's in. For the hair all method. Dripping from the lake. The slime that covers us is not defiled her. Don't get me away. Use all your strength. Paddle. Paddle. Ah. Paddle. Slapped in two. Ah. Was eaten through by worms. Worms from the lake. Oh, we're drifting. No. We're going too far. Something is pulling us through the water. Something we can't see. We're going toward the rock. Yes. The spirit's talons. <laughs> the road to death leads over rocks like that, she told me. Only the good can keep their footing on them. The bad fall off into eternal torment. I'm not going to be dashed against them. I'm going to save myself. I'm going to swim. You can't save yourself. She prayed the lake to punish us. It will never let us go. Ah! Spirits of the lake, the Nibanobe. The rocks, the road to death, eternal torment. Ah, cold hands, pulling me down to the slime at the bottom. Bernice, you prayed the lake to punish. The slime, the slime that spared her. Will cover me forevermore. <laughs> well, Satan, the moral of this story is that crime don't pay, especially if you lives around the Indian Lake. For if the law don't get you. Then the spirits will. Come see me next time I have a birthday. And we'll have another pretty yarn to spin you. <laughs> of the eerie, weird, blood-chilling tales told by old Nancy, the witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. They are waiting, waiting for you, now. <laughs> Honor and thirteen year old I be today, yes, sir. Hundred and thirteen year old. <laughs> well, Satan, we'll be getting down to our yarn spinning if you'll tell folks to douse all lights. That's it. We want things nice and cheerful for our pretty little tales. <laughs> now draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll be across the seas in the jungle land of Africa. British Africa. In what's called Tanganyika territory. 
hear that chanting and them savage drums? With them begins our story of the Devil Mask. <laughs> the Devil Mask. The drums have been booming from solid hour now. We'll probably hear them until well past midnight. <laughs> I'll wager the drummer Johnnies will have aching wrists tomorrow. And the singers won't be able to speak above a whisper. On the contrary, they'll all feel wonderfully refreshed. But the ceremony to these tribesmen is, well, like going to St. Paul's on Easter morning or cantering through Hyde Park on a bright spring day would be to us. Oh, you mustn't speak of London here. It's only a reminder that we're over a month away from there. But we're leaving for England tomorrow, Harlan. You and Alec and I, when we reach there, we'll find it no more pleasant than Africa. You're right. For one finds contentment within himself, not in his surroundings. Well, one thing's certain, the foggy old London moon's never so beautiful as the one above us now. It is beautiful, isn't it? Gorgeous. It's like those we used to sit and watch so long ago in Surrey as we... Please, Harlan. Because you're now married to another man, can't I indulge in spoken memories? I wish you wouldn't. All right. Uh, rather a nice compliment those blacks out there are paying you and Alec, with their chanting and their drumming. Yes. Gadeo, the witch doctor's son, told me all about it, in his funny pidgin English. I had already told you. Oh, you simply said they were holding a religious ceremony to pray that you and Alec have a safe journey back to civilization. Gadeo's version was far more dramatic. He said this jamboree was to propitiate the devils. So they wouldn't harm. That's why Monpo, his father, came here to the bungalow a while ago. And muttered magic words about each piece of our baggage. To drive away the devil. <laughs> <laughs> well, that mask he had on certainly ought to frighten them away. <laughs> it's a sacred devil mask. One especially for this sort of ritual. Mm, Rum-looking object. Yes. Instead of taking measures to protect us, they think they're doing... They should pray to all their gods that we never leave the jungle alive. Oh, why, Phyllis? They owe you gratitude. Gideo tells me that you... Oh, were... I've tried to treat them decently. Mm. You mean that Alec... No, no. He's treated them well, too. Except when he's been drinking. Then... Then he isn't responsible. In the seven days I've been here, Alec's never drawn a sober breath. He's inside that bungalow now, sleeping off a quart of whiskey. And he'll begin on another the moment he awakes. It, it isn't his fault. It's just the effect that Africa has upon some white men. When Alec gets back to England, he'll become himself again. I hope so. No, hang it all, I don't. I hope the rotter drinks himself to death as fast as he can. I hope he... Uh, forgive me, Phyllis. I'm going inside. Good night, Harlan. No, please. Let go of my hand. No, I won't. Now I've begun, I won't let you go till I've finished. Phyllis, when your father brought you to Africa, my regiment was sent to India three years ago. You were engaged to marry me. For six months after that, I received your letters. Love letters, just as I wrote every day to you. Suddenly, I heard no more from you. And, and months later, I heard you'd married Alec. I didn't mean to speak, but now... Why? Why? Hasn't it occurred to you that I may have married Alec because I loved him and had fallen out of love with you? Was... Was that the reason? I... Yes. I see. Phyllis! Phyllis! Alec's awake. Phyllis, where the devil are you? I'm coming, Alec. All right, you're outside. Stay where you are, I'll come to you. Well, you and Lieutenant Lawrence being romantic in the moonlight? We've been talking, Alec, and listening to the chanting. It was that blasted noise woke me up. Where's my whip? I'll soon make a beggar stop. No, no, you can't interfere with them. Alec, that ceremony is for us. Huh? Oh, yes, yeah. so you told me. <laughs> oh, Monpo is driving devils out of the way. So I'll get to England safely. Nice of him after all the kicks I've landed on where he should wear pants. <laughs> He's got a first-class Christian spirit. Don't you think so, Harlan? Yes. He finds it easier to return good for evil than I ever shall. Oh, I wouldn't say that. You've got a first-class Christian spirit, too. <laughs> Why, you even come and pay me a visit after I married a woman you was once engaged to. Alec. Don't worry, Phyllis. I ain't gonna quarrel with your ex-lover. See here, Anton. I don't propose to... Hey, step... don't get mad. I ain't mad. I'd like to have you around, Lieutenant. <laughs> so you can enjoy watching my happy married life. Alec, go back to bed. 
please. All right, all right. I'll leave you two alone again. Please. please. Here, I'll help you. I don't need any help. What I need is another bottle of whiskey. No. Yeah. You don't want me to stop those black monkeys in the village from making a noise, so I got to drink enough not to hear them. I got a bottle in the cupboard here. All right. Get it if you must. Of course I'll get it. Hey. What's the matter? The bottle I had in here is gone. You must have taken it then. No. I put an extra bottle here special, so as I have it when I'm in a hurry. Who's stolen it? No one, Alec. Not a soul has been in this room since you fell asleep, except Lieutenant Lawrence, Monpo, and I. Monpo? Then he took it. I'll teach that Steve and witch doctor to steal my whiskey. Alec, put down that pistol. Come back. Take your hands off of me. Harlan, help me. Harlan. Now you keep out of this, Lawrence. Let me go. Drop that pistol, Alec. Stop. You're breaking my arm. Drop that pistol. I've dropped it. Take your hands off Get the gun, Phyllis. I have it. Lead him to bed. He doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, yes, I do. I'm going to kill that thief, Monpo. He's not a thief. He was never near that cupboard. He only came into the house to perform his magic on our luggage, to do us a favor, as he thinks. That rotten blighter has my whiskey. Monpo stole my whiskey. I think we'd, we'd better go away. He'll soon go back to sleep. Yes, he's, he's falling asleep now. Come on. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll kill the thief and blighter. Here, you keep his pistol. I don't want him to have it handy if he wakes up again. He's liable to do anything. Oh, God. To think you're married to that swine. To think you love him. Harlan, I'm going to tell you the truth. Truth? About Alec and me. What do you mean? Let's go outside again. Please open the door. Certainly. When I said I married Alec because I loved him, I lied. Phyllis. I mean to go on lying. But after all, I owe you the truth. Oh, why did you? You know that my father died of fever six months after we arrived here. Yes. That was when my letters to you stopped. The day before he died, a missionary came here. He was from the coast and on his way to the interior. Father knew that he had but a few hours to live. And when the missionary left, I'd be alone with Alec. Was the only other white man in 50 miles of jungle. Alec had often tried to make love to me. He was shrinking heavily then. Well, he suggested to Father that if he didn't have the missionary marry us, I... I believe you understand. The filthy, beastly swine. Please. Nothing we can say or do will change it. But we can change the future. And we will. Oh, my darling, you still love me. You get a divorce, and then... There can be no divorce. You... You mean you'll stay with this... this brute? He isn't a brute. He's a weak, spoiled, selfish child. He must have his own way, no matter how he gets it. No matter who it harms. I'm his wife, and I must take care of him and keep him out of trouble as long as we both live. You're not thinking reasonably. You've got to listen to me and then... Everything you could say, I've already said to myself. Now, we'll never mention this again. You've already re arranged to return to England with Alec and me, so that can't be changed. But after we reach there, we must never see each other again. I want you to promise me that, Harlan. No. If you must take care of the swine you call a weak child, then I must look after you until he dies or sends you to your grave. Harlan. How can you have sympathy for such a beast? Or consider it your duty to sacrifice our lives for oh, his? can't you understand? No, I can't. No more than I can understand why those blacks out there should repay his kicks with prayers that he was safe from devils. I can't understand why any rotter should get better than he merits. And I don't believe God permits such blind injustice for long. Harlan, what was that? It sounded like the back door. Alex the Wilson. He's gone out. Oh, what if he has? Yes. See, he goes across the compound toward the native village. And he has a gun. A gun? I have his pistol. He's taken his rifle. We'll stop him. But why? Come on, quick. He thinks Monpo stole that whiskey. And if he reaches the village before we can stop him... Oh, you don't think he's... He's liable to do anything. Oh, he's disappeared among the huts. Harlan, if he attacks the witch doctor when he's wearing the sacred devil mask, the other blacks will... Oh! A rifle. The drums have stopped. Ha, 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 ha! I'll teach you blacks to steal my liquor. Alex! Look! By that fire. Monpo, lying on the ground. I said I'd kill that dirty thief. Good day, Day, or your father isn't badly hurt. He isn't. Look for yourself, I miss you. Oh, there's a hole in his mouth that's spattered with blood. Shot between the eyes. Yes. My father, Monpo, 
Die as the Avandis sacred mask. Oh, Kateo, I... Kateo know that you do not wish him die, right, Missy? But for boss who did... Come on, Eklund! Come on, now! Come now! Kateo, my husband didn't know what he was doing. Please get behind me. They're closing him around us. Keep away from me, you blacks. I'll shoot the first to take another step. You keep back, Kateo, or I'll kill you like I did your demon father. Another of you. No, and my father, people... It is the dead who pay you for what you do tonight. Dead? You have killed a priest as you drive him devil from your path. Now his soul will drive those devils on you. <laughs> That's funny. When the sun rises in the morning, you will laugh no more. For you will own my father, devil mask. I'll own the devil mask? With his blood on the hole your bullet make when you kill him. Hey, you take his life. He gives to you his mask. Tamara Mio! Oi Mio! Oi Mio! I'll find the people no more close them way. You're free to leave here now. When the sun rises, you will own the devil mask. And it will never leave you come die. Phyllis, it's nearly morning. Won't you lie down now and get a little rest? Don't ask me again. You know I can't. In a few hours, we'll be starting through the jungle for the coast. You can't stand the trip without rest. Here I can watch that village. Oh, if the blacks meant to attack this bungalow, they'd have done it hours ago. I'm convinced that Gadeo wasn't attempting any trick. The poor Negro really means to leave his vengeance to the dead. His people believe the dead have much more power than the living. But... I still can't understand the things he said about that devil, Mark. Uh, some other savage superstition, I suppose. I've been in Africa too long to despise what whites call just savage superstition. But you don't think that, that that dead man's mask is going to harm him, do you? I don't know. Cadeo said Alec would own the mask by sunrise. Since we left the village, those drums have never ceased. They're making magic there. If the mask or anything else gets into this bungalow, it'll have to come by magic. Every door and window in the place is locked but this one, and we've sat behind a screen all night. I'm sorry I can't believe anything will pay that rotter his just desserts. Harlan. He's even safe here from the law. Looks as though I was wrong last night, and I told you God wouldn't long permit injustice. Ah! Alec! No, he must be having a nightmare. Come with me, quick. Look at the foot of my bed. That thing that's grinning at me. A devil mask. How did it get here? Look out of that window, Harlan. Lord, the sun's rising. After tramping through this rotten jungle all day, I'd like to sit quiet in my tent tonight and have a drink in peace. Will you two please stop talking about this crazy mask? Not until you do as your wife asks, Ransom, and get rid of the thing. Why in heaven's name did you bring it with you? When you first saw it on your bed this morning, you were more afraid of it than Phyllis is. I was merely startled. When I saw how frightened you two were, I made up my mind to keep it and prove what fools you are. There's no use arguing with him further, Harlan. It only makes him more stubborn. I'm stubborn because I won't give in to savage superstition. And I let Gideo and the rest of those blacks know they weren't going to scare me with their mumbo-jumbo. You heard me when they all came sneaking around to watch us leave. <laughs> I thanked them for their funny devil mask and said I'd keep it to remember them by. Yes. And Gideo repeated that you'd keep it until the day you die. Then I'll have it for a long while, and it won't hurt me in the meantime. I wouldn't be too sure of that. It wasn't presented to you as a love token, and it came to you somehow through locked doors and solid walls. So you and Phyllis say... Because we know. Don't think for a minute I care what happens to you. But your wife's terrified of that mask. The least you can do is to humor her fears. If you must know I'm keeping it, because I like to see you bothered. Uh, I guess that leaves nothing more to be said, Phyllis. I hope not. Then I can have a quiet drink. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to scare me with an ugly wooden face that has shells for eyes and bits of filed off lead and brass for teeth. Yeah, and a bullet hole between the eyes. <laughs> it was about this time last night I put it there. I'll have a drink to celebrate. Let's get out of here, Phyllis. 
where we won't have to breathe the same air as that. Oh. that. <laughs> I thought that had shocked your tender sensibilities. Get out! Get out, both of you, and leave me alone. Tell my wife what a cat I am and how much better off she'd be with you. It won't do you any good, but she won't leave me. Get out! Get out! You swipe. Don't, Harlan! Ah. Come! <laughs> Wait! Wait! Come back! Where are those drums sounding? Drums? Yes! We're miles away from any village. Who's drumming in this jungle? I don't hear any drums. Neither do I. Well, what's the matter with your ears? They're getting louder every second. There isn't a sound out there. There's drums, I tell you. And voices chanting. Like there was last night. Those blacks are coming after me. You can't hear drums or chanting. No, there's none to hear. You're lying to me. Now they're just outside. They're all around this tent. Where's my gun? They won't get me without a fight. Don't let him touch that rifle, Harlan. Well, I, I've got it. The fool's gone mad. Let me go. Let me go. Ah! Look at the mask. The mask? There's blood on it. As there was last night. Fresh blood. Oh, you're seeing and hearing things that don't exist. You're lying to me. Lying. Drums are beating all around me. The blood is pouring from that mask. They never stop. I know I just imagined drums. There's no blood on that mask. But I see blood. And I hear drums. That dead old mask keeps grinning at me. It whispers in the dead man's voice. And soon I'll die. It's going to kill me. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. How long has your husband been like this, Mrs. Ransom? It began three weeks ago, Doctor, in the jungle. He didn't talk as you've just heard him do at first. That began after we came aboard the ship. Now he keeps it up at intervals night and day. Hmm. And you say this fixation concerning drums and blood is in some way connected with that African witch mask at his bedside? Yes, Doctor. Then why haven't you removed it? You try removing that mask from his bedside, Doctor. Oh, I mean to. Wait. He's quiet now, which usually means that he's dozed off. Move very quietly so that he can't possibly hear you. Why? If you do as we ask, it will save much explanation. Mm, very well. Ah! Oh, no. No. Don't touch that mask. Bring it back. If you take it away, well, I can't see it grinning. I won't know what it's planning. I won't know when it's going to kill me. Here, here. Here's your mask, man. Take it and get back to bed. <laughs> you won't take it away again. Oh, you won't. No, 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 no. Get back in bed. Oh. You see why we haven't removed the mask, Doctor? How did he know I touched the thing? His eyes were tightly closed. I didn't make a sound. He just knows, Doctor. That's all. Oh, drums. Drums keep beating all around me. The drums. It's beginning the again. That the mask must drums. be removed without his knowledge. Yes, but how? When you called at my quarters and hinted what sort of a case this was, I prepared this hypodermic in advance. Now, you hold him tightly, Lieutenant, while I jab the needle in his arm. All right. Oh, let me go. What are you going to do with me? Oh, my arm. Quiet, man, quiet. Oh, guys, you're going to make me sleep while you take away the mouse. Don't do it. If you do, I'll die. No, 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 please, no. I gave him a double dose. It's hitting him quick. Oh, no. Don't. Don't. Drums. The drums are bit nasty. Now, take that ugly witch mask and throw it through the porthole. There. It's in the sea. Hmm. He should sleep for 48 hours and wake up cured. Harlan, the mask has bobbed up to the surface. It seems to be grinning at us. Phyllis! The ship should be leaving it behind. But it seems to be traveling along at our side. As though it was following. You... you don't think... The Deo said Alec would own it until the day he died. <laughs> As much as it hurts me to thank you for anything, Harlan, I'm forced to admit that you probably saved my life by throwing that rotten mask overboard. I'm not at all proud of saving your life, Ransom. Oh, too bad I didn't go crazy or blow out my brains when those drums were throbbing in my head all day and night. Then you'd have won my wife, perhaps. Suppose we don't discuss that. I've called at your hotel tonight to bid Phyllis goodbye. May I see her now? Did you say goodbye? She made me promise that after we reached England, I'd never see her again. Our ship docked this morning and you rushed her away. I'm keeping my promise after tonight. Well, that's simply fine. She'll be here in a moment. Ah, knowing I won't see you anymore adds extra delight to being home again. 
Ah, England. After three years in the bush, first class whiskey instead of African trade slush. And feast your eyes on that roaring fire in the grate. No open fireplaces in Tanganyika. And here there are no savage superstitions that a clever chap like you can use to drive another man. What do you mean? I've got that masked business figured out. You seized upon Gadeo's crazy threat that night as a means to drive me mad or kill me. You brought the mask into the house and put it at my bedside. It was your constant suggestion that made me hear those drums and see that blood. Ah, you're talking like a lunatic. Oh, no. I'm talking like a sane man now because I'm safe in sober England where nothing in the world can frighten me. My wife can get along without your goodbye, Lieutenant. You're getting out of here now. No, I'm not. Get out, I say. Get out. Alex. Phyllis, you're just in time, my dear, to see your lover leave here. I'm putting him out. No. You can't put this to pistol can. You're looking at my wife for the last time until the day I die. And that will be for a long, long time. Now, there's the door. Get out. You have me at a disadvantage. Goodbye, Phyllis. That's enough. Get out. What? Drums. Drums. What? I hear drums again. Drums coming closer. Drums in England. No. No, the mask is gone. At the bottom of the sea. The mask can't find me here. What's that? Who's at that door? Oh, look at Mr. Ransom, sir. Well, what? Who, who, who are you? Oh, I was your room steward on the ship, sir. I think the lady there recognized me. Yes, sir. But why... What do you want me here? Oh, I've come to return some property of yours to what was fished up from the dock this afternoon. I remember seeing it in your cabin when you were so terrible sick about two weeks back, sir. And I What's wrapped in that paper you carry? What do you mean to me? Why, yes. Oh, it's just this, sir. Oh, oh, the mask! It's swallowed. I knew it when I heard those drums. And now they're throbbing my head once more. But it's not going to turn my mind again. I'll destroy it now. Good. And all. Ah, you're sunk in the fire. Yes. <laughs> Water brought it back to me. But nothing can return from fire. It's flame from which all devils come. And back to flames they go. <laughs> I'll beat your rotten witchcraft now, I... Oh! It's shot. It came from that mask. In the fire. There's a bullet hole in Alex's head. Between his eyes. He... He's dead. How? Oh. Pull that mask from the flames, quick. Yes, all right, sir. I've got it with the tongs. Let me smother out the face. The little rug will do it, sir. Why take it from the fire? To save the rest of our lives. Look. Look where the fire's eaten away the wood. The metal teeth of the mast? Our old rifle cartridges with the bullets filed to slugs. And when the fire got them out, one popped right off. Then, then Alec was killed by natural means. And all the other things were coincidence. Imagination. I wonder. What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> You're right about that. <laughs> After the husband's funeral, them lovers went right out and got a marriage license. <laughs> Good old devil mask. <laughs> This is Vincent Price. Listen to a story of the night. We bring you stories of the night. This night. Today's night. A night which covers and uncovers. A night which brings sleep. But before that rest is full of small adventures, small laughter, small mysteries, and the tears, the salt tears, from the waters from which the shadowed gods made all things and us and you. We bring you Small Stories of the Night. This is Vincent Price again. You're about to hear a very unusual story. And yet it is more than unusual because you may find some of the events as close to you as your own blood. 
We're about to seize an hour out of time in these United States of ours, happenings from coast to coast in Peabody Award-winning Arch Obler's story that is titled with one simple word, night. The land is in darkness. The day, once capering with the promise of its allotted hours, has gone, creeping agedly over the edge of the sky. Night, soft veiling, lies thickly over the ponds and swamps and lakes and rivers, over the knolls and dunes and buttes and mountains, over the homesteads, farms, the ranches and plantations, over the villages and towns and county seats and cities. For a whisper of time, the night is on the land. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Night, by Arch Obler, with an all-star cast. And now the first act of Night. The night is a trickster. It mutates, transposes, changes, shuffles, conjures, prestidigitates, juggles, spoofs, hoodwinks, and hocus-pocuses. A white sheet, wind-tossed, spawns a ghost. A tumbleweed, a roving demon, a timber's creak, a dead man's bones. And underneath the bed wait nameless, faceless, night-born things. The night moves on and whispers behind the joke of the dark beyond the dark. You mean he cut them up in little pieces and stuck them in the boiler? That's what I mean. Gosh. Hey, Ryan, cut that out, will you? What's the matter? Nothing's the matter with me. Can't you play nothing else? Sure. Ryan. Ryan, cut it out, will you? What's the matter with you guys? Nothing. We don't want to hear your play, so there's something wrong with us? Yeah. Is this the music center or our fire station? How would you characters like to... Hold it. Hold it. Oh, that's over in Brooklyn. Yeah. Hmm. It's a hoodoo, all right. Hoodoo what? What are you guys up to? Listen to Hank. He'll tell you. Okay, I'm listening. It's Thursday, isn't it? Yeah, it's Thursday. There hasn't been a night run in this station on Thursday night for 25 years. 25 years? Yeah, since the Thursday night that Patty Connors died. On a windy night, just like this one. Patty Connors? Who was Patty Connors? He was a firefighter. And he died in this station... 20 years ago, right in this room. Hey, fellas, is this guy kidding me? Listen, you big lug, he's telling you the facts. Well, you want to hear the rest of the story, Ryan? Well, sure, why not? Okay. I thought maybe you didn't like ghost stories. Well, yeah? Go on. Okay. Patty Connors was the driver of the steam pumper that ran out of this station 20 years ago. He was a little guy, but big with women. <laughs> like me. Sure, sure. Yeah. Only one day he met a woman he shouldn't have met. The pretty wife of the fellow who stoked the boiler of the pumper. Oh. One day, the fellow who stoked the boiler of the pumper came home when he shouldn't have come home. Yeah. Patty did some quick talking. And he thought he'd talked his way out of it because nothing happened. Nothing? Nothing. But the next day, there was some kind of a big celebration out in Grant Park. 
and most of the fire department went down there to put on an exhibition, leaving only a skeleton crew, three or four guys. And Patty and the fellow with the good-looking wife were two of them. The other fellows finally went across the street to get a beer. They were only gone a few minutes. But when they came back, Patty was gone. Gone? Just gone. And nobody knew just where. And he didn't come back. The chief figured he'd run off with some woman somewhere, so he crossed him off the department's lists, and that was that. Only it wasn't that. Because a year went by, and it was Thursday, just about this time of night. Fellas were sitting around just the way we are, right in this room, everything okay, when all at once somebody said, Look, on the floor, what's that? That was a big stain. And when they looked closer and touched it, it was blood. What could they do? Nobody knew how it got there. So somebody got some soap and water and some sand, and they scrubbed it up in case the inspector came around. And everybody helped but one, the fellow who had the pretty wife. He just sat there. He didn't move. He just kept watching. A week went by. Thursday again. Same time of night. Fellas were sitting around here, just the way we are. And there it was again. The fresh blood. This time they called in cops. It didn't do much good, because blood is blood. And that's all it was, just a little blood on the floor. They scrubbed it up. A week went by. Thursday night came around again. And they were waiting. The floor was clean. They had a lantern sitting there. They waited. Nothing happened. And then all at once it did. The light went out. Everybody began to yell in the dark, running around, bumping into each other. At last someone found a light, lit it, and then they saw there on the floor was blood again. Only this time it was pouring out from the throat of the fella who had the pretty wife. Well, what? Who? He cut his own throat. At least that's what they say. And he left a letter telling what he had done to Patty. Cut him up and stuffed him in the boiler at the pumper all those weeks ago. Right here in, in the station. That's right. Right here in this station. And there hasn't been a night run out of this place for 25 years. What do you know? Mm. There was something else you fellas don't know about. Huh? His confession. The murderer said that he had cut Patty up right in there. In there? You mean the place where we make our coffee? That's it. Oh. Well, how do you like it? I don't like it. Well, that's all there is to it. Gosh. Sure is a dark, quiet night tonight, isn't it? Yeah. Say, Ryan. Huh? It's your turn to make the coffee tonight. Uh, uh is it? Sure. Well, well... Hank, would you you like to come along and sort of help me? We return to Arch Obler's story of night drifting across America. A very extraordinary night, full of wonder and amazement and horror. The night is a memory book, a diary, 
a doomsday document, inscriptions in deep carved eternal stone and metals, a tape unerasable with memoranda, notes, and picture jottings of every brainwave of a million billion bits of depositions made since slime was random life. And life was slime. Yes? Who is it? It's Keith London, Mr. McGronick. May I come in? Of course. Come in, my young friend. Here, let me have your coat. Oh, thank you very much. Forgive me for not phoning first, but... Oh, it's all right. I'm charmed to see you. Now then, sit down, please. Uh, what would you like to drink? A little spritzer with some nice imported red wine, maybe? No, 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 thank you. I must get back to the office rather quickly. Oh, the office? You, you Americans, always the office. Uh, please, please, you will sit down. You will tell your news, right? Huh? It is good news, eh? Yeah? Oh, how did you... Oh, I can see it on your face. So tell me. Victory. Complete victory. Uh, the ruling just came through. You cannot uh, be deported. Now we're in the foreseeable uh, future, and your citizenship is completely validated. Oh, my friend. Wonderful. Wonderful. I shake your hand. I embrace you. Oh, it's all right. It's my place. Oh, you're embarrassed. I embrace you. Oh, I forgot. You Native Americans are not so... Uh, how, sh how shall I say it? Free in emotions. All these years in America, I keep forgetting this. Oh, no, no, it's perfectly all right. I, I can understand what a load this is off your mind. Off my mind? <laughs> off my back? Uh, how can you know what this freedom is? Oh, bless you, bless you, Mr. Attorney. Well, well, I really must go. I have a late meeting. Uh, uh, you'll excuse me, the, the telephone. Of course. I'll let myself out. <laughs> you will thank your confreres, please. Huh? Uh, tell them I am overjoyed with gratitude. I'll tell them. Uh, just one moment, please, and I will speak with you. Uh, Mr. Linden, you will also tell them I will write them letters of appreciation. Yes, huh? thank you. <sighs> Hello. Hello, this is Gregory Margronick speaking. Oh, it is you, Carl. I was just saying goodbye to the young lawyer. <laughs> you have already heard the news uh, on the radio, huh? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. You can always depend on the sentimental Americans. For three days marching in front of the immigration idiots. Excellent. So then you will come here on Friday? Oh, we will have a, a great celebrations. No, 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 no. None of them. Only my friends, my personal friends. Yeah. Now, no more worries. I can go about my business. No more threats. I'm like, they say, wrapped around in the Constitution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're all right. Goodbye, Carl. Oh, hey, it's getting cold. You make a nice fire. And sit in front. Have my own celebrations. Matches. Mm. Well, well, oh, yeah. Uh. Ooh. My bones. I am old. <laughs> I am old. <laughs> like they said, the persecuted old man. <sighs> the sofa is soft. <laughs> Cat. You want up, huh? <laughs> right. Up you go. Yes. You have earned to sit in front of the fire. The newspaper photos of the kind old man with his old cat were very good for propaganda. <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> ah, the gas fire is warm. <laughs> you never saw those other fires, did you, Cat? No. Too many years ago for you, eh? The long lines of them marching, marching to the fires. Like obedient cattle. Eh. Behind my eyelids, I can see them. Eh, such power I had. Such power. 
I alone chose who would live, who would die. Uh, must I shout? Go down, cat. I must have more room to sleep. Tonight, I must sleep. No more worries. I am a special American citizen. And I will sleep good. The screams. They are beginning again. The screams. No, 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 no. I have been vindicated. The lawyer said so. Then why do I still hear the screaming? Why do I still hear the screaming? We return to our story of night happenings as time inexorably moves across the face of our country. The night is a non-sectarian air-conditioned meeting house, echoing in a thundering chorus, Bible pounding, Bible reaching, hallelujahs, Lord's prayers, whispers, heaven reaching, devil catching, gospel grinding, pitching, catching. The night is a meeting house. This concludes our great meeting for tonight. Bless you all, and don't forget to leave your free will offering as you go out to carry on the work of the Great Spirit. Hallelujah. Good night. God bless you, and don't forget to bring your friends next Saturday night, same time. Hallelujah. 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 The meeting is closed. Excuse me, Reverend. No, sorry, brother. Sorry, in a little hurry tonight. I have to do the work of the Lord. See you later. God bless you, Reverend. Uh-huh. All right. All right. All right. All right. I heard you stop yelling. Well, if you'd answer me, I wouldn't have to yell at you. Well, well, how'd we do? Fifty dollars and eighty-three cents. Fifty dollars and eight. Why, the low-living, tight fist. Don't blame them. It's you. Me? Preaching. By the way you were going tonight, you couldn't raise a dollar out of a hard shell on his way to perdition. I've been doing all right. You were doing all right, but I'm telling you, you're slipping downhill faster than a pig on a grease Now, you look here. Now, you listen to me. Fifty dollars and eighty-three cents from a meeting like tonight. You better listen. Well, what do you got to say? I've been doing a lot of thinking. These West Coast amen snorters ain't what they used to be working in airplane plants and all that. They're getting modern ideas fast. Well, all right. Why shouldn't you get modern ideas? I preach from the headlines. Oh, that ain't enough, Charlie. We gotta throw off the old coat like a rattlesnake in the spring. What do you mean? Don't be thicker headed than you are. We gotta go out of business and come back into business again. Oh, talk words. Just this. Electronics. Huh? Electronics. I've been giving it a lot of thinking. Everybody's talking about electronics, radio and television and that new stuff. Yeah. Computers. Electronics. Mm-hmm. That's what they're thinking about, and that's what we'll give them. Well, you keep talking. This is the night we're starting over. Close right down and move right out and start up somewhere else. Long Beach or San Diego. New start with a new name. Well, well... The Electronical Pathway to the Cosmos. Oh. Now, don't you look down your nose at me. I'm talking sense. The Electronical Pathway to the Cosmos. Now, that's scientific. Yeah, yeah. Fill the stage full of electrical stuff. Uh-huh. Sparks shooting around. Sparks rising up to heaven. Yeah. Going up to heaven. Uh-huh. Ride the sparks to the fountainhead of all the cosmos. Yeah, that's pretty good. And give membership pins. 
Make like jagged lightning. Mm -hmm. Pins to wear at five bucks cash to show that they're a member. Yeah. The Electronical Society of the Cosmos. Yeah, the Electronical Society of the Cosmos. Right. Oh, Harriet, I see it now. Jagged lightning crashing down on sinners. That's right. Burning sparks lifting the repentant sinners up, up, up to the highest pinnacle of the highest cosmos. That's right. Oh, the prophecies seen through the eyes of modern science through electricity. Electronics. Right. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. That's it. We're in business. We return to our story of one hour of night as the tick of the clock deepens the darkness across our country. The night is restless. It stirs and turns and carries with it the restless thoughts of artists, architects, contractors and builders, bricklayers and masons, ministers and teachers, tinsmiths, welders, charwomen, tailors, freightmen, executives and politicians, bankers, window washers, soldiers, brewers, leather makers, printers, butchers, tinners, roofers, fishers, millers, bondsmen, carpenters, lawyers, judges, painters, senators and representatives, wholesalers and retailers, tycoons. All the associates, colleagues, workers, and co-workers of the land. Lawrence, uh, close that window. What? What did you say, Philip? I said close the window. One thing I don't need is to catch a blasted cold. Oh, sorry. I like to look down at the street this time of night. Wall Street. Might as well be Hootersville, Indiana. Not a car, not a pedestrian. The window. Okay. The window. Where in the devil is that brother of yours? He knew the importance of this meeting. Why is it, dear Philip, that Jason suddenly becomes my brother whenever there's a problem? All right, my brother, your brother. He should be here. There's no excuse for his being late. Patience, dear brother, patience. Don't patience me. The time for patience has run out. Your voice... There's no one on this entire floor. You know that, so I'll yell all I please. All right. Yell. You're right. Uh... Uh, be a good fellow. Get me a drink, will you? Sure. So, what'll it be? The usual? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, a bit of wine. Right. Uh, is there any of the uh, Cabernet Sauvignon I brought back with me from France last year? No. What do you mean, no? There was a full case. Call security. If I ever catch anyone sneaking up Don't here... Don't blame the hired help. Have you forgotten your daughter's sub-deb party last month? Well, who in the hell authorized anyone to take that prime stock out of here? You did? Oh. Well, uh, tell me, Lawrence, uh, did the rains last month do any flooding at your place? If you mean my wine cellar, no, no, of course not. When Eileen added that new greenhouse, I had the contractor extend the drains to take care of all that. <laughs> well, at least you got something out of her. Passion for orchids? Me, I wasn't so fortunate. I mean, in those infernal rains. Water got into my garages. Six of my classics have been sent off for refinishing. Insurance? Oh, naturally, naturally. But the Ferrari will have to go back to Modena. Who in this jungle could do justice to the coachwork? Well, our prodigal brother arrives. Who is there? It's a night watchman. Who in the devil told you to come in here? I'm sorry, sir, but I heard... I that... don't give a damn what you heard. I gave strict orders. No one was to disturb us. Some heads are going to roll as soon as I find out. Security? Who is this? Well, mister, whatever your name is, this is Philip Terrell. Yes, you do know the name, don't you? It appears on the plaque at the entrance to this building and on your paycheck, if you ever see another one. How dare you send a watchman up to the executive floor contrary to my express orders? No, I haven't time for your explanations. Just get him out of here, and if you value your job, no more personnel on this floor tonight. Do I make myself clear? Now, you, watchman, get the devil out of here, now. Yes, sir. Well, Philip, even in your old age, you haven't lost your knack of biting heads off with one snap of your jaw. You aren't amusing. Believe me, I've made a note of that security fellow's name. Tomorrow morning... Now, who in the devil? Well, well... 
Brother Jason at last. Sorry I'm late. Hi, Phil, Larry. What was that watchman doing hightailing down the corridor? Hmm? Now you know how I detest your calling me, Phil. Uh, sorry, sorry. Oh, is that a drink, I see? Now you've had enough to drink. Don't you realize the importance of this meeting yet? Yes, Jason. Come along into the boardroom. Take my arm. Uh, I, I'm okay. I'm beautifully okay. And then come along, will you? Coming, coming. Ah, the room I love. Where did you import the paneling from, Phil? Uh, Philip, uh, I keep forgetting. Out of Castle in Spain? Ah, and these chairs, out of Inquisition. That's quite enough, Jason. Uh, let's get down to business. I haven't all night. Yes, yeah, sir, Master. I won't waste any time on why we're here. You both know. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. Now, all I will say is that a $50 million organization is jeopardized by one case of myopia. Uh, blindness, if you will. Our majority stockholder, as late as yesterday, adamantly and unconditionally refuses to permit us to use any of the capital funds to join with the Ketis Corporation or with Gentec in research and development on those areas of recombinant DNA, which can eventually bring immense profits to our own company. A lecture I don't need this hour of night. I'm trying to give you the facts. Lawrence, you've researched recombinant DNA. Speak up. Jason, all I can say is that unless we get into the business of inserting chosen genes into bacteria so that a new generation of bacteria emerges that, that can do everything from producing plastic to fertilizers to medicines without the need of huge factories like ours... My prophecy is that within ten years or less, our business will go down the drain of obsolescence like radio tube factories or, or, or buggy whips. Well spoken. Well, Jason? Why exactly did our chairman of the board object? With the statement that in dealing with DNA, we'd be tampering with life itself. The hour is late. No more discussion. Action. We've got to eliminate this block to the future of our company. There is only one answer to the problem. She has the voting power to stifle this corporation. I repeat, there is only one answer to our company problem. One answer. We've got to murder Mother. <laughs> The night is a sedative, prescribed by the rhythm of life's molecules, wearying in their sun dance. And the night is an old medicine man, mixing a dark brew of tremblings and laughter and fury and past ecstasy, terror and hurt, and the wordless murmurs of a woman talking in memory. The night is an old medicine man. Easy, girl. Easy. She's tired. Duster is, too. Aren't you, Duster? Have we been riding long? <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> We've been out for over two hours. Well, what do you know? I hope it rains soon. I mean, inside of a week. The barley. Yes. That county agent sure confuses me. About the plowing. I've used that kind of a plow on the north field for over 20 years. Now he talks about disking it. Sure got me confused. Ah. Ah, the wind feels good. Yes. I've enjoyed riding in the moonlight. Haven't you? <laughs> What's funny about that? Well, you of all people. <laughs> Talking about the moonlight. Yeah. <laughs> oh. When I think of how many times I've wanted you to go riding with me in the night. Yeah. You knew when you married me that I was a farmer, not a horseman. Oh, children. 
What does that mean? When you were courting me. Oh, yeah. We did do a lot of riding in those days, didn't we? <laughs> you wore a path all the way to the woods. <laughs> yeah. I've been thinking. In those days, we used to ride on other people's land. Now, we've been riding all this time, and we haven't left our own land. Yes. Ada? What? What's the matter? Nothing. Your face. Suddenly gone so sad. Tell me. Ada? You said our land. Yes. If it was only buried on our land. Ada, don't. I wanted to say it to you ever since we started out tonight. It's been in me for days. He talked to me and cried. <laughs> Why can't I cry over my son? Well, when there's a war... Oh, don't talk to me about war. <laughs> talk to me about my son. Where is he? Where is his grave? Oh, haven't they found him and brought him to me? <laughs> you know, I, I have no answers. Just... Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Forgive me, Dave. I shouldn't have done this to you. And on such a beautiful night. It's all right. You had to talk about it sometime. Our son lies among strangers. No. When you're dead, there are no strangers. The night is a movement, east-west along the path grooved by the sun. The night is a movement, east-west. What time is it? Almost half past. Maybe we ought to start for the launching pad. <laughs> They'll let us know when. What's the matter, fella? Haven't you learned how to wait yet? <laughs> yeah. Do we get to talk to our wives again? Yeah, sure. From the inside. Oh, yeah. Strange. Hmm? Uh, what? I thought about this waiting for months. First trip to the space station. Hallelujah. Now it's here. Doesn't seem real. Thought about it so much. Imagination gets mixed up with reality. What was the last word? Are they going to televise us to the public or keep it private? Uh, we beam in on NASA. Nowhere else. No, that's good. Yeah. With this new propellant, if we blow, I guess they don't want the taxpayers to get turned off. You know what I used to do on a night like this when I was a kid? What? I used to take rowboat rides in the park. <laughs> Same deal tonight. Bigger boat. Yeah. Only then it was with a girl. Florence? No. Long before her. Look. Night's so clear. All those stars. Yeah, stars. I'm glad blast-off time is before daybreak. I've always liked the night. Stick around, night. Stay right here. I'll be coming back for you. Maybe. The land is in darkness. The day, once capering with the promise of its allotted hours, has gone, creeping agedly over the edge of the sky. 
night, soft veiling lies thickly over the cities, county seats, towns and villages, over the plantations, ranches, farms and homesteads, over the mountains, buttes, dunes, knolls, over the rivers, lakes, the bays and harbors. For a whisper of time, the night is on the land. Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Night, was written, produced, and directed by Arch Obler. Your host was Vincent Price. The narrator was Hans Conry. The cast was as follows. The Screaming Sketch starred Shepard Mankin with William Phipps. The Firehouse Sketch starred Elliot Lewis with Byron Kane and William Phipps. Let's Murder Mama starred Shepard Mankin, Vic Perrin, and Byron Kane. Revival Meeting starred Virginia Gregg and Barney Phillips. Our Land starred Loreen Tuttle and Elliot Lewis. The Astronauts were Frank Brzee and Byron Kane. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Vincent Price. Death. Shakespeare called it the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. And to this day it remains the ultimate mystery and certainly the world's most accommodating one-way street. Yet suppose one of us stepped up to eternity's tour window and ordered a round-trip ticket. <laughs> Morning, Mr. Beasley. Morning, young man. Lovely day, isn't it? And lovely flowers you have there, Mrs. Grimshaw. Oh, azaleas. Courtney's favorite. Mm. Wouldn't want him to feel neglected on the day before our reunion. Hey, you know, Mr. Beasley, I I've been working at this mausoleum for almost three weeks now, and that's the first happy customer I've seen. What's she so cheerful about? You heard her, Tommy. Oh, you mean about a reunion or something? Or something. She doesn't look that sick. Well, what's that got to do with it? Well, she's over there placing those flowers at that crypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, unless I'm mistaken, that would be this Courtney fella inside that crypt. Courtney Grimshaw, her late husband. Okay. Well, so if she's expecting to be reunited tomorrow, then she must be a lot sicker than she looks or else about to commit suicide. Well, you've got it all backwards, Tommy. There's going to be a reunion, all right. And it's going to happen right before our eyes. We're going to have us a coming out party here tomorrow, the likes of which ain't never been seen in this world. You see, her husband is the one who's crossing the great divide. And that's only the beginning. Or perhaps we should call it the second beginning of our story. <laughs> Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Death, 
Warmed Over by Larry Tubell. Our stars, Mary Jane Croft, Keith Andes, and Elliot Reed. Till death do us part, the traditional limit of the marriage vow. Yet it doesn't apply in the strange case of Mary Grimshaw, a woman anxious to resume what may well be an unholy matrimony with a husband who's about to return from the limbo of death. To understand their unique relationship, we must turn back the clock 30 years to the day of their wedding. Glad it's over? Glad to be alone with you. Uh, Mary, don't. Don't what? Uh, don't sit so close. You're blocking the rear view mirror. All I can see is your head. I thought you liked my head. I love your head, but not in the rear view mirror. Yes, Dr. Grimshaw. Whatever you say, Dr. Grimshaw. I love you, Dr. Grimshaw. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you prefer the scenery to my head. What's that? My new watch. What's it trying to tell us? That it's time for my pill. What? Why are we stopping here? Oh, I need a little fresh air. Get away from those gasoline fumes for a few minutes. Ah, oh, such a pretty spot. Mm. Do you miss Boston? Not with you here. Time for another pill? No. Time for a kiss. Well, what do you think of Mason's Notch, Vermont? Is this it? Are we there? Well, don't blink or you might miss it. I love it, Cord. It's like a picture postcard. The main drag is down that way. General store, post office, graveyard, everything a person needs. Why, there's even a diner for special occasions. Why are we stopping? Behold the Grimshaw Estate. A fitting domicile for the town's new general practitioner. What do you think of your new home, Mrs. Grimshaw? Oh, Court. It's beautiful. Oh, but it's so big, it must have cost a fortune. It didn't cost me a penny. This was the family's vacation home when I was a boy. We spent our summers up here before my folks died. Huh. Ah, it was a happy time. I dreamed of living here someday, for good. I guess some dreams do come true. Uh, how come you never told me about this house? Well, you never asked. Besides, I've only known you for three weeks. There are a lot of things I haven't told you. Time for a kiss. <laughs> yeah, but you can't fool me. It must be time for another pill, too. Oh, how much further? I think I've had it. Ah, we're almost home. Just round the next bend. Now we've got to get you in better shape. This is the short course. Tomorrow we jog five miles. Oh, tomorrow you jog five miles. I read the morning paper and eat my bacon and eggs. Ah, you can see the house now. We're almost there. Oh, can't jog another step. You go on. I'll walk the rest of the way. Cord? Cord, what's wrong? What's happened? Cord! Oh, Cord! Don't cry, Mary. Please don't cry. I, I, I knew this was going to happen. I, I should have told you, but I, I couldn't. Mary, I... I'm dying. Oh. And, and you must listen carefully. Get in touch immediately with my friend Gordon Cannon, Dr. Cannon. You met him at the wedding. I immediately. He'll know what to do and he'll explain everything. Oh, but Trust him. Do just as he says. My will is up to date and everything will be fine for you. Oh, Mary. Mary. Wait for me. Oh, Cord. Cord, please, darling. Uh, wait for me. Oh. 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 Oh.
instruction from a dying man to his young bride. But then Dr. Courtney Grimshaw is not exactly your run-of-the-mill cadaver. As for poor, sweet, dutiful Mary, her ordeal has only just begun. Gordon, oh, thank God you're here. How'd you make it so fast? I had no choice. Uh, there isn't a moment to spare. Follow me. Where are we going? Downstairs to the basement. Well, why, why are we going into the wine cellar? Have you seen the wine cellar? No. Oh, you've never seen a wine cellar like this one. Well, I can't see a thing. Yeah. Where is that light switch? <gasps> oh, Gordon, what is this? Oh, it's nothing, Mary. It's only a mannequin. But why? What are all these tubes and machines for? To bring court back to life. Gordon, please be serious. This is no time for jokes. I assure you I'm not joking. It was Court's idea. Y you know about his parents, how young they died. Well, so did their parents. Congenital heart condition. Court knew he was going to die young, but he couldn't settle for such a short life. So he, he designed his own resurrection. You mean Court's actually going to come back to life to me? Well, not, not right away, Mary. Heart transplants aren't perfected yet, but... Court and I figured that in another 25 or 30 years, they'd be foolproof. And that's when Court will be brought back. 30 years? I... I won't be a young woman in 30 years. Young or old, the question is, do you want to be with your husband again? Of course I do. Then we've got a lot of work to do. And we've got to do it fast. Now, it, it's going to be very difficult and very unpleasant. Are you up to it? Well, I... I don't know. What do I have to do? Well, to begin with, while I prepare this equipment, I want you to go upstairs and get Court's body ready for transfer down here. I want you to massage his chest and to breathe deeply into his mouth. We've got to get his heart and his lungs working again. Uh, this machine will take over once we're getting down here. Oh, Gordon, I can't. It's too horrible. You can't ask me to do that. It's not me that's asking. It's Court. <laughs> Oh, I don't know if I can make it. Feels like a ton. That's what they, that's what they call a dead weight, Mary. Oh. All right, now, lift him up and on the table. Ready? Okay. Well, now the real work begins. I'll explain it as simply as I can as we go along. Court is clinically dead, but not biologically. His cells are still alive. Now, what we're going to do first is prevent any further deterioration. And we'll do that with this machine. Oh, there's the switch. Turn it on. Now, this is called a heart-lung resuscitator. What it does is push that piston down on Court's chest so that his heart is squeezed and starts pumping blood again. There. Yeah, good. Yeah, I think it's working fine. Now... What I want you to do, Mary, is hold Court's arm while I inject him with this anticoagulant. It's to prevent clotting. Good. Good. Okay, this part is going to be a, a little rough. We've got to insert this tube into Court's windpipe so that we can get air into his lungs. Now, that'll be regulated by the machine for every fourth beat of the piston. Hey, Mary, are, are you all right? Mary? Yeah, I'll be all right. I... I'm just a little dizzy. Uh. Uh, now, while I adjust the tube, I'd like you to start applying those ice packs to Court's body. All over the body. We've got to start cooling him off. Who? What? Who the hell are you? Oh, uh, Ambrose is the name. Christian Ambrose of Venable Mortuary and Cemetery. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I heard there was an accident here. I've been pounding on the door. What makes you think you can walk into someone's house? What do you want anyway? Can't you see we're busy? Well, yeah, I can, and, and, and this is fantastic. I, I came here to make funeral arrangements, but if you're doing what I think you're doing... This is none of your business. We've made arrangements, so please leave. Well, you're actually attempting suspended animation, aren't you? This is incredible. You know, I, I've heard of the canon freezing theory, but I never dreamed anyone would attempt it under these primitive 
relative conditions. I, I'd be grateful if you'd let me help. We don't need your help. Please go before I throw you out. Oh, well, I'd be of enormous value to your team. You see, I'm a whiz at handling the deceased. You need a professional. Why would you possibly want to get involved in this? Oh, well, because ever since I read of the freezing process, I, I've dreamed of the day to become a reality. Oh, but just put yourself in my shoes for a minute. Now, we, we mortuary people are treated as if we were parasites, feeding on other people's tragedy and misery. I see this innovation as our last great hope. It makes us the architects of immortality instead of the agents of oblivion. It gives us respectability, prestige... It's nice to have your endorsement of our project, but we don't need you. Oh, I think you do. If you look on the floor over there, you'll find the other 50% of your team. She's just collapsed. Mary! Um, uh, you tend her. I'll begin icing our friend here. After all, we wouldn't want him running a fever now, would we? Fascinating. Utterly fascinating. Dr. Cannon, you're a genius. But what motivated you to devise this theory? Our patient. When I first met Grimshaw in med school, I, I was one of his teachers. Oh. He was a good student. Had a life expectancy of about five years. I felt he deserved a few more. Or at least seconds. Yeah. Well, now, let's see. We, we've drained and stored his blood and pumped his veins full of DMSO... I guess we can turn off the heartbeat machine now, right? Wrong. We've got to circulate that protective solution through his bloodstream. We can turn it off tomorrow. Right now, it's time to apply the slush. Oh. In the freezer over there, you'll find a bunch of plastic bags. They contain a slush of dry ice and alcohol. All we have to do is pack the body in those bags, and we'll get his temperature down to minus 79 centigrade. Then, in a few days, we'll go from dry ice to liquid nitrogen and uh -huh. get him down to minus 196. At that point, he'll be in cold storage until whenever we decide to throw him back to life. Uh -huh. Oh, here. Put these gloves on before you start handling the dry ice. Marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. Mary, what are you doing here? I, I told you to stay in bed. I'm better now. Can I help? Mary, stay out of this. I've had enough trauma today. I don't want you to wind up with a nervous breakdown. I tell you, I'm all right. We're finished for the day anyway. Ambrose will be leaving in a minute. And... But I think I should stay the night. I'm afraid to leave you alone in your condition. My condition is fine. I'm perfectly capable of staying alone in my house. Besides, you forget. I'm not really alone. <laughs> of Mary Grimshaw, a whirlwind courtship of three weeks' duration, then the bride of a man who turns out to be fussy, demanding, and before the sheets have even cooled after a night of honeymoon bliss, dead as a doornail. As if that weren't enough excitement, she is then asked to participate in a chilling debate with death a process that includes such delights as mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation with the corpse of her loved one. Is it any wonder that she's cracking under the emotional strain? Against his better judgment, Gordon Cannon has decided to leave Mary alone in her house for the night, even though she seems to regard Courtney's cadaver as company. As the night wears on in this environment ripe with terror, Mary slumbers fitfully between two sets of worlds, the worlds of life and death, of dreams and reality. Only the morbid, maddening rhythm of the heart-lung resuscitator in the basement penetrates the eerie stillness of the house. On the brink of nightmare, the beat of the machine seems to convey a message. Wait for me. Wait. Lost in this realm of macabre fantasy, Mary is caught up in a chase through a kind of limbo eternity. Her pursuer is a jagged creature of ice that emits a vapor of frost in the manner of a, of a dragon breathing fire. Cornered, she produces a match, strikes it, 
and holds it up towards the oncoming creature as if holding up a cross to ward off a vampire. Reacting to the flame, the cadaverous creature begins to melt away like so much ice. To Mary's horror, she realizes the creature is Courtney. dream. Oh. Maybe this is all a dream. Maybe I've only been dreaming about the past 24 hours. Court? Court, tell me you're not dead. Come back to me, my darling. Is that you, Court? Are you calling me? Oh, come to me, my darling. Return to me, Court. Please, don't leave me alone. Don't leave me alone. <laughs> uh, uh, I must have dozed off again. Well, at least the storm's passed. It's so still. What a relief. The machine. My God, the machine stopped. Oh, for how long? Oh, is it too late to save Gord? The phone. Where's the phone? I must call Gordon at once. The lights are all out. Dead. The phone is dead. Still, it must have knocked out the power. Oh, I must get to court before it's too late. Oh, I can't see a thing in this darkness. Can't see a thing in here. Where's that machine? Mary! Who's there? Is that you, Court? Where are you, Court? Oh! 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 Oh, my God. What have I done? Mary! Oh. Are you in there? Oh! Mary! Oh! Where's that utility switch? Oh. Good. God. Mary, are you all right? I've killed him. I've killed him. Calm down, Mary. You can't kill a dead man. You've only knocked him over. He's all right. Are you all right? Here. Here, let me... Let me get him off you. Uh, uh, oh, he's so cold. It, it, his arm, it, it's loose. It must have been severed a bit in the fall. He's quite brittle, you know, but don't worry. We'll, they'll sew it together when they bring him back. Oh, he'll never come back. I've destroyed him forever. Mary, you're hysterical. Please, <laughs> go back to bed and try to get some sleep. I'll fix things up here and, and stay the rest of the night in case you need me. I've killed him. All he wanted was to come back to me, and now I've killed him. Forever and ever. <laughs> Well, here's to a job well done. And here's to Grimshaw. Frozen stiff and ready for recycling. <laughs> I've quit my job with Venable. Well, that hardly sounds like a cause for celebration. Oh, but it is. It is. Bartender, one more here. Oh, Venable was too scared to offend people by taking in Grimshaw. He, he simply refused to see the business potential of suspended animation. I talked myself blue in the face, but he'd only respond with, you can't tamper with the master plan. So I quit. Well, where does that get you? On welfare? No, 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 not on welfare. As a matter of fact, it could make me a very rich man. You know, I'm, I'm planning to open my own small place on the edge of town. <laughs> That's just what Mason's and Archie needs, another mausoleum. Oh, no, no, mine's going to be different. Yeah, it'll have a freezer wing, yeah, and the court. And court's going to be my first customer. You know, I can see it now. Uh, I'm going to call it the Rip Van Winkle Freezerleum. And the ads will say, play it cool. Die now for later. Oh, I've got a better one. How about, how about... 
Immortality on the easy layaway plan, huh? I like it. I like it. <laughs> the county motor board will call me an opportunist to cause. They'll pick up the story in Boston. I might even make 60 minutes. They'll come from all over the country to, to be frozen to death. And you, Cameron, you will be hailed as the founding father of eternal life. <laughs> you know what, Ambrose? Why? I think you're daffy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but you've got to be a little daffy to become a millionaire. Who is it? It's Gordon. Let me in, Mary. Gordon, you've been drinking. Yes. And I've been thinking, too. Thinking about what? Oh, well, about you. Mary, it's time to give up the ghost. Let's have Court buried and forget this whole ugly business. What do you say? Mary, life is for the living. Court has, has gone far enough. He's asking too much of you. He's slowly killing you, too. I want you to forget Court and come away with me. Let go of me. Mary, this is madness. She... You can't stay faithful to a dead man. I was wrong. I, I was crazy to think a thing like this could work. You've got to listen to me before it's too late. Gordon, you're hurting me. Let go. Mary, I want you to listen. And listen carefully. I love you, Mary. I won't stand by and let you destroy your life. I, I won't let you be sentenced to life imprisonment. Come away with me, Mary. I want you to be my wife. Oh, Gordon... Say you will. Gordon, hold me. Hold me tight. Say you come with me, Mary. I can't. I can't leave with you. But why? You must. Gordon, I'm going to have a child. Courtney's child. Her husband snoozed for 30 years in icy suspension, Mary Grimshaw, too, remained on hold, the prisoner of a remarkably courageous and unselfish vow. For 30 years, she voluntarily vegetated, rearing her heir, preserving an intact shrine to her quasi-late mate, and generally shaping her madness in a house suspended in time and haunted by the ghost of an illusion. The townspeople chose to regard her not as a madwoman, but rather as a fascinating eccentric. Then finally the great day dawned, resurrection day for eternity's first round-trip passenger, an event of monumental impact, of worldwide attention. Television commentators drooled over the dramatic prospects of this second coming. Uh, wait, I think this is she arriving now. A hush has fallen over the crowd as the big black limousine pulls over to the curb. It's the Rolls Royce owned by the proprietor of this world-renowned establishment, Mr. Christian Ambrose. Now, the chauffeur has opened the rear door, and out steps Mr. Ambrose, smiling and radiant on this day, his day of days, too. And now he has extended his arm inside the car, and indeed, out steps the widow, oh, excuse me, uh, the wife of Courtney Grimshaw. Now, as the crowd presses in for a closer look at the, well, you might say the co-star of this production, or reproduction, if you'll pardon the little joke, she hesitates for a moment. It's a look of panic, or at least perplexity, in her eyes. But now on the arm of Ambrose, she begins walking toward the main building, ignoring the autograph pads that's being thrust at her by the spectators. She's wearing a bright print lavender dress for this great occasion, looking, well, frankly, looking like the woman of 60 that she is, or perhaps a little bit older than that, after her three-decade ordeal. She's quite wrinkled and gray, as you can see, and obviously overwhelmed by the enormity of the prospect. And now, as Mary Grimshaw disappears into the entrance of the building, our cameras will switch inside to the recovery room, 
where we understand that Grimshaw is still slumbering after the grueling test of this morning's three-hour heart transplant surgery. The thaw has also been completed, of course. And we hear that Grimshaw's temperature is up to a perfect 98.6. And now, there you see Grimshaw in his bed as his beloved Mary enters the room. Oops. Her knees seem to buckle as she sees her spouse, but she's caught just in time by one of the nurses in attendance. And now a chair is being placed at the side of the bed for her. And all that remains is for the man in the bed to discard his 30-year-old coma or whatever you wish to call it, and re-enter the realm of consciousness. And so she waits. She who alone knows what true waiting is. Ladies and gentlemen, did you see that? A faint flutter of the eyelids. The great moment might be at hand. Mary Grimshaw, as you can see, is leaning forward expectantly. His eyes have opened. He's staring directly into the eyes of his wife. But he looks frightened. And now his eyes have closed. Mary's looking at the doctor. The doctor's looking at Mary. The doctor is shrugging. Oh, but wait, Grimshaw's eyes have opened again, and his lips seem to be quivering. Let's pick up the audio. Ladies and gentlemen, we may be about to hear a man's first words after a trip through the frozen eternity of death. What? What? Why is it so damn hot in here? Hot? Where am I? What happened? Oh, it's all right, dear. You died 30 years ago. I... what? You died. I died. You wanted to die. I did? Why would I want to do a fool thing like that? So we could bring you back. You see, dear, we've kept you in the freezer. In the freezer? I've been in the freezer? Yes. Until we could thaw you out and give you a nice new heart. Oh, I'm beginning to remember now. Yes. Yes, my heart. Yes, I... I remember now. Then you... You must be... Yes, dear? You must be... Oh... Why can't I remember your name? Oh, that's all right, dear. After all, it has been 30 years. Well, what is your name, anyway? What is this, a damn quiz show or something? It's Mary, dear. Mary, dear. Of course. Mary, dear. It's you. I'm back, then. I've made it. Mary, dear, come to me. Let me hold you. And so, as you can see, it is a very intimate moment as our two lovers, separated by an unimaginable gulf for 30 long years, embrace tenderly. Ow! Ow! An embrace punctuated by Grimshaw's curious cry of pain. Evidently, there's something wrong with his left shoulder. He seem, seems to be clutching it now. And his wife seems quite upset over the ailment, whatever it is. Perhaps a failure of the socket to thaw properly. Well, at any rate, this is Phelps Mancuso and Mason's Notch, Vermont, returning you now to our studios in New York. Now close your eyes. Close my eyes? Why? You'll see. Notice anything? I notice a bedroom. Our bedroom, as I recall. You notice anything different about it? No. That's the point. It's exactly the same as the night we slept in it 30 years ago. <laughs> Come on, follow me. Look at this. It's a tube of toothpaste. I'd recognize it anywhere. Yes, but it's your toothpaste. Oh, that is thoughtful of you, Mary. I'd hate to change brands after 30 years. Oh, no, no, you don't understand. It's not only the same brand, it's the same tube you used that morning. And this is the same bar of soap. Everything here is perfectly intact. Even the sheets on the bed are the same ones we slept in that night. But, but where have you been sleeping all these years? On the couch. I didn't want anything disturbed. I wanted everything just the same as when you left. So, 
we could resume our lives together as if nothing had been interrupted. Oh, that was very thoughtful of you, Mary. But uh, where's the evening paper? Tonight's paper? No, the one from 30 years ago. Just thought I'd scan the obits. Oh, that must be him now. Him? Who? You'll see. Well, well. Mother always said I was the spitting image of my old man. Now I have the living proof. Uh, you are alive, aren't you? Darling, I'd like you to meet your son. This is Courtney Jr. Uh, you can call me Court. Or you can call me what my friends call me. Son of Frankenstein. <laughs> You're not eating. I've planned this dinner for 30 years, and he's hardly eating a scrap. Oh, just not very hungry tonight. It's not the food. You know, dear, it's really not necessary to follow that old food chart of mine now that I've got a healthy ticker. My first night at home after 30 years in the cooler, and she feeds me cottage cheese and a raw vegetable plate. The woman is mad. Quite mad. Let's just leave the dishes and go to bed, darling. I'm going to slip into something comfortable for the night. All right, go ahead. I'll be right up. God, if only they'd left me in that tank for another 10 or 15 years. Ah, you look very lovely, dear. Poor thing. Primping like a schoolgirl. Can't she see what the mirror is telling her? <laughs> you haven't lost your charm. Or your taste for necks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you don't look bad yourself, Dr. Grimshaw. Bad? He looks marvelous in the mirror. And look at that old hag next to him. My God, I hadn't realized. What a fool I've been to think it could work. I look twice his age. Well, that's not surprising. I am twice his age. It must be that 30-year beauty rest I've had. She's right. I do look good. Or maybe it's just the contrast. Well, I'm ready to call it a day. Me too. Good night. Good night. <sighs> Mary, you can't just pack up and leave a house you've lived in for 30 years. This is terrible. Think of what you're doing. I have thought about it. I know what I'm doing. But nothing has really changed. We can pretend it's like, well, 30 years ago. Everything in the house is just like it was then. You've seen to that. Everything in the house with one exception. Your 60-year-old bride. Well, maybe we can work something out. Maybe, maybe there's a way... If you really mean it, there is a way. There is? Yes. And it's the only way. Well, what is it? Could you love me if I was your age? Well, of course. Didn't I? Thirty years ago? Well, since it's impossible for me to be your age again, could you love me if you were my age? Well, yes, of course I could. Well, suppose I were to die today say, from an overdose of sleeping pills, would you be willing to wait 30 years for me? Like I waited for you? But, Mary, that would be... That would be insane. Yes, it would. As it was for me. But would you? Mary, of course I would. Oh, Court. It's so much to ask, but I knew you would. I knew our love could never really die. As soon as you're gone, I'll contact Ambrose. He has new techniques that are foolproof. We'll bring you back as good as new. But, Mary, are, are you sure? Are you willing to die just for me? For us, for our love, our undying love. Besides, I won't be dead. Think of it as my turn for a beauty rest. Thirty years... I don't know if I can live that long without you. Well, wait as long as you can. It doesn't have to be 30 years. I'll come whenever you call. I'll... I'll save our toothpaste. 
and I promise not to change the sheets. the good court. How long she been dead? It couldn't be more than a few minutes. I, I talked with her less than an hour ago. She seemed despondent, but I never suspected she'd do a thing like this. Well, there, there, there's still time. We can freeze her and bring her back, just like we did to you. I'm sure that whatever was bothering her will seem insignificant, but she's brought back to you for another chance at life. <laughs> you know, Grimshaw, there's something beautiful about this. Sort of like, uh, well, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, so let's get her ready. We have a moment to spare. Uh, no, Ambrose. Huh? We must let the poor woman rest in peace. She was old and wretched and miserable. She'd lost her will to live. What good would it do to bring her back? Well, we could wait 30 years, and you two could resume your lives and re renew your love on even terms. It's was a kind of poetic justice to that. Wrong, Ambrose. Oh? It would be insane. She said so herself. She knew what 30 years of separation could do to a relationship. It was my mistake in the first place. And she paid a terrible price. We can't make her pay that price twice, can we? No. No, I suppose you're right, Grimshaw. You certainly can't force someone back to life when they... When they'd rather be dead. I guess it's a new twist to an old story. Live and let live. Die and let die. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Death Warmed Over, was written by Larry Tuvel and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Mary Jane Croft, Keith Andes, and Elliot Reed. Featured in the cast were Hans Conried, Bill Baldwin, and Corey Burton. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by CERTA, perfect sleeper mattresses and foundations, with the top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us again tomorrow at this time for another portrait of people in love and sometimes in trouble. Mm -hmm.